Hey, this is Andrew Brown over here at Exam Pro bringing you another complete study course. And this time it's the GitHub Foundations Certification. This one's all about GitHub and practicing some of your Git skills. And this is a great certification if you're looking to show your developer skills in the cloud or tech. Uh, the way we're going to help you get the certification, as always, is the lecture content, doing hands-on labs, and giving you that free practice exam so you can go ace that exam, get that certification, and put it on your resume. Uh, I want to point out, if you love these kinds of courses, the best way to support more free study courses is to buy the paid additional materials that is optional, but you'll get uh, things like cheat sheets, uh, more practice exams, and other things like that. So I just want to tell you that I've taught a lot of different kinds of certifications in cloud and in tech. Uh, you name it, I've taught it. We've got AWS, Azure, GCP, Terraform, Kubernetes, and more. And obviously now GitHub. And if you're wondering why I'm in a snowsuit, it's because my office, it's really cold. It's like negative seven. So this is how it has to be. But I will see you in class in two seconds. Ciao. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're at the start of our journey asking the most important question first, which is, what is the GitHub Foundations certification? Well, it is an entry-level GitHub certification teaching you Git version control basics, working with GitHub repos, collaboration features, modern development, project management, uh, GitHub privacy, security administration, GitHub community, and open source. Now, I put in Git version control basics, but uh, they don't really require it in the uh, certification itself, but you will implicitly learn them as you work through uh, this course. The unofficial course code uh, for the certification is GHF because there are no course codes uh, that GitHub has published. So I've used the um, small initial initializations that they use on their um, certification page. GitHub is the leading uh, uh, version control service in the world. It's one of the most common ways for developers to showcase their code. Uh, if you go for uh, developer interviews, a lot of times people want to have your GitHub link so they can see your activity um, and your code. So who's the certification for? Well, consider this certification if you are new to cloud programming and need to learn version control fundamentals, um, more like version control workflows online, I, I would be better to say. Uh, you're a non-developer uh, at tech role. So you are in tech, but you're just a non-developer looking to quickly add developer skills. Uh, you want to be effective uh, collaborating on code bases with other developers. This GitHub certification will not test your Git skills. It's focused on GitHub. You will use Git, but you may have serious gaps in Git knowledge um, to be used in a uh, work or production environment. So make sure you polyfill that information where you can. Um, in terms of the roadmap, they have four certifications, the foundation, the advanced security, the actions, the admin. And this is where I would put them in terms of difficulty. They don't um, categorize them into levels, but uh, in level 100, I would say the foundations is, is very easy. Um, the advanced security, I put it at 150 because it looks like an extension of the foundations focusing on the security features. Actions is very technical, so a level 200 makes sense. And admin is, I wouldn't say hard, but it goes into enterprise, so it's harder to get access to the enterprise account and test it out, and you have to understand enterprise concepts. So I put it at the level 300. Uh, there's a lot of different routes you could take. You could go from the level 100 uh, to, or sorry, the GitHub Foundations to Advanced Security to the admin or the Foundations to the actions. To me, the Advanced Security seems like such little effort to do that it seems like a, a good follow-up or something you should do at the same time uh, if the content's available to um, a study when doing GitHub, GitHub Foundations. Uh, if you're looking for particular roles, you could probably say the Cloud Security Engineer is where you'd go for the Advanced Security. So you'd start with the Foundations for all of them, go there. If you want to be a cloud developer, uh, GitHub Actions is super useful because it's a CI CD pipeline and it's becoming one of the most popular CI CD pipelines out there. If you're an enterprise engineer, then the administrator is good for having that enterprise knowledge if somebody wants to run GitHub uh, there. But you know, these are just titles. You're not going to actually have that role from completing these certifications. It's just part of uh, content for those particular roles. Um, GitHub certifications do not validate programming, technical diagramming, code management, other technical skills that are required for obtaining technical roles. So just understand the limitations of these certifications. They are useful for learning, but understand that uh, it, it stops at a certain place, okay? How long should you take to uh, pass? Well, if you're a beginner uh, and you've never used GitHub before and you've never used Git or written code before and you're new to 
to cloud and tech, maybe 20 hours. Um, there is no uh, historical information about this certification because it's brand new. And I'm the first one with a study course out. So we'll say 20 hours is a sufficient amount of time uh, for experienced folks. Um, if you have practical knowledge working with GitHub, if you have technical knowledge working with Git, uh, you have strong background in technology and worked in a technical developer role, that's going to be four hours. If you're, an, if you're in a technical role but just not a developer, you might be more in the middle. Um, and so I would probably say 14 hours of average study time, 50% lecture, 50% labs, uh, at, or sorry, 50% lecture and labs, and then 50% practice exams. That's usually always the same thing I always say. And one to two hours a day for 14 days. If it's 14 hours, you could do a, an hour a day and you'll be in really, really good shape. What does it take to pass the exam? Watch the video lecture and memorize key information. This exam in particular is very factoidal and unfairly so. So make sure where I call out factoidal information to memorize it because it is silly and you'll lose points uh, for that. Do the hands-on labs. It's going to really help cement how all this stuff works together. And even though the exams don't really require it, I, I want you to have that knowledge and I want you to have an easier time passing. So please do the uh, follow, uh, follow alongs. Do paid online practice exams because this one in particular, again, it's very factoidal and you need to see some variations so you don't get caught off guard. If you think that you go through my course and go, I'm really good at GitHub now, uh, you'll be throwing a, a bunch of like enterprise questions and stuff that you didn't think that would be there. And in particular, what information is there. So make sure you utilize practice exams. Make sure you utilize my free practice exam, which will come out with this. Um, and you'll do fine. Again, not a hard exam, but you know, I don't want you to be frustrated on that exam, losing out some particular points because you didn't know that you had to know the, uh, uh, the lineup of GitHub work, uh, workflow uh, actions inside of uh, GitHub projects or something like that. There are seven domains for the certification, and I need to point out that for some reason, GitHub uh, does not share the weighting of each domain. Most exams do that. And my experience when I sat the exam, it was kind of in balance where I had a lot of enterprise questions. So um, just understand that you might not even see a question in the domain that you are expecting, or you might have very few, a lot in other areas. I don't know why they did this. It was a bad choice, but that's what they did. We have seven domains. We have support uh, GitHub Enterprise for users and key stakeholders. Uh, domain two, manage user identities and GitHub authentication. D uh, domain three, describe how GitHub is deployed, distributed, and licensed. Domain four, manage access and permissions based on membership. Domain five, ensure, or sorry, enable secure software development and ensure compliance. Domain six, manage GitHub actions. Domain seven, benefit of benefits of the GitHub community. There's no development stuff in here, but I've crammed in the exam development stuff because you really should know development stuff and GitHub is a developer platform. For some reason, they decided not to include it in here, but I feel that it really makes it easier to utilize GitHub if you know the developer tools. Uh, where do you take this exam? Well, at an in-person test center or online from the convenience of your own home. GitHub delivers it with PSI. Um, so PSI has an online version and then they have a, a bunch of test networks that they are partnered with. Um, it, is a, it, it is a proctored exam. So there's somebody that's uh, supposedly watching your exam so that you do not cheat. I just want to warn you, PSI is not known for having a good test experience. When I saw it my exam, um, uh, I was 30 minutes early checked in and uh, I waited 40 minutes after my check-in time because it said it was connecting me to a special specialist. It never did. I had to contact support. They, uh, they made me uh, fill in a bunch of information, which seemed weird because they should know who I am already because I'm in their app. And then they told me, oh, I'm not actually connected to anybody. And so the app lies to you. So don't get stressed out if you have technical issues with PSI. It's extremely common. And uh, if you're doing it online, if you can do it in a test center, I strongly recommend doing so because it just makes the whole experience a lot less stressful from the environment perspective, from uh, the technology perspective. But if you got to do online, just uh, don't stress out and understand that everybody has these issues. Uh, it doesn't make sense, but everyone has these issues and not to, not to sweat it or throw you off before your exam starts. In terms of grading, they don't give us a grade. GitHub does not provide a passing score. We don't know how many points there are. We do know how many questions there are, but uh, for some reason, they've decided not to provide that information. Uh, they say in their FAQ because they can't exactly calculate it. They don't want to give you an inaccurate number. It really makes no sense, but I'm going to tell you that you still will pass, pass this exam. It's not that hard. 
But yeah, you just have to make sure that you can get as many points on those factorial questions. And don't stress out about not knowing what your passing score is. There are 75 questions in this exam, 60 scored, 15 unscored. So you can afford to get 15 questions wrong at least. There is no penalty for wrong questions, at least as far as I'm aware of. And I saw um, both multiple choice and multiple answer. Uh, sometimes it was choose two, choose three. It was never more than three. There wasn't that many multiple answer uh, like basically multiple select ones, so it wasn't that bad. Don't stress out about the unscored questions because there's 15 of them. They don't count towards your exam. Why is there unscored questions? Uh, they're used to evaluate the introduction of new questions, to determine if the exam is too easy, and the passing score or question difficulty needs to be increased to discover users who are attempting to cheat the exam or still dump exam questions. If you encounter questions you've never studied for that seem really hard, keep your cool and remember they may be unscored questions. The duration of this exam is two hours, so you get 1.6 minutes per question. So that exam time in minutes is 120 minutes. Your seat time is uh, 30 minutes, or sorry, 150 minutes, because you add 30 minutes there. When I say seat time, that's the time you need to go in and check in and re-review the instructions and get your workspace set up and sign the NDA and show them your space, um, provide feedback at the exam. Uh, I was able to check in 30 minutes online prior you you probably want to be 45 minutes prior to your exam, okay? So give yourself a few minutes to get set up and try to check in early. Sometimes they let you start exams early, right? So even if you're scheduled for five, uh, sometimes five minutes after your check-in, you can start and get rolling on it. But uh, yeah, there you go. And we'll see you in the next one. Ciao. Hey, everyone. It's Andrew Brown. And in this uh, video, I want to show you uh, where you can get... Uh, the exam guide and ad other additional information so you can understand where I'm getting this stuff and make sense of it yourself. And you might hear my space heater here. I have the tiny space heater uh, to keep my feet warm, my hands warm. So sorry if the background noise picks up, but let's go take a look. So the way you can get to this is you just type in gh.io forward slash certifications. Love the short link, by the way. And I mean, they have stuff down here below, but what you really got to do is go to register and then connect your account and it'll do something with GitHub and then you'll see this stuff here, okay? Now, I wanna point out that um, they have an FAQ down below. Uh, I guess they have a candidate handbook, which is something. I'm not even sure if I open that up. Mm. This is more about like how to run stuff. Yeah. Okay, not really useful, but um, what we're looking for is the exam guides, okay? So if we were to go into the foundations, which is this is the certification we're focused on, you can see the price here. It says you pass with the exam of 82%. Hooray, I actually can see my score now. I didn't know where that was. You can't see it. I'm trying to move my head here. Not sure why uh, it's not letting me do that. There we go. And so I actually got an 82%, which is pretty good considering I thought I flubbed a bunch of questions, but that's pretty good. Remember, there is no study course or practice exams before I took this. Um, so that's great, but they really should tell us the, the non-passing score. So if we go down below to FAQ, okay, and we look up passing score, since there are multiple versions of the certification exam, the passing score can have minor variances depending on which version you take. To ensure the integrity of your exams, to avoid confusion on why there is a small variance, will not provide you a specific total score. And I mean, I think that's kind of a failure of uh, any kind of certification program. I think that would be very frustrating for the person taking the exam, not knowing what the score is. But again, I passed it, so I'm just telling you, like you will pass it, but understand that they're just not gonna tell you what it is, at least not at this time. So that's one thing that uh, I found uh, stood out there. But let's go back over to here and we have the learning path, which is on Microsoft Learn. They might have some content that, um, that gets covered a little bit differently here. I found it not to be uh, very good, but there was some stuff about like enterprise um, that I don't really go much more into detail where they're talking about like bringing in identities. It might be this. Right, so again, I didn't, I didn't look at this until afterwards. So yeah, I don't really go this full top into this. Um, I do like UFA, but um, you know, you might want to top off in that one section here. But the rest, I don't know about the rest. <laughs> like in terms of quality, it's, it's not, uh, it's not there. Um, so let's go into the study guide, and we'll just open that up. Okay. 
And we have our domains, so we have our seven domains. And if we go and scroll on down, we can see they have Git and GitHub Basics. So they have like a little bit about the expect you know about Git, like commit and branching. Um, I made sure to include other things like what is remote. Uh, I don't know, I have a big list of it. It's in the, uh, we have a, uh, a Git and GitHub quick and dirty crash course to get you through all that stuff. We have uh, GitHub ident identities, so understanding the different types of accounts, GitHub Markdown. What's unusual is like, they talk about GitHub Markdown, but they don't talk about GitHub Flavored Markdown. Really odd, they have a Markdown section, but not that. GitHub Flavored Markdown is amazing, by the way. You have GitHub Desktop, you have GitHub Mobile. Um, coming down here, all about how to work with GitHub repos, um, how to work with issues, how to work with pull requests, how to work with discussions, how to work with notifications. I don't know if I even got a question on notifications on my exam. Uh, GIST, wikis, and GitHub pages, nothing on GitHub pages. Surprised they didn't promote that a bit more. I really like GitHub pages. We have GitHub Actions. Um, in this, for GitHub Actions, you know, you need to know a little bit about the syntax of the file because I was getting very specific questions about that. Um, Copilot, so we have Copilot, we have Code Spaces. I actually was surprised how little there was on Code Spaces, but I do do a very thorough cho uh, job of covering Code Spaces with us because we need to utilize it to be effective. Uh, and so we get a lot more knowledge in that than expected. We have uh, GitHub Projects. Um, it's weird because they say GitHub projects, but it's really project management. So like labels and milestones aren't specific to GitHub projects. So I kind of broke that up into a different area there. And there were some other things that were project specific that, um, um, that I, uh, that I had to put in here and things that I didn't. What's weird about GitHub projects is they need, they want you to know very specific things. Like they want you to know, um, the types of built-in workflows right, the types of, of charts. And that kind of threw me off because they seem so trivial to know, but they asked you in the exam, so I was surprised. This thing is not specific to GitHub projects. I'm not sure why they put it in there. Um, but anyway, in this this as well, so yeah, I'm not sure why these are in here or even create template repos. These All these here shouldn't be in this section, but they are. Uh, we have privacy, private, privacy Security Administration, so we have a few here uh, for uh, security. Then we have GitHub administration. I might call it administrator. I'm not sure why, but I might have messed that up. This is supposed to be about like the management of your repo. I actually covered a lot of it in the GitHub repo section. So I end up repeating the content a little bit. We have the benefits of the GitHub community. So knowing what sponsors is, what is open source, what is GitHub's relationship with open source, um, inner source, and there you go. So. Yeah, I would say that, again, it's not a hard exam, um, and I really make sure that you're super prepared for it. Just make sure you do do uh, uh, some practice exams just so you don't get caught off and lose some points on that factoidal information. But there you go, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown. I'm just going to do one ask of you, if, if you can, uh, if, you, if you like this course and it helped you out. They have this program called GitHub Stars, and they basically recognize people that did good work uh, uh, promoting GitHub or educating in communities. I think I'm doing that because I'm making a free course. And if you want to do me a favor, you can go hit here to the nominate up at stars.github.com. You can say, I nominate, and it would be like Omen King because it would be something about the actual, uh, you know, like I taught you GitHub, and you thought that was really great. And I really great, greatly appreciate that. And you know, maybe that way I will go make more of GitHub content and we can help the community more. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown and we are taking a look at version control systems which are designed to track changes or revisions to code. And there's been a lot of software over the years that helped us do that. We had CVS, Subversion, Mercurial, and Git. So back uh, in 1990s when we got CVS, Though even though we had it, I don't think a lot of companies were using it. It took some time to adopt. If you ever heard of like Doom or Wolfenstein, you'd be uh, interested to learn they didn't use version control systems. And what they would do is they would literally copy files onto floppies and hope that they don't lose their files. But of course, a version control systems makes it really easy to not worry about losing floppies or CDs or drives because they keep track of all the history. Then came Subversion in 2000, 
But the real game changer was in 2005 when we were introduced to a new type of version control system. And we had Mercurial and Git. Um, but the key difference between the old ones and the new ones was the old ones were centralized and the new ones were decentralized. And these decentralized ones became very popular for very specific reasons. They had full local history and co uh, complete control of the repo locally. They were straightforward and efficient for branching and merging, which was a really big deal. Uh, better performance, improved fault tolerance, flexible workflows, worked fully offline. Um, and out of the two, Git was the one that won. And there are reasons for that. And we'll talk about that when we look at version control services. Um, but uh, yeah, Git is the one that everybody is using today. And that's why we are taking this course. I just want to point out, they're going to come across a lot of terms that sound like trees, tree, trunk, branches. Um, the reason for this is that version control represents um, uh, the revisions or changes in a graph-like structure. You can even say a DAG, um, if you're familiar with that. And so, uh, you know, you'll see these terms and we're not talking about real trees. We're talking about uh, the components of a version control. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown and we are taking a look at Git. So Git is a distributed version control system, a DVCS. That's gonna be hard to remember. Uh, and it's created by Linus Torvald. If you've ever seen that name before, you might know that Linus is the creator of the Linux kernel, but he is also the creator of Git. And Git right now resides with the Linux Foundation, which I believe is a uh, nonprofit set up by uh, Linus as well, or has some uh, part to do with it, where a lot of open source projects reside. Um, but you know, I don't really wanna focus on that. I wanna focus on the practicalities of Git. So the idea with Git is that each change of your code, a Git commit, can be captured and tracked through the history of your project, a Git tree. So I'm gonna get my pen tool out here for just a second. And so I just wanna make this very clear. So we have over here a file and a Git commit can, or a commit can be made up of multiple files with multiple changes in them. And then they're represented over with a, uh, a, a message, okay? So here, this is a single um, git commit and it can have multiple files and uh, files and changes in that single one. And then that's your tree, okay? So hopefully that is clear. If it's not, don't worry, we'll get hands-on skills and we'll definitely be able to remember them later. I wanna take a look at a bunch of common git terms um, and it doesn't matter if you remember these now, but you will know what they are hopefully by the end of this course. Um, and so there is this nice graphic here that is provided by Wikipedia that gives an idea of how all of these terms uh, work together. Uh, but let's go quickly through them and see what we can make sense of. So the first term is a repository. This represents the logical container holding the code base. In fact, you, you could interchange the word code base repository and mostly mean the same thing. We have a commit. This represents a change of data in the local repository. And so um, that's pretty clear. Then we have the tree. This represents the entire history of a, of a repo. So when you see tree, just think of that graph. We have remote. Uh, this is a version of your project hosted elsewhere, used for exchanging commits. Uh, some people might be a bit uh, picky about this because they might say remote is actually a remote reference to a repository. So it's pointing, it's a pointer, but I'm just gonna make it think that it's a remote uh, repo, it's just somewhere else. And there, uh, there are branches. So these are divergent paths to development, allowing isolated changes. You're absolutely gonna know what branches are. You're absolutely gonna have to work with them quite a bit. Um, there is a branch known as main. It was formerly known as master. Uh, the word was changed because it was not a popular term anymore. And so now main is the new name. Uh, and this is usually the default branch or the base branch, uh, if that makes sense there too. So we have clone. This creates a complete local copy of a repository, including its history. So this will create like a little .git folder. Um, so it's not just the contents of the files, but some configuration around the Git repo. We have checkout. So this switches between different branches or commits in your repo. We have pull. So this downloads changes from a remote repository and merges them into your branch. We have push. This uploads your local repository changes to a remote repository. We have fetch. This downloads data from a remote repo without integrating it into your work. Um, we have reset. So undoes local changes without options to unstage revert commits. We have merge. This combines multiple commit histories into one. We have staging files. This prepares and organizes uh, changes for commits. 
it's not a command, but like it's just where you would work with your files. Um, in the uh, example here, I'm just gonna get my pen tool out again. It's kind of over here. It has to relate with this up here as well. And so within staging files, we're gonna have commits, which we already talked about prior. And then there's that add command. So adding things that will get committed. So hopefully that makes sense and we'll see you in the next one, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown and we are taking a look at version control services. And if you're thinking that we already covered this, it looks that way, but the other one was version control systems. This one is version control services. And yes, they have the same initialism, which is confusing, but it's very important to make that distinction because those are two separate things. So version control services are fully managed cloud services that host your version controlled repositories. These services often have additional functionality going beyond just being a remote host for your repos. Git is the most popular and often the only choice for a VCS. And we often call these Git only uh, providers, Git providers. Um, I need to also point out that some people call version control services, version control systems, and vice versa, and it just gets really confusing. So I did my best to make that clear distinction between the two, okay? Let's take a look at some VCSs. So the first here is GitHub, and it's owned by Microsoft. It's the most popular VCS uh, uh, due to offering, uh, uh, due to its ease of use offering and being around the longest, at least for Git. Um, and they've always been very developer focused and super friendly. Uh, GitHub is primarily where open source projects are hosted and offer rich functionality such as issue tracking, automation, pipelines, and a host of other features. I remember the day GitHub came out and I signed up for it because I was so done with using Subversion. Then came along GitLab. So GitLab was an emerging competitor to GitHub and at the time had unique features such as CICD pipeline and improved security measures. This is no longer the case as GitHub is now on par with GitLab. Um, but yeah, at one point, a lot of people were looking at GitLab. Then there's Bitbucket. This one is owned by Atlassian. You might have heard of Atlassian before because they are uh, the same company that makes Jira. And Jira is the most commonly used project manager uh, for um, people in tech. So, you know, even though GitHub is really great for developers, a lot of companies still use Bitbucket. And the interesting thing about Bitbucket was that they originally hosted Mercurial. So remember I said back in 2005, Mercurial and Git came out? Well, Alatsian adopted Mercurial, GitHub adopted um, Git, and Git won, and GitHub won. And so what's really interesting is that Bitbucket then eventually added Git and then sunsetted Mercurial. So everything basically is Git now. There is a, another provider called SourceForge. They are one of the oldest places to host your source code. They existed before GitHub. Um, and they were the first uh, to provide free of charge um, uh, Git repository hosting to open source projects. Um, the only thing about SourceForge is that they never really dominated because they just had so many ads and bad practices. And so it just didn't work out for them. They are still around and a lot of open source projects like to only host there. They might mirror, make a copy to other providers like GitHub, um, but for the most part, everybody's on GitHub, um, but there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown. We are taking a look at GitHub, and this is a version controlled service that initially offered hosted managed remote Git repos and has expanded to provide other offerings around hosted code bases. If you go look up what GitHub calls themselves today, they call themselves like an AI uh, developer powered platform. Um, it's really bizarre because they are basically a host for, uh, for Git repos with uh, extra stuff on top of it. But I guess since AI is so popular, they got to try, right? But let's take a look at all the functionality that they have. So we have Git repository hosting. That is their main bread and butter. We have project management tools, issue tracking, pull requests and code reviews, GitHub pages and wikis, GitHub actions, GitHub copilot, GitHub code spaces, GitHub Marketplace, GitHub Gists, GitHub Discussions, Collaboration Features for Organizations and Teams, API Access Development, so GitHub Development, uh, they have a GitHub CLI, they have SDKs, um, we have security features like auto-detecting credentials in repos, they have education-specific things, or course automation like GitHub Classroom, and I'm sure they have more. 
Uh, we're going to learn about all of these things because this is what the GitHub course is about, to understand the full offering of GitHub and to make best use of it. And just a fun fact is that GitHub was originally built in Ruby on Rails. Ruby is my favorite language. Rails is my favorite framework. So I've been uh, uh, on the, the ride or the train since day one with GitHub. Um, so I know it pretty well, but let's jump into it, okay? Hey everyone, this is Andrew Brown. And this fall along, I wanna show you how to set up UFA or multi-factor authentication. We'll talk about it later in the course, but it's very important that we get this set up early uh, so we get it out of the way. And that's our opportunity to also install a really useful application called GitHub Mobile. So I'm gonna go into Google and just type in GitHub Mobile so we can take a look. And so what GitHub Mobile is, it's an application that allows you to uh, basically interact with um, uh, GitHub on your phone. But the major reason why I want you to install it is because it's also used as a uh, authentication tool for GitHub. Now you can use another tool if you already have Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, Authy, you can use what you wanna use and you can actually add both of them there. But I find the easiest way to um, do UFA is to use Git, uh, GitHub Mobile. So I really do recommend that you install it. It's for both Google Play and your Apple phones. I'm on screen for a second. Sorry for the, uh, the upward uh, camera. I'm in standing desk mode right now. But the idea is that you're looking for the app. It's literally just called, I don't know if you can see it, GitHub. Right, and so you want to install that application, okay? So here it's showing my profile as I'm logged in here. And this will be what we use to log in or confirm when we log in the future. So what I'm gonna do is go up here, I'm gonna turn off the video so I don't have to look at myself. And we're gonna go over to ooh, um, settings, I would think. And then from here, it would probably be under passwords and authentication. And so if we scroll on down, um, I mean, there is a passwordless way of logging. I have yet to use that, but what we're looking at is the two-factor authentication. I'm gonna go ahead and enable that. Now, what's interesting is that if you have a lot of um, open source contributions, you have to have UFA turned on. So in my main account, they turned it on for me. They said I couldn't use my GitHub account unless they turned it on. But we have this QR code. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take a quick look here. Um, I mean, this is one way of doing it. I guess we could do text message as well. Let's go back here because I thought if you had the GitHub mobile application, it would show it here. But since we have nothing attached, we'll have to attach something. So I'm gonna go here. I'm just gonna uh, carefully look here. And um, you know what I'm gonna do S, no, I'm gonna stick with the authenticator. So I already have Authy installed. Um, so I'm gonna use that. I really like Authy, it's by Twilio. And I find it is one of the most light ways of um, getting a multi-factor authentication. So I'm just gonna show you what it looks like again on my phone, but I really wanna use GitHub Mobile, but I'm, I'm really surprised that they don't show that in the setup, but yeah. So for example, this is uh, Authy. It's really simple. You put in a pin and then you can get into your actual codes uh, that rotate out. Um, so you can go install that. It's in the Google Play Store and the iOS Apple store, but um, I guess I'll add that. So what I'm gonna do is scan this QR code with my phone and all phones can scan QR codes. You just open your photo app and hover over and it'll pick it up. You'll get a link and you'll click through and then it'll ask you what app you want it open with. And so I already have Authy installed. So I'm gonna click Authy. If you wanna see this, again, I'm trying to show as much as I can on my phone, but it's asking me what app do I wanna open with, Authy after scanning that code, right? And I'll say uh, this time, yes. And then uh, I have a pin, so I'm gonna to have to enter my pin in. Okay. And Authy opened, but it didn't automatically add it. So what I'm gonna to have to do in Authy, I'll just show you this for a second, because I thought it would add it, but it didn't. So I'm gonna to have to say add account at the top. There's a little drop down for, for that. Okay, so now it's asking me to scan the QR code. So I'm gonna do that. Okay, and so it's brought it in here. And so now I have it here, it says GitHub, and then my username, I'm gonna hit save. And so now I have a code. And so that's the code I need to enter in, all right? So I'll just turn off my screen and enter the code in as quick as I can. 705839, really doesn't matter if I tell you this code out loud. And now we have our backup codes. 
You should never share your backup codes with anybody. This is a way that people can get into your account. Um, I really did not mean to show them to you here. I'll have to do some editing to um, hide them, okay? So I've downloaded my codes and make sure you print out these codes and you put them somewhere safe and have it offline. Do not have it online. That's the whole point. So go get the a special Duotang. You have permission to go buy some uh, stationery and put that in and, and put it somewhere safe, okay? So I have mine downloaded to my computer and I'll go print it out later. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and say, I have saved my recovery codes. And so now it shows GitHub Mobile. This is so silly. The GitHub Mobile app on your phone can be used as UFA. Enable it by installing the GitHub Mobile app. So maybe the reason it didn't work was because I didn't sign into it. So if I had signed into it initially, maybe we didn't have to do this to begin with. So what I'm gonna do is just go hit done. And I still think, again, it's easier to use the GitHub Mobile app. So I'm gonna go and see if I can log out of GitHub Mobile and log into this other account. Or maybe I can be logged into both of them at the same time. So I'm opening up GitHub here and I'm just seeing if I can be logged into multiples. So what I've noticed here, I'm logged in already. I just wanna show you something. So here I am in GitHub Mobile and there's a little cog at the top. So I'm gonna click that cog and then I have my settings, right? And I'm gonna scroll on down and there's a thing that says accounts. I know, I'm sorry about the glare. So there's accounts. I'm gonna click accounts and it looks like that I can add multiple accounts and that's what I'm gonna do, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and hit add account and it's gonna ask me to sign in with GitHub. Okay, so I'm gonna hit the big white blob of a button and then it's going to show this here, sign in with different accounts. So I'm gonna go ahead and use a different account and then I have to enter my uh, username, email and password. So just give me a moment, okay? All right, so I had to like email myself my password because my, <laughs> my dash lane wasn't letting me log in. But once you're there, you're gonna see the, that authentication code that it's gonna want. So I'm gonna go grab that from Authy. And it's good to have Authy installed. I like having it because uh, you can't use GitHub Authenticator for everything. So I'm gonna go real quick and put that code in. Nope, I missed it. So I'm gonna have to try that again. Sometimes you miss it, you'll have to try it twice. Okay. There we go, it's gonna ask uh, to get access to authorize it. Go down below, say authorize GitHub, that green button there. And it's signing me in. And it looks like I'm now in. So I'm now in here with my account. I imagine I can switch between the two. What I'm gonna do is just turn off my screen here and let's take a look and see if this is showing up now. So we'll give this a refresh. And there it is, so it's now configured. So. The idea here is that you can also set the default. So again, I would recommend GitHub Mobile. It doesn't hurt to have more than one, but I find this to be super convenient because um, it, like when you go through this, you only have to enter in like two letters. It's a lot faster. It'll, it'll, it'll uh, jump up on your screen, whereas these other authenticators will not. Um, so that's my recommendation to you there. And now that we have two factor, we are in great shape. I'm gonna just go back to home by clicking the OctaCat. And uh, that's it, so I'll see you in the next one, okay? Ciao. Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and in this follow along, I wanna show you how to create your own GitHub account. Every single developer on the planet should have a GitHub account because it's a great way to showcase your work. Uh, we'll talk about that later, but you can see that I'm already logged in here, so I already have a GitHub account. And what I'm gonna do is log out and I'm going to create a new one from scratch. So here we can see uh, we can have multiple ones. Um, I'm gonna just sign out of all of my accounts here and let's go ahead and create ourselves a new one. So I'm not sure, remember I told earlier, I told you they're like the leading AI powered developer platform, which is such a silly term, but um, let's go ahead and see if we can make a new one. So just in case it's the future and they've changed this homepage, I'm gonna go up to sign up and I'm gonna see if I can make an account, if I can find an email that has not been used so far. So I'm gonna type andrewexampro.co. If you're using Gmail, so I can't use that one. If you're using Gmail, you can use like plus signs to um, create multiple ones. So like my really, really personal email, don't email me because I don't ever check this one, is like omenking at gmail.com. You'll learn that my username on GitHub is omenking. Why it is that? I don't wanna talk about it. It's like forever ago. I made this account like so long ago and I really wish I could have got Andrew Brown as my username, but that's not what it is. And so I'm just gonna go here and say alt. 
Okay, so this is a trick with Gmail that you can do. You can put a plus alt on it or uh, maybe a minus, I'm not sure, but let's go ahead and see if that works. And I need to create a password. So I like to generate really strong passwords. Um, you can use whatever you want. I like to use, hold on here. <laughs> I like to use this site, which is the uh, password generator plus, passwordgenerator.net. Um, I should make a disclaimer if this isn't secure, don't use it, blah, 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 but I'm pretty sure it's fine. So I'll usually go like 24 and get a nice long password. Um, and I'll just generate a few different ones off screen here and I'm gonna enter that in, okay? So just generate out a few and I'm gonna drop this in on here. Okay, we're gonna hit continue. It says it's strong, that's good. And then I gotta choose my username. So I probably can't get Andrew Brown. And um, so I need like another name. I'm gonna try Durano, not available. Uh, that's like my game uh, gamer uh, uh, tag on um, Steam. So what's another one that I could have? Uh, we'll just say Andrew Cloud. Can I get that one? <laughs> so hard. We'll just say Andrew WC Brown. Can I get that? There we go. WC is my mid middle initials. It doesn't stand for water closet, okay? <laughs> I know it looks like that. We'll go ahead and hit continue. I'm gonna hit continue again. And so now what I need to do is do this verification. Please solve this puzzle so we know you're a real person. Uh, verify. Okay, use the arrows to rotate the object to the face in the direction of the hand. Okay, use the arrows. So I think I have to make it face the same way, match the angle. Okay, uh, this way, okay. There we go, create my account. And so now I need to open up that email. Just give me a moment, okay? All right, so I've been waiting a few minutes and I haven't seen anything and I resent the code. So maybe it doesn't like emails that have that plus in there. It's totally possible. So I might actually have to go ahead and create a new email, which is quite the headache uh, as I ran out of emails here. Uh, unless I can think of another one. You know what? I think I have another idea. I'm gonna use uh, a different one here. So it looks like unverified. Can I change this? I'm gonna try, um, because you have a, a privacy e uh, privacy email, uh, will be used for account related stuff. Mm, yeah, I'm not really sure what's going on here. I thought maybe my account even exists, but it looks like it already does exist. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna add another one. I can do Andrew maybe at teacherseat.com. We'll try that. Oh, it's already in use. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's so hard to get an email out here. Okay, let me just think about this for a second, all right? All right, another thing I'm gonna try is I'm gonna try uh, maybe accounts at teacherseat.com. That's another one that I might be able to use. Okay, and I'm gonna change this over here and save it. Great, and that should be my primary now, right? Oh, it really wants to send it to this one. Maybe what I can do is I can click, oh, it looks like we have both. Okay, so we have this one. Um, please verify the, I'm gonna get rid of this one here because that one's not working. I'm gonna try uh, accounts at teacherseat.com. So that's in my Outlook, so I'll go take a look there and see if I get it. All right, so uh, this is working out totally fine. So over here we have um, the confirmation email. So I can go ahead and just verify that email. We can also just grab this link. I kind of prefer using the link here because um, that just gives me kind of a guarantee. And we'll go here and now we are in. So this is exciting. Um, it's been a long time since I've made a new GitHub account. So I'm not sure exactly what to expect. But it looks like we have some places we can start, start a new project, collaborate with your team learn how to use GitHub. Hey, I'm already doing that. You don't need to do that, GitHub. Let's go ahead and skip this for now, and we should get back to our main dashboard. So we are now in, and we have an account that we can use. Um, so yeah, that's all I wanted to show you in this video, uh, but I'll see you in the next one, okay? Ciao. Hey, this is Angie Brown, and this fall along, I just wanna show you that I'm gonna be setting up multiple accounts to quickly switch between them. Um, if you want to take full advantage of learning how to use GitHub, you're gonna need probably another account because you're gonna have to have somebody else to work with. So I already have my primary account. I already showed you how to make an account. So what I want you to do is make a secondary account. I know it's a pain, but go ahead and do that. 
Well, what I'm gonna do in this video is show you how you can log into both and switch between the two. And I'm also gonna set up a repository um, that I'm gonna put code examples in if we happen to put any in there. So what I'm gonna do is go up here at the top right corner, I'm gonna go add account. And so this is gonna allow me to log into my other account. I can put in my username or my email. So this one is, um, this is monsterboxpro.com. That's my old, <laughs> my old company that's not been around for a long time, but I've never updated it. And the exam pro email is on a, another GitHub account. But I'm gonna go ahead and find the password so I can go log into this one. So just give me a moment. I'm just trying to find it. Here it is. There is the password. I'm gonna paste it in here. Uh, okay, we'll hit sign in. Okay, and notice it says GitHub Mobile. So now it's my opportunity to show you GitHub Mobile. So what I'm doing is I'm opening up my phone and right away it pops up. It says, uh, you know, new sign in request. Now it says reject or approve, I'm gonna hit approve. It says authentication request was approved. Uh, the first time I, I had to do that, I had to enter in like a code, like two numbers, but now from then on, I just have to do that. And it's very easy to, uh, to do that. So if I wanna switch between accounts, we can go here and just switch between them uh, freely. So that is really easy. And so what I wanna do is go to Exam Pro. This is my other organization. You'll learn about organizations in this, um, this here. That didn't really help. But what I wanna do is create a new repo. I can create a new one up here in green, or I can go up here. I never notice these up here, but this is another place to do that. Anyway, you're just watching, you're not doing right now, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and hit new. And in here, I'm gonna go to Exam Pro. I'm gonna say, uh, GitHub examples. So this will be the um, GitHub, uh, or we'll say a repo containing GitHub examples for, or pro for programmatic examples. For programmatic examples, this will be public because I want you to have access to it. I wanna have a readme, I'm gonna create that repository. And so this will crop up later in the course and you'll have to know where this, this is, but just remember where that is. But the key part of this video was how to log into another account um, and be able to switch between them, okay? So we'll see you in the next one. Ciao. All right, so what I wanna do in this fall along is set up a GitHub organization. And the reason we wanna do this is so that uh, it's gonna make it easier when we get to that section. So what I'm gonna do is go to the top right corner and I want to, mm, I can make this an either or account. I'm gonna make it in the alternate account because I already have enough organizations in my main GitHub account. And what I wanna do is go over here to um, maybe organizations. And here it says, uh, you are not a member of an organization. We could turn this account into an organization. I don't wanna do that. Or we can make a new org. So I'm gonna make a new org and notice right away, it's gonna hit us with some pricing. So. Um, you know, Teams gives you the uh, full functionality. We just wanna have the free one, uh, which might have some limitations, but um, it should get us started. If there's are things that we can't do, um, then I'll switch over to our paid one that I have in my account. But for the most part, we should be able to do um, pretty much everything as long as we're using a public GitHub, um, public GitHub repo. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit create a free organization. And so I need some kind of name for this organization. Um, so, Mm, I don't know, but we'll just say cl uh, GitHub Cloud Learners or Journeyers. Okay, notice that's gonna be the name of it. I say accounts at uh, teacherseat.com. And this organization belongs to a personal account. We could say a business or institution, but then we get a little bit more details there. So I'm gonna just stick it to normal and go to personal account. Then down below, we need to solve our puzzle. So we've seen this one before, we'll rotate that out and we'll submit, okay? And you'll have to name your organization, whatever you have to name it, but that's what I'm calling mine. You can put some numbers on the end here. If that makes it easier, you could do like four, five, six, seven or something. Cause these are gonna be unique names, just like your, your username. I'm gonna go ahead and hit next. And so now it says add organization members. So we can go ahead and add some people. So what I wanna do is I want to add um, Omen King. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Please don't add me, <laughs> all right? Add your own other account, your two accounts. Okay, we'll hit complete setup. And so now this person has been invited. I'm not sure if they're instantly added. Um, not yet, but I believe that I was 
yeah, here's the invitation. So we'll go here. And so the invite has been sent and we'll have to go look for that. So I'm gonna go over here and switch to my other account, okay? And so now what I'll do is I'll click up here and maybe it's up here, my notifications. No. Do I have invites here? No. <laughs> And um, maybe I got an email, I'll check my email. No email. And this is something you'll learn about GitHub, which is like invites are a pain and you always have to really figure it out. So I'm just trying to think about where that, or that could be. Um, what we could try to do is type in the organization name, which I thought we already did. Um, so this one, let's see, my profile is this. Yeah, so the organization is gonna be, what was it, cloud? Oh, I don't even remember. We'll switch back to the other one, what a pain. Okay, and we will look for that organization. GitHub Cloud Journey. So I'm just gonna copy this URL. I want the um, view organization. I wanna go to this page actually. I'm gonna copy it here. I'm gonna switch back and I'll enter this in. And so now notice that it's showing me where the invitation is. So it says, Andrew Brown invited you to join this organization. View invitations, okay? And I, I don't know if there is, but I'm just gonna double check here because a lot of times GitHub will have like invitations, invitations. They might have a page for it, they don't. GitHub, if you're watching, make a forward slash invitations page so we can easily find them across them here. So as you've been invited to GitHub Cloud Journeyers, Ask for a GitHub Copilot seat optional. I guess this is kind of an upsell. They're like, hey, do you wanna be able to use GitHub Copilot? But I'm gonna go ahead and join this organization. And now I'm in there. So there's two people in here. Again, we'll come back to this later. I'm the member, this is the owner. Um, and uh, you know, if your company is using GitHub, they're likely gonna be using, using an organization. So it's good to get some knowledge on that. But I'll see you in the next one. Ciao. All right, so I'm on the myoctocat.com and we can go ahead and build our own Octocat. So what I'll do is create your Octocat. You can also get started, it'll do the exact same thing. And it'll have a fun little animation here. There's no audio, but it's kind of showing you something. <laughs> we'll give it a moment here. And so now we have the default Octocat and we can do something fun. So you can choose obviously a color. I'm just gonna go down one shade here for face. Um, I'm pretty pale, so let's go real pale here. These just look like off colors to me, but we'll do that. For eyes, we could choose anything else, but I usually will do glasses, so it's not gonna matter anyway. So if I go down here, uh, I'm, I'm gonna want some glasses on. Uh, we'll go to mouth. We'll choose something there. You can choose hair. There's probably something that kind of looks like my hair. Um, facial hair, it's bizarre because they show like other ones that I could have. I don't have a full beard, but like they have this one and it doesn't show up. Do not want mutton chops, okay? We'll go over here to tops. I'm in Canada, so it probably makes sense if I was to choose the Canadian one. I know it's summer here. Where are you? It was here the other day. I wonder if this is like region specific. Nope, there it is. Okay, so I have Canada. Um, I'm gonna keep the bottoms off, maybe have some skates. And if I got a toque, I should be wearing a toque, shouldn't I? No. Any accessories, props, whatever you want to have. And the funny part is I don't play hockey, but this looks good enough. So what I wanna do is save it so we can share it. I'm not sure what happens if we do that. Click the share button. Oh, and that downloads the file. So that's perfect. So now we can use that as our profile. I'm just gonna quickly open that up in Explorer. It's opening somewhere on my computer. I'm sure it went to downloads, but I'm gonna go ahead and close that out. I'm gonna switch back over to my other account. And obviously for your primary account, you should treat it like a profile, just like your LinkedIn profile. If you're alternate, alternate it doesn't really matter. We're just goofing around. So if we go over to, um, Profile, still not showing up, here it is, great. So I wanna go ahead and change this. I'm gonna change my avatar and then I'll click here. And uh, I'm just going to move this off screen here and I'm gonna go find it. 
There it is right there. I'll hit open. And there it is. And say Andrew Brown. Okay, alt account. This is Andrew Brown's. So at sign Omen Kings alternate account for the purpose of learning GitHub since you need another GitHub account to make use of learning all of GitHub's learning GitHub. I guess it cuts off right there. So there we are. And uh, so that looks good to me. I'm gonna go ahead and update our profile. All right, I can go and view my personal profile. And I mean, that should be there. Mm, I don't see it. We'll go back to edit. I'm gonna click it again. Maybe it didn't upload. It is there. So probably what's happening is it's just a caching issue, right? Um, and so it's just gonna take some time for that to show up. So, or maybe if I open it up in another browser, it will show up there, but you know, eventually it'll show up and I'm not really worried about it. Uh, but that was Octocat. So um, yeah, I'll see you the next one. Okay, ciao. Let's take a look at GitHub Octocat. So this is GitHub's official mascot and it's a cat because, and an octopus because it's supposed to symbolize friendly and engaging nature in the world of software development collaboration. I don't know if I believe that, but it looks cool. So cool. Uh, you can actually create your own Octocat. I thought that'd be a great opportunity for us to create a profile for our alternate, alternate account or for both, whichever you want to do. You will see Octocat in other places. So um, they have a bot that's called Octocat that is used throughout the platform. Their SDK is called Octokit. So you're gonna see that themes in a few other places so you know where that is originating from, okay? All right, let's make sure we understand clearly the difference between Git and GitHub. I don't think it's that confusing, but it is in the study guide or exam outline. So I'm just trying to make content that they want us to know. Um, so let's do a comparison and go through some things to make sure we understand the difference. So Git is a distributed version control system, a DVCS, and GitHub is a version control as a service. I called it a version control service. It can also be called a Git provider, or you can call it a version control as a service. I'm just trying to get you exposure to all those different terms you could call what GitHub is. For functionality, for Git, it manages source code history. For GitHub, it provides cloud storage for Git repos. Of course, it does more than that, but that's, its main functionality. Um, for access, you're doing this via your local system installation or it's basically wherever it's installed. But the point is, is that you're working on it on a machine, on a server or some kind of compute. Uh, and GitHub is accessed through a web interface because it is a cloud service. For the scope, we're talking about local repository management. And then for GitHub, we're actually talking about the online collaboration and remote hosting. Uh, so anything that has to do with remote or things around the repo, the Git repo itself. For collaboration, it's for local changes, requires manual sharing. For GitHub, it has integrated tools for collaboration like issues and PR and a lot of other features. For usage, you're gonna be using this primarily by the command line interface. There's definitely software out there that makes it a lot easier to use. Um, we'll get into that, but generally it's a command line tool that you're using. For GitHub, it has a graphical interface and it also has its own CLI tool, but most people are interacting with it via the website. Okay, so there you go. Ciao. So a Git repo or repository is your Git repo, think of your local one, that you push upstream to GitHub to be uh, hosted remotely. And GitHub allows you access to manage your repo uh, with several functionalities. So here is a screenshot of a GitHub repo. This is when I ran a bootcamp in 2023. Uh, and so let's talk about what is on this GitHub repo page. I don't know what they want to call this page. I just called the GitHub repo page for a specific repo, um, but you can view different branches, view tags, view commit history, uh, explore repo files, view releases, uh, see code base language breakdown, view top level markdown files, and so those top level files might be the readme, the license, uh, security, other things like that. You can perform actions from this page or quickly to it. 
such as pinning, watching, forking, starring, cloning. So uh, a lot of stuff going on this page, and this is gonna be, we're gonna be spending a lot of time or uh, going from here to somewhere else, but that is a GitHub repo, so there you go. All right, in this follow along, I just wanna give you a tour of GitHub repos so that you have a, a general famili familiarity uh, uh, so that when we start diving a bit deeper, we understand what we're looking at. So I'm on my dashboard and I have a lot of different repositories. Um, and so I can go here and find a repository. I can search stuff and say like, if I'm looking for my bootcamp, I can type in bootcamp here and then make my way over here and find it. Um, a lot of times when you are looking for stuff, you're gonna use the global search. So up here, you could do that as well. And I could find my own repos or other repos. Um, there are a lot of open source repos on GitHub. And so um, I know Rails pretty well, so I'll go ahead and type in Rails. And so we have this Rails repo. I'm gonna go open this, open this up and take a look and see what we can see because this is a very mature um, uh, GitHub repo. And we'll make it very clear of all the functionality that's happening. So notice we have our main area. This is where all of our files are. Uh, we can actually view any of these files, so I can click into any of them. So I can go into the gem file and it will show me the contents of the gem file. What I like about uh, GitHub is that when you click into here, then you kind of get this file explorer and it's extremely powerful. Uh, if I click this on the right hand side, it will show me symbols. That's not a very good example. I might open up a Ruby file to show you what I mean. So I'm just looking for a Ruby file here. And so this will show you like places you could jump, uh, jump towards in your code. Um, that's really nice. You can see who did what by going to blame. So we can see exactly what somebody's doing. By the way, I'm going really quick here. It's not important for you to remember any of this. I'm just giving you a tour of stuff. So just relax and uh, enjoy the information that we're learning here. You don't have to write it down. If I wanted to find a file really quickly in this repo, I could go here and type something in. So maybe I'm looking for um, something like view. And so it's going to drop down and it has this fuzzy search. If I wanna find a Ruby file, I could type this in and we have a lot of them here. I believe there's a hotkey here. So if I hit T, if I'm over here and I hit T, it will bring me over there. I can switch branches really easily. Um, does that let me add a file? It's not my repo, but if I add a file, I'd have to create a fork. Um, the search brings that up there, but we'll go back over to code, okay? So my point here is that you have all the files here and you can browse them. Um, you can switch branches. You can go and take a look at all of your branches. You can take a look at all your tags. You can star, you can fork, you can watch. Here for code, you could launch this up in code spaces, which is a cloud developer environment. I normally have um, Git pod installed. So if I hit refresh, that button might show up here. This button, you will not have this button. I installed this because it's like code spaces, but different. Um, on the right hand side, you get a bunch of information about the repo, like stars, watching, fork. Uh, some of these probably are conditional because I don't remember seeing these on my repos. You have releases. So maybe you are building out binaries, like downloadable files that people can uh, utilize. So some people, they will host all their code here and they'll build the binaries for quick downloads. So that's somewhere else you can go to. Packages is probably similar to releases. I don't, I don't think I've ever used packages ever in my life. Uh, let's go over here and take a look. Browse, browsing all packages. Yeah, I don't know what uh, packages do. We can see who's using it. The contributors, so people that are writing, uh, writing code. Um, we have the languages, so you can see this is mostly a Ruby <laughs> library or um, a repo, which makes sense because it's Ruby on Rails. Down below, we get a preview of our README file, so that is in the top-level directory. They have a codes of conduct. I imagine that is a markdown file here and as well. The license file, I'm sure that's in here as well. The security policy as well. Um, so yeah, there's a lot going on in here, and then there's all this stuff up here. This is, these are features on top of your repo. So lots and lots and lots of stuff. If we wanna see our commits, we can go here and click on commits. And this is kind of like a tree. It doesn't give you the full view because when you are looking at, um, when you're looking at a tree, uh, there's branches and stuff. So we're missing that information here. But the idea is you can go here and uh, go to different branches and look at those commits. And that's basically all I wanted to do here. We'll get into it a lot deeper later on, but that is your tour of GitHub repos. Ciao. Hey, this is Andrew Brown. And in this video, what I wanna do is a quick and dirty Git crash course. 
Um, you are supposed to already have this knowledge uh, coming into this uh, certification, even though they kind of suggest that you do and you don't. Um, this is not going to be a complete crash course. Um, it's just going to be uh, the least amount of knowledge we need to know in order to be able to be productive in GitHub. Uh, you really do need to make sure you know Git very well and should look at other additional resources to go beyond this little component, but it'll be good enough. Uh, we did create that repo, or oh, I created that repo earlier in Exam Pro. I think that's a great, uh, great place to start. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go and log into my other new account. So over here, and uh, I'm gonna go and make my way over there. So I'm gonna type in forward slash exam pro co up here. I'm gonna look for this new repo here. And um, the reason I'm doing this, normally I would just open it in my regular account, but what I wanna do is I want to show you how to fork, and then we're gonna do some work in here, and you'll commit it to your own repo, but what I will do is I will end up uh, bringing those changes over into the original repo, okay? So anyway, the way we're gonna get started is, um, there's a few ways. We can go ahead and open up github.dev or we can open up Codespaces. So Codespaces is one way of doing it, which gives you a full environment that will have a, um, a terminal, but probably the easiest way is to open up github.dev so anyway, the first thing I wanna do is go over here to fork and fork this repo. That's gonna make a copy of it and have a reference to it. So I'm gonna go and click that and notice it'll pre-fill the name in, make sure it stays the same. It says copy in the main branch only. That's all there is right now and that's what we're going to do. So we'll create that fork and now we have GitHub, uh, 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 GitHub examples and notice under our name, we have it here. It shows that it is a fork. So. I want to open this up in github.dev. Github.dev is an IDE that does not have any compute attached to it, and it makes it really easy to start working with files. Uh, this is new. I don't remember the sync fork being here. That's really nice. But anyway, what I want to do is I want to press period on my keyboard. So I press period. Oops, sorry, I hit forward slash. <laughs> period. And what that's going to do, it's going to open up github.dev, okay? And we'll give it a moment. And I think that we can do stuff in here. If we can't, we'll have to open up a developer environment like uh, GitHub Code Spaces. But I'm hoping that we can use this initially because we can write commits in here. So this is open and um, we have our readme file. And on the left-hand side, we have this GitHub icon. So this is obviously an extension installed specifically for GitHub. But if we don't have a terminal, we're not gonna be able to do a whole lot here. So we could commit stuff over here. I mean, we'll start with that and I'll just show you how to do it with the GUI. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna make a new folder. I'm gonna call this git crash course, okay? And in here, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna name it lowercase. I actually prefer when they're lowercase, git crash course. And there's a few things that we wanna cover. Okay, so I'm gonna make a new file here. I'm gonna just say readme.md. And um, a couple things. I want to cover uh, commits. I want to cover branches. I want to cover remotes. I want to cover stashing, because I think that's really useful. Mm, I guess merging is something that would be really important. And so I think that's sufficient enough to begin with. And whether we'll do this in order, I'm not really sure, but we'll start at the start. So the first thing I wanna do is I want to go ahead and create um, a, a git commit. And we're not doing this programmatically, we're just gonna start out by uh, doing this over here in the source control. So source control is a built-in extension in VS Code that allows you to um, uh, basically write commit messages. It's really simple. So what I'm gonna do is just right here and say, um, create skeleton readme for git crash course, okay? And so I have my commit message and notice that we have changes that are staged. So those changes can be either staged or not staged. So if I right click this here, um, I can hate, I click stage changes and now it's up here. So what's the difference between being up here and being down below? Well. Uh, when I go ahead and, and click commit and push, it will only take the stuff that is from the stage changes. Anything else will be left behind because sometimes you're working with a lot of files and you don't want to commit them all, okay? So that is the reason for that. 
Um, but the idea is that you can hit minus and plus and move them back and forth. So hopefully that is very clear. We can click on a file. We can see the difference in changes. This is a completely new file that we're adding. So we're basically having, uh, having stuff that's added and prior there was nothing. So it's showing that on the left-hand side and we are ready to do something with this. If we drop this down, we can have commit and push. I've never clicked on this before, so I'm not gonna do that. But I'm gonna go ahead and click commit and push. And so what it's done is it's committed it and it's pushed it up. Normally, you'd have to perform those as separate actions, okay? But we'll talk about that when we start using the terminal. So now that we have pushed that up, what we can do is click on this little icon, or maybe not. <laughs> what I'm looking for is a visualization for our, um, uh, for our tree. Here it is, view as tree. And that's not helping, okay? So I guess that doesn't do what I thought it would do, and that's totally fine. So what we'll do here is we'll go back and open this up in uh, GitHub, the repo. So I'm just trying to find if there's like a short way to do that. No, there's not. So we'll have to go ahead and type in GitHub. I'm gonna have to type in my name, uh, Andrew WC Brown. This will be GitHub examples to get back to this repo. And we can observe that we've pushed that commit. So if I go here, you can see our uh, git commit. We can click into it. We can see our git commit. We can comment on stuff here. So I can say, this looks great. All right. Add a single comment. And so that should be pretty darn clear. We have a uh, commit SHA. So that's over here. Um, there should be some way to get the full SHA. I'm not exactly sure where it is. Because uh, I can see parts of it. A lot of times if we click into here, it might show it here. So if we go here, I could copy that, go back here. I could get the full SHA, right? Okay. But uh, what I'm realizing is that github.dev is not going to be able to do what we needed to do, which is to work with git command. I knew it didn't have a terminal compute attached to it, but I thought maybe it might have git commands, but it doesn't. So that's okay. But we can use this as a means to quickly edit files. What I want to do is go ahead and close this out and we'll go back over to our code. And what we'll do is we'll launch up GitHub Code Spaces. So GitHub Code Spaces has a free tier um, and that's what we'll be utilizing. Okay, I'm going to try to find the pricing here if I can. And I'm not exactly sure where the pricing is, but that's totally fine. We'll go ahead and open up a new code space on main. There's a whole section of uh, code spaces in the course, so we will come back to this and cover it in more detail. So we'll give it a moment to launch up. It is spinning up a virtual machine underneath. Uh, so that's why we have to wait a little bit. Um, or if it's not spinning up a virtual machine, it's spinning up a Docker container on existing virtual machines. That's probably what it is. And so now we get a terminal and that's gonna allow us to interact um, with GitHub using git commands. So I'm gonna go down to the bottom left corner here. I'm gonna change my theme because I cannot stand working in a light theme. And I'm gonna change this over to something that is dark. Um, so I'm gonna go to GitHub dark. And so this is a little bit easier to read. We can also increase the font here if this is hard to read. I'm gonna do that by going to settings. And I'm just gonna bump up the font here to 20 for font size. And I'll do the same thing for terminal. So I'm typing terminal in here and I'm looking for font size. We can also just type in font. Sometimes it's a bit tricky to find. Terminal font. There we go, and we'll turn this up to 20. Okay, so that should be a lot easier to read. So I can go in here, I'll click into readme. Now this is gonna come pre-installed with Git. If I type in Git, it should be here. Okay, so I didn't have to do anything, it's already installed. I'm not covering how to install Git on your local machine. I'm gonna be doing everything in the cloud developer environment because it's just easier and I don't want to uh, work through all those challenges of trying to show you how to do that. Um, so normally what you'll do is when you start working with a repo, you're going to clone it. Now this repo has already been cloned because we opened it up, but let's say it hadn't been, let's go ahead and just do that ourselves. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna just CD back a directory and type in clear and type in uh, ls, and we're gonna see where we are. So right now we're in workspaces, okay? I'm just gonna make uh, a new directory and just call it temp. I'm gonna cd into that. And what I wanna do here is I want to take the first step into bringing in this repo, okay? And the way we're going to do that is by going back over to here, 
and we're going to go over to code and we're going to go to local and then we have these commands we have https ssh and the github cli and so these are ways that we can bring in um, our repo okay and so the most common way is by using ssh where you will actually have to add a public key and we can do that the second one is http s where you'd have to use your personal access token and there's the GitHub CLI. And this, I think, is probably the way we should do it in the future. But we're just going to work any way we can here. So what I'm going to do is go back over here. And we're going to go all the way to the top. And we're going to talk about cloning. Okay. So we have three ways to clone. So we can clone three ways. HPS, uh, SSH, and GitHub CLI. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with HTTPS. So we'll go over here, I'm gonna copy this, and I'm gonna go over here, I'm gonna type in git clone, I'll write it in here so we can copy it out. But this is gonna be git clone, and I'm gonna paste this in, okay? And since we're working in Markdown, and that's part of the course, you have to learn how Markdown works, I'm gonna put three back ticks and put an MD here. Okay, you should do all this because we're just learning everything up front. If you're wondering what the, the back tick is, it is a character that's above your tab key. Let's see if I can find it for you here. Back tick key. And it's this key right here. Okay, so notice that there's a back tick. It's the tick that goes back. And so that's what I'm pressing. I'm pressing three of those. And the reason I'm doing that is that it will then render that out. Um, it's actually not MD, it's just SH. I don't know why I did that. And if you go up here in the top right corner, we can preview all the stuff we're working on for our documentation. But anyway, this is the first command that I want to run. Um, so I'm just going to go up here. We'll make a directory uh, since so we'll say since we're using we are using GitHub code spaces. We'll use we'll create a temporary. directory in our workspace. Okay, and so that's what we did. So that's gonna be, SH stands for bash. I mean, it's not exactly, it's shell or whatever, but it's pretty close to it. And so what we did there is we typed in mkdir forward slash workspace TMP, and then we're doing CD workspace TMP, okay? And then the next thing we wanna do is clone this uh, repo. So I'm gonna go ahead and attempt that. So it really matters whether the repo is public or private. If it is public, then we don't need any credentials to clone it. But when we want to push it back up, that's a different story. So I'm just trying to copy that. This is a bit finicky, the, the copy paste here, control the command V. Uh, and it's not letting me paste it. I'm going to try this again, copy. There we go, right click paste. For whatever reason, from here to here, it didn't work. So I'm going to go ahead and hit enter. And so I'm actually cloning from here now. Now we have this. This is attached um, to that other location. So just ignore this for now. We're going to pretend this doesn't exist. And we're just going to strictly use um, the git commands to do everything. So we've cloned this. I'm just typing clear. And what I want you to do is type in ls-la. So what ls-la does is it'll show you all the hidden directory or hidden folders. And um, we don't have any yet, but we're going to have to CD into this directory. So I'm going to go ahead and type in GitHub examples, right? And um, so what we'll do is just type in CD, GitHub examples. And so now we're in this directory. And I'm going to want to type in ls la. And so I'm showing you here that there is a hidden folder called .git. This is how it knows that there is a GitHub repo. OK, so I'm going to go up here for a second. And we'll make another thing. So we'll just say GitHub, or sorry, git, git uh, hidden folder. So there is a hidden folder called dot git. Which tells you that uh, your project is a git project or a git repo. OK. And normally what we would do is we create our git repo outside of this. So if we wanted to, we'll see you back here. I know this is a mess, but I told you it'd be quick and dirty. <laughs> is that if we wanted to create a new repo, we could actually go ahead and just type in git init in a new folder. So, uh, you know, if we want to 
to create a git repo in a, a new project, we'd create the folder and then initialize that repo using git init. Okay, so what we would do here, trying to get those back ticks here, git init, because we're using code, we always use back ticks for codes. So what we would do here is we'd create a new folder, so, so we'd, make, we'd say um, mkdir forward slash workspaces, and then we would say temp uh, new project, and then in here we'd have uh, that new project, so we'd CD, in, CD into it. So we just say workspaces, temp, new project. And then we would do git init. We'd create some files, so we'd say touch, make a new file, so we'd say readme.md. Then we could open that file up, so I could say open readme.md. Then we'd make some changes to it. Uh, so make changes to readme.md. Then we could commit this. So we'd say git commit hyphen m hyphen m hyphen a, sorry, hyphen a hyphen m. So add readme file. All right. And so let's do a little bit of that right now. So I'm gonna say mkdir, I'm gonna say new project, okay? And then I'm gonna go git init. It initializes a new git repo. And we end up with this dot git. Uh, folder here, okay? And then we could touch a new file. So let's say readme.md. And then if I want to open that up, I probably can type in open.md. I would imagine that it would open up in here. It didn't. What if I type in VS code? VS, VS code, readme.md. No. How do you open files in VS code from terminal? I thought it was just open. Terminal, command, what is it? There must be like a command. <laughs> code, I think we type code, that's what it is, code. Okay. I usually, usually use Vim, so this is not my uh, primary editor. So we open that up and I can say, hello world. Okay, we'll save that. I'll type in clear here. And now what we can do is we can type in git status. So we can see what's going on here. So let's say git status to see what files are being tracked or untracked. This is the exact same thing as this thing here. When you're typing git status, this is what this is right here. That's your git status. Okay, so we have files that are, are tracked, but nothing's chain, uh, uh, staged. So we can do git add all, okay? I guess I missed that there. Git add all. Take this part out here because we don't need it. And um, it says you've added another Git repo inside your current repo. We'll just ignore this because it, it's just confused because we have that other repo. We'll type in Git status. And notice now these are changes to be committed. Okay. So the idea is that these are going to be the things that get pushed. Let's say we didn't want to add in GitHub examples. We definitely don't want to do that. So I'm going to say Git remove GitHub examples, git status, didn't really work, that's okay. Um, we can say, sorry, git, I didn't mean to do remove, I meant to say git um, uh, rem, um, so I can reset, <laughs> sorry, git reset, git status. There we go, so reset, we'll put them back in here. I actually only wanted to add that, so git add readme.md, okay? So we'll go down here, and we'll say git add readme.md. And while we're on it, I'm gonna have to go and just say um, reset, git reset. So reset allows you to um, move changed files back to untracked files or un, like change or sorry staged staged changes to be unstaged okay this is useful when you don't want to uh, you want to when you want to 
revert all stage change all files not to be committed <laughs> sorry i know it's a bit messy but the idea here is that we're going to go here and we'll just say get at all get reset so i'm going to go here and just say uh get reset will revert a get at all okay we have add So this is git add readme.md, git add when we want to stage changes that will be included in the commit, we can use the period to add all possible files. All right, we have git status. Git status shows you what files will or will not be committed. Okay, that's git status. All right. So I want to type in git status again here. Okay, so this is what we want to commit. So we'll go back up to our commit section here and um, yeah, over here, which we were kind of working on it, and we'll, we'll go ahead and type in git commit. Okay, so if we just type in git commit, it's going to try to open up the editor. So it actually opens up here. So what I want to do is just comment something here. So git commit. When we want to commit code, we write we can uh, write git commit, which will open up um, the commit edit message in the editor of choice. And so this is already configured to open up in VS Code. If you're running this in your local machine, it would complain and say, hey, you have to set a default. Okay, so git config set default editor. Okay, so if we had to do that, I'm just gonna look this up really quickly here. Editor, normally you'd have to set it, right? So you'd have to first set that. Um, okay. And so this would be Emacs or whatever. Um, set the uh, global editor. I don't know what it is for this. Um, we could take a look and see what it is. I just hit Control C to get out of that because I really don't want to do that right now. And so let's go find where this is actually configured. Um, so I believe that there is like a global Git folder somewhere. It's not there. Yeah, I'm not sure where it is. When we type in git config, could we see that? We type that in. I just wanna see what is being set for the editor. Um, so I'm not exactly sure. I just wanna know what it is. So, uh, you know, git et, uh, editor VS code default. I just wanna know what that value needs to be. Um, so that would be set as what? Oh, it's dot .git config. That's the file we're looking for. Okay, hold on. So this would probably be in our home folder. Let's try this again. So let's say code git config. Where is git config stored? Where is git config stored? Um, oh, we can just list it out. Okay. Let's see if that works. Okay. Um, we'll go down here for a second. The git config file 
is what stores your global configurations uh, for Git, such as email, name, uh, editor, and more. Okay, so we'll go here and I'm just gonna say git config hyphen hyphen list. Uh, and that's showing the contents of our git config file. Still don't know where that file is but at least we know what some things are set at. And so what I'm looking for in here is that editor and it's not showing up. So what I'm thinking is that it already knows what to do, but it is setting our user.name and user.email. This is something that you would normally have to set. So I can go back to just git config here and customizing git and notice that these are the first two things that they set, right? So, um, when you first install Git on a machine, you are supposed to set up your name and email. Okay, and so those are the examples there. All right. So they're right here. You can see that they already set it for us, but normally you'd also have to set the editor and it would complain. But for whatever reason, it knows to open it up already in, uh, in VS Code here. So I'm gonna go back up to here. And so that's gonna open this up interactively. So I'm gonna type in git commit, whoops, editor. Down below here, I'm gonna type in, um, well, first I wanna make sure I'm in that, that folder, that new project. Oh, you know what? I created that readme in the wrong spot. <laughs> Let's go back here for a second. Type in ls hyphen la. And yeah, I didn't even make it in the right place. So remove that folder. We're gonna remove the readme file. New project, I'm gonna type in clear. And I'm gonna try this again. So we'll type in mkdir, or sorry, just touch. Touch readme.md will open up this file. So code readmd, we'll just say, hello world. Save that, we'll close that. And now we will type in git status. There is no git repo, so we'll type in git init. And then it's initialized an empty repo, so that's good. We'll type in clear. And then we will type in git status. And now it's not complaining about that it or that um, GitHub examples because this is now in a subfolder, so it's not trying to add a sub module. So now we can do git add all. We could do git status. And now this file will be added and we'll do git commit, which will open it up in here. And so now we can write our message. So let's we'll just say, add readme file. Okay, I'm gonna save that and close it. Okay, and so now it completed it and it's created it. By typing git status, you'll see it's gone. And so if I wanna see the tree for this, I think I can type in git, uh, was it git log? And it's gonna show me uh, that commit there. So if I added another one, it should show multiple commits here. So let's, let's go ahead and, and modify that readme file again. So I'm gonna just open it up again here. Uh, code readme. And what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna take this other tab out of the way and open a new tab and have it over here so we can make sense of what we're doing. And I'm gonna put another exclamation mark. So another way that we can commit is in line is by putting the M flag. So I'm gonna type in git status. And then uh, what I wanna do is add that file Okay, and type in git status again. And now I want to commit that change, this, this part here. And so what we can do is type in git commit, and now we'll type in hyphen m, and I'll just say add another exclamation mark. All right, and don't worry about the spelling, I do not care, and I'm really bad at spelling. And here we'll type in git commit hyphen m, add another exclamation. Okay, so uh, make a commit and commit message without opening uh, editor. And so what we'll do is go ahead and hit enter. And so that added there, we'll go ahead and type in git status. We'll do git log. 
to see stuff. So we'll go here and say log. So git log will show recent git commits to the git tree. Um, if we wanna see more of the tree, I don't know what command it is. Like, is there git tree? I always forget. And the reason I don't remember is because often you're relying on these tools. So there's some stuff you should know here and there's some stuff you should just utilize in here, but you should know the basis of git commit commands, okay? So that's good. So we learned about git commit status, a few other things, okay? And so if we wanted to take this project and push it up uh, to GitHub, it's not gonna, it shouldn't work because we don't have credentials, but technically this account uh, or that this environment is actually um, tied um, to GitHub, so it actually might work. Um, how it would work, I don't know. Maybe we would add our personal access token, um, but we could just find out by trying to push. So what I'll do, let's go down here below and type in uh, push. So uh, when we want to push a repo to um, our remote origin, and so this would just be simply git push. This should not work because we don't have a repo to push to. Okay, and so we have to add a remote. Um, so we can do git remote add origin and then put the name there. But we haven't created a repo, so there's nothing for it to go to. So even if we added a remote, it's not gonna work. Okay, so this project here is done. So I'm gonna go ahead and just clean this up. And we'll just go ahead and type in remove RF new project. So that's gonna give you some ideas what you can do there. So what I wanna do is LS, and I wanna go back into this one because this one has, um, sorry, a Git folder. And let's just open that up really quickly so we can take a look at what's in there. So we open this up. I typed in code. <laughs> it opened it up in a new repo. I'm not really sure why. Try this again, code.git. I don't know why it's opening up in a new repo there. I guess it's confused, um, but it did work. The only problem with this is that it's opened up another developer environment. So in here, this is all the files that are in this. Why couldn't do it over here? I don't know. But um, if we just take a look here uh, closely, we have the config folder, and this is what I showed you earlier in those slides. This is how it knows what the origin is. This is how it knows how to push to main. We have some core configurations here. And there's some other stuff like we have head reference and stuff like that. I don't really want to get into all this stuff um, because it's just too much. But uh, the most important thing to know is this config file because that's where these things are. And so if you ever get this stuff mucked up like your remote or origins or something's not working, you can fiddle with stuff in here. Um, and that's all I wanted to point out here. So I want to just stop this, um, this one here. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, close this out. There's some way to shut this one down. I'm just going to close it out and should stop it. With, with GitHub code spaces, you gotta really be aware of all the ones you're running because then you can run through your free hours very quickly. So I'm gonna just see what's running. I'm gonna see if I can just type in code spaces up here. There we go. I just wanna make sure that I'm only running one. Okay, and it looks like I'm just running one. So I think all it did was it opened the same uh, running environment in another tab because it got confused, which is totally fine. But anyway, this file is now gone. And let's focus on this one. So we created this repo here and technically we should not be able uh, to push up to it. Now we might be able to because it might be storing our personal access token or some credentials, but in, uh, technically it should not work. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and try to add a file to this repo, okay? Sorry, I don't wanna lose this one. Um, and see what happens when we try to push, okay? So uh, what we're gonna do, make sure we're in this repo, we're gonna type in touch, readme.md, and then I wanna open this one up. So I'm gonna type in this here. I'm gonna say, hello world, we'll save that. And the idea is that this is the same repo as that other one. So actually we just, mm, we just technically edited this one. So you know what? I actually don't wanna make this file here because I realize that's gonna cause us a problem. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to ls here. I'm going to cd into git crash course, and I'm going to make a new file here. We'll just call it um, uh, hello. So just say touch hello. 
Okay, and then we'll open up this file here. Oh, sorry, code. And then we'll say, hello. All right, so it's not here because of course we're ignoring this. Okay, but if we type in ls-la, we have this hello file, right? And so if I type in git status, I can see that this file is untracked. So I wanna add it and do git status, type in clear, and now I'm gonna do a git push. So this should fail, but it still might work. Let's see what happens. And it says everything's up to date. And the reason why is that we didn't create a commit, right? If we do git log, you notice we don't have anything. This is the last one we ran. So I'm gonna do git commit hyphen m add hello file, okay? And now I'm gonna do git log so I can see that it's there, right? And now I'll do a git push and it did work. So it probably worked because this environment already has the stuff loaded up. If I was using my local developer environment, this should not work. Um, and I suppose I could show that. I'm just trying to decide whether I want to do that or not. Um, Give me a second to think about it. Yeah, I think I really should show you this. So what I'll do is I'll open up VS Code on my local computer and we'll do that, okay? So my point is, is that even if you're not doing this, I just want you to watch and understand what you'd have to do if you're using your local developer environment. The trick with local developer environments is they're really finicky because, um, especially on Windows, because you have to get Linux installed and you need the Windows subsystem Linux and that's such a pain to work with. So I'm here in VS Code, this is on my local computer. And what I wanna do is I want to uh, bring down that repo. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is just open up terminal. Okay, if I can find it any day now, here it is. Um, and I need to store this somewhere. It's opening up in PowerShell, but I wanna use Windows Subsystem Linux, okay. And I'll give it a moment here. And so it's, it's starting up Linux. And so here it's on my desktop in a folder called code. Okay, I'm just gonna type in ls. Not sure what this is. But I normally like storing things in a folder called sites. So I already have one here. And the idea is I want to, um, I want to clone that repo into here. So what I'm gonna do, just bring this over here for a second. All right, so this one, was, uh, uh, this, was, this one was no good. I couldn't really show you this example here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and remove this one. And we'll just get this back to normal. Okay, type in that clear. And I'm gonna go back over to here into our Git, GitHub crash course so we can keep working on this. And I wanna go back up to commits or sorry, cloning. And I wanna go ahead and attempt this clone uh, that we're doing earlier. So this is mine, right? Of course, you'll have to switch this out for yours. So understand that you can't just copy and paste this. You have to modify it. But I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna go over here. And in my Linux system, I'm gonna go ahead and paste this in. So I think I already have Git installed, right? And it's downloading it here, okay? So I've downloaded it because it's a public repo. But the question is, can I push to it? So I wanna open this project up here in VS Code. I'm gonna go ahead and type in code period. And that should reopen VS Codes in this context. And I'll get rid of this old one here out of the way. That was some other thing I was working on. I'm gonna say, I trust the authors, it's totally fine. And apparently there's a newer VS Code, I do not care. And it's opened up this entire directory. So I kinda of messed that up. <laughs> and I'm gonna go into terminal again, so sorry. You can see I have a bunch of stuff in here. I'm gonna CD into this by typing in um, GitHub examples. And we'll try this again, I'll type in code period. And then I'll close this one, all right. And then this time we now have our local developer environment in good shape, okay? So just understand that you can connect GitHub code spaces to your local one. I don't wanna do that. I, Cause I want this to be detached from Git so I can show you the challenges of cloning. So this has been cloned already. We already did that. And if I go over into terminal here, okay, new terminal. 
and I want to make sure I'm in uh, WSL, which I am. I'm going to type in ls-la. I want to see that I have that .git directory here. And we're going to go ahead and modify this hello file. I'm going to put an exclamation mark. I'm going to hit save. And so the idea is I'm going to do git push. And I'm expecting it not to work. So it says, it doesn't work. Would you like to sign in with GitHub? No, I don't want to sign in with GitHub. Even though that's awesome, I don't want to do that. And the reason why is because I want to show you how you would use a personal access token. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here, bring this down, and I go back to GitHub, and we're going to go over to here, and we're going to go to settings, and then all the way down to the ground, we're going to go to developer settings, and we're going to click into personal access tokens, and we have a fine grain access tokens. You don't need to use access tokens very often. This is just for this specific use case, but we're going to go ahead and generate this token. I'm going to say um, temporary token uh, local dev. And I want this to expire uh, in the least amount of time. So today is Sunday. I'm going to say tomorrow. Uh, this token is just for today. And I want this for a very specific repo. So you can say all repos. I'm going to say a select repo. I'm going to go here and select my one repo. And for repository permissions, um, I just want to be able to push this and work with it. Account permissions. So I just have to make sure I give this proper permissions. Um, pull requests, merges, issues. Um, I'm trying to give it permissions to just push code. Push, commit. So I think we definitely want this, read and write. We want commit statuses, read and write. And I think that should be sufficient. I'd probably put pull requests in here as well. Before GitHub used to just have like, you'd make a classic token, you wouldn't have to do all this, but they're trying to make it more secure, so that's how it is. Um, and so I think this is sufficient. So I'll go ahead and create this token. And so I now have this token. So the idea is that um, when I'm over here, normally this would prompt us, it wouldn't do this. Oh yeah, we have the username up here. So it's asking us to enter our username in here. Normally this would prompt down here, but it's not. So I'm just gonna hit clear. Okay, and I'm gonna try, try this again. I'm gonna say git push. And I'm saying cancel. And so it's prompting up here. If you're not using VS Code, it would normally show up here. But I'm gonna type in my username like this. And now it's asking for a password. And before you could put your actual password in here, you can't do that anymore. You have to use this personal access token. So if I got those permissions right, this should work. Okay, so I'm gonna paste that in, hit enter. And so now it says everything up to date. So did it push? <laughs> That's what I wanna know. So we'll go back over to here. Um, and if we click here, we can go, um, um, oh, sorry, down here. I'm looking for how to find this repo. There was a button here before. Why can't I find it? Maybe it's over here, no. Hmm, that's fine. But we wanna go ahead and look at that repo. So I'm gonna go and type in Andrew WC Brown. And I wanted to look at our only repo that we have. And I wanna see if the, those commits work. So if I click in here, we have add hello file. And that didn't do anything. So maybe it's because we didn't add anything. Let's go get status here, get status. We have to add it if we want it to work, right? It was like git commit update. And then I'm gonna type in git push. And so it's trying to log in. So every single time we wanna push, it's going to ask us for that because it doesn't remember what it is. We can technically cache those credentials. Um, I'm not sure what the flag is. I've never had to ever have, have to do it but there is some way to cache it. But I'm gonna just hit cancel because I just wanna show you how to use that personal access token, okay? And uh, then I'll go, uh, go back there and grab that. I think we still have it there, good. Okay, I'm gonna go back to our local VS code. I'm gonna paste this in, hit enter. And so now it pushes, okay? So it's pushed it there. And so that's one, one example of us doing that, okay? And we'll just confirm that it's there. We can see it right there. 
So that's one method of cloning. So go back over to here to our uh, documentation in GitHub Code Spaces. So here we'll just say uh, you'll need to, um, so you'll need to generate a GitHub access token or sorry, personal access token. And we'll go grab that link so we know where that is. So it's right here, okay? So this is a beta feature, but I can't imagine they'll revert that. You will use the PAT as your password when you log in. Uh, and the permissions we were, you know, give it. I think we need that, all right? So that's one way. Another way is with SSH. Okay, so what we'll do is I wanna get rid of this token because I don't need it anymore. I'm just gonna go ahead and delete that. And I wanna go back to our repo, which is over here. And we want to clone this via the SSH. And because I can't trust GitHub, because I think it's uh, the GitHub code spaces, I, it already has our credential somewhere, we're gonna have to do it this way. So I wanna CD back here, I'm gonna remove this directory. Okay, clear. And I wanna clone it again. And so this time I'm gonna grab the SSH. If we go over here, we'll paste this link in here and it looks really similar but this is not the same link SSH okay and then we'll want to CD into that so the difference here is that look at this this says HTTPS is the protocol this one puts this stuff in the front so it's a different protocol um, and, and URL for cloning so we'll go ahead and copy this and we'll go down below I'm gonna paste this in and hit enter. Okay, so it can clone because it's a public repo. If this was a private repo, we would have to already have our credentials set. I'm gonna go ahead and um, close this out and we want to reopen this. So it should know this is the same thing, but because we deleted that repo, it's confused. So I'm gonna go into GitHub examples and I'm gonna reopen this up in VS Code. It'll open up a new window. Not sure what's taking it so long. Okay, it just auto-detected it, so I guess it didn't have to do that, it's fine. But um, we'll open this file up again, and I'm going to put an exclamation mark on the end. And so I'm gonna do git status, right? Again, we can do it over here, or refresh it, but I'd rather do it from here. So that's not there, I'm gonna say git add readme, or period. Now let's refresh it. Notice it moved to stage changes, and then we can do git commit hyphen M update SSH way. All right, and it pushed. Um, how did it do that? <laughs> because it's not supposed to work. Um, so it makes me think that that personal access token's still there. Okay. Oh, no, 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 no. It, it didn't push, it didn't push. The reason I'm confused is that notice that this said push so when we go here, this will let us commit and push sometimes, but we've only just committed it locally, okay? So if I type in git status, all right, it's here, okay? It's not, um, it's, not, it's not remotely there, okay? So in order to actually get it, get it up, we have to type in git push. So that's a separate action. So we'll go ahead and type in git push. So now it should complain. And so this is rejected. Um, and the reason why it's rejected is because we don't have an SSH key. So what we'll need to do is generate out an SSH key. And the way we do that is we type in SSH key gen hyphen T, I believe it is. And we type in RSA to be specifically what it's for. We can even say the length of it. This is a Linux command. Uh, most Linux distributions should have this pre-installed. So you can definitely do it. The place that you would put this key would be in a very specific location. 
So I already have a default one and I'm gonna rename it to something else, but you can leave it as a default if you want, if you've never ran this command in your life. But I'm gonna go ahead and hit enter. Oh, you know what, it's keygen SSH or keygen SSH keygen. I forgot what it is already. Keygen SSH, it's SSH keygen, okay. So go back here, I'm typing SSH keygen TRSA. Okay, and it's saying, where do you wanna create it? It will usually create it here. I want this to be named a little bit different. I'm just gonna say um, GitHub Alt, and then I'm gonna say ID RSA, okay? And then I'm gonna hit enter for no passphrase. A passphrase, it, passphrase is a way to password protect it. I don't wanna do that. You don't always have to do that, um, but it makes it more secure. Notice that it generated up both the private key and the public key. We're gonna talk about key pairs later in the course. I made sure to cover this. They didn't make it a requirement in the, in the, uh, uh, the, uh, the guide or the, uh, the, cert the certification course, but I know you need to know this, so I made sure to put that in there. So we've generated out this uh, private, uh, private and public secret, and they're located here. So we're gonna to need to get the contents of this one and send it over um, to, to GitHub. So the way we can do that is we can just grab this URL or, or write this out and, and cat it out. So cat is a way in Linux to print out to the terminal. And so I'm gonna type this full path. I'm hitting tab to quickly complete uh, this so I don't have to write it all out by hand. I'm looking for GitHub, GitHub, Alt, IDRSA. It's kind of not showing me all the files. So I'm gonna just go ahead and type this here for a second. Okay, and um, weird, it's not there. So it says TSRSA, enter the file in which to save it. Oh, it didn't actually save it here. Did it save it over here? It did. All right, I don't want it here. I'll try this again. So we'll hit up, because it wants the full path, that's why. Um, and so we'll do this again. We'll say home, Andrew, SSH. I'm gonna say uh, alt. GitHub underscore ID RSA, enter, enter, enter. So now it's where we think it is. So it's actually here. I'm gonna copy this and we'll type in cat and we'll paste this in. And that's gonna give us this funky looking thing. So this is the contents of the public key. And I, I need to copy that. So I'm gonna just do this and write copy. I, I did control C because I couldn't right click it. Um, and I'm gonna go back up to here, and then in GitHub, we gotta add that to our account. So I'll go to settings, and I'll go over to SSH, and I'm gonna add a new SSH key, and I'm just gonna say, paste this in here, I'll just say uh, local uh, environment. You might even say what computer this is from. You might have multiple computers with local developer environments. So I'm on my, my, my Windows machine, so Windows local. And you know we have two things here. I believe it's an authentication key and we'll put that in there. So this should allow us uh, to now push, okay? Because it will, it will match the private and public key out. I explained in the course how it works, like the logic behind it, but this should work assuming I set it right. So what I'll do is I'll type in get status because we should have something ready to push, right? So notice it says, here, your, your branch is ahead of origin by one commit. So we have one commit that hasn't been pushed yet. We'll go ahead and hit get push. And if we did it correctly, it should work. And so I did something wrong. Um, what I did wrong, I'm not 100% sure. Um, so we can try that again. So I'm gonna go ahead and go back up here because this format might matter. It might be in the wrong format, but I'm pretty sure it should just be this. Give us a refresh here. Uh, it says never used. I'll try this one more time. Maybe it takes time. Sometimes it's finicky like that. Nope. So if it didn't like that, I'll try signing. I don't remember there being two key types before, so I'm a little bit confused myself and I don't remember this stuff off the top of my head. If we copy this wrong, that could be the issue as well. But we really wanna copy the public key, okay? Notice it says begins with R, R, S, H, or that. 
Okay, so I'll paste this in. It's definitely the right format, so I'm not sure why it doesn't like it. Windows local. We'll try this again. Okay. And we'll go back over to our local environment and we'll say git push. Still doesn't work. Yeah, I don't think it's the signing key. <laughs> we'll try this one more time. New. Paste. And like that doesn't seem like that's the problem, right? Maybe it's supposed to have a space. Let's go back and take a look at uh, VS Code. This has a space in between it, okay? This has a space. Okay, so SSH keygen, key not working, GitHub. And it's not uncommon to have issues. Like it just happens to me sometimes. Um, sometimes we can test it out. We don't have to set the origin because we cloned it, eh? That should be fine. I'm not really worried about that. Um, SSH key gen GitHub, because maybe they might tell us, like it give us an example and then um, maybe I entered it in wrong. Maybe it wants it in a very particular format. Because it can be finicky. Give me just a second, okay? So I'm not sure we have to do this, but maybe we need to add the SSH or the, the key to our, our SSH agent. Um, I remember doing this one time, but normally it usually picks up anything that's in that directory. So I'm actually kind of surprised. But if that's the case, let's go ahead and just explicitly set it. So let's give that a go. And um, so we'll just hit up here. And I'm just gonna go ahead and type in SSH add and Add your SSH private key, okay. And that's just RSA there, like that. I'll hit enter. Could not open a connection to your authentication agent. Just a second. Um, it's suggesting you run this line. Again, I'm kind of getting the territory of like doing anything, which I don't really like. The SSH program runs in the background to hold your private keys. Keeps them ready to use by SSH. Okay, well, let's try this. Um, and th again, this is why I don't like showing local development because it's so finicky. It's a lot easier on a Mac, but I can't share my screen on a Mac. So, I mean, you could, but I, I, it's very difficult for me to do so. So now we've added the, the identity and I'm hoping that now this will work. There are debug commands that you can use. So like GitHub SSH debug, um, like here there, there is like this you could run. So attempts to connect to SSH to see if it works. So we could use that and give it a test. Um, we'll go back over here, right, and hit enter. Hi, I'm King, you successfully authenticated, but GitHub d d does not provide shell access. So that's one way we could test. That's a good command to know. Um, we'll go here and just say, put this here. We can test our connection here. We will need to create our own SSH key, uh, key pair, RSA key pair. So that'd be SSH key gen TRSA. for uh, WSL users and if you create a um, you, WSL users and if you create a key in a, a different uh, a if you create a non default key you might need to add it so that was us running that um, like this here So that might fix that issue for us. 
Um, this is for testing our connection. So that's telling us that we can push, okay? And so what I wanna do is go back over to here and let's see if we can push, get push, fingers crossed. And normally what happens the first time you add something, it's going to add it uh, to the key ring. Usually it asks us to uh, say yes, but it's still not working. So, I mean, that might establish a connection that we can reach. You, su you successfully authenticated, but d does not provide shell access. Okay. Um, so our key's still not working. We have permission denied. Are we pushing to the right repo? Yeah, we are. It looks like we are. Um, one thing we could do is check that hidden folder. It's not showing them here. There's some way to show hidden folders in Git. I'm not sure why it's not showing up. Give me two seconds. I'm being told the hotkey is Control Shift G, Control Shift G. If you're on a Mac, it might be Control G. That didn't work for me. I tried it. What is it? Command Shift period. Ugh. Control, shift, period. Nope, no good. So we'll just go to our settings and open it up. Hidden files. Come on, show hidden files. I just want to see them. Show hidden files. Files exclude. Preference settings. Mm, files. Um, yeah, so I, I want to see that. There we go. So it's, it's, it's hiding some of them. The reason I want to go here is check the config. I want to make sure that we're going to ours because if you try to push to mine, let's say you cloned mine, it would not work because you can't push to mine. You don't have permission to do so. But I, I should have permission to push to my own. Here's another question. When I upload those keys, what account was I in? Okay, I'm in the correct account. So this is the one that I'm supposed to be in. Uh, is it though? Because I might've had another tab open. Let's make sure we're 100% in the right location. We are here. I'm gonna go to SSH keys. It's not here. You think? You know what I think I did? I might've added it to the other account or we deleted it and we didn't add it back in. So I'm gonna go ahead and add this in. <laughs> Windows local. You really have to think these things through and think, okay, check, 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 all right? And so I, what I want is that SSH key again, I think it's gonna work this time, okay? Uh, I don't wanna add it, I just wanna cat it, okay? And we'll go back up here and we'll paste it in and we'll hit uh, add the key. And now this time I think it's gonna work, git push. Excellent, okay, great. So that's now done. I wanna go back here, I'm gonna delete the repo again because we have one more way that we can do it, okay? And the last way is gonna be with the GitHub CLI. So I'm on local, so I might as well just go ahead and install it. I'm gonna delete this key because I don't wanna have it. I wanna see if it will work without a personal access token or, or without SSH so that we can attempt to log in. So what I wanna do here is I want to install uh, that. And I believe that it would use brew or whatever. So Type in GitHub CLI install. We'll go here. And um, it's gonna be different based on what you use. So if you have Homebrew installed, you can use Homebrew. If it's Linux, um, it's gonna be different. Um, I'm looking for Ubuntu in particular. So Debian and Ubuntu are basically the same way of installing it. And um, I think that we could probably just do it this way. So we need to do a sudo app update. I guess I have to put my password in here. Is this my password? Like, I don't know. Yep, that was my password. And so that's doing an update. Once that's done, it will do the next step. So I'm gonna go grab this here. We're gonna go back over to GitHub code spaces. Close this one out. I guess we never saved it. That's why it didn't work. Um, and so our third way is GitHub CLI. Install the CLI. Okay. E.g. Uh, Ubuntu. For Linux, okay, so Ubuntu in this particular case. I believe this is Ubuntu and that's Ubuntu. They're both Ubuntu. 
And I'm gonna grab the next line here and we'll paste that in. That's gonna install it. Could not locate the package. If it couldn't locate the package, it probably doesn't know where the package is. So I have to go back over to here. And so this adds the source, that's what it wants. So I'm gonna just go grab this whole darn thing. It's all the same command. No, it's not, but we will grab the whole thing. And this will actually install all of it in one go. Paste. You can actually see that it's doing an update and then it's installing it here. So I'll go back here and update our docs. It's a bit messy. Okay. And so once that's installed, uh, we'll have to do a couple of things. We'll have to do gh login. And then we'll have to do gh clone and get that link. We'll go grab it from our repo. Um, so go here, we'll go to code, we'll go to CLI, we'll grab this and we'll bring this on up here. And I'm gonna do GP. Well, I, well, I wanna paste that into our uh, example here. I'm gonna do gh clone. Okay, gh login. Now we technically don't need to log in for uh, this to work. Should be, oh, I think it's gh auth login. That's probably why, there we go. GitHub. Um, oh, we're gonna choose a method, uh, HTTPS. Authenticate with your GitHub credentials. Yeah, I thought it was gonna just do something for us, but apparently it's gonna have to rely on, on something like that. So if that's the case, I think what I would rather do is use the SSH key. So I just hit Control C to log out of that. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna have to go back and put that, that SSH key back in because we deleted it. Um, it doesn't matter if you see mine because you don't have my, you can't see my private key. So you really shouldn't show anyone your public key, but it's not gonna hurt that you see mine. Um, I'm gonna go back over to here and add it again, I guess. We're gonna go down to here. We're gonna add that SSH key. Windows local, okay. And then I'm gonna go back over to here. We'll type in clear. Um, I wanna just update the doc so that it says off here. We'll save that, we'll bring this back up. We'll type in clear and I want to do gh auth login. And we'll log in with GitHub, we'll use SSH and we'll tell it which key to use, which is pretty cool. And the title for your SSH key, well, why do I need to upload a title for your SSH key? Oh, it'll actually upload it for us. Oh, that's cool. Okay, clear it, let's go back. <laughs> I didn't know it could do that. We'll go ahead and hit delete and we'll try this again. GH login, that's really cool, I like that. And we'll say SSH, I also wonder if it would generate out your token for you. So we'll use this one and we'll say Windows local and um, we'll log in with a web browser. First, copy this one-time code into your browser. Press enter to open github.com your browser. Okay, I'll hit enter. And I'm gonna log in with this. We'll enter that code in, we'll continue, and we'll authorize it. And so now we're logged in, okay? So we can now use GitHub to clone the, the CLI. And we'll go back over to here Okay, and we'll copy this and we'll go back over to here and we'll paste this in and we should be able to clone. So maybe I, I typed that command wrong. It doesn't look right. It looks like it's doubled in here. I'll try this again. We'll hit enter. Sorry. Try this again. That's not working. So I'm doing something wrong. Let's go back over to our docs. Have it in here double. And uh, oh, maybe it's like GitHub repo clone. That's probably what it is. There we go. And so we clone the repo. All right, we'll CD into that directory as per usual. Um, we'll go in here and just say, hello, git add uh, all, git commit, say it's GitHub CLI way. And we'll say git push, oops, git push. And that worked. Okay, so that's all of our ways that we can do it locally. I'm pretty much done with this. I'm gonna close it out. And so we've learned 
um, all the ways here. So that's pretty sweet. Um, this get get repo clone. So that's good. We learned about commits. Okay. Um, learned about adding. We haven't learned about branching. So branching is pretty straightforward. We're going to be doing a lot of branching, so I don't feel like I have to do a lot here right now. Um, but uh, what we can do here is we can type in git branch to get a list of branches. So a list of branches. Okay, and we can go ahead and create ourselves a new branch. So I'm going to go ahead and type in git branch um, and then type a name. So we'll say... Um, dev and I'll hit enter. So create a new branch. Branch name. And if I type in get branch, I can get a list of them. Okay. And so I can check out that branch. So let's say check out the branch. Get branch sorry, git checkout dev, git checkout dev, and notice I'm in dev. This highlighting stuff here will not be in your local terminal. Uh, you might have to install something or additional or in VS Code it may or may not show up. Just understand that this is preloaded with some stuff in here. Um, so we're in dev right now. We're actually in a different branch. So I'm going to do um, git, um, uh, I want to change this file here. So go ahead and just change it. Uh, where is it? Refresh. Oh, you know, the thing is, is that we've been making changes, but we haven't been doing them in here. So if I do git fetch for a second, you'll notice that origin main is, uh, there's more going on here than you, than you think. And so by doing fetch, we can actually see if we're out of date or not. Um, and so my issue right now is there's that file, I don't have access to it, but I'm gonna go ahead and make it again. I'm gonna say hello here. I'll say, uh, branch version, okay, and I'm going to do git status, and so we have that there, um, so what we can do is go ahead and, and go git add all, and I'll say git commit hyphen m uh, changes, okay, and now what I want to do is git push and push that branch. And right away, you're gonna notice that it's not gonna work. And the reason why is that branch does not have a remote, right? That's really important because if it doesn't have a remote reference, it's not gonna be able to push. And there is no branch in our GitHub repo right now. If we go back to our repo, um, in mine is listed over here. Remember, your name is different than my name, so type yours. Uh, GitHub examples, let's go here, into here. Um, you know, I have a branch here. It should, uh, well, we don't have one yet. We haven't created one yet. So that's one thing uh, that we need to make note of. Um, so the thing is, and the other thing is like, um, have we been making these changes this entire time? Yeah, we have. Um, but anyway, so, yeah, we have a branch. <laughs> that's that uh, locally, but we don't have one that exists yet. And so the idea is that we want to, we can either create the branch and then push to it, or we can basically run this command and do it in one go, okay? So what I'm gonna do is type in git push, and I'm actually gonna type in u because that's a much shorter version of this. I'm gonna type in origin dev, okay? And now it is tracking our dev to the remote dev. If we go over here, this branch might exist now, okay? And if we drop down, you can see dev is there. We haven't pushed anything into it. If you go to commits, our new commit's not there yet, right? If we go to main, you'll notice main is over here, right? Um, my point is, is that uh, we need to, for this to work, we will need to um, uh, push this change. So we have this one file, and I'm gonna go ahead and say uh, git status, okay? Oh, did we actually push it? Oh, I think we ac accidentally pushed it. So maybe we did make that change. Yeah, we did, it's over here. Okay, sorry. So I thought we had not pushed it yet, but we did. Um, now the question is, how do we visualize this in a way that is easy to read? And that's where we would have an extension. Normally there's one installed, like in Gitpod, they'll have it pre-installed, but apparently this one doesn't. Um, so what we'll do is go to extensions. We'll type in git tree. 
okay? Because I want to be able to see what we're doing. And there's Git Graph. So Git Graph is the one I usually use, I think. And we'll go ahead and install that. There's another one. Um, I'm not sure, like Git Lens. Some of these can get pretty crazy, so I try to keep it really simple. Git History. Yeah, we'll stick with Git Graph. And so once Git Graph is installed, if we go over to here, we should have a new icon up here. Um, and so I don't see it. Sometimes down below, it'll be down here. So I can click this. No, that doesn't help either. And so maybe what we need to do is reload our environment for it to show up. I'm gonna hit refresh on here and just hit enter. And so hopefully what this will do is load it up again so we can see that. So I wanna see that Git graph. What do you mean it doesn't exist? <laughs> uh, okay, it's telling me it didn't exist because I hit a refresh there. Um, okay, I'll open up code spaces because it seems like it's confused right now. This one's running, open in browser. We'll try this again here. Give it a moment to reopen. What do you mean it doesn't exist? It's right here, you're crazy. We have it open. So it's saying it doesn't exist, but we clearly have it open. But it's opening the .git directory. Okay, let's see the back for a second. What is going on? Oh no, I really don't wanna lose my changes. I don't think I'm going to because everything's pushed, but this is where it's kind of acting weird. Again, I don't use GitHub, GitHub's code spaces. I prefer Gitpod, but this one's acting a little bit funny. Um, and so in this case, I'm not 100% sure what to do because it does exist here. So what I'm gonna do is stop this code space Okay, and I'm gonna start it up again. And maybe what this will do is it will unjank it. Okay, so I'll be back here once it, once it stops and then restarts. It takes a little bit of time, okay? Okay, it shows me this button. I'm gonna hit restart uh, code workspace and hopefully this will resolve our issue. It's saying the workspace does not exist. The terminal process failed to launch the starting directory. So it's getting confused. I don't know what's going on here, but this workspace is, is defunct. So what I'm gonna do is again, stop this workspace. We'll open up code spaces. I'm gonna stop this one and I'm gonna delete it because it's not really doing what I wanted to do. I'm not gonna lose anything because everything we worked on, we should have pushed at this point. But uh, yeah, you just gotta be careful with code spaces because it kind of acts a little funny. <laughs> but uh, we'll go back over here and what I'm gonna do is I actually wanna open up this branch. We have the two branches, but I wanna open up code spaces in this branch. I'm gonna go ahead and drop this down. I'm gonna say, create a code space on dev, okay? And so hopefully we don't run into any more issues. It looks like it's losing all my settings, so it's not persisting them. Uh, there are ways to persist them, syncing settings. Uh, there's an option I think here we go into here, because this is gonna drive me crazy if we don't do this. And we'll say automatically detect, not dot files, but um, sync settings. So I'm gonna click this and I'm hoping that what this will do is anytime we change branches or stuff, it's gonna remember my settings. I don't wanna keep changing them. So I'm gonna go here and it should be syncing settings now. I'm gonna go and change my theme again. And I'm gonna go over to settings I'm gonna go to, uh, uh, I'll change the font size to 20 here. 20 is a bit too large, we'll say terminal font. Here, I'll change this to 18, okay? And so I also wanna make sure that my extension's installed, so I'll try this again. Personally, I think they should have this pre-installed. That's the other one. So there's git log graph and Git graph, I'm gonna install both of these because I actually like both of them, to be honest. And uh, we can add this to our dev container. Yeah, make a new dev container. <laughs> um, I don't know, make an empty dev container. I want whatever the base one is. Base, bare bones. You know, I just want the configuration. I'm gonna go ahead and just say bare bones Ruby here, sure. 
and just say, okay, I don't, I don't want that. So I'm just trying to create this file in here. So it knows to remember our extensions um, for this repo. We'll go back and do that also for here. It should remember it, but in case it doesn't, I'm gonna put this in here and I'm gonna go modify the step container. This is also something we're gonna learn about later on. Um, I don't wanna build anything. So I'm just gonna take this out here and I'm just gonna take this out as well. Uh, just say basic config, get graph. I don't see the other one added there. I'm gonna go back over here and try this again, get graph. Um, add to dev container. There, they're both added there. But the reason I'm doing that is I really want to get these tools in here. So now they're here. They show up here and they show up down below. So this is one of them. We'll open that up. It's before I made a pull request. And there's the other one. So I just want to show you there's more than one kind of tool that you can visualize this stuff. And sometimes they give you different information. And so right now we're here, we're in dev, okay? And we added that one, those couple changes over here. And the idea is that we branched over here. So this doesn't know about these changes and vice versa. And we got a whole lot going on here, okay? And so this is where we get into things like merging. So if we want to bring um, dev up to date with main, which we really should do, we should merge main into dev. And that's what I'm gonna do. So I'm in dev, I'm gonna type in git merge main. Um, and sorry, I should I should note that there's origin main and then main. So that there's what's on origin, there's what's on our local main. And so our local main might not have this stuff, okay? If I go over here, it's a bit more clear because it shows them as separate things. So our head shows us exactly where we are right now. We have origin dev, origin main. So I'm gonna do a git fetch because I wanna know where we are right now. And it looks like we're all up to date, so we're fine. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna type in git merge main and it's saying did you mean to merge no i wanted to merge main and so it looks like we don't have a local branch of main okay so what i'm going to do is type in git checkout main okay and so now if we go back up here if we maybe there's some way to refresh this like a refresh button notice there's two now okay so before i didn't even know there was a main i did check out and immediately it said there was no main branch, but it said, oh, you have one on origin main, we'll just add it here and now it's here, okay? So now we have a main and I can go back to dev and I'm just gonna do git fetch, it's just out of habit. And so now we see both of them here, okay? So now I'm gonna do git merge main. And it says we have a conflict, okay? And the reason why is that we went ahead and we changed readme and that other file and they exist there as well. And so sometimes you have to resolve conflicts. Okay, so this is auto merging, merging conflict, automatic merge failed, fa fix the conf uh, conflictions in order to complete this here. And so normally what happens if you pull, or sorry, if you try to do, if you try to do a pull or you try to merge and there's a conflict, you have to resolve it. And so notice right away that now we have new files over here. This wasn't here before. But if we go here, we can see, type in get status, it wants us to resolve it. And the message is a little bit different here. It says, you have un unmerged paths. So we gotta fix this here. And so it's showing us in this file, we have two versions. Which one do you wanna keep? The top one or the bottom one? And so I'm gonna just take the top part and take out this part because we don't want that committed. And so these, it had no problem. And so what I wanna do is I just wanna go ahead and add this. And we're basically just adding everything, uh, adding everything at this point. So I'm gonna say git add all. And then I'm gonna say git commit. And in this case, you do not want to put a, a git commit message in here because it needs to put it its own in here. I'm gonna hit enter and it's gonna open. And this is, the, this is the merge message. It has to be this, you don't ever set this. So notice I typed in git commit and it also filled it in here. And so all, all I'm gonna do is close this and now it's merged it. So if we go back over here, now we can see it represented. Okay, so we took that and we brought that up to date, right? Okay, so and the reason we wanna do that is so that when we merge back into main, we don't have to deal with conflicts. You really don't wanna deal with conflicts 
merging to main. You want to do, deal with those, those conflicts in your branch before you merge back into main, okay? So that's good. Now what we can do is now that we're all up to date, we can continue to work on our readme file. So I don't need this Docker file. This wasn't supposed to be here, but that's a great opportunity for us to delete it because I don't want to launch up a Ruby environment. Um, so what I'm going to do is type in git, um, git remove. Well, first I want to, yeah, git remove Docker file. No, 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 I don't want to do that. Um, I just want, I'm going to go ahead and delete this here. We'll just delete this permanently. So if we go over here, this should show up here. Yeah, we can do that. I think we could have just typed in, if we delete the file, it would show up there anyway, but um, git remove is a bit funny because you can have files you want to remove from tracking that are in your repo to say, stop tracking this forever. Um, or uh, if there's, even there's previ previous versions of it and there's removing the file. So we'll just delete and that'll, we'll keep it simple. So I'm gonna say git add and we'll say git commit hyphen M remove Docker file. We don't want to build a Ruby Ruby environment. Um, so this, I have to put a single comma there. So I need to point out that like we can rebuild our code space um, and, and then it would build that Docker file, but, but we'd have to manually do that because it won't do that until we rebuild it manually. But anyway, so we have that change there. And I'm gonna go ahead and do a git push. And we go back and take a look and we can see that this is now pushed up to date. It wasn't pushed there a moment ago. And so now main's starting to get out of date. But let's go over to our readme file in our crash course. And what I wanna do here, so I wanna do a few, a, a bit more documentation. So we'll go down here below. And so we can add remotes, but often you will just add remotes when you are doing, uh, when you, uh, via upstream or in adding a branch. So if you get branch, um, you origin new feature but you could do it like a git remote add. I, like I rarely ever do that. So I, I don't feel like really covering that here. That would be something I would actually cover in a proper uh, git crash course. Um, I don't know if we really need to do stashing right now. I, we could leave it or take it. Git merge main. So git checkout dev, git merge main. Okay. So I feel like we've done a lot here. I don't want to overload you folks. Um, I think I'll just show you stashing really quick. So um, let's say, let's say I wasn't, I wanted to work on something else and I just wanted to move this to a side and come back to it later. What I can do is add all the files. So it's staged, get status, okay. And I could just stash these for later. So I type in git stash. And what that will do is it will put it in, in it'll just put it somewhere. Okay, I'll put in my stash. And if I type in git stash list, it's here in my stash. Okay, and I can bring it back and say git stash pop and pop it off the stash and bring it back. You wouldn't want to do this in a cloud developer environment because you could lose changes. But if you're in a local developer environment, you might just have stashes and just hold on to them for a long time. But a lot of times you need to move things out of the way. But usually you want to name your stash. So you'll say git stash save and then say, um, Readme changes, so we know exactly what it is. And then we can do git stash list and see what's there. And then we can say git stash apply. And instead of popping, it'll just apply the last one. Um, so there are some commands there that are useful. So we have git stash list, git stash, git stash save my name, and then git stash uh, apply, a pop, and we apply, and then we have git stash pop. Okay, so those are really useful. I use them all the time. Again, I'm hoping that as we go through this course, we'll run into scenarios where we need to use them. Um, but I do actually want to add this, so I'm going to go ahead and git git commit hyphen m minor updates. Um, I'm just going to refresh this, make sure I have that latest one there. Sometimes you miss them, and I'm going to go ahead and do that. And I just want to show you what the graph looks like. 
So you can see, even chose the stashes as well. And devs uh, uh, in front of it, we're gonna do git push, okay? Now let's say we wanted to do a pull request. That's something we're gonna learn later in more detail, but I'm gonna just do it really quickly. A common thing that you should do is open up pull requests. So um, I'm kind of done with this uh, workspace. So I'm gonna go ahead and just close it out because I think the rest of this we don't need to do in here. I'm gonna go ahead and stop this, okay? We can leave it in this state if we come, decide to come back to this, but I'm gonna just stop it for now. And I wanna go back to our repo. GitHub, Andrew Brown, and we'll go to our repo. And I'm gonna go ahead and open up a new pull request. So I'll go here, I'm gonna create a new pull request, and I want to have the pull request come from dev into, this one is showing me everything, I'm not sure why it's doing that, but I'm gonna go here and go from dev into main, and from Andrew Brown into Andrew Brown. I wanna be into my own, I, I wanna merge, I wanna make a pull request into my own. There we go, it's simplified, that's what you should see. And so what I'll go, go ahead to do is hit create pull request. And the idea is that this would be an opportunity for people to review it. So uh, will you accept my code, right? And then the idea is that somebody is supposed to review it. Now, because I'm the only one in my own repo, um, I'm just gonna merge it myself and confirm that. And so the idea is that that is now merged. If we were in GitHub, we would see that that was now merged into main, okay? All right. So now what I wanna show you is just the last thing is I just wanna show you how I would bring these changes into my fork. So I'm gonna switch back into my other account. Actually, before I do that, I'm gonna go ahead and go into my pull request and I'm gonna create a new pull request and I'm going to make a pull request from main from this GitHub account into the example one, the base one. I'm gonna go ahead and create this pull request. I'm not telling you to do this. Please don't do this because I don't wanna deal with a bunch of pull requests. This will be, uh, Documentation changes, documentation for GitHub, uh, or sorry, Git mm, crash course. I think I called this like GitHub crash course, which it should be really GitHub Git crash course. Show me the basics of Git, okay? So I'll go ahead and create that pull request. All right, and the thing is like, I can't merge it from here because I don't own that other one. So what I'll do is switch over to this and now I'm gonna go and see that there's a pull request and it's coming in from Andrew Brown. Oh, how nice of this person. And I'm gonna go take a look here and I can see that they have some changes and I can go and review their code and then ask them to make fixes. I can go here and say, hey, do this, do that. And then I might uh, accept it, but I'm gonna go ahead and prove it. I don't need to approve it here because there's no required reviewers for this but I'll just say it's approved. And then we'll go over to code. And I'm gonna go ahead and, oh, sorry, <laughs> pull requests. I'm gonna go ahead and merge this stuff in because I, I want this stuff, okay? And we'll merge that in. And now it's merged. Just one other thing, I wanna see if I actually named this right, git crash course. Yeah, it's named right, okay, great. And so there's our stuff. That's all the stuff we learned. Was this a mess? Yes. Could I have taught this a lot better if I organized it? Yeah, but I gotta record the rest of the course. And uh, again, you know, if I'm gonna make a, a proper Git crash course, I'll do it somewhere else. Um, but I just wanna get you the basics and hopefully that was helpful. We wasted a lot of time on cloning, but that's something that's really important to know how to do. And I'll see you in the next one, ciao. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at Git commits. So we're gonna take a look at a series of Git components. Uh, in this course, um, it's not really a focus on Git skills, but more so GitHub, but I wanna make sure you still have some Git skills. So after we go through uh, some of these things, I'll then do like a really quick and dirty uh, Git uh, command crash course, okay? So a git commit represents incremental changes to a code base represented with a git tree, so a graph, at a specific time. So here we can see that git tree. Um, this is in GitHub, so it's not the full representation. When we go into uh, VS Code, we, will, we can see a better representation of it. There are external tools for that. But for the most part, the idea is that you have um, uh, you have git commits that are over a historical period of time. Then we have our uh, git commit. Here is one 
within uh, GitHub that I clicked through and I looked at, okay? And from here, a git commit contains additional modifications, deletions of files, uh, additions and deletions of file contents, and it's not the whole file themselves. And this is a strategy to make the uh, commits efficient because if you if you were to store full copies in every single commit, your repo would get really big, really fast. I'm gonna repeat that again, and we'll talk about the contents of uh, commit files here just shortly. Uh, each commit has a SHA hash that acts as an ID, so it looks something like this. We can use this uh, to check out very specific commits, which is very useful. I wanna repeat, Git does not store the whole files in each commit, but rather the state of changes. This greatly reduces the file size. So, uh, so for uh, developers, to the developer you, it will look like a whole file, but really when you store it in, in uh, your Git tree, it's not gonna be like that. Um, so what are the components of a git commit? We talked a little bit about that, but we have that commit hash. That is a unique SHA-1 hash identifier for the commit. I don't know if it's really SHA-1 because I'm not really familiar with all the different types of SHA, but it's SHA something. Uh, we have the author information. So we have name and email. Often you have to configure git to say what email you're utilizing the name. So that's attached to the commit message uh, or the commit itself. You have the commit message. This is the description of uh, the uh, the commit, this is, we're gonna be spending a lot of time when you are making commits because you wanna write good commit messages. You have a timestamp, so this is the date and time when the commit was made. Um, you have the parent commit hash. This is a SHA-1 hash of the commit this commit is based on. I don't really understand that because I've never had to bother with the parent one, but it is something that's in there. And the snapshot of the content, a snapshot of the project at the time of the commit, not the actual files, but references to them and the changes that are occurring. So if you had VS Code open and we were taking a look at a um, at uh, changes that we have staged, so they haven't been committed yet, but you can see here we have uh, the commit message. It says remove old comments. We have files changed that we plan on putting in the uh, commit. And you can see some deletions there on the right-hand side. We can have additions. So hopefully it's very clear what a, uh, a git commit is you are going to need to know these basic commands and we will get a little bit practice. Again, quick and dirty. This is not a full-blown Git course, but it'll be enough to get you by so that you can do the GitHub stuff. And so we have a bunch of stuff there like Git add, Git remove, Git message with the, the hyphen M flag to add a message, hyphen A to automatically stage all track changes. If you have a commit and you haven't pushed it up uh, to your, uh, your remote repo, you can amend it. Um, you can create empty commits. Uh, you can specify the author if you need to. You can check out a very specific commit. But yeah, that is Git Commits in a nutshell, and I'll see you in the next one. Ciao. Hey, this is Angie Brown, and we are taking a look at Git Branch. So Git Branch is a divergence of the state of the repo. There might be better uh, descriptions than that, but that's the way I think of it. You can think of branches as being copies of a point in time that have been modified to be different. And so what I want to do is step you through what it would look like working with Git branches. And this is going to be a little bit messy and it doesn't matter if you can remember or make sense of all this because it will make more sense when we start working with it, but do your best to follow along here. So imagine we have a Git repo. In that Git repo, we have a main branch. And basically all Git repos have a main branch and that's pretty much the standard name for them now. And we're gonna also have a production branch. So the main branch is where we're going to have code uh, that features and bugs will be um, rolled up into. And then when we're ready to push it out for production, it will go into the production branch and some CI CD tool will push it out and automatically deploy it. So um, let's imagine we already have a commit in the main branch. Uh, maybe there are pre previous versions in the production branch, we're not gonna worry about it. So uh, you have developer A, developer A needs to, to work on a very specific feature. They're gonna open up a feature branch. And in there, they're gonna put in some commits and they're working along. Uh, meanwhile, in the company, somebody already has pushed some stuff into the main branch. It's not ready to go in production, but that commit is now out. So what's important to note here is that Feature branch one is not aware of that new commit because things are happening asynchronous, in async manner in different branches. 
And this is the challenge with Git is that you have to deal with all this async stuff and make sure you bring those changes into yours, deal with conflicts, things like that. Now let's say we have developer B and developer B is working on feature branch two. And when they started on their, on their, um, uh, their feature, they decided to branch from this point in time. Okay, and so they start working on it and they get their feature uh, done and um, they get, they talk to their, um, uh, the director of engineering and, and they make a pull request. The pull request gets accepted and it gets merged back into main. Okay, and so developer A, who's working on fe uh, feature branch one, has all these changes that they still don't have. So let's remember that they're gonna have to deal with that at some point. But anyway, that feature got merged into main and it looks like it's ready to go in production. So it gets merged into production. And so this particular commit contains, I'm gonna get my pen out here, contains all of this information, right? And it's all packed into here, if that makes sense. Okay, I'm just gonna erase that here. And so that gets put to production and it gets tagged. A lot of CICD systems will trigger when a tag is applied. That's definitely how I do it. But now coming back to developer A, they're on feature branch one and they have all this stuff um, that they need to get their branch up to date. So what they'll do is they'll merge back in, in their direction. I know it doesn't show a merge, but it, they'll merge that information into feature branch one. So they are now up to date and they have now finished their feature by doing a bit of extra work. And so they've merged back into, into the main branch and now their stuff is to be rolled out to production. So it gets merged into production and then that gets tagged. So hopefully that gives you kind of an idea of uh, this kind of workflow. This should have really been like that. Uh, and this actually has a very particular name. It's called the GitHub flow. Now there are some variations of this. So that's why I say very close to it because in case I'm wrong, I wanna have that buffer to say that, well, I didn't say this is exactly the GitHub workflow, but this more or less is the GitHub workflow where you are creating branches, feature branches, merging it back into some other branch and then you have a branch for production. Uh, you can have branches for all sorts of things. You can have specific environment branch branches like staging, development, and production. You can have specific branches to developers, so like based on their names. You can have branches per features, branches per bugs. It's gonna be based on what your team wants to do. All right, uh, there are definitely Git branch commands you should absolutely know, and we will do, again, a quick, quick and dirty crash course so you are familiar with it. This is a extremely common pattern that you're gonna find that you'll be doing, which is you'll be creating a new branch for a feature. You're gonna be adding changes. You're gonna be pushing it upstream. We might do this via VS Code using the Git CLI. We might be doing this using GitHub, uh, creating a branch from an issue, but we'll definitely be doing this because this is something that happens a lot um, in professional um, uh, teams is that they're creating feature branches. So hopefully that makes sense. And again, if it doesn't, wait till we go ahead and do it and then it will make more sense then, okay? Ciao. Hey, this is Andrew Brown and we are taking a look at Git repos. So these represent the reference to a remote location where a copy of your repo is hosted. So when I say remote, Git remote, I'm saying remote reference or remote ref. You might see those terms uh, used all over the place. Uh, you can have multiple remote entries uh, or remote references for your Git repo. And the most common one you're gonna see is called origin. It's almost always uh, there. Uh, everybody seems to use it. It indicates the central or golden repo everyone is working from and represents the source of truth. Uh, the remote entries or references are stored in your .git config. We don't really talk about this .git folder in any of the slides, but the .git folder is how you know that your project is a uh, has a, a Git repo in it because it needs that folder uh, to initialize a Git repo. We'll look at that in the quick and dirty crash course. Um, so in here, in the config file, you can see we have remote defined. So this format of a file is called a TOML file. Um, so anytime you see those square braces and then definitions, that's usually a TOML file. But I'm just gonna get my pen tool out here. But the idea here is we're saying we, uh, we have a remote named origin and the URL is pointing to our GitHub repo. This part says how it should fetch. Uh, I'm not gonna get into that right now. And then down below, we can see we have some branches that we are tracking. 
and they're pointing to remote origin, and then they, uh, they're saying that we want to uh, merge um, uh, there. So hopefully that is clear. Notice remote names can be referenced. So we have origin up here, and it's referencing this up here. Okay, so I'm just going to <laughs> clear my annotations here so this is a little bit more clear. And there are a bunch of git remote commands you should know. I don't remember the most, like the git remote add, I don't ever remember that one because often when you clone, it's going to add them anyway. And so usually you pull them from GitHub, but you should know push, you should know pull, you should know fetch. Uh, and when you are creating branches, you should know um, how to uh, push upstream. And we'll talk about upstream and downstream next, okay? All right, let's talk about the concepts of upstream and downstream. So imagine we have GitHub who is hosting our remote repository, and then we have our local developer environment or cloud developer environment. Uh, this is local basically, where we are doing our work. And so they both have a main repo because we know that Git is decentralized so we can have repos in more than one place. We might already have some commits on the remote side, but what's going to glue these two together is going to be the remote. And so we set up a remote tracking branch, okay? And, and you'll see that term when you create uh, and you push branches up because the idea is that it's tracking, uh, the origin is pointing to main, so this is the way we track them. Uh, we saw that was stored in the dot git forward slash config. So when we go ahead and we perform a pull from our local developer environment, we call this downstream. We're pulling downstream. So a repo that pulls or clones from another repo. And just understand this is relative to the direction or the perspective um, of who's pulling. So if the remote was pulling, it would be downstream. It's, it's anytime you're pulling, it's always downstream. And now imagine we have commits We've been working locally and we wanna push those up to remote, we would call that upstream. So this is when you are pushing changes. So that's upstream, that's downstream. And when we have a remote reference, it is a tracking branch. So there you go, okay. Hey, this is Andrew Brown. We are taking a look at GitHub Flow. So this is a lightweight workflow for multiple developers working on a single repo. There's a lot of variations on this. Uh, so this is not a technically perfect description of it, but there really isn't one. And I wanna show you a really old graphic. Um, I don't know how old this is, but I've seen this and older ones, maybe all the way back to 2008 at least. And I remember before GitHub Flow because GitHub came, or sorry, Git came out in 2005 and it took a few years to gain adoption. So for a long period, for a few years, we just had a mess of stuff and then somebody came up with this. Maybe it was GitHub, I'm not sure, but uh, it's called the GitHub flow. And um, here we have a bunch of branches and it looks very similar to the one that I showed you in Git branch. It's a little bit different. And so the big difference is that, well, first of all, uh, we don't call it master anymore, we call it main, but my main was the develop branch and then I would call this branch master, I would have called it production because I think that makes more sense and a lot of people do that these days, but when it first came out, this is how we were doing it, okay? So understand this variation. But the idea is that you have this one branch, I call it main, this is develop, and it holds things that, um, that, uh, that hold feature branches or hotfixes and everything. It's basically like rolls everything up, but it's not in production yet. And so the idea is that when these things are ready for um, production, you can push them out into a release branch. A release branch could be also called staging. That's normally what we call uh, today. And this could be where it would roll out. So once you push stuff here, this could go out and execute a CI CD pipeline and it would set up a staging environment so that QA could be done on it or any kind of load balancing could be done on it or stress testing um, there. And the idea is that as developers, you would open up feature branches off of develop and as you complete them, they would come back in here uh, and they would get merged in. And then when things were really ready, you take it, take it from uh, release branches and push it out to your production branch, which they're calling uh, here uh, master. If for whatever reason you had a serious problem you had to fix really quickly, you could um, uh, create a branch off of master into the hotfixes and then merge it back in, skipping all the stuff down below. 
Uh, you know, again, I wouldn't do it this way anymore. I would be surprised if companies are sticking uh, to this method, but this is the original way. And I just wanted to show you that there is variation. Um, and, you know, a lot of people do skip having a release branch and they'll just deploy often and into production. So it's gonna be really dependent on your team. So here we'll just kind of loosely describe GitHub Flow. You create a branch for each new task or feature, create a new branch off the main branch. Add commits, make changes and commits, commit them to your branch. Open a pull request, start a discussion about your commits, reviewing code in the pull request. Discuss and review, share your pull request with teammates for feedback. Deploy, test your changes in production environment. Um, so yeah. Oh, and the last thing would be merge. So once your changes are verified, merge them into the main branch. So that's the general concepts of it. And hopefully that makes sense. And we will see you in the next one. Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and we are taking a look at the GitHub CLI. So this is a command line interface to interact with your GitHub account. You can quickly perform common GitHub actions without leaving your developer environment. And uh, if you uh, went through the quick and dirty um, Git uh, crash course, then you definitely got some exposure to GitHub CLI, but the idea is that you'd have to log in. You can perform actions there. So we have something like creating a repo, creating an issue, uh, reviewing a PR. There's a lot of uh, CLI commands. Uh, the GitHub CLI can be installed on Windows, Linux, or Mac OS. Um, that's an example of using Brew to install it if you have it. For um, uh, dev containers, you can specify it as a feature to get installed. So that is a very easy and quick way to have it uh, installed there. And just to give an idea of commands, we have our core commands, we have a lot of additional commands, and then we have one specific to GitHub uh, Actions command. So we're definitely gonna get some exposure uh, to a GitHub CLI uh, in this course, but there you go. All right, so in this follow along, I wanna take a look at the GitHub CLI and see if we can do a few different things with it. What I'm gonna do is switch over to my other account. Um, uh, this is just my uh, play around account for, for GitHub. And we should already have a repo in here called GitHub exa examples. And what I wanna do is I want to, um, you know, just do some things in the CLI. So I need some kind of environment to work in. And so what we'll do is launch up a code space. Uh, we do have this older one. Um, I think what I'll do is make a new one. I don't think it really matters if we make an old or new one, that other one is stopped. So we'll open this one up and we'll see if the GitHub CLI is already pre-installed. It could be pre-installed on this because I would think that if, well, if I was GitHub, I would have it pre-installed so people could start using my product right away. But if it's not, we'll definitely go ahead and take a look at how to install it. We did install it manually locally um, in the uh, Git crash course, the quick and dirty crash course. So. Uh, you know, if we don't have to show the install, I'd rather skip that, but we'll wait for this to spin up, okay? I have no idea why, but that took a little bit time to spin up. Um, you know, our goal isn't to really make anything, just to play around with the, um, the CLI here. The code space is currently running in recovery mode due to configuration error. I didn't do anything. I, I don't care, it's, um, I mean, it's a new environment. Why should it be recovering? Is there something it can't do? Yeah, I'm not sure about this. So what I'm gonna do, cause I don't trust this workspace is um, this one is running here. I don't know, we'll just see what we can do with it. But it didn't pick up my uh, settings when I told it to save it earlier. So I don't know if it's because it's in recovery mode or not, but for the time being, I'm gonna go ahead and change the theme. So I'm not upset. There we go, that's a lot better. And I wanna see if we have, um, GH installed. So it's not installed, which is totally fine. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, if we had this installed, can we install it through here? Sometimes you can install stuff through plugins, right? And so I'm just curious if we could do that there. No, okay, so that's fine. We'll go ahead and install this. And I definitely know that Brew is installed, or maybe it's not installed on this, let's find out. <laughs> It is installed on Gitpod, but I'm not sure about GitHub. It's not, okay. So what we'll do is we'll look up the GitHub CLI and we'll go ahead and install it. We already did this before, but we'll do it again. And what we're looking for is those install instructions and we want it for um, Linux. Okay, so we'll go over into here into Linux and we'll grab this one line command. It looks like a lot, but it's really just doing this update and this install like down here, but it has to add the repo so it knows where to install it from. But I'm gonna grab that big thing there 
and we're going to go ahead and paste that on in, say allow, and hit enter. And um, it failed. It failed. And I can't look at, I can't see what I'm doing. So I'm going to bump up this font. I do not like GitHub code spaces. I'm so sorry. I really like Gitpod. And we're going to go here and say terminal font. I'll try not to complain too much about it in the course, but uh, I can't promise anything. I'm going to copy that again. And we'll try this again. It hit enter. No such file directory. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know what you want. So there's this line here. Okay. Maybe because GPG, GPG isn't installed. Sometimes you don't have to do a GPG check, but we might have to with this. And um, failure to write destination. Okay, so if that's not working, maybe what we could do in an easier way is we could just add it um, to the uh, uh, t to the that this file, this code spaces file. So we could just make a dev container, um, and maybe that would be less of an issue. So what I'll do is I want to add a dev container. Um, we'll go up to here, dev container, like that. We actually already have one from before. And maybe we can just throw it in here. So I'll grab this. Maybe we do want to commit this. Maybe this is a good idea. Um, and so we'll, I'll put this here. And I need a comma there. And so the idea here is that this should install the CLI into this environment. And maybe the reason why this thing messed up was because it wasn't specifying any base image. And that's why it got upset. Because when we did this in the uh, tutorial earlier, um, it kind of complained. Or sorry, like when we spun this up, it complained. But we didn't specify a base image. So I'm going to look up what the base image is for dev container. The base image for GitHub is. And maybe that will help us. If that doesn't help, let's go, let's go ask ChatGPT. Log in. Let me in. <laughs> let me in. Come on. I pay for this. Let me in. What is the what is the base image used for a dev container for GitHub code spaces? Uh, let's see if that can figure it out. It's probably just going to go to the um, the documentation, but um, I, I don't remember where it is. So if you don't specify one, it will create in the default one. Okay, that's what I would rather it do. So I'm going to leave it alone. And what I want to do is rebuild uh, this environment because we've added this change. Before we do, I need to commit this maybe. So I'll just say um, it should install the GitHub CLI. Go ahead and do that. And I'll say OK. So it should sync it up. Good. And so let's see if we can find the rebuild. So I'm clicking up here, rebuild. That's no good. We can open up the command palette this way. Command palette has all the commands for, for VS Code. And there should probably be something for code space. So if I type in code spaces, there's probably something here to rebuild. There it is, rebuild container. So I'm going to go ahead and rebuild that container. I'm going to go ahead and hit rebuild. And so I'm hoping that will install the CLI and that avoids us having to install GPG or whatever it wants because that's a headache and I don't want to deal with that. So see you back here when this finishes building, okay? All right, we're in. It says the code space is currently running in recovery mode due to a configuration error. Please review the creation logs, update your dev container as needed, or rebuild the container. So it clearly doesn't like something about my file. I'm not really sure because there's not a whole lot in it. Um, so we have command control shift P. Okay. Control shift P. Hey, like learning's learning, right? And uh, we want to view creation logs. Oh, that's just to open up the uh, command palette. View creation log. And somewhere here it's messing up. Now, I don't understand how it could be messing up because we literally have next to nothing in it. Um. Yeah, this is supposed to be an easy, easy GitHub CLI tutorial. Failed to create the container. An error occurred. Unified containers error creating fail. Doesn't even tell us why. It's just like, nope, it doesn't work. <laughs> Maybe it's up here. Um, 
No matching entries and unable to find user dev container. Okay, maybe it's this. Okay, let's take this out. All right, and uh, that's probably the reason why, okay? So we'll save that, okay? We'll have to update that. Don't change remote user, okay? And we'll push to main. And I'm gonna try to rebuild this again. I'll open up a command palette down here below just in case. And I wanna say rebuild. Um, I wanna do like a full rebuild. Let's do a full rebuild. That's fine, let's rebuild. And we'll get it going this next one, okay? I'll see you back in a moment. Okay, so I think that resolved the issue. It took a while for that to rebuild, but what I wanna see is if the CLI is in here. So I'm gonna type in uh, GH and there it is. Okay, great. So that's the easy way to get in there as long as you don't make any mistakes in your dev container uh, uh, JSON or JS or JSON, JSON file. And so let's go ahead and see what kind of actions we can perform. So what I'll do is go over and type in GitHub CLI and we'll take a look at the documentation and see, that's not what I want. I want the uh, official documentation. So we can see what kind of commands we can get. Here it is. Okay, so here's all of our commands. And the question first is, are we logged in? Because that's something we might need to do. So let's go ahead and type in gh login. Oh, sorry, gh auth login to log into the CLI. And we have two options. We'll do github.com. It says the value of the GitHub token environment is being used for authentication to, uh, okay. So it sounds like we already are authenticated because of um, GitHub code spaces and it's loading some kind of temporary um, token in here. Something we could check here is to see if there actually is a token being set. So I'm gonna type in env grep and we'll type in gh. And I don't see anything there, but apparently it seems to think that it is ready to utilize. So maybe what we could do is list out repos. So I imagine if we go here, there's probably something like list, there is. And we could try to list our repos. Let's go ahead and try that. GH repo list. And we have a repo and that's actually a really nice display. What else could we take a look at here? Um, so again, back over to the repo. We can list our repo. What if we go to view, what would that do? Let's take a look. GH repo view. And I was hoping that it would set, it would select the current one, but apparently it didn't. Well, we can do uh, gh repo set default and I gotta type it right. Maybe it'll let us choose the repo so we don't have to uh, goof around. And so there it is, we can choose one. And apparently uh, we have two, Xampro Co and the Andrew WC Brown. Curious that it's showing forked ones, but this is the one I want because this is the account I'm in right now. And so let's go ahead and type in gh repo view. And so now we can see some stuff in here. Um, not a lot of information. It looks like it's kind of the information about maybe the description or stuff like that. So I was hoping to see a little bit more there, but that's okay. Let's go down here and see what else we can do. Um, we could edit our repo. Like we could change features, turn things on or off. Mm, that's not that interesting. Something we might want to do is maybe we might want to uh, maybe change our labels. Let's go ahead and try that out. So I'm gonna go here and say GH labels list. Um, is it just label or labels label? Oh, cool. Yeah, and we can see our codes. Can we add a new one in here? Uh, we'll go to create. So GH label, so we try this one here. Copy it, paste it in. And there already is a bug, so we can't have two. So I'll go here and just say um, danger. Something really not right. We'll hit enter. And so it looks like we've created another label. Let's go hit ahead and hit up. Okay, so it looks really good there. Bug isn't working, good. Um, if we wanted to create a new repo, sometimes what they'll do is they'll um, they'll create like a, uh, a wizard in here. So if I typed in GH create repo and I said um, GitHub, I'll just, we'll just do this. I bet it will prompt us. 
Oh, I got to type it right. I seem to be typing everything wrong here today. Repo create. And so it'll ask us some things like create a repo from a template repository, make a new one. So I could do this. I could say GitHub um, repo, GitHub CLI example. And I'll just go hit enter here. I'll just make this one private. I could add a readme file. We could add a gitnor. We could say what we want the git ignore to be. So maybe it's for C++. That let's add a license. We could choose Apache 2.0. Um, we want to do this. We'll say yes. And it seems like it should have created, but we get a resource not accessible by integration for 403. So I'm not 100% sure as to why we're getting that. It could be a permissions issue because everything is based on um, that token, right? And so maybe we have a personal access token that allows us to read but not write. Um, and we got a 403, right? So 403 error is for forbidden, meaning we don't have access to do it. So what I'm thinking is that we can probably create our own um, personal access token and try to get around that. So I'm gonna go to settings here. I'm gonna go all the way down to develop for settings and we're gonna go into personal access tokens, fine grain tokens, and we'll generate a new token. Again, I don't know if this will work, but I'm just gonna try it. So we'll just say um, uh, repo access. Right, let us create a repo. And I'm gonna set this for tomorrow because I don't need it forever. And if it's for all repos, then that's a challenge, right? But then how would you create a token? This is public repos. So here it says, this applies to current and future repos owned by this resource. All, all includes public repos read only. So the other question is, is it because we tried to make it a private repo, but then why would it have it as an option if we can do that? I mean, we could also authenticate uh, via SSH. So I'm not sure. So I guess that's where I'm not 100% sure. So maybe we'll just say all repos here and we'll go to repo permissions. And I'm looking specifically for repos. Contents, no. and carefully looking here to try to find that. Um, account permissions maybe? It feels closer to this. Type in repo. Um, let's see here. So what does this one do? Interaction limits, uh, interaction limits on repos. I don't think it's that. And so I'm just carefully looking to figure out what functionality we would have to provide. Managing repository environments. It could be this, read, write. I would probably put this in just because that is the usual. Um, oh, repo creation, it's up here. So I don't think we need these other ones. I'm gonna leave them on because they're not that big of a deal. Um, and this one says it's mandatory. So sure, we'll have that in there. It got it added in there. I'm gonna go ahead and generate this token. And so now we have this token, I'm gonna copy it. I'm gonna go over to here. I'm gonna type in export GH token. And I'm gonna go ahead and paste this in. And so the idea is that when we use the, um, uh, the CLI, it should pick up this as opposed to what else is on here. So I'm typing env hyphen grep, because I want to make sure that this is actually set as our environment variable. If you have other tabs open here, it might not show up. So just stay on the current tab. We'll go ahead and try this again. Another reason why it might have not worked is because that name was already taken, but I don't think so, because it's scope based on our user. So we'll go ahead and try this again from scratch. So we'll say GitHub CLI example, and then we'll say, uh, we'll put nothing in there. We'll make it private. And it was interesting, there's a visibility of internal. I imagine that maybe that's for enterprises. We'll say yes, yes, and it doesn't matter. I'll just choose that one. We'll say yes, it doesn't matter. I'll choose that one and we'll say yes. Let's see if it works now. Clone the repo locally. Mm, yeah, sure, let's do that. And so now it's working. So whatever key, whatever personal access token that is somehow being loaded in there did not have the correct permissions, we were able to get around that. So I don't really want this repo, so I wanna go ahead and delete it. Um, let's go take a look and see what actions we have there. 
we have delete. So I'm going to hope that it just will like give me a wizard so I don't have to pick it. So we'll say uh, gh repo delete. Um, and I don't want to delete our current one. So I'm going to hit control C because that's totally not what I want. And we'll go back over to here and we'll take a look and see what we can see for the uh, repo. I really wish they would list them up here. Maybe if we go to the getting started for available commands. Yeah, that's a little bit easier. It's not great, but uh, we'll go to repo here and we'll go to delete and we can put the repo name here. So we'll go back over to uh, GitHub here. We'll go to our names. This is gonna be Andrew WC Brown. And we should be able to see two repos in here. There's our other one. I'm gonna grab that name. And we're gonna go back over here and I'm gonna say that. So do we wanna delete it? So type the name again, sure. And we have to put in also uh, the username in front of it. We'll hit enter. And that repo should be now deleted. We'll go back over to here. Okay, and it's deleted, so that is in good shape. So that's all good, so I'm really happy with that. I'm gonna go ahead and stop this uh, uh, code, code space. I'm just going to delete it. And you know, I'm gonna delete the other one. I'm just gonna make sure I keep everything nice and clean and, and not worry about overspend. And what I wanna do is just merge this into my other account. Again, you don't have to do this. You can just watch me do this, but it's good to watch because this is something that people have to do a lot and actually what I should have done is I should have gone over here and I should have done it from here first. So I'm gonna go here and create a PR, create, create a new PR and we'll say create is it going in the direction we want. Yes, it is, we'll hit create, um, fix dev container. We'll create that pull request. Good, we'll switch back over to our other account and then I'm gonna go into uh, the same repo. I'm going to accept it, confirm it, and we are in good shape. I'll see you in the next one, ciao. A common strategy for authenticating uh, to perform Git operations on your remote GitHub repo is by using an SSH key. Uh, you're definitely gonna to wanna to use this because it is a great way um, to work with Git. Uh, in your local developer environment. It's definitely the way that I like to use it as opposed to using a personal access token. But uh, the way it works is you'll have to generate out your own SSH uh, key using a command like SSH key gen for Linux. There's probably different ways, but that's the way that I know. And specifically an RSA key. I'm sure there's different kinds of uh, keys that uh, Git, uh, GitHub will take, but that's the one that I know. And so the idea here is that we have our computer, our local computer, and then we have the server, which is uh, GitHub. And the idea is that there'll be a copy of the public and private key on your local computer. And then on GitHub, you'll store that private key. And so the, the process of authenticating and authorizing is gonna go like this. So the server checks to see if you have the same public key. If you both have the same public key, it's gonna send you a challenge message. That challenge message contains the public key uh, encrypted, and so it's gonna send that on over. And then uh, the idea is that um, the private key on the local computer will decrypt it. And then it will be able, to, uh, if, once it decrypts that message, it will then take the private key and do something there and then send back a, well, it won't do something, it'll send back a signature. Um, and then that signature will be sent to GitHub and then they'll verify it and that will establish that connection, allowing you to use SSH keys to get clone or push or or things like that. Uh, under your account settings, SSH and GPG keys is where you'll be able to add the public keys. So here you can see I have a couple SSH keys in one of my uh, GitHub accounts and it's there under SSH and GPG keys. And when you want to go use um, or clone a, a repo, you're gonna really want to use that SSH style address. It will not, not work with the HTTPS one or the GitHub CLI one. Technically it will work with the GitHub CLI one, but uh, that's what you're gonna wanna do there. So there you go. In this video, I just wanna show you quickly how to create SSH keys. We did cover that in the quick and dirty uh, Git crash course, but it's good to do things more than once so that we really get good at them. I'm gonna open up a new environment here in Code Spaces, and we'll get that spun up. So I'll see you back here when this is ready, okay? 
All right, so we have this environment spun up and it's just not remembering my uh, settings whatsoever, but you know, that's just how things go. And I'm gonna make a new folder in here. I'm just gonna call it um, SSH keys. And I'm gonna just go ahead and make a new readme file. So normally what we'll use is the SSH keygen command. I realize that's small, I'm just gonna jump it up like that. And so we use TRSA to make an RSA um, uh, style key. I would imagine that uh, GitHub can support different kinds. Not that I know much about the different kinds. Let's go take a look here and see what we can see. So that's from local. I'm gonna go ahead and delete that because um, I don't need that right now. If we go here, you can see things like SSH, RSA, SHA-2, something like that. So it'd be interesting to generate something else out. So ECD, SSH, keygen, key gen, ECD. So I wanna see if we can generate something that's a bit more secure. I, I assume it's more secure. It's a relatively new crypto, cryptographic solution. Um, it's been around for five years. Okay, so how do we make it? And the way we make it is probably by supplying this like that. Okay, great. So what I'll do is go back over here and we'll change it from RSA to this one and see what happens. I've never done this before, but I imagine it's super simple. And I'm gonna CD into the SSH directory. I'm gonna go ahead and hit enter. Say allow, yes, I wanna paste. I'll hit enter and see if it can do this. And so we'll go ahead and hit enter. Um, it will create it in the code space directory. So I suppose that's fine. And we'll do that and that. And so then we're gonna get that key. And then the idea is that we can then go ahead here and then we could go and cat out the contents of it, right? All right, and so we could copy this and it's actually a lot shorter. That's actually really nice, I like that. And then we could go over here and then we could add it. So just say uh, cloud developer environment for CDE and we could add that key. Now I wanna point out that you can add keys to repo as well. So we're not gonna really test this to make sure it works. I just wanted to generate out another one and show you that. But what we'll do is we'll go over to our repo because I wanna show you where that deploy keys things is. And if we're in a repo like this, we can go to our settings and there should be deploy keys down below and we could add a deploy key and it's the same process. You just paste it on in, you, know, you say what it's from, uh, you can say whether you want it to have a write access and boom, there you go. But a lot of these um, repos only need read only. So especially if you're building, you're just cloning the repo. So you don't need that. But that's all I wanted to show you. So I'm gonna go ahead and commit this. Okay, so we'll just say uh, basic instructions for SSH. Okay, so that's all good. I'll say okay. And then what I'm gonna do is just switch into my other accounts. And I probably can merge the other way too, um, if I try that. So if we go here to pull requests, we go to new pull requests, and I could probably try to grab from that other repo. So I wanna bring in from here, from there, yep, I can do that. And then I'm just basically allowing myself to pull the changes in without the other Andrew having to uh, put it forward, okay? There we go, and we are merged. I will see you in the next one. So deploy keys allow you to attach public keys directly to a Git repo. And the use case for deploy keys are if you're using, let's say, a build server or a CICD third-party service that needs to clone the repo so they can perform a build or deploy, or maybe single repo access. So instead of using a shared key pair for the uh, for multiple repos, you have a single key pair for a single Git, uh, Git repo. And another reason would be to avoid using the personal access token. Um, I'm gonna tell you, I've definitely used deploy keys, especially if you're not using GitHub Actions and you're using third-party CI-CD tools, which is pretty common with uh, GitHub, um, you will find yourself using deploy keys. And I just want to make aware that's very similar to the other one with some advantages. So you have to decide in your use case where you're gonna wanna use it, but it's as simple as that, okay?
Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and we are taking a look at personal account access tokens, or specifically personal access tokens, or PAT, which is an alternative way of using a password for authentication. Now, PATs are not specific to GitHub, but they do utilize them. Uh, and the purpose of these tokens is to give you access to the API um, when you're making direct calls or using the command line or using the SDK. Uh, GitHub no longer supports the use uh, of using a password directly with interacting with the API. They used to, but now you have to use an access token. Uh, if you're coming from like the AWS world, it's kind of like your access secret. Um, so it's giving you that access. Uh, there are two types of paths on um, GitHub. You have the classic token. They're less secure and no longer recommended for use. Customers with legacy systems may still be using the classic token like some of my apps. <laughs> Uh, then you have fine grain uh, personal access tokens. These grant specific permissions. They must have an expiry date. Uh, you can only access specific repos, um, or if you want all repos, it'll probably only be read only. You can only access resources owned by a single user or organization. You can find this stuff under the developer settings. Um, there are a few use cases where we'll use uh, PATs. It would be like logging in using uh, Git clone for HTTPS and uh, Let's say we are using uh, the GitHub CLI. You could set uh, a token, or sorry, a, an environment variable called GH token, to be used uh, for for the GitHub CLI to for the, to pick that up. Uh, if you're using SDKs, you're going to be supplying your token. I would imagine that the C, uh, that these um, SDKs would pick up that environment variable as well. But there you go. Hey everyone, it's Andrew Brown. And in this follow along, I wanna take a look at personal access tokens. Yes, we've already played around with them, but let's play around with them a little bit more, okay? And so what I'm gonna do is go over to my repo and I might already have a code space from before and I'm, it's already still active. So I'm gonna go ahead and open that to save myself some trouble. If you have to launch a new one, you can absolutely go ahead and do that. Remember to close your code spaces so you are not using up your free tier usage. Uh, you get so many hours per month. I don't know what it is. Uh, you can look it up if you wanna know or we'll find out when we make it over to the uh, code spaces section in the course. Um, and so what I wanna do here is I just want to uh, work with personal access tokens. Now we might have one set from before. So I'm gonna take a look here and see what we have. So I'm gonna type in env grep gh and see if there's anything set. And there's nothing set here, so that's great. And what I wanna do is go to the top left corner here, go to settings, and then down below, we'll go to our developer settings and we have our personal access tokens. We have fine grain tokens and token classic. Now, something I would like to know, I'm gonna go ahead and delete this one. What I would like to know is, can we generate them out from the GitHub CLI? Uh, you'd think you wouldn't be able to because then you need permissions to have permissions, but I'm gonna take a look here and see what we have um, because I'm just curious to see if it's actually there or not. And so I'm gonna just type in token and there is a token. So it says, the, this command outputs the authentication token for an account on a given GitHub host. Well, that's really interesting. So what would happen if we wrote that in? So I'm gonna type in gh auth token and see what we get. And we actually get a token back. So I'm not sure if that means that um, that's that token code, but let's find out if it is by generating out a new token. Another thing I might wonder is like, what permissions do we have? I'm not sure if it would tell us. I don't think so. Let's refresh, refresh our token, expand or fix the permission scope of the stored credentials. That's kind of interesting. Like you could go out and request to have more permissions, but I'm not sure exactly how that would work. Um, but let's go ahead and generate a new token. I'll just say um, create issues. And I'm gonna set this for one day. Okay, and we'll go down below and we're gonna uh, select it for a very specific repo, this one here. And I'm gonna go to permissions. And I'm looking for issues. We'll say yes to issues, read and write. And we'll go ahead and generate that token. And so we can see that's what this token looks like. We're gonna copy it, uh, bring it over here and I'm gonna set it to this. So I'll say gh token equals and then a double quotation, paste it in, enter. And so now it should be set. So if I type in e env grep, uh, GH, we should see it there. Excellent. So now let's type in GS auth token and see if we get a different value. Notice that this is the one we have. Now it shows that we're using a personal access token. So this is getting loaded, loaded in by GitHub. How it's getting in there, I don't know. But this one looks exactly to be the same 
as this one. Let's go test and see if we can make an issue. So go down below here and we will say create and I'll scroll down and grab an example. So we'll do this and hopefully I'll just know to create it in the current repo. Hit enter and we need to set a default repo. So we'll go ahead and do that. I'll choose this one here and I'll try this again. And so it's created it. Oh, this repo has um, issues disabled. That's interesting. So we'd have to go ahead and enable that. So I'm gonna go back to our repo here. I'm gonna go over to settings and we'll go down below and we'll turn on issues. Now we could do this via the CLI, but it's just easy to checkbox that. And we'll go back to our environment and we'll hit up. And now it's created the issue. So now the question is, if I get rid of that token like I unset it, uh, what would happen? So what I'll do is I'll just hit up till we get to that set. I'm just gonna purposely set it blank, okay? And that way this shouldn't work. And so now if I do GH list, issues list, I wonder if I can get a list of them. Now remember this repo is public, so it's going to work because it's public, but the question is, can I delete the issue? So I'm gonna say delete, and um, it's expecting some args. If I, if I type help, will it tell me how this works? The number of it, that's perfect. So the number is two, so that's easy. And I wonder if I can just put a two on this. Type two to confirm, yes. Okay, and it deleted it. Now the thing is, is that yes, I was able to delete it, but just understand that this thing has some base uh, access underneath that original token. And so it probably had permissions, this one here, to do that. There's probably some things that this thing can't do. And we learned that before, which was that uh, being able to create a repo. Um, but uh, you know, if, if I did this on localhost, I would assume that this would have not worked and that's totally fine. I think that satisfies us for learning about uh, personal access tokens. I'm gonna go back to our personal access token, go ahead and delete it. And we'll call this one done. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and go into personal access tokens and delete this. And if you want, you can stop and delete your code spaces. I'll see you in the next one. Ciao. Let's talk about the GitHub API. And specifically what I wanna talk about is the fact that there are two versions of it. We have the REST API and the GraphQL API. I'm not gonna do a big lesson into what APIs are and uh, that kind of stuff, but I want to give you a comparison between these two to understand what are the pros and cons of each of them. So let's do a breakdown quickly here. Uh, so the first thing is the design philosophy. So for the REST API, this is resource base, and this is uh, this means that usually with REST APIs, you'll have a different endpoint per resource. Uh, for GraphQL, you'll have a single endpoint with queries for per, per, uh, precise data requests. Um, for methods, we can use get, post, put, delete. Um, but for GraphQL, they usually use post. For data fetching, we can have multiple requests for related data. For GraphQL, you use a single, re single request that can be very complex, but can get whatever you want. Uh, you can have over fetching or under fetching. For GraphQL, you're, you have precise data fetching, so you're getting exactly what you want and nothing more. For performance, it is less efficient for complex systems. But you know what? I think that is something we could argue because I still really like REST APIs. For GraphQL, uh, it's more efficient for complex queries. For caching, it's easier due to HTTP methods. Um, for GraphQL, it's more challenging due to post methods. The learning curve, it's super easy to use REST APIs. GraphQL uh, requires a lot more knowledge to pick up. Um, for REST API, it's server-driven structure. For GraphQL, it's client-driven, okay? Uh, for versioning, you often have to do API versioning for REST API. For GraphQL, you usually don't have to, and that was the huge reason for having Graph, uh, GraphQL APIs. The ecosystem for REST API is mature with extensive tools. GraphQL is still uh, growing. But uh, the point is, is that GitHub has both, and these are the two big flavors of APIs on the internet. Um, and I think the major reason they did GraphQL was when they opened uh, the GitHub App Store. So you get exactly the data you wanted because the REST APIs didn't always return the data uh, that, that people needed to build apps. And I think that was the reason why. Because I remember trying to build an app when the App Store first came out and I had to use GraphQL. In fact, I learned GraphQL because of GitHub because uh, they were one of the early adopters of it when it came out. But there you go. <laughs>
Hey, this is Andrew Brown. In this video, I want to show you the GitHub API. Um, you know, the reason I know the GitHub API is because I've before GitHub Actions and all this other stuff, you would have to interact with it a lot more. I need to point out that there are two types of APIs, the REST API and the GraphQL API. Uh, I wonder if you could give us an example of what that looks like for GitHub so you have an idea if you've never seen a GraphQL API. Um, but uh, let's see what we could find out. So it looks like there might be some way to interactively explore it here. Oh, look, there we go. So GraphQL, um, it has its own syntax language. And the idea is that you are formulating what data you want. It'll turn it back. So we can sign into this and then we could probably do some live stuff. Now I'm not saying I'm good at GraphQL, but I'm sure we can figure it out. So go ahead and authorize that. And so here it says query viewer login. So it looks like we already have some kind of query that's showing who is logged in. Um, so what I would like to do is figure out how to query more stuff. Um, and I'm gonna go ask ChatGPT because it's such a powerful tool. And let's go ahead and figure this out. So I'm gonna go back over here and it, uh, we'll say, write a GraphQL query that will return public repos uh, for the uh, named Ruby um, for GitHub GraphQL API. And let's see if it can do this. This is a great feature if it can do this for um, this for us here. Because I do not like figuring out how to write GraphQL. And so here is a query that it is writing that we could possibly use. Okay, I'm assuming that's part of the language, those three hyphens. And we'll go back or periods, and we'll paste it in and see if it can work. Oh, look at that, okay, it worked. So there you go, that is a way that we could use GraphQL. GraphQL is a lot more hard than just this because you actually have to have some kind of tool um, uh, or interface in order to utilize it. But yeah, it's as simple as getting the data back that you want. There is public data and then there's data that needs to be authenticated. You have rate limits for certain stuff, so understand that you can't just get everything that you want. Let's go over to the REST API. And I'm not sure if they have, there's ways to interact with it, but sometimes what they'll do is they'll make it really easy for you to interact uh, through it here on the left-hand side. So if we went to issues, and let's say we wanted to list things, they might have some examples and we might be able to run them. Um, so here you can see we have like the GitHub CLI, but what we're really looking for is how do we do it raw? Like how can we do this um, using curl or maybe even JavaScript, but let's go ahead and do curl because that's more like API-ish. And we'll have to open up a code space for this. I think I already still have mine running. Again, try to shut yours down as much as you can so you're saving money. Um, I'm not worried about it. I'm teaching a course. I'm just gonna exp expense it. So understand that I'm a little bit more loose with this kind of stuff. The question is, will there be a curl command pre-installed in this cloud developer environment? Sometimes they don't like, like installing those in here for you, but this one does have it. So we'll go ahead and copy this command, curl, and we'll go back over here and we'll paste it in. We'll hit enter. Now this isn't gonna work because we didn't provide it an access token. So let's go over, I'm sure you know this by now, we'll go over to our personal access tokens and get it going. So all the way down to the ground, developer settings, personal access token, fine grain permissions, create a token, only issues, uh, issues, so this is for REST API. We're gonna set this for one day. That way, if you forget, it's not a big deal. And we'll say for um, all repos, I guess it doesn't matter. I'm gonna go here and I want to grab, oh, we can't do it for that. We'll say all repos. And I want issues, uh, read and write. We'll generate that token out. I'm gonna grab this token. I'm gonna to go back over to here and I need to kind of assemble it somewhere. So I need a scratch pad really quick. Just put that here and I'll paste that in. And what I'll need to do is just go above here and, and insert this. So I'll grab this, paste that in here. Okay, I'm gonna cut this out and paste this back in. And so now we should be able to Utilize this. So let's see if that works. Copy, paste. And so we don't get any issues back. Now that doesn't mean that it didn't work. It just means that there's no issues for it to find. And we really don't have any issues. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and create one. Let's say uh, my issue. 
I think originally when you created issues, you weren't able to d delete them, but now I think they've changed that and you can. Um, so I wanna try that again. If I hit up, will it bring the whole command? Yes, it will. And we're still not seeing anything. Now that doesn't mean that it's not working. It's just that uh, <laughs> it's not getting exactly what I want back. So maybe we can specify a very specific issue. It says a list of assigned, uh, this issue is assigned to the authenticated user. Now there's none assigned to us. So let's go back and um, assign it to ourselves. Okay, so we'll try that. Maybe that will help. We'll hit up and there we go. So now we're getting data back and it must be that issue. So that's all I really wanted to show you there. We'll go ahead and delete this. Okay, there's some way to delete this. Uh, they really don't like you deleting them. There it is down below in the bottom right corner. And that's all I really wanted to show you before the APIs. But most of the time you're gonna be interacting with some kind of CLI. This is in JavaScript, um, or sorry, SDK. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll see that in the next video, okay? Ciao. Let us take a look at the GitHub SDKs. And I told you Octocat would make another appearance because their uh, SDKs are called OctoKits. These are the official SDKs to programmatically interact with the Git REST API, and GitHub officially supports a few different languages. So we have JavaScript and TypeScript, C Sharp.net, Ruby, which is my favorite language. So we're absolutely gonna use that, and Terraform. So here's an example of using Terraform to uh, create a repository as infrastructure as a code. Should you use Terraform for uh, GitHub, for certain things, yes, like repos. Uh, for other things like issues, no, but just understand that sometimes Terraform gives you functionality uh, that really shouldn't be used and it's up to you to figure out for your use case. Here's an example using Ruby and make note that we are passing the access token, the, the PAT uh, to the client. Um, but yeah, there we go. <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown and this follow along, I wanna take a look at the SDKs. So we can probably use Ruby and JavaScript. Those are both very easy to use. Uh, so what I'll do is go ahead and launch my code spaces. I already have one running. Uh, you might have to make a new one. You might already have one running. Make sure you don't leave them running because they do cost money. And so it still has some stuff open from prior. It probably still has the GitHub ac uh, access token, but what I wanna do is go take a look here and type in GitHub SDKs. We'll take a look at what we have because there's a couple that we have. We have um, Ruby, JavaScript, TypeScript, C Sharp, C, um, and they should be really easy to work with. So I know they're called OctaKit, so I'll just type in OctaKit GitHub and that probably will get us to the repo for all of them. There we go, and so we can get to our Ruby one. Ooh, Terraform, let's do Terraform and JavaScript. This shouldn't be too hard. Let's do Terraform first because I'm really excited to do that one. And in order to do this, we're gonna have to have Terraform installed so that's something that I, I'm gonna want as a feature. Um, so for our mm, dev container, we're gonna have to get that feature installed. And I'm not sure where we can find that. So I'm very curious if like we get a list of uh, features. Um, list of dev container features GitHub code spaces. Cause there has to be one for Terraform. And so I'm just searching here for features, available features here. Okay, container dev features, that's how we found it. And uh, just because we're doing a little bit more here, I'm gonna go ahead and make a folder. We'll just say SDKs. And I'm just gonna say file new, readme.md. We'll go ahead and paste that on in here. Um, and we'll just say, we can uh, install the following features into our code space environment. It's just called code space. And so what I'm looking for here is the Terraform CLI. So I'll go ahead and do that. And it's right here. So I'll go ahead and grab that and we'll go back over to our dev container and um, I'll put a comma and we'll do this. We put colon queer, uh, curlies. So that's that one. Uh, while we're here, I wouldn't mind Ruby. Do we already have Ruby installed? Let's go take a look. Type in clear, Ruby. 
They might already have it pre-installed in the base image. Uh, if it is, it shouldn't take that long to run. It is, okay, so we don't have to install Ruby. Do we have Node? I think so, yeah, we do. Okay, so we don't have to install that. So really we just need um, Terraform. Now Terraform uses Git, or sorry, uh, Go, but they're all compiled, so I don't think we need to install Go onto this image if we needed it. So I wanna get this Terraform CLI installed. So I'm gonna go ahead and say install Terraform CLI. We'll go ahead and commit this. And then what we're gonna to need to do is rebuild this environment. So we'll go down below, go to command palette. I'm gonna look for rebuild. Um, I don't know if we need to do a full or a whatever. I'm gonna do that one. That seems fine to me. Let's go ahead and do that. And I'll see you back here when this is done building, okay? All right, so it rebuilt. That was really slow, but it is done. So that is good. Um, I'm not sure if we ran into any issues. Oh, come on. <laughs> it's currently running recovery mode due to configuration error. What do you mean a configuration error? I did exactly what you told me to do. It's like literally one line and I'm not allowed to do it. Okay, so let's find out what the issue is. Um, control shift P. I do not like, I do not like uh, view code spaces. Okay, let's find out what the problem is now. We'll go down below. Um, what's the problem? It's not even like easy to find the problem here. I'm just gonna zoom out for a second so I can find it quicker. Okay, it looks fine, finished. Error up here. Um, Docker build failed to build. Okay, but why? It just failed to build. Mm. No space left on the device. Well, then how am I supposed to? All right, so I was hoping that we could install it that way. If that's not gonna work, that's totally fine. I'm just gonna go ahead and comment that out. Okay, so we can just do this for now. And I'll take that out because I don't wanna fiddle with this all day. We can just install Terraform CLI um, the usual way. Okay. I'm gonna type in clear. And so I know it's in recovery mode. I really don't care. We'll just try, try to proceed forward and do what we can. So we'll go ahead and install the Terraform CLI. But you'd think with all that stuff, <laughs> it just work, it would work, right? Uh, install. And we're gonna get started. I just want the Terraform CLI install instructions. If we go here, um, we need Linux and we're choosing Ubuntu. So we're basically going through all these commands. It's that stupid GPG. I really hope that we don't have to do that. Um, I find that really frustrating. So I'm not sure if I can work around that. I think I have to get the dev container working. Let me go figure it out. I'll be back in a second, okay? I'm not sure what would fix it, but like this looks right to me. I, I don't feel like we're doing anything wrong. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop this workspace completely. I'm just gonna launch it again and see if we get any errors. And we probably will, I don't have to fiddle around with it. But uh, I mean, this is the experience of code spaces. So I'm not sure what, uh, why GitHub would want us ever to use these things, but I'm gonna go ahead and delete this, delete. And I'm gonna wait a moment here. I'm gonna go back here to our repo. I'm gonna to try to launch it again. I'm gonna see if it makes any kind of difference. Okay, we'll try this again. If it doesn't work, I'm gonna just use Gitpod. I'm, I'm not even gonna try with GitHub code spaces, but we'll see if it builds, okay? All right, so I'm back and uh, I mean, there was no error. So maybe it did run out of space. I'm not exactly sure how that works. Um, I'm not sure why it would run out of space, but that's totally fine. I'm gonna go ahead and open that up there. And I wanna see if Terraform's installed. So I'll type in Terraform and it is. So that is really good. So in our, um, our SDK directory, I'm gonna just make a couple new folders. So we'll have one for Terraform. We'll have one for Ruby and we'll do a very simple example with JavaScript as well. 
Okay, let's just say JS. And so for our Terraform one here, I'm gonna make a new main.tf file because that is how you create Terraform. And everybody should know Terraform because it is a great thing to learn. Okay, we'll type in clear. I'll go into Terraform here. And the idea is that we will want to fill some stuff in. So over here, they're saying there is a Terraform provider. And the way that works is it will link over to the registry. So um, if we go here, we'll get to the Terraform registry for Terraform. We could get it on the homepage as well by just going to providers. And there's probably one here for GitHub by typing GitHub. If it doesn't show up, we could probably just search it, um, GitHub, right? And so they should have one. I thought that'd be a lot easier to find, but apparently not. But that's okay, we'll click back. And I mean, this is one way to find it. And so the way you use a provider is you're gonna grab this over here and we'll paste that into the top. We'll say allow. And what we have here is the required providers and then any kind of configuration. In Terraform, they'll usually tell you how to configure that in the, uh, the first block here. Um, and so I'm carefully reading here. Uh, it looks like you could use a CLI to authenticate. Uh, you can also pass in the personal access token this way as well. So I'm hoping that it'll just pick up the CLI. Um, so I think that's probably our best bet. And already has a token technically installed. Whether it can create a repo is another story because we know we have to create separate tokens for that. But let's go on the left-hand side to resources and there should be something here to create a repo. Or we could just create a branch. And so let's copy this code and we'll go down here below and we'll paste it in. And so we have to say what repo it's for. So this is for the um, GitHub examples. And I want to call this branch uh, SDKs, okay? So now what I can do is type in Terraform in it. And that will initialize it. And then we can type Terraform plan. Okay, and it's saying that it's going to create this branch. Looks good to me. So now we'll do Terraform apply. I'm just going to type in auto approve because I don't want to have to hit yes. And uh, otherwise, we'd just say, say yes or no. It says that it created that branch. Now it created this Terraform lock file and some other files in here. Um, I don't want this to junk up our um, our repo, so I'm making a dot git ignore in here, and we'll go to GitHub and we'll just say GitHub uh, git ignore Terraform. And in here, what we can do is just grab that uh, Terraform one here, and this will make sure that we don't have all this junk that get, might get committed because we don't want to commit. Uh, a bunch of stuff in here. And so this is just gonna make our lives a lot easier. You can have git ignore files within subfolders. So that's kind of interesting. We go back here. Now it's a lot cleaner. That's totally fine. Let's go take a look and see if that branch was created. So if we go here and uh, refresh, making sure we're on ours and not the other one. There it is. Okay, great. And so we can also tear that down. So say terraform destroy auto approve. And so that was pretty nice. There we go. We'll go back. We'll check to see if that branch is there. It's gone. Excellent. So now let's go ahead and do a Ruby example. So for Ruby, um, we need a, two files. We need a gem file. I'll generate it out because I think that's a bit easier. So we'll CD into that. So say uh, bundle init to create a gem file. I always forget like the, these few lines here, but I think their gem is called Octo, Octo Kit. And it was their first gem, so I like I'm really familiar with uh, with that there. And so we have that installed. Let's go take a look in, uh, at that CLI and see how that works. Um, or sorry, SDK. So we have the Ruby one here. I'm going to go over to this one, and they should show some very simple instructions. Mm hmm. Uh, they're not showing much, but I'm gonna go ahead and grab this one. A lot of libraries, especially in Ruby, they'll they'll already assume that uh, there's certain um, tokens being set. So I'm hoping that it'll just pick it up. I don't have to do anything fancy. I'm gonna make a new file here called main.rb. It doesn't have to be called main, it's just what I'm calling it. 
And then the idea of the client is I want to go ahead and I want to uh, try to create a branch. So, you know, they might have like a, um, a uh, um, documentation for that. I don't want all this stuff. I just want to get to it. I want the manual. So maybe if I go over here, this is what I want. And so what I'm looking for here is uh, a way to connect or create a branch. So I'm going to click on client. And again, I've never looked at this in a long time, so I'm just guessing. But over here, client has a bunch of uh, things that we can uh, do on it. And so, I mean, there could be a method here. So I'm just going to take a look here and see if we have like branch. And it looks like we do. I want to create a branch. And I mean, we do have methods. And here it says included in repositories. So if I go over to this one, here we go. And I just want to create a branch and say create. Okay, what if I search for create branch? Create branch. I'm going to try methods up here. That might help. Create branch. <laughs> I don't know why I can't find it. I mean, I can find branches. It might be it might be the case that there is a thing for branches here. There might be like an object for it, and then we create off of it. I mean, I don't see one. Branches. What the heck? Um, I mean, it's going to be something under repositories, that's for sure. So if I go to repositories, they have an object here, and it has to be something on here. So if we carefully look, we've got fork, we've got replace. So yeah, I'm not really sure. So, well, if I don't know, I'll go ask ChatGPT and we'll see if they can make the code. Uh, create a branch using the Ruby OctoKit or GitHub. And let's see if it can do it. But normally, you know, I would just go and look for it. Um, but, you know, it's giving us a really hard time. So I don't want to waste a lot of time here looking for it. Uh, yeah, that probably would be one way to configure it. Okay, that looks fine. Okay, so you create a reference. And I guess that makes sense because you're not actually creating a branch, you're creating a reference to a branch and then the branch gets pushed later. So I suppose that makes sense. Um, they do configure it up here. Again, I don't know if we'll have to do that, but it looks like this is what we're gonna wanna do here. So I'm gonna just grab this one. I don't know if we need the SHA, but I'll grab it anyway. And I'm gonna go back to this. If you don't, if you can't find this code, I have this repo public, so you can just grab it from here. Um, and so it says, get the latest SHA from the base branch. So get the latest commit in main, main being the base, meaning, the, uh, meaning that there. Um, and then we'll create a branch from it. We'll need to specify our branch name. So we'll go back to this code. Here, I'm gonna grab these three lines because they look okay. And I'll paste this up above. And our branch here is called I mean, again, it's going to be different for you, but uh, it was to be Andrew, Andrew, WC Brown, GitHub, examples. I just noticed that I named this with a lower H, but that's okay. Um, the branch name is going to be SDKs. Uh, the base branch is main. It must have been pulled from some really old code. We'll save that. I'm going to go ahead and type in bundle exec install. That's how we install Ruby gems. Okay, and it's saying missing file operand for install. So maybe we have Ruby install, but we don't actually, we can't actually install anything. So bundle install, really? Oh, no, no, sorry, it's just bundle install. I didn't mean to write exec, that's why. And then what we can do is type in exec Ruby main.rb and it should run. Uninitialize constant octokit because we need to require it. Octokit, we'll save that. We'll go ahead and hit up. And we ran into an error. Um, it wants Faraday, try to use the middle, middleware Faraday. So um, install the Faraday retry gem. I think Faraday is for like APIs and then maybe retry is like a variation of it. I actually don't know, but we'll just try this. Bundle I might install it. There we go. And we'll go ahead and try that again. And 
now we have a 404. So octokit not found. And it's looking at GitHub examples for the commit SHA on main. So it's using this path here. I'm not sure if we could paste that in like that. This is not found commits. So that's really interesting. Um, I don't really understand why that's happening. Base branch, main, main. Yeah, that's right. Did I spell this wrong at all, maybe? I did. So we'll go ahead and hit up. I forgot the S on it. We'll try this again. And now we'll see what it complains about. Um, 404 not found. Andrew WC Brown, GitHub examples. I really don't trust that I'm writing it correctly. So I'm gonna go down below here. I'm gonna grab this exactly. I'm gonna go ahead and paste this in here exactly, okay? I'm gonna double check my name, make sure it's right. Andrew WC Brown, that's right. And it looks good to me, so I'll try this again. Still says 404, not found. Um, okay. I mean, we could try and ask ChatGPT. Maybe it's using like an old API. Uh, one thing we could do is go back to the Ruby OctaKit here and check the documentation. Okay, and in here, I'm gonna go look under, what am I looking for? Um, just trying to find, here it is. Uh, this command here. So this says create ref off of the client. And to be fair, like we did we didn't we didn't put in our token yet, so that might still be an issue. Okay, so it does have create ref on there. And that looks fine. Okay. This one says heads master. This one says Ref heads main. I don't know if that matters. I'm going to take out the refs part on it. Well, maybe that one's fine. Go back to this one. Creates ref heads master for Octocat. Hello world. Um. Just to make this a little bit more clear, I'm just gonna take this out and, and so we can simplify this, we'll say SDKs. Because again, we just want this to work. And this is for this particular repo. Sometimes simplifying the code is going to reduce our issues. And I'm gonna just take this completely out here. I wanna grab the latest SHA. So if I go into our commits over here and we're on main, we can go ahead and grab this code here and I'm just going to go ahead and replace it, okay? And so the idea is that this is going to just rule out a lot of issues that we're having, okay? And I want to bring this on down like this. And so this is going to really simplify this one, okay? Now, again, we haven't passed any tokens, so that could still be our issue, and it's still not working. I could also take out heads here and see what happens if I do that and no luck. So I'm gonna go ahead and just take, take, uh, take another look here, GitHub, um, uh, Ruby, SDK, create branch. And also we could probably check this way as well because, well, they'll have the JavaScript version, but maybe they'll have the equivalent for um, creating uh, for JavaScript, we can just look at the Ruby. What's really bizarre is they don't have the Ruby example. I think they used to, but maybe they just stopped doing that. Um, get a branch, rename a branch. I want to create a branch, work a branch, merge a branch. So I guess it's not really any of those. And so I'm going to go back over here because it, it looked like it was more of a ref. And on the left-hand side, we're going to look here in the API and try to find it. Um, maybe repositories. We'll click into repositories here. No, we'll click on this one maybe. I'll type in ref. Create ref. No. 
<laughs> we're not having a whole lot of luck here. But hey, we're learning about the APIs and being able to navigate them. That's got to count for something, right? Because it's not going to be under refs. Dependency graph, no. Actions, no, because that's going to be GitHub actions. Um, commits, no. Let me go find it. I'll be back in a second, okay? Okay, all I did in Google is type in REST API create ref, and then I went to the first one, and I think now we're in a good place. And it, there is references. It's under Git database of all things. That's a little bit confusing. A Git reference is a file that contains the Git commit SHA, et cetera, et cetera. Great. So I want to create a reference here. Can I, am I zoomed in? Oh, that's why it's so hard to read. I was too, super zoomed in. We'll scroll on down here and we have create reference. And so this is what I think that we're using, right? We're creating a reference. We have owner, repo, but they don't have a good example for this. So, you know, if this is not working, what I'm going to do is copy the JavaScript one and then we'll work our way backwards to the Ruby one and see if we can get it to work. Okay, so we'll go here. I'll just say main.js. Okay, I'll paste this on in here. And, um, you know, it's asking for the token. Again, it should really load it in via the environment variables if it's not. Um, I'm really surprised that it's just using a request and it's not using the SDK. I don't feel like this is the right one. I think this is not the SDK. Um, so I'm going to go and type in octokit. JS GitHub, and I feel like we're going to get a much better way of interacting with it. Yeah, this is going to make a lot more sense. So in here, yeah, yeah, okay, here we go. Um, so what I'll do is I'll go grab this line here. That's why it's good to know more than one language, because you can always work your way back and try to figure out what the problem is. But it's showing OctoKit here, so maybe it is actually using the kit, right? Yeah, it is. Okay, so that code is using that. Uh, we don't need app, apparently. I'm not sure what app is for, but that's fine. Uh, but I'm really surprised that we have to pass the token that way. Let's go take a look and see how we can authenticate. Um, I was just, like, hoping that it would just pick it up by default. But I'm not sure about that. They're talking about RB, like uh, OctoKit RB. Um, actually, this is the Ruby one again, so I'm on the wrong page. Let's back into this one. And yeah, I meant to be over here. I'm looking for authentication. Here it is. Yeah, I'm not sure how it picks it up. Well, I guess we'll bring in the token then. Um, what I'll do is, I, is I'll have to bring in a token. So we'll go here, we'll go to settings, and maybe that would fix the Ruby one. Maybe that was the Ruby problem the entire time. I'm gonna go ahead and drop this down, find grain permissions. I'm gonna delete this old one. I'm gonna create a new one. And I'm gonna just say uh, create branch, which is really creating ref. That's what we're actually trying to do. And I'm going to go ahead and go to the next one here, and we'll say for select repos, this will be for our only repo, and we need to go through permissions. So I'm looking for references, ref, database, API. Like, where would this be? Would it be under repositories? So I'm going to choose this one. I'm going to choose the repo one if I can find it. Oh, it is that one right there. Uh, read and write. Um, maybe this one, because that's repo creation. Commit statuses. I'm just kind of picking a lot so we have a good chance of this working. I'm going to go count permissions. Um, don't think I need any of those. So I think that's fine. I'm going to go ahead and generate this token out. I'm going to grab this token, go back over to our environment, and I'm going to go ahead and set this as export gh uh, token and then we'll go ahead and paste this in and do that we'll type in clear we'll do grep env 
GH to make sure that we can uh, find that there. Oh, I got that backwards. ENV grep GH. The token is set. And so what I want to do here now is make sure it gets picked up. I'm going to test the Ruby one here and just see if it, if it makes a difference. And uh, it does not. Another thing I might try is go back in here and explicitly set that token. I believe we can set that as access token. And I can say ENV GH token. And so that would be a very explicit way to get it. I'll hit up again. Oh, there's no problem now. Okay, so maybe it was a token the entire time. Like that was the issue. So what I'll do is I'll go back over to our repo. Again, that was all just guesswork, you know. You gotta have confidence, you gotta try things. And I'll go over here and drop it down and there it is. So that definitely did work. Um, I don't want this branch right now, so I wanna go ahead and delete it. We can go to our branches here and I'm gonna go ahead and delete this branch. And I want to delete it again. I just want it gone. It's gone, I think. And so now we have our Ruby one working. So now we need to get our JavaScript one working. And it wants a token as well. The way we bring in environment variables is a little bit different. Um, it uses like process. So it'd be like import process. I always kind of forget. Maybe we don't have to import anything at all. Um, we'll say reference a nvar or like call an nvar in Node.js file example. Yeah, it is processed, but do we need to import it? Uh-huh. So I'm thinking maybe we don't need to even import anything for it. I'm gonna just go ahead and try this. Uh, we'll go back over here. I'm just gonna paste this in. GH token. And so I'm not confident whether it's getting imported or not. So what I'm gonna do is do a console log that should print out the token, token, dollar sign, uh, or maybe it's backticks. I know a lot of languages, so I get confused easily. Um, okay, so that's in there like that. Um, So here we have the reference. It looks like these replace these placeholders. So we'll have to specify the owner. I'm the owner, so this is gonna be um, Andrew WC Brown. We'll need to have the SHA. So I'll go back over here and grab it from here. Okay. And we'll paste that in. This is gonna be SDKs. I'll put JS so we're really sure we know what we're using here. Uh, the repo is going to be GitHub examples. Okay. And I'm going to make my way over to that directory uh, for JavaScript. Now I'm going to want the git ignore for JavaScript in particular, git ignore JavaScript. I didn't do it for Ruby because Ruby doesn't really make that much junk files. So it wasn't a serious issue, but if you really wanted to, you could go ahead and, and um, uh, grab it if you wanted. So go ahead and grab that. And we'll go back over here to here and we'll say dot git ignore. And if anyone's wondering, I'm like watching when my test is gonna come up here. So I'm just kind of getting nervous. Uh, not because the test is hard. I just want, don't wanna forget about it and then miss uh, sitting the GitHub Foundations certification course. So that is now in there. So that won't dump a bunch of junk files in when, when it adds that. I wanna add that right away. So add the git ignore. Sometimes it won't take effect unless you add it right away. I know I spelled that wrong, I don't care. Um, and so I'm gonna go and type in npm install. I'm gonna imagine that this is Octokit as well. It has to be, because <laughs> it's called Octokit.js. Sometimes like the files might be a little bit different, like Octokit hyphen period JS or JS after it. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna do an npm install. Oh, it's already installed. But, and so what we'll do is go over here and take a look. And we now have a package JSON. And I want to run as, I don't know why I didn't put it in here, but I want to have a script in here. I'm going to go ahead and just type in npm init because it really didn't give me a whole lot. I really don't like that I didn't get stuff here. And so it overwrote it. And I'm going to just install it again. And that way I don't have to fiddle with it so much. So now I have the scripts and I can just say start. And what I'm going to do here is just say um, node 
main.js. Okay, and so now, if we call on there, we should be able to do npm uh, start, and that should try to run that script. Um, it didn't like the import for some reason. To load ES module types, um, you have to load something, something. So I think it's just the style that we're using there. That's totally fine. I'm gonna have to go to the top here and change this to be require, I guess. Um, we'll go back to the, our JavaScript here. I'm gonna go all the way to the top. And I need a different way to import it. Um, this one is what we want. It could be the node version that's installed here, but I really don't think that's the case. But I'm gonna go ahead and do that. That's easy enough to fix. And we'll hit enter. And await is only valid in async functions at, at, at the top level bodies of modules. Okay, I mean, I really don't care if it's a, uh, async. Can I just take it out? Will that work? The token printed out, so that's good. Um, we'll go back over here, see if our branch created, just refresh on branches. It did, perfect, great. So now that means we can go ahead and commit this. Just double, triple check your files, make sure you're not committing anything you're not supposed to commit. Don't commit your token. Go ahead and commit this. I'm just in a hurry for my exam. And we'll just say uh, SDK stuff, SDK. I'm gonna go ahead and commit that. I'm gonna say, okay, sync, sync, sync. I'm gonna go back over here. I'm gonna switch accounts. <laughs> I'm in a big hurry. Uh, you know, I'll stop your code spaces. Don't waste your money. And um, I'm gonna go over to our repo here. Um, and I actually wanna be in the exam pro one, exam pro co. Exam pro co. Okay, I'm gonna make a new pull request. I want to merge, um, compare across forks. And I wanna grab this one and bring it over into that one. Boom. It's just <laughs> SDKs, SDKs. I really shouldn't be silly like that. You should take, take time naming your pull request. And wait a moment, merge it, we're done. I'll see you in the next one, ciao. Hey, it's Angie Brown, and we are taking a look at GitHub Desktop. So this is a standalone application to interact with GitHub repos without the browser or via code. And it can do common Git and GitHub operations that you can perform via the GUI for an easy to use experience. It works for both Mac OS, Windows, and Linux. So yeah, it's a very useful tool. Um, you know, when you look at Git as uh, a, a thing that you can use. A lot of times there are these other kind of um, standalone applications specifically around Git to make Git actions easier, but this does two things. It does Git and GitHub. So it is very powerful if you are using the GitHub platform. So I recommend you give it an install, okay? Hey, this is Angie Brown and this fall along, I wanna take a look at installing GitHub desktop and see what we can do with it. So. What I'm gonna do is open up a new tab and just type in GitHub desktop and we'll find our way over there. So here it is uh, at desktop.github.com and we can go ahead and proceed to install this. So I'm on Windows right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and just download that, okay? All right, and so that's finished downloading. Let's go ahead and install it. So it should be pretty straightforward. I'm gonna double click the executable. If you're on a Mac, of course you drag it into your applications. For Linux, I have no idea, but I imagine it's not too hard to install. And I'm just waiting for it to um, prop, uh, uh, pop up here and proceed with installation. So you can see my computer is thinking. There we go, it's starting to open up. All right, so we'll wait for that to finish its install. There we go, it looks like it's installed and we can log in either into github.com or GitHub Enterprises. So let's go ahead and uh, log into github.com. You can see we can sign into uh, either or. I think I'm interested right now in this repo here. So I'm gonna select this one and we'll go ahead and authorize it. Um, and it says, when your phone is ready, click the button below. So I'm gonna use GitHub mobile to confirm because we have UFA. So just give me a moment. And while I'm waiting here, I guess I have to press the button. I wasn't doing that. And so it pops up with 14 and um, I have a pseudo request. And so I'll just share my screen here for just a moment. But what it's showing me here is I have to enter those two digits in. So that's what I mean where sometimes it, it uh, pops up 
or other times it's just confirmation. It's going to really depend on the action that's being performed. Let's go ahead and open this up in GitHub Desktop. And we can see that it's setting our name and email. So it's like it's con it is configuring Git underneath. Um, so that is interesting there. We'll go ahead and uh, click Finish. And I mean, we got tutorials and other stuff here, but I'm not really interested in that. I just want to open up the repo that we already have. So let's go ahead and open that up. And I guess we're cloning it. And it's actually showing us that we're going to clone it in a specific location. Here it's putting in documents, GitHub. I guess that's fine. Uh, we go over to GitHub, your uh, github.com. I suppose we can just select the repo and it'll put the path there. So there's two different ways that we can do it here. I'm not sure which way is better, but I'll go ahead and do uh, this method here because it just seemed a little bit simpler. And so now we have our repo pulled up and so we can perform stuff here. Um, so you uh, you have changes on this branch. Would you like, what would you like to do with them uh, to contribute them to the parent project? Um, I, I don't know, I just, <laughs> I just opened it up. Why am I already getting asked questions? You have changes on this branch. Would you, what would you like to do with them? To contribute to the parent project for my own purposes. This will help you contribute to this repo. I guess the top one, maybe it's just trying to tell me what I want to do or not do. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but now we have this opened. And so the idea is that if we make changes, we can do something in here. It looks like we can also open up our repo directly here in Visual Studio Code. So I can go ahead and click this. I guess the nice part of this is that I don't need to have any compute attached. Um, in order to uh, work with this. So normally you'd have to have uh, get installed here and just say, I accept this. And so we could go in here, I'll go into our crash course here. I'll just add another exclamation mark. If it ever lets me here, good. I'll just say save. And I'll go back over to here and it shows that we have a change. Uh, let's take a look at history. So we have um, history over time. I would really prefer a graph. I'm not sure if they actually have like a graph mode in here. So this isn't like super useful. A lot of other uh, Git programs, like there's one called Kraken, like Git Kraken. Um, they say it's a legendary tool. I think it's a little bit heavy, but the point is, is that they will have a, a much better visualization in terms of what is going on. So, you know, this tool is okay but it's not the best tool. You can create, uh, you can push, pull, fetch. You can view stuff here. You can open up the command prompt. Um, so there are some things you can do. You can do stuff with branches, um, but it's really up to what workflow you're working in because of course, you know, if you're already using Visual Studio Code, you don't really need this tool because we can do uh, everything and much more here. And then there's also a GitHub plugin that we can utilize. So, um, you know, GitHub Desktop existed before uh, Visual Studio Code and before the Visual Studio Code extension. So, um, you know, it's there and, you know, maybe if you're using a different editor or some, or maybe you couldn't install the extension or something like that, there'd be a use case for GitHub Desktop. Again, it's not bad, but, um, you know, it is, it is what it is. Uh, it is very good at keeping uh, your repos in a particular location and managing, managing them. So that is really good there. But again, why they haven't added a visualization, I have no idea. But there you go. That is GitHub Desktop. Um, as far as, as much as we want to cover it here and we'll see you the next one. Ciao. Let us compare the difference between github.com and github desktop for the following, uh, comparisons. So let's start at the top here. So for github.com, it is a web-based interface access via the browser. The github desktop is a standalone desktop application for accessibility. The github.com is accessible anywhere there is internet and the GitHub desktop is only where you install it on your computer. For repo management, it directly manages repositories online. For GitHub desktop, it manages repos locally. For basic Git operations, github.com performs operations like fork, star, and watch. GitHub desktop, um, simplified interface for commit, pull, uh, push. And so notice it says fork star and watch. Those aren't really Git operations. Those are GitHub operations. I just want to clarify that. Um, for collaboration, direct collaboration tools like issues and PRs, focuses on local repo management. Um, then for advanced Git features, supports advanced features via commands, simplified experience for basic features, integration tools, integrates with various online CICD tools, and limited to local Git tools. So these are not like hard rules for all of them, but um, it's just a general distinction between the two, but there you go.
GitHub Mobile is a mobile application you can install on iOS or Android phones to perform read-only basic GitHub repo management tasks. It can manage triage and clear notifications, read, review, collaborate on issues and pull requests, edit, edit files and pull requests, search for, browse, and interact with user repos and organizations, receive a push notification when someone mentions your username, search through code in a specific repo, secure your github.com account with two-factor authentication. And that is the primary reason I tell you to install it is for that, as it, I find it very useful. Verify your signed in attempts on unrecognized devices. GitHub mobile can be used for UFA, which is a convenient way over other methods. And I definitely agree with that. For everything else, you know, I'm not really sure. I think the thing about this particular product, um, I really should have highlighted this, is it's really good for triage and people that need to stay um, uh, stay up to date with what's going on. So people that maybe they're a sysops administrator or something like that. Um, so GitHub mobile becomes very, very important. And uh, even though it doesn't show up in the exam, it's in the exam guide outline, they really want you to know about mobile notifications to stay on top of stuff. So we'll look at that next, okay? Let us take a look at mobile notifications on GitHub. Just understand that these are the settings on Android. I have no idea what they are for iOS. Maybe they're different, maybe they're the same. I would imagine they're the same, but different UIs. But we just wanna make sure we cover our bases because the exam guide outline wants us to know this, probably for people that try to triage things when issues happen in GitHub. So let's quickly look at it. So you can set push notifications you want to receive. So we can say direct mes me uh, mentions, review requested, assigned, deployment review, pull request review, and workflow runs. Uh, you can set the working hours to only receive push notifications for specific periods of time. So that way you're not getting annoyed when it's your weekend or it's your time off. Um, you can set swipe options on notifications to perform save, mark as read, mark as done, or unsubscribe. So you can go left or right on that. Um, you can change the app style notification. This might be specific to Android, but making sure that you can see the type of alert you want to see. So it grabs your attention. So you jump on top of it and there you go. Let us take a look at the types of GitHub accounts. We've got three, personal, organizational, and enterprise. So for personal accounts, these are individual accounts with a username and profile. They can own resources like repos and projects and actions are taken uh, based on the personal account. They can either be GitHub free and GitHub pro, which we will definitely describe in this section of the course. Then you have organization accounts. I said organizational above, organization, just think of them as the same thing, whichever language you want to use. Shared accounts where we have multiple people collaborating on projects. They can own resources just, like, uh, just as the personal account has. Um, and these are generally managed through individual personal accounts. I say generally because um, when we are going through setting up our organization, we have the option to convert our personal account into some kind of business. Um, so we didn't go through that. And generally, I've always known this to be through personal accounts. The exam is not gonna test you either, either way, but I just wanna point that out. Organizations offer different roles with varying levels of access and constant security features. Those roles are predefined. Um, if you want more flexible custom roles, you'd have to have enterprise for that. Enterprise accounts, so this is part of the GitHub Enterprise Cloud and GitHub Enterprise Server. These accounts allow for central management of multiple organizations. They're geared towards larger setups needing centralized policies and building management, or if you have to have internal Git, uh, uh, GitHub repos, which is a, a specific type of GitHub repo specifically for enterprise. The exam, surprisingly for me, asks a lot of uh, enterprise specific questions, which I don't really think is fair for the GitHub Foundation. So I'm just telling you up front, you're gonna have to remember some factoids for enterprises if you want to max out your points on the exam. Let's take a quick look at GitHub personal and organizations before we move on here. So as you can see, you get a profile. If you look at the top right corner, it is based on your username. So github.com forward slash uh, uh, forward slash Omen King there. And if you had a repo, the repo is gonna have uh, your, your, your username followed by the repo name, okay? For organizations, it's very similar. It also has a public profile page. Uh, it also has a username and um, it's, not, it's not exactly the same, but it's the same concept, but it's gonna follow the same pattern for uh, repos. So repos can either have an org name or a username, okay? So there you go.
All right, let us compare GitHub free versus pro. And I just want to warn you that the exam might ask you one of these things. So it becomes a little bit more important to remember the differences between them. Is it fair for an exam? Not really, but it's just how they made their exam. So I just want to point that out that you have to remember some factoidal information here. So we have GitHub free and GitHub pro. So let's go through the GitHub free features. You get GitHub community support, dependabot alerts, deployment protection rules for public repos, two-factor authentication enforcement, 500 megabytes of GitHub packages storage, 120 gig, uh, GitHub code spaces core hours per month, 15 uh, gigabytes of GitHub code spaces storage per month, GitHub action features such as 2,000 minutes per month, deployment protection rules for public repos. I'm not sure why it's listed under there because that makes no sense, but that's where they put it. And so basically um, in GitHub Pro, you get everything you'd get in free with addition of GitHub support via email, 3000 GitHub actions per uh, minute per month. So an extra thousand, two gigabytes of gig GitHub, pa uh, GitHub packages storage, 180 GitHub code spaces core hours per month, 20 gigabytes of GitHub code spaces storage per month, advanced tools and insights in uh, private repos, you have required pull request reviewers, multiple pull request reviewers, protected branches, code owners, automated link references, GitHub pages, wikis, and repo insights graphs. If you don't know what all this stuff is right now, do not worry because we're covering basically all of it, like working with all these tools, and then you should come back and re uh, review this again so you have it for your knowledge when you take the exam, okay? Ciao. <laughs> For GitHub organizations, there are three type of plans. We have free, teams, and enterprise. I put an asterisk there because this is more an upsell to the enterprise um, uh, uh, account. Uh, but when you go and you try to buy, it will show you there the enterprise option. So just pointing that out. Let's talk about free. So you get everything that was in GitHub free with the addition of team access controls for managing groups, 2,000 GitHub action minutes per month, 500 megabytes of GitHub packages uh, storage. Um, and I don't really understand those last two because it, is it for the org or is it for the personal account that has the org, but it's in there, okay? Then we have Teams, and this is where we start paying. Everything from GitHub org in the free edition with also GitHub support via email, 3,000 GitHub actions uh, minutes per month, two gigabytes GitHub package storage, advanced tools and insights in private repos, required pull request reviewers, multiple pull request reviewers. And notice that the minutes for GitHub Actions and packages look very similar to um, the pro, plan, pro account for the GitHub uh, Personal Pro. And there is more, so let's keep going. Uh, we have draft pull requests, team pull request reviewers, protected branches, code owners, scheduled reminders, GitHub pages, wikis, Repo Insights Graphs, the option to enable or disable GitHub code spaces. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is the code owners because that is quite a unique feature. We'll talk about that when we get to wherever that is in the course. Um, but I think that one is one worth remembering out of the Teams functionality. Also draft pull requests, I'd try to remember those two in particular as those are very specific and unique features and they both showed up on my exam so just Make a note of that, okay? All right, let's take a look here at GitHub Enterprises deployment options because they have two kind that you can have. Uh, we have GitHub Enterprise Cloud. This is when you want to have a hosted version of the Enterprise Edition on github.com. And then you have GitHub Enterprise Server. This is a uh, self-hosted one. So let's take a look at uh, what we have for our deployment options in terms of feature set. On the GitHub Enterprise for both cloud and server, they're gonna share this same functionality. For, so first of all, they're gonna have everything that organization teams has, but they're gonna get GitHub Enterprise support. They're gonna get additional security compliance deployment controls, authentication with SAML uh, single sign-on, um, and accessing provisions uh, provisioning with SAML and SCIM. They make a large emphasis on this in the exam. In fact, I totally thought it didn't matter. And then I got a bunch of questions on this on my exam. And I was like, really? 
But uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to make a couple slides on that in our enterprise section because they really want you to know that that is an offering for enterprise. Um, deployment protection rules with GitHub Actions for private or internal repos. And that again is a feature specific to enterprises. So make note of that as well. We have GitHub Connect. Actually, I actually don't even know what that is. Um, I'll have to, I guess, make a slide on that as well. Option to purchase the GitHub Advanced Security. So that is a um, some kind of additional feature. For specific features, we have 50,000 GitHub Action minutes per month, 50 gigabytes of GitHub packages storage, a service level agreement of 99.9% .9 monthly uptime, option to centrally manage policies and billing for multiple github.com orgs with an enterprise account. This was a question on my exam as well, and I was not prepared for it. Um, they never asked for like minutes. I think this kind of information, I never saw that there. So you don't have to really worry about that. We have options to provision and manage the user accounts for your developer by using the uh, EMUs. Um, I'm glad we never had any questions on those, but uh, EMUs seem like they're really involved, but I imagine that would be in that GitHub administrator um, or administration or administrator certification. But there you go. <laughs>
and you should do it if you have the option to do so because it makes things so much easier to read. We have footnotes, we have heading IDs, which I've never used before. We have definition lists, which I've never used before. We have strike throughs, highlight, which I've never used before. It might be fun to try that out. Emojis, which I love and GitHub has great support for. And we have task lists, which um, GitHub, this, this one's a really useful one. Then we have subscript and superscript. And I've used those in a few cases, but uh, yeah, there you go. That is the Markdown extended syntax. <laughs> So in GitHub, when you ever have to write something that is Markdown supported, it's gonna have this text formatting toolbar. And it allows you to uh, utilize GitHub flavored Markdown syntax, which we'll talk about in the GitHub flavored Markdown syntax section. And it appears right here. And so the idea is that you can uh, press these buttons and it's gonna make your life a lot easier. You also notice that a lot of times you'll have a preview as well. So that uh, makes it very easy to turn that raw Markdown into uh, the final product, the HTML rendered in terms of what it'll look like to the end user. Um, and so I find that super useful, okay? Let us take a look at slash commands. So these are uh, functionality, at least within common boxes, but allow convenient features such as formatting markdown. And I'm implying that there could be other functionality, but right now it only does uh, markdown and it's a beta feature. Oddly enough, even though it's a beta feature, it appears on the exam because GitHub apparently puts beta features in their exams, which I think is bizarre, but whatever. So let's say you wanted to create a table, you basically get this WYSIWYG and you go through it. The idea is that you can put that forward slash to start triggering that um, uh, line of prompts and it can make your life uh, a lot easier. And actually it is a good idea, but um, again, you know, beta feature probably shouldn't be an exam, but hey, that's how GitHub rolls, okay? <laughs> Let us take a look here at GitHub flavored Markdown, also known as GFM. This is a dialect of Markdown that is currently supported for user content on GitHub.com and GitHub Enterprise. GFM provides powerful functionality such as collapsible sections, embedded mathematical expressions, embedded diagrams, relative paths or linking to files in the same repo, task lists that can be converted into issues, extended formatting for tables, shorthands to auto links to issues, pull requests and repos, render code snippets from other code bases via linking and more. Um, and we can see the whole detailed spec at GFM spec uh, website here. So that's at github.com forward slash GFM. It's a really good read and I'm being sarcastic because it is very dry, but let's take a look at the functionality we're listing here on the left-hand side so you have a really clear idea of what you can do. So the first that I think is really cool is having um, better syntaxes, or sorry, a control over your tables. So here you can actually have embedded syntax within the table cells, which is not a normal thing you can usually do with Markdown. Another thing is more uh, control over the look or formatting of your tables. So you can uh, better align that stuff. I imagine that they have things like merging cells and uh, excluding the headers. I think that they have that, but um, these are the two that I can remember that are a big deal. Um, they have this details tag and this allows you to have collapsible sections. Uh, it has support for mermaid. So this allows you to render things like um, uh, DAGs, dicrylic, direct acrylic graphs. It's just a type of graph, okay? Um, we have GeoJSON and TopoJSON. This allows you to create interactive maps. So here's an example of GeoJSON, and then here's an example of TopoJSON. I imagine that they render a bit differently, so one might be better than the other in terms of information shown. Then we can uh, render 3D models, so that's kind of cool. Um, it can render mathematical expressions, and I really know LaTeX because so I used to work for a math uh, educational startup. And so you have your double dollar sign for your latex, or you can use uh, fencing blocks, code blocks and have math. This is using math jacks. So if you're wondering what implementation, that's what it's using. And so those will both render out the same thing based on what syntax you want to use. Um, if you have links, they'll automatically be linked. That's not like a GitHub specific thing, but it is something that um, they have set their defaults for their markdown to do. But what is really interesting are these quick links. So the idea is if we do pound 26 or gh hyphen 26, it'll create hyperlinks. And these hyperlinks will go to issues, which is super useful. 
Um, might call for pull requests as well because they usually treat the numbers as the same. So like if you make an issue one and you make a pull request, the next ID will be two in your project, if that makes sense. Within comments, you can quickly link to other repos. So if you have something that looks like a repo, it's gonna go to a repo. Uh, that would be the final product, uh, produce there. And then you can also link things based on um, commit SHAs. So yeah, a lot of cool linking. Um, task list can be, uh, can with, uh, can be, op can to be turned into open issues, kind of wrote that a bit weird. You can associate tasks to specific issues, creating basically subtasks. GitHub can keep track of your open or closed state of linked issues. You can on click turn a task and associate with an issue. So here is your usual task list, but notice there's like little icons and stuff. Um, and you can also reorder them. So a lot of great uh, additional functionality that is on the rendered side or uh, on the markdown side that is new. Um, but yeah, that is GFM. You should know some of the stuff because it really does make it a lot easier to work on GitHub. But there you go. Ciao. All right, so in this fall along, what I wanna do is get some practice with Markdown. There's a few ways that we can uh, work with Markdown here. Um, we could uh, edit files in line, we could use github.dev, we could open up code spaces. But I just wanna show you, um, you know, a few things that we can do here. So maybe what I should do is go over to our new repo, GitHub examples, and we should try to uh, utilize um, some of the abilities of creating stuff without opening up an editor because I know the exam, they might ask you that. And so I figured a little bit of practice with that would be good. So let's say we wanna make a new folder here. What we can do is we go ahead and add a new file and we will create a new file. And in order to create a, a new folder, all we gotta do is type a forward slash. I'm gonna say markdown uh, here and put a forward slash. And now we have a folder and we now have ourselves a readme file. Now I didn't mean to hit forward slash there. I think it just, happened prematurely, so I just hit backspace. I can type in MD, and notice right away that we can start writing Markdown. Okay, so we can go here and flip between them. They really want to use Copilot. I do not care about Copilot. And I'll go ahead and just say uh, Markdown, uh, Markdown Examples. And what we'll do is we'll work through some here. So again, I'm just gonna show you that you can commit uh, this, but let's make a list of things that we should learn how to do headings. We should know how to do, uh, and I'm already writing Markdown as a list, headings, uh, unordered lists. We should have ordered lists, um, uh, formattings like uh, text formatting, code, uh, tables, auto links, lists. Um, we could also have like images, links, images. Okay, so that's a pretty good list of things that we can learn how to do. And I think that's a good start. So let's say unordered list. I'm gonna go ahead and commit that change. So I just wanna show that you can commit directly with files and update files here. And that's really, really nice. And you can see that stuff rendered in place. But I think what's gonna make this a lot easier to work with is to uh, use that github.dev now that I know about it before we used to just edit these or open up um, uh, a cloud developer environment, what we can do is press a very special button called period. So if we press in period, what that's gonna do is open up github.dev. You should really remember that because it will show up as an exam question. They might try to trick, uh, trick you by asking you about a comma, which is not a thing. I hit period, but it didn't do anything. I hit period again. And I think it had to like move or something there. And now it's gonna open it up in github.dev. And so this is a great environment for us to learn Markdown because we can render things in real time very, very quickly. And then we don't have to have like a bunch of small commits and um, make a big mess. So here we have Markdown, open up our readme. And in the top right corner, there's this little icon. I know it's hard to see. I don't know if I can make it larger. There we go. It looks like this. I have no idea why it looks like a key, but if you click it, it splits the window and we can see our markdown. Okay, so let's go through and figure this out. So the first thing are headings. So this is a heading up here. This is a heading one. If we can go, we do this, this is heading one. And now we'll just do heading two, headings. And I feel like we already kind of figured that out because we're, we're doing that. So I'm not sure if we really need to have that as we know what headings are. So we'll say unordered lists. And we'll just uh, say unordered lists. Yeah, we can create unordered lists. 
in Markdown using hyphens. Okay. And while we're doing this, let's open up uh, GitHub flavored Markdown because maybe there's some things that are there that might be interesting to take a look at. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab this link. I'm gonna dump it in. Remember that just auto links as soon as we paste it in here. And if we go here, we could see that there is a bunch of stuff. So there could be something for lists. I'm not seeing anything for lists. I'm gonna type in lists here, lists, container blocks, lists. Um, notice they have a minus or a plus. So it looks like that breaks it up into separate ones. So we can give that a go. Let's just go ahead and copy these and take a look at what we get. So we do this and that will treat this as two separate lists. I guess we can have pluses or minuses. Didn't know that, that's cool. Again, these are extensions to uh, the, the regular one. And then we can have our unordered lists. Or sorry, our ordered lists. Okay. So it's interesting that, you know, you can do one, two, and then have three, but notice if you repeat three multiple times, it will increment from there and it starts from where it incremented. Um, so I think that's really cool. You can also just have them all the same number if you want. So you don't have to really worry about that, but that's a nice way of splitting. Again, never knew that because I never bothered opening this up till now. Um, so there's that. Uh, let's go take a look at uh, text formatting. So we have, let's say bold. So if we are so supposed to do italics first. So italics is gonna be this, okay? Scrolling down so we can see it. Bold, it's gonna do that every single time, eh? Bold can be this, doubles. And see how it like formats it as well so you can kind of have an idea. You could also probably do bold with underscores, I think. Apparently it does italicize. I guess you can do one or the other. So I was kind of wrong, but I guess we could do it this or that way. Not all Markdown um, parsers do that though. Some might treat um, uh, underscores exclusively as a bold. So understand that. Let's try to strike through. Strike through. We have to use doubles for some reason. There we go. Does Markdown give us anything or GFM? Does it give us anything fun? We'll go all the way to the top here. Um, characters and lines. Hmm. I mean, apparently, apparently it pays attention to tabs. That's cool. Um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure, but maybe there is something else there. Some inline stuff. So that's fine. Uh, we'll go to the next one. We have code. So for code here, we'll say code. What we'll want to have here is stuff like um, backtick. So we might say um, something as like, puts hello Ruby. So that's how you say, that's how you print in Ruby. Hello world. Notice that it has this interesting formatting. So it's different from like whether we were to bold. So if we were to do the same thing, it wouldn't be really the same thing, right? If we did this in bold, that's great, but we'll take out the back ticks. But like, this is a lot better when you have something inline. So you can print to the terminal using the command. So that's really good when you want inline code. So say like inline code, multi-line code. So here I could do triple back ticks. It will say without highlighting. With highlighting. Okay, so we'll say something like def hello world and puts hello world. And I'll copy this, I'll bring this down here, we'll do RB. And so notice this one's highlighted and this one's not. So really try to do those high highlights as you can. Um, I think they say like what it's using underneath. So there's probably, I can't remember what it is. But uh, they say in the documentation, in the getting started, like what syntax highlighting program they're using. And so you can probably look up these codes, but for the most part, you can guess. I don't know if like I typed in Ruby, if that would still work as well. It looks to be the same. Yeah, it's the same. So Ruby or the extension. Okay, so there's that. Uh, we have tables. So we'll go down below here. I really don't like making tables, but we can try this here. 
We could use that text toolbar to make it really easy, but I'm not going to do that. Um, so somewhere here should be tables, 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 tables. I'm going to search tables. Here it is, extension. Okay. So some things are like clear extensions and other things are just like the settings they use as their default. So we'll go down here. And so this is a basic table. Okay. You always use three for this. I'm not sure why, but it's always three and you have to follow this format. Here is something that looks like more about um, changing the alignment. So go here, make sure we're at the right levels here. Um, so maybe you don't have to have that. So cells in one column don't need to match the length. Okay, so basically you can do whatever you want here. And does it stretch it more if we go more? No, it doesn't. So it says it's one or whatever, but standard markdown would only have uh, three. So that's uh, like that's nice that you don't have to do exactly exactly three every time. Um, so that's piped content. Okay, that's fine. I see something a little bit more exotic. That's kind of interesting. So I think I'd make an empty cell in this case. I think I'm missing the uh, one in the front here. Uh, that didn't render out. So despite it being in there, oh, you know, this one's missing. That's why it's getting confused. And this one's missing. So what if I take this one out? No, this one just does not render. So I'm not sure why they show that as an example because that doesn't render. Oh, it will not be recognized. Okay. <laughs> I thought for some reason it would be like it'd leave an empty space. Let's try this one. There we go. So we have an empty space in this case, but in this case it doesn't. So I guess you have to have the full length. And if there's one, like if you don't have the full length of one, then it won't work. Okay. Looks like we can just have a heading or is it a body? Yeah, just the heading. So I know there's more to it than that, but um, for whatever reason, that's what it's showing up there. We could take a look at block quotes. Um, this is kind of interesting. I've never seen that much for block quotes before. Let's go block quote. Let's say when you're doing like a quote for somebody or like you're making like a note. So that's really interesting. Usually I would just do this like um, uh, the cloud is amazing, right? So you do that. But here we're actually getting some different levels here. I never knew you could do that. Let's try this block quote. Okay, this one is similar. Nothing super exciting there. So yeah, that's interesting. Let's go back to our top. We have um, block quotes. I can't spell block quotes. Do this for your block quotes. And I'll go all the way down to the bottom here or back to the top. Uh, images, images, we'll do images and links. This should really be over here. So something we could do is if we wanted to make a link, we could link, um, let's say we wanted to uh, link this. I'm just gonna copy this here, unordered lists. And we could put squares around it like this. Okay, and notice as soon as I hit pound, this is specific to GitHub, but it can link to the anchors that it sees on the page. So if I wanna link to this unordered list, uh, it'd be this, right? So this would map to that, which is really nice. So if I click that, it would jump to that part of the page, okay? You can also do relative links to other stuff. So if I had like um, a file in here, I'd just say uh, secret, secret.md. Uh, we say this secret page. Hopefully I spelt that right. Secret, 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 secret. Okay. That other one looks right to me. I can't really tell the difference. Um, so, you know, like for links, I just want to link to that. So these links are going to be, become very useful here in a second. So say links. Let's try this again. Link, 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 link. Do we not have a heading for this yet? So I'll go down here. Links. Go all the way back to the top. Links, and I can just jump to that here on the right hand side. And so maybe we want to go to that secret page. So I'm going to do squares, uh, parentheses, and this is going to be this part is the text, I think, um, secret page. And so this goes to the secret page. So now what I can do is I could type in um, 
I'm trying to think of how I do this relative. So now see how it's auto-completing. So if I do this, let's actually jump to that, right? So, and I don't think you need that. You probably do that as well. It would still go there. And so this is a great way to navigate around when you have a lot of pages. Again, this is specific to GitHub. Um, so other things might not do that. Uh, we can just put a link out to anywhere here. So let's say we want to do um, something out to like github.com. We can say GitHub website and we just type in HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash github.com. If something looks like a link, it will turn it into a link. So that's really nice as well. It might be fun to try out that repo thing. Remember the link in auto links. So let's say we did uh, issue one. I wonder if it would render in here. Uh, it didn't, but you know, this might be contextual based on where it is. So this might only work in comments. And I actually think that in my, um, my slide, that's actually what it says is that um, it should, that it only works in comments. So we might have to go test that out here in a moment. Um, so is there anything else that we're missing? We didn't do images. Usually you drag images in here and then they'll, they'll, they'll populate. So I'll show that somewhere else, but we'll consider this our markdown stuff here. We'll say markdown examples. Okay. The other thing we didn't do was I think a list. So if I did this, I could say like item one, I put a space here. So say uh, task list, um, double here and say item one, item two. I'm not sure if it'll work here. It's not rendering it. That doesn't mean it's not working. It just doesn't render here. And so we'll go ahead and um, just commit these changes, make sure we get all of them. So I'm just gonna add this, refresh, got them all in here and we'll commit that. So let's go take a look at some of the other markdown stuff that we're not gonna see here. Um, so what I wanna do is go back to this repo. So there's a link here. I think Codespaces doesn't, I think last time I was looking for it, I couldn't find it. And so what we might wanna do is look at an issue and play around with markdown here. So we don't have any issues in this repo right now. So I'm gonna make a new issue. Um, and apparently we can link to pull requests and other things like that. So I might need to do a little bit more than just what we're doing here, but anyway, I'll just say um, GitHub fun, or sorry, Git or Markdown fun. Learning how to use Markdown. And so what we could do here is make a list. So let's try the forward slash because that's something they want us to know. And I mean, we could use this for a few different things. Adds a detail section to hide and show stuff. So that's kind of cool. It dropped that in there. And we could just say my to-do list. Apparently it has a summary, it didn't tell us that before. We go here, we see how we have this nice drop down. Um, I don't know if we need this interior P, but what I wanna do is make a list. I could try doing forward slash to see what else we have here. Nothing really interesting. You can insert issue templates. That's kind of cool right there. We'll look at that later, but let's try to do this to-do list because that's what I'm really interested in. So I'll just say, um, uh, we'll say lists and headings. It's a little bit small, I'll bump it up, I'm sorry. Headings and bold and italics. And we'll go ahead and submit that issue. Let's expand that. Notice that these are now, uh, we can sort and move this around and we can check these things off. Um, it's probably possible for us to link issues to other issues. So I'm gonna try to make another issue. Again, I don't know if this will work, but I'll try it. Actually, before we do that, Let's do it over here. So let's say we want to do headings. This used to be on the left-hand side. Now they have it on the right, whatever. We'll click that and it should make a new issue. Okay, so we do that and now it's being tracked, I guess. So if we go over here, let's see what happens if we close it. Say this is, well, maybe we can reference that one. This references um, this one here. Notice that we have a link there for the repo. I'm gonna try this, Andrew WC Brown, and we'll say GitHub. I'm gonna try to write it exactly the same here, GitHub examples, because they said that would link, <laughs> it didn't copyright. I'll try that one more time. So do that again. It really does not wanna listen here. We'll try this again. GitHub examples, so I wanna see what we're getting here. So this isn't linking how I was hoping it would. I mean, it says in the docs you can, so I'm not making things up here. We'll just comment on that. Okay, that didn't hyperlink. Interesting. Let's go take a look at that. Auto links, GitHub. Okay. Um, this might've been in like GFM getting started. 
I have to kind of remember where that is. GitHub. And we'll go to this here. And I'm looking for where that could be. Um, no, no, not this, not this one. Um, like they had like a getting started for GitHub flavored markdown. Here, here it probably is. There we go. And so in here, they should have things for like auto links. I'm gonna grab this so we don't have to find it later on. Um, I'm just gonna modify the file so I have it. Go back over to our examples here and into our markdown. And I'm just gonna go ahead and edit this file in line because I'm only making one line change. But you could do a lot from just here, but again, it's a lot more um, uh, efficient to use github.dev. Anyway, coming back over to here, I'm looking for those auto links. Links. Auto links. Anyway, I know that they're there because I took screenshots and I, and like I, wherever it was, it's somewhere, okay? Maybe it's like advanced formatting. That's probably what it might've been. Code blocks, auto linked references. Okay, here we go. So in here, we should be able to link the repo. Reference type, unless I didn't understand it. Over here. Oh, maybe we gotta put an issue afterwards. Okay, so maybe we just can't link the repo by itself. Uh, we're saying a very specific repo. So I guess that is a minor mistake on my part. Let's go back to our issues, okay? Good thing we always double, triple check things. If I go back to this, then maybe I do pound and then four on this. Would that work? There we go, okay, and then it shortens it, and then we can see our to-do list here. Uh, can we check off from here? That'd be cool if we could. No, but uh, let's close this issue, because I, what I wanna see is does that close that thing out? So we go over here, and look, it says one of four tasks completed, which is really cool. Um, so the question is, if we were to check off all these things, would this all be done? This one, this one, this one. There we go, okay. Um, so that's pretty interesting. There's a lot of little markdown things that we can do, um, but I think that is sufficient uh, and we have a good idea how to work with markdown. Um, documentation is its own little skill. So, you know, getting as much practice as you can is really great, but I'll see you in the next one. Uh, ciao. Let's talk about uploading files on GitHub because it's super easy. The idea is that you could just drag them into any Markdown box and it will generate out uh, that image tag. We didn't do it in the Markdown section because I wanted to leave it for this. But what it will do is it will have a placeholder and when it finishes, it will then uh, place a link and basically GitHub is then hosting uh, that file that you're uploading. Uh, in terms of what you can upload, well, there's a maximum file size of 10 megabytes for images and GIFs. 10 megabytes for videos, surprisingly, I didn't know they could do videos, uploaded to a repo owned by a user or org of a free GitHub plan. 100 megabytes for videos uploaded to a repo owned by a user or org on a paid GitHub plan. 25 megabytes for all other files. Um, supported files would be PNG, GIF, JPEG, um, SVG, log files, markdown files, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel, text files, PDFs, zips and video. So there you go. Hey, it's Andrew Brown and this fall along, I just wanna show you how to upload files very quickly when you are in comments. I don't know if this works in uh, github.dev, I don't think so, but in the comment boxes, it absolutely will. So what I'm gonna do is go over to our issues and we're still learning how to use Markdown. I didn't finish that task. And the idea is that we want to have some kind of image. So basically what you need to do is download any kind of image. I got an image on my desktop right over here. And so what I'm gonna do is drag it on in and I'm gonna drop it in and notice that it's gonna replace it with this link format. And uh, so if I go to preview, you can see the image is there. It's as simple as that. So that's all I wanted to show you. You can also go here and upload directly. It'll open up you know, your, your downloads box, but I don't really wanna do that. I just prefer dragging. And that's it. See you in the next one. Ciao. 
Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and let's take a look at the GitHub user profile. So for personal accounts, you get a GitHub user profile to showcase yourself as a developer, and that seems to be what they want the focus to be. As, as you uh, start us using it, you kind of get that idea. So here's an example of mine on my personal account, and let's just walk through the features of this profile. So we have a profile picture and bio uh, that you can provide there. Um, notice that the bio is actually this little small tagline that's under your account right here. Uh, we have user profile readme. So that is this readme file over here that you can uh, put whatever you like in. It'll show it'll showcase your repos, including the, the ones that you've pinned as your favorite. You'll have the contributors graph. This is a graph displaying your contributors over the past year. You might see an exam question on this. I got one uh, for contributors graph. So basically what is it actually showing? Uh, it has commits, pull requests, issues, and code reviews. If you remember that stuff, like what's in it, then it'll be very easy to pick it out in a lineup. You have followers and following. So this displays the number of followers you have and the numbers of users you are following. I didn't even know I had followers on GitHub, <laughs> but uh, apparently I do. You have stars, so show repos you have starred. We have organizations, so lists the uh, GitHub organizations you are part of. Contribu con contribution activities, detailed lists of recent activities on GitHub. Let's take a look at these features in more uh, closer view here. Um, so the first thing is that big um, uh, profile readme, and you can have your own. All you got to do is create a public repo at, at, with the same username and uh, the same username as the repo name and the user. I'm trying to get my pen tool out here. That wasn't supposed to be uppercase. You know, PowerPoint likes to title titleize stuff all the time, but you can see up here this is what it is, and then I just have a readme, and that's what it's rendering out. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. You can change uh, your profile photo, your display name, bio, URL in your profile and your social your social accounts URL. So name, bio, if you want pronouns, URL, social accounts, yeah, choose your public email if you even want to show one. Uh, so there's that there. If you're looking for a job, you can also say, hey, I'm looking for work. Um, you can pin specific GitHub repos that best showcase your work. So, you know, if you want to say, I made this video game called Swap and Pop a long time ago. This is like 2016, which was a clone of Tetris Attacks. So I wanted to showcase that really good skills. Or maybe the 100 is a cloud. That was another project that I had. So there's other things like that that you might want to showcase. Um, and it's very easy to pin. You just go there and say, I want to pin these repos or these gists. If you don't know what gists are, we'll talk about it in the gist section. For uh, contributor activity, this is going to show how active uh, your prof uh, public profile is. And so here we are seeing activity. I think these are all basically for public repos. Some people get really creative and they try to um, make their activity uh, look like a photo. I'm trying to find my, there's my mouse. <laughs> so they might try to make this look like something and, and into artwork by purposely committing. They might have like a bot that does that. I don't do that, but uh, that is something that you can do. But there you go, okay? <laughs> Hey, it's Angie Brown, and we're taking a look at GitHub user profile. So we do have uh, this new user I created, but I want to show you what mine looks like first because I want to just make a call out uh, to something that might show up on the exam, and I didn't include in the lecture slides, and it honestly threw me off that they even bothered asking this in the exam. But uh, they might ask you about uh, some of the features uh, in the profile, and one of them is about achievements. So I don't know why why they would ever ask this, but achievements are things that you do um, that you can earn uh, these pointless badges for doing certain things, okay? What those things are, I don't even know. I don't even think it matters, but the point is, is that they have them here and they'll ask you on the exam about achievements for some crazy reason. So I wanted to point that out, but you have an idea of what my repo looks like or my profile looks like, let's go back over to the other account and get set up. So we already set up a, um, a user profile photo for this one. And before it was it was showing the old one so we couldn't really see it. Also just know so we can set status here. I didn't even know that. I don't think I would ever do that. This isn't a, you know, it's not, it's this is not a, um, uh, what do you call it? A social media platform, but whatever. They have everything under the sun here, but this is now showing up here. You've unlocked new achievements with private contributions show them off by including private contributions in your profile in your settings and look hey i'm already getting junk achievements but just understand that they're there um what we can do is pin this here so we can go ahead and say let's pin 
uh, this repository here. Um, apparently, we can pin this other one. I think it's because we contributed to it. That's why we can pin it. But I'm going to go ahead and just say GitHub examples and save my own. And it was already kind of showing up there, but now it's there. We can go over to gists for fun and make a new gist and then pin that. Just say uh, hello, hello.md. And I'm just going to go here and say puts hello world. And we'll scroll on down and we will create this as a public gist. Okay, I'm going to go back over here. It might already show up because we have such few stuff here, but I can go open this up and I'll pin this. And now I have this gist. So maybe if you want to like have a readme file and have more information, this is actually kind of a smart idea would be to have like two of them up here and pin them. I never even thought of that. Uh, let's go uh, ahead and get in our uh, readme page. So we know that if we create a repo with the exact same name, we can have that. So I'll go ahead and make a new repo and call this one Andrew WC Brown. And notice that we get this nice little pop-up. I like the little icon or the uh, pixel graphic here. This is a special repo. Okay, make sure it's initialized with a readme to get started. So I'll go ahead and create a readme. And that's now there. If we go over to our profile, okay, it's there. So pretty straightforward, not much else to say there. Um, there you go, okay? We'll see you in the next one, ciao. Let's quickly talk about readme files. These are markdown files that provide documentation and structural information and a repo, a GitHub repo that has a readme.md or readme in all caps or readme in all caps with .md in the projects root will be rendered on the homepage. There's actually some other markdown files that will also be rendered there, but it's really important to remember the readme one as it will probably come up as an exam question and they'll actually ask you like what uh, where, where should this be located? It's always in the root. That's what's going to render. Uh, I don't think it renders anything else but that one, and they might try to trick you there. Um, you do get this nice little table of contents on the right-hand side, so if you have uh, headings, it will figure that out for you there. I remember that wasn't there before, so that's really nice. Um, but yeah, it's as simple as that, okay? So GitHub wants you to know about basic repo navigation, what that means, I don't really know. So I'm taking my best guess to show you what that is. Uh, so within a GitHub repo, you will have a navigation bar with various features of your GitHub repo. And this is how you get to all the cool stuff. And the main one is code. This is where your code's gonna live, um, such as files, folders, things like that. Um, we have issues, that's for tracking problems. It's basically a ticket tracker. We have pull requests, that's where we're going to be uh, uh, when we're managing collaboration with other uh, developers and they want to bring changes into our repo, it's our opportunity to uh, check that work before it gets merged in. We have actions, that's for GitHub actions. Uh, for projects, that's for GitHub projects. Uh, for wikis, that's the wiki. Security is like a, a list or a, um, a checklist of things that you should do. I think it changes if you are looking at the context of a uh, as a, a user and you're not the owner of the repo, you're going to see maybe the security policy or different information. But if you are the owner, you're gonna have a checklist of things you should do. And it basically mirrors kind of what's in the settings page under security. So it's kind of weird that they do that, but that's how they do it. Then we have insights. This provides st st uh, statistics, mostly in the form of uh, charts and graphs about the repo. Sometimes this information is public, sometimes it's private. Then you have settings. This is where you control all the settings for your repo. Um, the other thing is that when you are using at least in the code section, you can navigate around files. So I showed you this in a uh, prior um, follow along. But the idea is you can search stuff, you can see the contents of file, you can comment on code per line. So there you go. So when you create a repo, you can choose which owner you want it to be. So right now I have it set as uh, my personal account, but you could drop that down and you could also choose an organization that you belong to. Uh, repo names are scoped based on uh, the account. So you can have the same name uh, for different organizations. Other people can have the same name if they're a different user. So just understand that you can do that. Uh, you need to choose an available GitHub name, again, based on that scope. Uh, your repos can either be public or private. Um, pretty self-explanatory. You can quickly add a readme file, a .get ignore, and license. It's very, very important to remember those three because you might get an exam question asking about the three things that you can quickly and easily add. If you're using the CLI, you can add it 
uh, this way or create one. We did this earlier when we did the GitHub CLI kind of demonstration, and we found out that repos require special additional permissions or personal access token permissions um, that the GitHub code spaces would not allow you to do. But yeah, there you go. That's a create a repo. All right, let's go ahead and create ourselves a repo. I know we already know how to do this, but it gives us an opportunity to talk a little bit more about uh, some of the things that might appear on the exam. You can create one up here in the top right corner. And I have this double click problem, so it's getting a bit confused. I can go to this new green button. That's usually what I do. And we can have a new repo. So I'm gonna say my uh, cool repo, right? We can provide a description. Um, this repo is amazing. And we can set it as public or private. I'm gonna stick with private for now and we'll add a readme. We'll drop down to git ignore. We'll say maybe we're working with Ruby. So we'll get that by default and we'll add a license like MIT. We'll go ahead and add, uh, create that repo. Um, I wanna point out that you have other things that are rendered here. So that should be very clear. Um, we have releases and packages, which we should talk about at some point. I'm gonna leave this repo around if we want to play around with it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's pretty clear how to create a repo. It's not hard. Let's go take a look at a more popular uh, repo like Ruby on Rails. Um, so I'm just going to type this up here, type in Rails, and we'll take a look and see what they have. Um, so if we go into here, you'll notice there are just more things. We have codes of conduct, right? We have our MIT. We have our security policy. If we go up here to the security tab, this is what we can see. Um, so we have the security policy being rendered out here, and then it's showing um, uh, possible uh, exposures, probably based on one of the scanners. I'm not exactly sure which one is showing that. Um, but that is that there. If we go back to our own repo, we might be able to uh, take a look at security here. Hold on. Uh, going back to wherever that one was. <laughs> we just made that repo. And it can be a little bit of pain to sometimes find your own repos. I'm not sure why they've never made that easier, but just how it is. And if we go down, we can find my cool repo here. And there's a security tab. And notice that it's listing out uh, things that you should do for your repo. It's important to know what these are because, um, well, if you have this, uh, uh, the exam is going to probably ask you like, what's what things can you access from here? And this is just from the public repo. If you have a private repo, it's going to be different. Sorry, this is private. Public can be different. So let's just open this up and make a comparison and see if what kind of difference there is here. So if we go over to repo here and we go into this public one over here, what options do we get? So we get a lot more going on here. So notice that this is the private and that is the public, probably because if you are if you had a paid version, you then get additional code scanning and secret scanning for public repos. You automatically get that stuff. I just wanna point out that all this stuff is also under your settings, under uh, security options. So they kind of just like repeat it there, you know? So it's just what they do but hopefully that makes sense. And that's all I wanted to show you. So I'll see you in the next one. Ciao. Well, let's talk about maintaining a repo. Now, what's unusual about this slide content, it's not unusual, but it's the fact that in the outline, they have a whole section for GitHub administration. And uh, for whatever reason, I have it over here as opposed to into the other section because of the way the outline is designed. So understand that I'm not going to cover that stuff in that other section because it's just repeated. Um, but anyway, let's continue on and look at maintaining a repo. So the first thing is your name. So you can change the name of the repo if you do not like it. As long as the name is available, you can absolutely do that. And a reminder that repo names are scoped based on personal or organizational accounts or organization accounts. I, I keep writing organizational, but it means the same thing. Uh, you can change the base branch, the default branch. Uh, you can rename it. Um, just so you know, main is the unspoken best practice for naming your base branch. Everybody does it. The old one was master. Nobody calls it master anymore. Um, you can opt in and opt out of some features for your GitHub repo. I say some as a catch-all, just in case there's features that do not show up or there's ones that are locked in. Um, but that's pretty straightforward. You just check a box and you might have to do some additional configuration. Then there's the danger zone, which contains actions you need to think twice about because they cannot be undone if you make a big mistake. And in the danger zone, we have the ability to change the repo visibility. Um, it's important to understand 
What happens when you make a, a, a repo from private to public, the code will be visible to everyone who can visit at github.com. Anyone can fork your repo. All push rule sets will be disabled. Your changes will be published as activity. Now, will this show up in the exam? Probably not. I didn't see it, but that is something to consider. Um, you can disable branch protection rules. Uh, so branch protection rules are strict workflow rules uh, uh, that dis like will do something like disallow someone from pushing to main and uh, you can temporarily disable them if you have to apply quick fixes and you can't work around those rules easily. You can transfer ownership to somebody else and they'll become the owner of the repo. You can archive the repo so it becomes read only. You can delete the repo. So there you go. All right, time for some repo maintenance. Uh, so what we're gonna do is I wanna create a new repo. I'm gonna make it in my other account. Uh, just because we're going to want to transfer it from one to another. But I'm going to go here and just say, um, uh, under here, Omen King, and I'm going to say, my cool repo to, okay? And I'm going to just make this private, and I'm going to add a readme here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and create this repo, okay? So now that this is repo created, we can go over to our settings. And let's say I didn't like the name two. I need it to be three because we already have another one called two in the other account. I'm going to rename that and it renames. Before we used to rename, it used to take time. Now it's instantaneous, which is really, really great. If we scroll on down here, we could change the main branch. We could change the name to main two. Um, there are some uh, limitations there because it's not showing all of our options as we don't have other branches. Apparently it doesn't create it instantaneously, but it will change it in a bit of time. There it is. So I think it has taken effect. If we go here and yeah, it shows that it's been renamed. So that sounds really good. We're gonna go back over to settings. Notice that we can checkbox and uh, checkbox on and off features. Let's get rid of issues. Let's get rid of projects. If we go over here to our code, notice that they have vanished across the top. So that is great. We'll scroll on down. Um, we have more abilities somewhere here in the danger zone. So we can change our visibility. It will give us a warning about it. I'm not sure why it's making it so hard. I'm gonna make this public. I'm gonna say that I, I accept the changes and we're gonna make it public. And then apparently I have to confirm. So I'm gonna get out my phone and it wants me to enter a number into my phone. Okay, so 37, approve, great. And I'll wait a moment for it to take effect. There we go, so now it is public. Um, we can disable our branch rules. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Uh, we can go ahead and transfer this repo. I'm gonna send it to um, a specific person. So this is gonna be, I wanna send it to Andrew WC Brown, which is the other me. And then I gotta type in the repo name. So we'll go ahead and do that. My cool repo three. I understand. Okay, so now it should be transferred. Um, and I think the other person has to accept. So I don't think it's instantaneous. So if we go over here, hmm, do I have the repo now? If I go up here in my notifications, how do I see the repo transfer? I'm not sure. I'm gonna go check the email for this account and see if it shows up there, okay? All right, so in my email, we can see over here that uh, there is a repo transfer link. So I'm gonna go ahead and click that. <music> GitHub repo templates is a feature for public repos that allow other GitHub users to make a copy of the contents of the template repo to use as a starting point for their own repo. And I believe it's only for public. I, I haven't checked for private, but I don't know why you'd want to use it for private. We set a, uh, a, a repo as, as a template by checking a box on the template repository. And then you'll have this option to use the template. And when you click use this template, it will then ask you to choose a new name and it'll say, what do you want to include? And then it'll show that that was generated from that other template. I use these in my boot camps because I will create a starter project and then you will uh, start from that template. How are these, how is this different from cloning or forking? Um, the idea here is that um, you're starting with a clean repo. You're not having all the baggage of, of stuff that comes with it. It is a really clear, uh, clean repo. 
And so that's how you're going to go ahead and uh, utilize it. But that use case that I explained for, which is like, you know, you wanna have something like a project that people are gonna start as a basis of, that's where you're gonna be using repo templates. Okay, ciao. Hey, it's Angie Brown. In this fall along, we'll go ahead and make a repo template. So um, we have here, um, let's go over here to our other repo. I'm trying to find it. Sometimes it's a bit hard to navigate repos. There we go, that's a bit better. And so we have this My Cool repo. What I wanna do is convert this repo into a public repo for now, just so that we can utilize this feature. I wanna go to the top and see if we can make a template. Actually, it looks like we can. I'm really surprised because what would be the point if um, it's private? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because we go here, how's anyone gonna click that button? It doesn't make any sense. So I really think that that is a public feature. And notice I actually checkboxed it on and it turned off. So I think it is. Yeah, it is. Nope. Okay, it's on now. All right. I mean, I guess you could use it to make your own from it. So I guess my thought was it was always about other people using it, but I guess you could make your own default template and use it for yourself. So I guess it's not just a public feature, but they're never going to ask you on that exam. So I'm not going to fix the slides because of that. But let's go ahead and uh, create a new repository from this template. And we'll just say my cool repo two, and we'll make it private. I notice we can include other branches, but I don't want anything else. And there we go. So now we have this a repo that is making a copy of, we'll give it a moment. And here it is, you can see it's generated from that one. And there you go, ciao. So in GitHub, you can clone a repo programmatically three different ways. Uh, we have the first, which is HTTPS. Uh, you will have to supply a GitHub username and password on the clone, and you'll need to set uh, get to cache the credentials if you don't want to keep entering them in. I didn't write it in here, but when it says password, we're talking about the um, personal access token because GitHub does not let you use passwords anymore. Um, but in the documentation, it kind of suggests that you can use a password because it says password protected. Oh, not here, but under here, it would, it would, it would say that. Um, for SSH, uh, you can utilize that method. You'll have to have an SSH key pair and you'll have to upload that to your uh, GitHub account. Then we have the GitHub CLI. Um, so we can do that as well. This is going to use credentials uh, when you do GitHub login. It'll actually use either a personal access token or SSH. We can also clone repos in the GitHub desktop and we could just download a zip. It's not really cloning, but we can download the contents of it. Um, so that's pretty straightforward there. Sometimes you just want the, the, the code's repo. Um, I wanna point out that we did all this in the quick and dirty Git and GitHub crash course. So if you're wondering how to do these three, make sure you have watched that video and you've done it all, okay? See you in the next one, ciao. You can add files to your GitHub repo directly via the GitHub UI. If you drop down code, you or sorry, add file, you'll have create new file or upload files. So it's great for both text and binary files. Um, and uh, the idea here is that when you uh, go ahead and add a file, if you need to have folders, you can put a forward slash and it will end up creating as many folders as you want. And then you put the name in and you just create that file there. When adding multiple files that you also need to edit, you can also quickly use github.dev at no cost. Um, but yeah, that folder trick is something that you should really want to know how to do. And we did show it somewhere in this course, but uh, there you go. There are lots of ways of creating branches in GitHub and Git. Um, something that you should really know how to do is to use this single line command, git checkout hyphen B to both create and check out a branch in one go. You should absolutely know how to do git push hyphen U origin staging which is basically the hyphen U is short for hyphen hyphen set up stream. I know it looks like a single hyphen there, but there's actually two uh, for this flag. You can create branches from issues um, and then the branch and issue will be associated and linked. You can directly create branches in the GitHub UI. You can create branches in the uh, GitHub desktop and I'm sure you can create branches in the GitHub CLI. And uh, yeah, there you go.
Hey, it's Angie Brown, and this fall along, I want to create some branches. Nothing super difficult to do, but um, something that will take us just a moment. I'm gonna go ahead and use um, our My Cool repo. And what I wanna do here is I wanna go ahead, actually, I wanna clean these up. I don't wanna have a bunch of uh, <laughs> junk repos hanging around. So actually, I decided against that. And I just wanna keep things clean and keep with our single repo, even if it is uh, public. So I'm gonna go ahead and type my cool repo here and clean this up, Andrew W.C. Brown. Or, man, geez, Andrew W.C. Brown. Brown, my cool repo. It's that autocomplete that's messing it up. There we go. And I'm just gonna go ahead and also get rid of this one. And then we'll just be really focused on what we need to do at hand here. Just give me a moment. There we go. Okay, so now let's just go back to our GitHub examples. And there are a few ways that we can create issues. Uh, one is, or sorry, branches. One way is to go to the branches tab, and I'm pretty sure we can just create them right here. So I can go here and just say uh, feature uh, cool one, okay? And we can say what we're branching from. So that's an example, and there it is. Uh, another really useful way and something I really recommend is you create an issue and we'll and we'll make a task saying create a branch from an issue, okay? And then what we can do is then go ahead and create a branch here in development in the bottom right corner. Notice it's gonna put the number in here. That's a very common pattern is to have whatever your issued number is and then a, a, a short name for the branch. Okay, then it's saying like, what should we do next? Code spaces, locally. I don't really want to do anything next. I just want to um, uh, do nothing, but I'll go ahead and hit create branch. And so then it gives us like a button where we could click to go ahead and play around with it. So that is something I do a lot. When I teach boot camps. I show this a lot. This is a very common workflow and something you should absolutely remember uh, that you can do. Um, let's go ahead and launch up this in code spaces. So we're gonna go here and uh, we have this one here. Sure, I'll launch up this old one. Sure, why not? And once this is launched up, we'll take a look and learn how to use a very cool shorthand for um, implementing uh, checkout and creating a branch in one go. Okay, so just back here when this is ready, all right? All right, so this is back up and running and notice that we are currently in the main branch. We can type in git branch to get a list of branches. And so what I wanna do is I want to create myself a new branch here. And actually there are other branches, it's just not showing them. If we do git pull, um, it might show us those other branches. There we go. And now if we type in git branch, it still doesn't show them, but that doesn't mean we can't check them out, but uh, our, um, our uh, uh, program is aware of it. We might also be able to create branches within a Git graph. These were things that we installed earlier. So they might have the option to do that here. I'm not 100% sure. So you create branch, so we could do that as well. I'm not gonna do that. But what I really wanna show you is something that will show up in the exam. I'm actually really surprised that it did, but it is a really good thing to, to, um, uh, to know, is that normally when you create a branch, you'd have to type in Git branch and I'd say my new branch like this. And then I'd have to do git check out my new branch. Okay. And so that's something you can do. But what is more efficient, you can go check out back to main, is we can do that in one call. We can see git check out hyphen b for branch, my new branch two. And that's going to create that branch and check it out. So really make sure you remember this one because it will absolutely show up on your exam. It's absolutely something you'll use every single day. And I strongly recommend it. The last thing um, I want to go over is just pushing to origin. So what we can do is, is set um, upstream, but I think that you is a lot easier to do. And we say origin and we just say my new branch here too. And then that will push that branch up there because you really want to know how to set that origin. So that's all I really wanted to show you. And um, yeah, we can just stop this environment. So we'll go ahead to command palette. Just say stop current code space. 
and I'll see you in the next one. Okay, ciao. So starring repos is uh, something that we can do. And it's similar to bookmarking uh, for a repo that we're interested in keeping track of. And so stars are public and everyone can see them. And usually this is an indicator whether something is really popular. In fact, GitHub might take notice uh, in their community and do something nice. Um, so a lot of people seem to care about star counts and uh, make it their goal to try to get as many as they can. If you wanna find um, starred projects that you have starred, you can go to github.com forward slash stars. And there's a, a few other things that we can explore. Um, and you know, in the exam, they might actually ask you what that URL is to get to uh, your starred, um, uh, uh, starred things that you have starred. So just make sure you remember that URL, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown. And this follow along, I wanna take a look at starring repos. So what we can do here is just go into our own project. And I think we could star our own, which is a little bit silly, but it's something we can do. We could also put it into a list. So let's go ahead and hit starred. And I might also wanna say this is for inspiration. And so now that I've starred that stuff, let's go take a look at our actual starred pages. So we could type in stars at the top here, but I think also on the right hand side, we can go to your stars. And um, I mean, this is showing stuff that we've starred and this has a list, but that wasn't the same page that I saw. So I'm actually surprised this is different. And maybe there's actually two, there's this one and another one. So let's go ahead and type in stars at the top here. Yeah, why do they have, <laughs> why do they have two different pages? They got this one and then they got this one. And to me, it's like the same thing. Okay. Whatever. I guess maybe one is specific to the repo. So this one's for Andrew Brown stars. So is that like public ones that everyone else can see? What if I go up to here to my profile? You know what? I actually never noticed these tabs up here before. So yeah, I guess this is your public profile one of things that you have started if you want to show other people. I didn't realize that. And then we actually have this other one, which is the stars. Okay. Um, I could probably show you something a little bit more because in mine, I have a lot more starred stuff. Not that I remember what I have starred, but if we go here to stars, you can see a lot more uh, stuff here and it shows you could jump to a friend. We have categories, which is kind of cool. I don't really see the lists here, but I suppose that's more for um, the profile. Uh, but yeah, that's about it. Um, and I, maybe you might want to remember uh, over here, the all for this. Okay, because like I remember just on the exam, they're asking about like the star, the star URL, and I know there's supposed to be stars. Okay, but we'll see you in the next one. Ciao. Another thing we can do is watch repos, and this allows you to stay informed about activities occurring within a repo. So the idea is that you'll hit watch, and then you can say uh, to what level of notifications you want for watching. And notice that if I go custom, I can say exactly what I'm looking to watch. And in your GitHub account, you can specify how you want to be notified. So there you go. Well, let's take a look at watching repos. And I actually can point out a repo that drives me crazy because um, somehow I got, I got subscribed to it and they update it so often and it's Wing Lang. And I'm not saying it's a bad project. I'm just saying like they really shouldn't have opted everybody into the, uh, to the alerts because it, it's driven me crazy. Um, so like notice here, I said, stop ignoring. Cause I, I was like tired of getting updates for this. And the reason why was that in order to get access to this project in the beta, they had to add you, uh, in some, in some manner. I'm not sure if it was a contributor or something else, but all I know I was really getting sick and tired of getting alerts on my phone. So, cause it'll, it'll have it in summaries and it'll, it'll fill up these digest emails and it gets annoying. So I ignored it. Okay. But let's go ahead and I'm going to pretend that I want to, uh, watch another project here from Andrew Brown. And we can go over here to GitHub examples. And then we can go ahead and click watch. And um, we can say all activity, right? We go to custom, change, maybe we just want issues. Okay, I'll go back and say for everything here. There we go. And I just want to point out that if you go to your settings, uh, your settings over here, and then we go to notifications, we can control you know, what we want to see for notifications, specifically for watching, we can say here on GitHub or email. You can say, I don't want the emails, okay? So very straightforward. 
Um, is there a place to see all of the stuff that you're watching? Probably. Uh, we could try like, I think it's under notifications. It's like notifications, maybe it's like watching. I know this is in another slide later on in the course. Here it is. And so I can see everything that I'm watching and I could just say, stop watching all the stuff. Notice that I'm automatically watching stuff for my own repo. So automatically you're always set to watch all of them, if that makes sense. But there you go. Feature previews allows you to enable or disable features that are in beta in your personal accounts. So the idea is that we have feature, uh, feature previews and we go over here and then just kind of enable it is what we want to have. Um, some of them might be already turned on, some of them you might wanna turn off, but let's go take a look at it, okay? All right, so I'm in my account and I wanna go ahead and take a look at fe uh, feature previews. I don't wanna meddle with my main account, but I'm gonna go here and go to feature previews and here we can see some stuff. So let's say we wanted the command palette. That sounds really cool. I'm gonna turn that on. Actually, I think it's already on. I didn't even know that we could do that. And it seems like we would have like this global search thing. We could turn off slash commands if we wanted to. So we say disable or enable it. But let's go take a look at command palettes because I didn't even know that we had. It says here, control K. I'm on a Windows machine right now. So we have control Alt K or control K. I'm gonna give that a go. And so I'm gonna try this, control K. Ooh, look at that. That is smooth. And so then we can jump to something. Uh, what if I type in gists? No, but I mean like maybe we could find stuff really quickly. I mean, that's kind of nice, like PAT, personal access token. Uh, let's say I want to go to Andrew, or let's say we want to go to uh, examples. Oh yeah, I'm going to use that a lot more. You might see me doing that. I might tell you that. Um, I really hope that that becomes a main feature because it's really nice. Um, feature previews, I assume this is beta. Um, I don't think alpha features ever get shown, but that is really cool. I'm surprised they didn't put that in the exam. Anyway, we'll see you in the next one, okay? Ciao. So tagging is used to capture a point in history to mark version released of your code base and GitHub makes it easy to explore tag versions of your Git repo. So here's an example of Ruby on Rails and you can see they have 516 tags. And if you go into the dropdown where your branches are, you can switch over to the tags and you can see the versioning. Um, tagging is not specific to GitHub. It is a feature of Git. Um, and just a good practice to know. These are common uh, Git commands, Git tag commands. You absolutely should know. They're super useful uh, to utilize. And a very common um, workflow is if you have a production branch to tag, when you tag a release, that would be the thing that would trigger it out and send it uh, to uh, your production compute. So um, yeah, tagging is super important. Um, and often, when you see milestones on GitHub, they'll usually correspond to tags. When we looked at milestones, we saw that they were versioning them based on, or the names of them were based on tag releases that they're they're working towards. Um, so yeah, I just want to get you some practical knowledge with tags, even if it doesn't show up on the exam. Okay. Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and this fall along, I want to show you tagging. And if you're hearing my uh, heater in the background, it is super cold in my office. It's like negative 10 Celsius. I do not have heat, and I'm doing the best I can. So sorry for the background noise or the shuffling of the snowsuit. But let's go ahead and learn a bit about tagging, because tagging is such uh, a useful skill um, that there's no way I was not going to show you this. So what we'll do is we'll go over to, mm, let's say our GitHub, our GitHub examples repo. I'm gonna go over here and um, yeah, we'll go into this one here. And what I wanna do here is I want to start making some tags. And what we'll need to do is launch up a new code space. Okay, we'll give it a moment to load up and I'll be back in just a minute. You know what? I think what I ended up doing was running the exam pro GitHub example. So I'm just gonna go back because this one's never gonna work for me. And I'm gonna make sure that I'm in the correct directory. So it's this one that I want. And we'll go back up here. I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, well, if I already have an active one, I would probably rather use that. So I'm just gonna open this one. You just gotta get your code space up, however you're gonna get it up. Um, but I just wanna get in here and get working. So I'm gonna launch this one. No, that was the one that was building, I think. Yeah, I'm not sure, sure exactly what's wrong. Container build failed, checking troubleshooting, view logs. Uh, I didn't know you could check the logs as it's building. Mm. Docker build x build failed. 
Mm. It's it's uh, failing with Terraform. So um, I thought we uh, <laughs> I thought we fixed that. So if we go into this, is this still having the uh, Terraform code in here? It is. So what I'm just going to do here just to, um, you know what I think it is? Um, because sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And what happened last time is it ran out of space uh, is what I noticed. It was really a weird thing that happened. So what I'm going to do is just stop this code workspace. Go up here. Stop, stop, stop. Let me stop it, please. You ran out of space, that's fine, I get it. Let me stop the workspace. Okay, and what I'm gonna do, since this seems to get us more reliable results is always deleting the code space. And I'm gonna go ahead and delete this here. And I'm just gonna go ahead and make a new one. Okay, so go all the way back here to <laughs> the Andrew Brown one here and we'll make a new one. And unfortunately, that's the most reliable way to use code spaces. Again, I really prefer Gitpod. I don't have these issues with Gitpod ever, but we'll let this spin up and I'll be back here in just a moment, okay? And this environment is still failing to build. It's really bizarre what's going on here. Um, and I'm not exactly sure why it's failing, but, uh, okay, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go back to view logs here because maybe it's messing up on that Terraform again. It is, Terragron. It's like downloading a bunch of stuff I don't need. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in here and I'm just gonna ignore this. I'm sure it's gonna continue spinning up. I'm gonna click into my dev container and I'm gonna edit this. And for whatever reason, it's just not working. So I'm gonna comment this out for now. And we're gonna just pretend Terraform doesn't exist. It was working fine so many times, but if that fixes it, that's good enough for me, okay? So I'm gonna go to our uh, code spaces again. Go ahead and delete this one. And I'm gonna go back to that repo. If I can, please make sure I'm on the right one and we'll go ahead and launch it. And then maybe that must be old. Let me refresh that. I thought we stopped it. There we go. We'll start a new one. And then maybe this time we'll get into code spaces. So see you back in a second, okay? All right, so this environment finally worked. I guess Terraform was giving us trouble. And you know, I thought these these uh, these packages were pre-built, um, but I guess they must be compiling at the time of source code and there's some issue that's happening. So it might not have that we ran out of space, it just might have not worked and totally a detour to what we wanted to be doing. But what I'm gonna do is go ahead and create a new folder here. And this one's gonna be called tags as we want to just work through some tagging stuff. Readme.md, okay. And uh, there's a few things I want to show you how to do. The first thing is how to tags. So, uh, like we could say version 1.0.0. We could push our tags. We will check out. We could check out a tag at some point. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. I don't think I need to show you that, but I'm just going to write it out here so you can see it. 1.0.0. We can do git tag hyphen D 100 to delete our tag. And then we can uh, delete our remote tag. Those are the three things. I want you to know. So before we do this, I want to talk about semantic versioning because semantic versioning is a way of tagging, okay? And most repos use this. If you see a V in front of it, I know I used V as an example there uh, in, in the actual slides, I, I put a V in front of it, but uh, generally this is the format that a lot of open source projects and places like to use. Um, depending on how old the project is, they might have just stuck with the V in front of it and, and use everything else with that. We could take a look here and see what Rails does as an example repo. Rails. And what I want to do here is just take a look at how they're tagging. So see, they have a V in front of it, and but they've been around forever. And, um... I'm just telling you, like the, at one point, this page did not exist. There, there was this idea of semantic versioning, but whenever it came out, you know, some of these projects existed before then. So that's the reason why you might not see it. Um, but anyway, we'll come back all the way over here. And I like to stick with semantic versioning as best I can, as long as I remember how to do it. And so the idea is uh, we'll want to apply a tag to a particular commit. And just to make things a little bit easier, let's get into a dark theme. And the other thing I, I'm going to want to have installed here is Git graph. All right. 
And I think that if we have this installed, oh, it looks like it's already installed. Did it actually remember my settings? Remember I complained about how often it does not remember my settings? It might actually work in this case. So if I go down below here, I have Git Graph and Grit Log. They're actually both installed, but why the theme didn't persist, I don't know. And the idea here is that I wanna be able to apply a tag. Um, and the way we can do that is we're gonna go ahead, we have some uncommitted changes. I'm gonna just say tagging, whoops. <laughs> We'll just say uh, tagging here, and we'll go ahead and first try to apply a tag. So we'll say git tag 1.0.0, and it should show up here. There it is, okay, great. But understand this tag is local. If we go over to our repo, and we give this a nice refresh, it's not here, it's zero tags, okay? So if we want that tag to go up, I have to go git push hyphen hyphen tags. Okay, when you do your regular push, you can add that as well. You can see that it's been pushed. We'll go back over to here. We'll give this a nice refresh. And now we have one tag We go over here, one tag. So good shape, right? Um, and the idea is you can switch over to it just like a branch. You can check it out just like a branch. Um, and so that's something that is really useful. If we go back over to Git, Git Graph, we can now see, uh, it actually doesn't show you if it's pushed, which is uh, one thing I think is, a bit sad, but uh, it doesn't show you when it's pushed, so that is one indicator that can be a little bit confusing here. Um, and actually, when we did push push tags, it didn't actually push the uh, the commit. So I always thought it did both, but I guess it only does the tag when you do that. So we'll type in git push and make sure that that's pushed as well. There we go. They're all over here now. Let's say we made a mistake with our tag. Sometimes you do this. You might uh, someone else tag something, and then you tagged it the same, and you got to delete your tags. So we have to delete, uh, delete it in two places. We have to delete it locally, git tag hyphen D one zero zero zero, okay? But if you go here, it still exists. So I'm gonna give this a nice hard refresh. And this absolutely exists. So if we wanna get rid of this one, we're gonna have to type git tag hyphen hyphen delete origin one zero zero zero, okay? Um, and it didn't work there. Mm. I mean, that's the, oh, you know, it's push, it's push. Sorry, it's push. <laughs> we'll say git push, delete origin 1.0.0.0. And so now it's deleted it. We probably should have took a look at the um, uh, the GitHub config file. There might've been something interesting there, but uh, we didn't. I'm gonna go ahead and give this a nice refresh here. And I'm just curious what would, well, this is Rails, it's not us. But if we go back here and give this a refresh, this should now be gone. And I'm just gonna tag this one more time, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead here and say, git tag 1.0.0. I'm gonna say git push hyphen hyphen tags. If you wanted to tag some other place, you have to check out that commit using the shock code and then tag it. I'm not gonna do that here. But let's go take a look at the, um, the git directory because in that git directory, it might show us something interesting in the config file. So we'll go to settings and we know that we have to tell it to unhide certain stuff. Okay. So I'm looking for hidden files in here. It's somewhere in here. But type in dot get, could find that. Dot get. Here it is. It's under exclusions. So I want to just take that out so I can see it. And we'll go ahead and open up our config directory. Because what I wanna see is if there was any tagging information in here, and there's not. So there's nothing new here to see. I just thought there might be. But yeah, that's all there is to tagging. And uh, we'll call this one done and I'll see you in the next one. Um, okay, so ciao. So GitHub releases allows you to create releases with release notes and linked assets such as zip sources or binaries for specific platforms. So in a Git repo, you'll see releases. And from there, you can read about the release and see all the stuff that has changed. And there might be the source code or binaries. If you if this is something like, um, I'm trying to think of an example, like let's say you like to play video games and there's an emulator uh, for like the PlayStation. Uh, they'll have like builds here for Windows, Mac, and um, other things here. Uh, maybe you make a video game. In general, you could distribute the binary here. It's anything where you're distributing the binaries or the source, source code, but you're making it very clear what has changed. 
as a release. Um, and often, like, when I'm having issues with something, I will actually go through and re read the releases when, let's say, um, I, like, React Router. Have you ever used React Router or DOM and they've changed versions? I'm trying to understand, like, what compatibilities have changed? What does not work anymore? Maybe I was experiencing a bug. And if they do a good job of the documentation, it will be in there. So there you go. <laughs> Hey everyone, in this fall long, I wanna take a look at GitHub releases as it is a very useful feature to let people know about changes that are happening in your repo. Um, so before we do, let's go take a look at some other project that might have changes. I'm trying to think of something interesting, like maybe an emulator. Um, so I'm just typing emulator in here. I'm just looking for one. Here's a Nintendo Switch emulator or maybe PS, PS2. I'd rather do PS2, I feel like they might have good uh, information about changes like PCS, PCSX2. And on the right hand side, you can see we have releases. And if we open up the releases, um, they do not tell you much. Okay, so that's not a great example. <laughs> so we'll go back to another one and we'll try another uh, video game emulator. Maybe we can just try putting the word emulator. You know, and, and people can write whatever kind of releases they want. This doesn't have releases. Uh, we'll try the 3DS emulator. This one doesn't have releases. We have... Mm, this one here, do they have releases? No, well, they do. They do. No, just tags. Okay, so I guess we're just going to not get really good ones here, but I guess we could just go to Rails because they seem to always have enough for us. But I just wanted something that was written a little bit more uh, nicer so you could see a good example of a release. But here is one where, um, you know, they're talking about different versions. I feel like if there was a release for a specific uh, tag version, right, that uh, we get better information. Like when Rails first came out, like 700 probably would be a good one. So I'm just scrolling through here. I mean, these are pretty good. But again, I just want to try to find a major release one. This is, this is 1.0. 7. I'm going to just type in 7.0.0. I might have to scroll a bit to get it to load. 08. There must be. Where is it? What? <laughs> it just skips over it. Okay, well, I mean, 7.1 was pretty good. So we'll go over back to 7.1. And uh, yeah, like here it's telling you about all the libraries and things that are changing. This one's a bit better because it's showing examples of things that have changed. So you can put whatever you want to release and it's just to help communicate what the differences are because a lot of times you just don't know. So we did do some tagging and that's a great opportunity for us to create our own release in our own repo. So what I'm gonna do is go back over to our home. I'm gonna find this repo that we have. I'm gonna go over to releases and we're gonna create ourselves our own release. And we'll just say version 1.0.0 ready for the world. The best. GitHub example materials around. My hands are cold. If you, if you can't tell, I'm, uh, sorry. But I'm in like full snowsuit right now and I got the heater blowing. So if you hear the heater, I apologize, but it's just how it is right now in my office. Anyway, we you can choose a tag, which is great. And then um, you can then attach the binary. So the idea is we would download the zip and then re-upload it again. I'm not gonna do that because that's pretty straightforward. We'll go ahead and do that. And so there's our release. And that's all I really wanted to show you for releases. Apparently there's a compare button. I didn't even know that. So that might be kind of cool to do, but um, yeah, there you go. So GitHub Packages is a platform for hosting and managing packages, including containers and other dependencies. And the things that it can uh, host in terms of its package registry or repository is JavaScript packages, Ruby gems, Java, Maven, and Gradle packages, .NET packages, and Docker images. And the last one I think is gonna be the most common uh, one that people can utilize. Um, they have a free tier, they have a pay tier, so you can start using this right away and we will go give it a go. Um, probably the easiest thing we could do would be to create a Docker uh, container and then push it to GitHub packages. So that's kind of the code that we'll have to go through. We can make a simple hello world Docker file, run it, make sure we build it. And uh, GitHub Actions could be used to build and then publish, I, put, I wrote the word public, but publish packages to GitHub pages. So there you go. Hey, 
Hey, this is Angie Brown and this fall along, what I wanna do is go ahead and create a GitHub package. So what you're gonna to need to do is start up a code space. I actually already have mine running. I think by this point, you probably know how to do that. I just uh, was working on the video earlier and I had to close out and restart. So that's where we are now. So anyway, I'm gonna make a new folder in here. This will be for uh, pack, uh, GitHub, GitHub packages, okay? And if you're gonna try to spell S, if you hear a bit of noise in the background, it's because I'm running the little space heater near my feet so my feet don't freeze. I'm in full snowsuit right now, okay? But anyway, what we'll do is we'll go into the package directory and we'll make a new file and we'll call it docker file, okay? And from here, um, we want to create this little docker image. So we'll say alpine, uh, latest. This isn't a Docker course, so I'm not teaching all this, but just follow along with me here. Or just copy paste it from my repo, whichever you want to do. Echo. We'll say hello world. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and save that file. And now what I want to do is go into that directory and build it. So what I'll do is run docker build hyphen t hello world period we'll build that okay and now we'll try to run it make sure it works there we go that works okay and so we're in good shape uh, the other part here I would say is now that we have our docker image built we want to now push that so um, I'm going to make a new readme file, so I just have a little bit of room to work with here. And there's a few things we need to do. We need to set our username. So I'm going to say username here. I'm just going to set mine as what I am, Andrew Brown. WC Brown, that's the account that I have here. Okay. And I'm going to put export in front of it. So I can export it. And yeah, I want to allow pasting. Good. And we'll hit enter. It actually double pasted it, so I gotta be careful there. I imagine this is a bit hard to read, so I'm just gonna bump up the font a bit. And so that should be set. The next thing is I'll need a personal access token. So I'm gonna go over here, and we've done personal access tokens quite a bit in this course. And we'll go down to developer settings, and we'll make a new one. And this one is going to, well, I guess we gotta confirm with GitHub Mobile first. I'll get my phone out here. And uh, it wants me to enter a code in. Mm, one, two. Okay. This one's gonna be for GitHub packages. Oh, I'm not registering an app. Whoa, 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 let's go back. <laughs> Personal access tokens, there we go. There's an old one, I'm gonna delete that and I'm gonna generate out a new one. We'll say uh, GitHub packages. I want this only to be for a day, just in case I forget it and someone tries to take it. And this is going to be for a specific repo. So we'll go down here and say this repo. And then for permissions, I'm looking for packages. Packages. It's under here maybe. Packages, let's search for it, packages. It says we need a personal access token. Mm. So I'm not seeing packages in here and this makes me think that we should probably use a traditional one. I don't normally do this, but because I cannot find it, I'm gonna use a classic token. So that's what I'm gonna do. Um, I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna generate a new token. Really wants to make, make a new one and just say GitHub packages. And so it's really similar, um, very similar to the other one. Oh, I want it to expire. And I'm looking for packages. Here it is, read and write packages, delete packages. So I'm not sure where that new one is in the new one. Maybe it's not and we just have to use the classic token. We'll go ahead and generate that token out. I now have this token. I'm gonna to bring it on over to uh, uh, here. And I wanna set this as our environment variables. I'm gonna say gh token. 
we're going to paste that in. Okay, and we'll copy this. Good. And we'll paste it in and hit enter. So now that's set. Um, I need to set the image name. I'm just going to keep putting a GH under it, image name, just so it's a bit easier for me to find them when I want to find all the environment variables later. Hello world. We'll go ahead and do that. And copy that and paste it in. Hit enter. Uh, so I'm going to put export in front of that just in case that didn't work. And then I'm going to do export. My hands are really cold. <laughs> it's really cold in here. Uh, I think it's like negative seven. It's because my shed uh, has a um, oil furnace or gas, yeah, oil furnace. And I have to go drive out to um, the, the reserve to get some gas. And it's just really bad weather. So I'm just trying to get this done so you folks can get this course as quickly as possible. So we've exported those values. So that's really good. I want to make sure that they're set. So I'm going to type in ENV grep GH. And there they are. Okay, so now we need to write some code. The first thing is we need to log into Docker. And so Docker somehow talks to GitHub. I'm not sure how that works, but we'll just go ahead and work with it here. So I'm going to say Docker login. Um, and we're going to say G C or say G H C R. So that's for GitHub container repository, I'm assuming. Hyphen U. And then we'll say G H username. And then we'll say password S T D N. Okay. So that'll pass the password. That's what that pipe does. And see if that works. We'll hit enter. Uh, doesn't know what that flag is. Mm, did I type it wrong? I did. And we'll copy that and we'll paste that there. Enter. And so now we're logged in. So that's step number one. Step number two is we need to tag our Docker container. So we'll say de uh, Docker tag, and then I want my image name and then my version. Uh, this will be GH version. And this will be gh. I mean, we could just write it out if it's a bit simpler for everybody. So we could just say hello world 100. And then on the other side would be ghcr.io. And then that would be our username. So I could just type it in here. It's up to you whether you want to use environment variables or not. I'm just, uh, I just want it to work. So I'm just going to write it out in full, even though we made environment variables up here for this particular use case, but that's okay. One zero zero. So the idea is we're going to tag um, our Docker image we built as, uh, for one point zero zero to map to here. Okay, we'll go ahead and copy that. Hit enter. Um, no such image. I mean, there is no tag called one point zero point zero on it. We do Docker list or Docker images. It's called latest. So we'll change this to be latest. We can make the other tag latest as well, but I'm going to make it 1.0.0. I'm not sure why. I'm just going to do that. So it's going to be, we'll go ahead and enter. And so now that's tagged. And so now we should be able to push it. ghcr.io forward slash, say, Andrew WC Brown forward slash, hello world, colon 1.0.0. Copy, enter. Um, so it says an image with the tag does not locally exist with that tag. So maybe I tagged it wrong. T-H-C-R-I-O. I spelled it wrong. Yeah. And we could have just copied this one here to get it. All right. Hit enter. And there it's pushing it. Okay. So pretty straightforward. Uh, we could have even done this. We could have said like, uh, export, um, Tag name, right? And we could have done this, right? And then we could have just done that. And we could have done that. I'm just cleaning it up, doing that uh, post, post refactor here. And um, here we could have just put these in as such. So we could have done this. And then this would have been GH. Uh, image name, and then this would have been GH version. And so you get the idea there. So that's pretty much it. Let's go take a look and see where this actually is. I'm done with this personal access token. So I want to uh, delete it. So nobody else is using it. And 
this revokes all personal access toast and classic. Just in case, I'm going to do this. So I'm going to say Andrew WC Brown. I think they're all revoked, but just in case they're not, let's do that anyway. And we'll go over here and we'll take a look at our profile because it might show up under packages here. I'm not exactly sure how you set public packages. Oh, there it is. It's private. All right. And I'm not sure if, if it's specific to a repo. Link this package to a repository. So I guess if we wanted to link it, we would have had to apply uh, a label. And so I guess labels are what you think they are. They're labels. And that way we could associate it. I'm not going to do that here today. I think that's fine. But I will copy this just in case anybody else wants to do that. And um, we'll go ahead and save our changes. Okay. And uh, this really doesn't want to push here today. I'm not sure why, git push. What doesn't it like? Um, uh, oh, push protection. Okay, it detects something here. Oh, is my token in here? Wow, that's cool. It actually detected it. So that because we turned on security scanning earlier, it would not let me do that. That's awesome. I wish we, I, I thought of showing that earlier. So don't show token. Actually, what we have to do uh, is we can't even just push the old one. We have to amend uh, the last one we had. So if we go over here, uh, I'm going to have to go ahead and amend this. So I'm trying to figure out if there's a way I can just quickly amend. Um, I'm going to get rid of this change here first. I'm just going to say discard this change. And I'm going to type in git commit hyphen hyphen amend. And so now uh, what I should be able to do is go into here for all changes, right? And I should just change it. Actually, no, that'll just amend the message. Sorry, that's not gonna do what we want. Uh, what we actually need to do here is, we have amend mode, I think we are, yeah. Um, I'm gonna do git reset uh, soft head tilde one. And what that will do is bring the changes back into here. And so now I can go back and fix that. But that's really good that uh, I had the, the secret scanner turned on. Do not commit your GitHub token, but we did also delete it, so it's less of a problem as well. Uh, GitHub packages. So just be really, really careful with that stuff, okay? And there you go. So I'll see you in the next one, okay? Ciao. So for a GitHub repo, under the Insights tab, you can gain lots of statistical graphs about the repo. And so Insights contains the following tabs. We got Pulse, this is an overview of recent activity, contributors, a list of contributors and their activity stats, community standards, uh, commits, code frequency, dependency graph, network, forks. And I want to point out that on the exam, they definitely I had to know the contents of some of these, which I think is really silly, but that's how they did the exam. And so it's important that you pay close attention here of what kind of stuff can show up on these pages so you can identify uh, which uh, category of um, graphs they're talking about here or charts or whatever you wanna call them. Um, and I noticed that Repo Insights is not listed as available in the free tier, but I think if it's a public repo, it shows up. So maybe they're talking about for private repos. I didn't thoroughly test it, but I just wanted to point that out about, um, about that there. Let's go take a look at all of these in more detail. The first is Pulse. This contains pull requests, open close ratio, issues, open close ratio, summary of activity, a graph of top contributors, list of merge pull requests, list of issues closed, list of issues open, list of unresolved conversations. Remember this one, because this one will help you narrow down or, or rule out the rest, because this one is a little bit more complex than other ones. Uh, then we have contributors. This contains a graph of all commits over a time period, a graph of a specific contributor commits over a time period. Then we have community standards. This is a checklist of, uh, of recommended I spelled that wrong, but recommended community standards and how 
much a community profile has completed. This graph will only show for repos that have community profiles. So community profiles are open source projects on GitHub. And I think you have to turn it on to turn yours into a community profile, okay? We have repo insights. So this contains a number of commits per week for the last 52 weeks for a year. That's how many weeks there are in a year. So that kind of makes sense. The average number of commits by day uh, of the week uh, for the selected week. Then we have um, code frequency. This contains the amount of additions and deletions of a code, uh, a code repo, or sorry, of code to a to a report per month. <laughs> I really wrote that weird, but you get the idea that you have additions and deletions over time. And I noticed that for really large repos, they can't even render it. So this is not really useful for large open source projects, but um, you can see it in smaller projects. And that's what I, I said right there down at the bottom. Uh, we have dependency graph. This contains list of dependencies, list of dependents, and export software bills of materials, also known as SBMO, SBOMS. So security and compliance teams increasingly request software bills of materials to identify open source components of their software projects. They assess their vulnerability to emerging threats and verify alignment with license policies. So it sounds like a good thing for security folks. Um, then we have the network graph. This thing is super useful, um, especially when you're working on uh, like, uh, or you're utilizing an open source project and something goes wrong. I will jump into this and try to find uh, other commits from other, other branches or forks to uh, get the functionality that I need in my application. So this will show the 100 most recent pushed forks. You can read the commits to determine the difference of these forks. Um, then we have forks itself. So this contains a list of fork, uh, filterable forks, very similar to the last one, but this is just a, a list of forks. And the other one is over, um, over time and it's visualized. But yeah, I just want to point out that you do need to know these ones, uh, even though, again, I think it's a bit silly, but yeah, you're going to have to know specifically like what they're doing on these, um, on these, on these pages or graphs. Okay. Hey, it's Angie Brown. And in this fall along, we're just going to take a look at repo insights. So what I want to do is go to a popular repository like Ruby on Rails that has a lot of activity and take a look at what their insights look like. So the first is Pulse, and you really need to know Pulse because again, on the exam, they might ask you about this one in particular. Uh, if you notice here, we can change the scope. So we can say one month, 24 days. Um, this one's gonna show us here um, at, uh, open versus closed, I believe. So we have open and closed pull requests and open and closed issues, red being closed. I'm gonna assume purple is closed and green is open. Now we have some summaries, merge pull requests, open pull requests, closed issues, new issues. These here are all listed down below. So if you click on this, it's gonna just jump to that location, okay? So that's how you know what's all down here. These four things are listed down below. The nice thing here is this summary. So excluding merges, 75 authors have published 240, 247 commits and 388 commits, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of like a thing you can put in a PowerPoint. Then these are your top contributors. So the person that was uh, doing all the work here is Jonathan Hefner. So good job, John, uh, keep up the great work. Um, let's move on. So we have contributors. These are people that are contributing code. And so it shows kind of a histograph of, or ticker, ticker tape or whatever you wanna call it, of the amount of commits that they are committing. So we have a good idea there. And this is for everybody across the top. So in 2014, you can see a lot of stuff was happening. Probably a major refactor was occurring and that's probably why that's so huge there. Um, probably again, other peaks where you're seeing very large things is they're preparing for new versions of Ruby on Rails. We'll go over to community standards, checklist, cool. We'll go to commits. Um, shows us that there was a lot of activity this year in December. So in December, I mean, this, we're in January right now at the time of this video, but in December, you can see they did a lot of work for Christmas. And then back here in February, they did a lot of work for some reason. You can see Monday seems to be the busy day, but I'm not sure. Oh, you click to find out. Okay. Before I didn't know, like with this is over time, but I guess it's like you click it and then it shows you. Okay. Code frequency won't show us here, okay? Dependency graph, uh, things that it's dependent on, makes sense. Network, 
This will take a little bit of time because this has at least 100 forks. We'll give it a moment. But I'm telling you, this thing is super powerful and I've used it since the day it's existed and it's been around for a very long time. Um, but when you're working on open source projects and you're having issues, you can bet your buttons that somebody else has already fixed it and you can just go look at their commits and figure that stuff out. So yeah, we'll let that keep loading. And while that's loading, we'll open a new tab and we'll take a look at forks. So here's all our forks. Okay, we can sort based on stuff. Uh, and hopefully the exam won't ask you about what you can filter by. They do, they do that for issues for some weird reason, but uh, come back here. And so we can see this is Rails, right? And so if we go over here, we can see, oh, this person's doing something. Make the, this relation model delegation stricter. They have a work in progress here. We go down here, add a readme, something in another language, update screenshot and getting started with Rails. But sometimes, yeah, fix style code. Sometimes people find like bugs and before they even get fixed, they'll be in someone else's fork. And so you can grab them and just keep working. But uh, yeah, that is um, insights. We can take a look and see if we get any insights in our teeny tiny repos. We go to this one here and we get insights. And so we already have some stuff here. We can see a few different Andrew Browns. Notice here that shows exam pro dev. The reason why is that you can have, um, uh, you can like, if I'm on my computer, my computer, which is here, uh, it can have a different Git email and name set. So even though it is from this account, which it was, it can show a different person was contributing. So just be aware of that. But anyway, yeah, that is Repo Insights. See you in the next one. Ciao. So in GitHub, we are able to create ourselves issues and it's pretty straightforward. You just need a title and description and we can also create it via the GitHub CLI. Um, there's not really much else to say about creating issues, um, but there you go, okay. All right, let's do a comparison between issues, discussions, and pull requests. It's very important to understand or distinguish these three things because they seem kind of similar, but uh, they're not. Um, so the first is issues. They are for tracking tasks, bugs, enhancements, and other actionable items. Then you have discussions. These are facilitating conversations and Q and A's about a wide range of topics related to uh, the project. And then you have pull requests, proposing, reviewing, and merging code changes in the code base. So on the issue side, this is often linked to code changes and can be linked to PRs. For discussions, you have categorized by topics, can be converted to an issue, but really it just creates an issue with a soft link to the issue. So it doesn't really have the same kind of relationship that an issue would have with a PR. Um, it's not directly linked to code changes. Um, so again, discussions are really for as it's implied, community uh, engagement or uh, conversation around your repo. Um, we have for pull requests directly linked to code changes can be linked to issues. Now I should point out that when you have the numbering for issues, it has like one, two, three, four, five, your pull requests will, I think, pull from the same pool of numbers. We'll test that to make sure that's the case. Um, and so uh, just understand that when you reference issues or pull requests, um, they're pulling from the same number pool, okay? There you go. So what I wanna do in this video is I wanna prove a theory that the issues and pull requests are pulling from the same number pool in terms of when they're incrementing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over uh, to our GitHub examples repo um, and I want to create a new issue and make note of the number that is used. So we're gonna go here and I'm just gonna say, uh, create a new um, issue, okay? And we'll create this and notice that we have the number seven, okay? So we have the number seven. So the question is, if we were to use a new pull request, create a new pull request, what would we get? So I'm gonna make a new pull request and I technically have some code that I can merge in. If you don't, then you'll have to make some, but I'm gonna go ahead and create this new pull request and this will be Andrew Brown into the exam pro repo and go all the way down to the bottom or maybe all the way to the top, sorry. <laughs> and we're gonna go ahead and create that new pull request and just say more changes, okay? 
And let's make note of the number. The number here is five. If we go over to issues, the last one that we created in our, um, oh, sorry, the pull request over here is five. Okay, so that didn't make for a very good example because it went the other way. <laughs> so what I'll need to do is I wanna delete this pull request. This one's kind of useless, we'll close that. And what I actually need is I need some kind of change in this repo to go the other way. All right, because I need to see if that other number is gonna increment. We'll go back to this main repo. And remember we created this issue, and this issue number was seven. And so I wanna see what the next PR in here is gonna be. We did just close this one, but maybe we need a PR for just something locally, not something across, across uh, forks, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and go to code and I'm gonna go to branches. And I need to just move over to another branch. We have some junk branches here. I'm just gonna go ahead and delete them. Okay. And I'll even get rid of this one here. We don't need that. I'm gonna give this a refresh. And so now what I want to do is create a new branch. I'm just gonna just say um, number test. And so this will be off of main. And then what we can do is go over to our code and I just need to make some kind of change. So I'll, I'll switch over to number test. And what I wanna do here is I want to just change something. So I'm gonna go into our git crash course, go into our hello, and I'm gonna go edit this file. And we'll add uh, another exclamation mark. We'll commit those changes. And so now we have a reason to make a pull request. We'll make a new pull request. And this one, I just want it to be in the current repo. I don't wanna go uh, somewhere else. So very straightforward here, here to there. And let's make note of the number that is used. So here it's using the number eight. So I wanna show you, this is seven and this is eight. So they are indeed pulling from the same number pool. So just so you know, like you might expect clean numbers as you're going up with your issues and you're like, what happened to this number? Is it an unlucky number? Did GitHub get rid of it? No, it's probably over in your pull request, okay? We can also link pull requests. We'll probably do this later again, but you can link your issues to your pull requests. Um, if you go to development here on the right-hand side, you can just click here and associate this way. So I can go here and then choose a pull request. Mm, it's not showing up for some reason. Do we not have a pull request over here? We do, it's right here, yeah. Go back over here, development. Oh, did I click the, I clicked the wrong repo, that's why. And so I can choose this one here and we'll apply it. And so now this is linked um, uh, to that there and it shows the link there as well. You might be able, to be able to link them up here as well. I'm not exactly sure. So what I'm gonna do, I just wanna unlink that for a second. Okay. And I wanna see what happens if we were to, um, if we were to go and update this and then put in, like it says closes eight. Right, and we do this. Would this link it? I mean, we have eight here, it's showing there, okay. And link a pull request that it now is closed. So did it just do that? I'm like, I'm not 100% sure, did it do that? Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just delete this for a second, edit, to update, because I can't tell. <laughs> but that's what I wanna know. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do this one more time. I'm gonna delete this issue, okay. And I wanna see if that takes any kind of effect. So we'll make a new one. We'll just say a uh, cool issue. And we'll say closes pound eight. Okay, and I, I just wanna see if it's linked in any way. So it doesn't look like it's linking in any way there, but it could be that um, a particular commit could close a ticket for sure. Um, but I thought something with pull requests would happen here. Well, anyway, what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna edit this to say my Cool issue. And what I wanna do is I wanna see when we close this pull request, when we cl close this pull request, will it close this ticket? Okay, so I'll link a pull request now that will close this ticket. So we'll go over here, and I'm gonna go here, and I want to merge and pull and confirm. Now we could just close it, but I don't think that's the same thing. So I'm gonna go over to our issue and I think our issue's now been closed. So it was closed when we closed 
that pull request. Another thing we should, we should check is, is using keywords. So this thing called keywords issues, I think. It could also be in PRs, GitHub. Using keywords in issues and pull requests, suggesting that it could be used for either or. So to link a pull request to an issue, show the fix, so automatically closes. When someone merges the pull request, type one of the following keywords followed by a, a reference to issue. So close the issue when someone merges the pull request. Okay, so that's something we could try doing when someone merges the pull request. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reopen this issue. And um, by the way, just because we have a pull request doesn't mean we can't uh, push to it again. But uh, like you can use a pull request and push, well, we'll talk about that when we get in the pull request section. I don't wanna confuse anybody here. So I'm gonna go back over to uh, here. I'm gonna switch back to number test. And we're gonna go into get crash course. And we're gonna go into hello. We're gonna edit. Uh, I guess it's already here. Wait, can we just edit it right there? No. <laughs> edit. Another exclamation mark. Commit the changes. Commit it. Good. We're going to go over to pull request. Make a new pull request. And uh, keep it real simple. We want to go to the keep in the same repo. And we want this to be number test. We'll create that pull request. And I mean, I want this to close but it says when we merge here, it says to link a pull request to an issue, show that the fix is in progress or automatically closes the issue when someone merges. So I'm gonna say fixes, I, and we're gonna put a pound here. This will be cool issue, that's our new one. And I wanna see if that links it in any weird way. It's not weird, but in some way. So I'm gonna go back over to my issues. We'll take a look here. And notice it says link a pull request now that will close this issue. So, you know, it was saying that it had to be at the time of merge, but did, does it really? Because it looks like it just has to be somewhere in the comment here to link it. So it links pull request to issue, but not the other way around, right? So it has to be in, in that uh, direction, okay? Um, so I think that's really important to note. The other thing is that the exam will probably ask you to remember these words. Notice we have close, fix, resolve. Close, fix, resolve. You can remember that then you'll be able to pick it out in a list because they might show like just closes and then fixed and then resolves and try to mess with your mind. Uh, but I understand those three there, but hopefully that gives you a little bit more uh, information about issues. Um, very obvious things, you can assign people to an issue. You can apply labels to an issue if you want. You can uh, associate to a project, you can associate to a milestone and we saw that it can be part of a branch and a pull request, um, all pretty clear stuff. We can pin issues. I'm sure we'll talk about that later on, but if I pin it, it will then go to the top here. If I go back over to my issues, here it is. A few other things um, is the, the sorting stuff here. You really should know how to filter, uh, filter with uh, some of these options here. And I'm gonna just tell you on the exam, they, they said, hey, how do you filter issues like what options do you have to filter? And they gave you a list and you had to pick from them. I really didn't like that. I thought it was kind of a dirty question, but that was something you might have to answer. You might have to know this query language a little bit. So just understand that those might show up on the exam, but definitely linking is something that will show up in the exam for sure um, and creating a branch, okay? So hopefully that gives you a better idea of issues there. All right, ciao. So something you can do is you can create um, a branch from an issue and you, or you can associate an issue to a branch. Uh, what you can do is you can go ahead and create a branch uh, on your issue. Then it will allow you to uh, name the branch. Notice that it's going to have the number of the issue in front of it, which is a common convention when making feature branches. So people know what issues or ticket it goes back to. This is not just with GitHub, this is with any project tracker that has to do with code. A common workflow is creating feature or bug uh, branches, but define your issues up front and then you quickly create those branches and that way you don't forget to make those branches. Creates great habits. So you define the feature bug, then you go ahead and you make the branch. There you go. Hey, this is Angie Brown and this fall along, I wanna create a, uh, a branch from an issue. We've probably done it before, but let's do it again because maybe we'll learn something different if we do it slightly different. 
Um, and it seems to be a very important topic for the exam. So we do have this issue from before. I'm just gonna go ahead and close this as this one is uh, done. And I'm gonna go back up here and we'll make a new issue. We'll call this issue cooler issue, right? Cooler issue. And what I wanna do is I want to create a branch. So what's interesting is you can link a branch, you can link a branch or a pull request. I think we've created a branch this way, but we've never uh, done it the other way. So let's just go ahead and create a branch. And you can see that's pretty straightforward. I don't think that's super exciting. Um, notice that the branch has to be one of the branches you have here. Uh, so sorry, I guess you could actually associate it to an existing branch. So uh, repository destination, change branch source. Oh, sorry, what you're branching from. Okay, that's what that's for. But yeah, we can create a branch there, pretty straightforward. Uh, but let's do this the other way. We're gonna go ahead and create the branch first and then connect an issue to it. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna say new, super cool branch. Super cool. And we'll go ahead and do that. We'll go ahead and create our issue. This will be, whoops. <laughs> this will be our super cool issue, right? and I'll just put cool in here. That's emojis, that's how you use them. And uh, what we can do here is then click here and it says link branch or pull request. Most times we've been doing this with pull requests, but we'll do this with um, uh, a branch now. And so look at the icon that tells you what it is. So these are, um, these blue ones, I, I pretend like I know, these blue ones are our, um, Branches, these purple ones are our pull requests. And this green one here is, I have no idea. Is that another issue? Can you link issues to other issues? Can you? No, that's not that that is. So that's something. What is that? Is it like an old one? No. I know we made that. What is it? Number test. Number test. What is that? Okay, we should find that, well, what well, that is. We'll go here, and so now we've applied a branch the other direction, okay? But uh, I really wanna know what that number test thing is. It's another branch, okay? So then why was it colored differently? That's what I wanna know. Maybe it was a branch, maybe it's a branch that's been merged in before, that's probably why. So that's probably what they're doing. So they're both branches, it's just that branch has already been merged again, so you'd be using an old branch that you, that you've already done. I think that's what they're trying to indicate there. They don't really like tell you about these uh, icons anywhere. If they are in the documentation, they are super hidden. But I wanna go back here and take a look. See, now this one's blue, this one's blue. Yeah, so these ones I think are ones that have been um, number test green. So green is, it's already been merged in. You can see the icon, it shows that it looks like it's been merged in and it shows that it's a branch. So this is actually a, uh, a branch that has been merged, okay? But uh, yeah, hopefully we learned something new or we got a bit extra practice and I'll see you in the next one, okay? Ciao. So with search and filters, you can quickly sort through a lot of your issues. There's a bunch of predefined ones that are there or you can use a syntax language uh, called the advanced search syntax and roll up to find uh, something more advanced. The exam, at least for me, absolutely asked me both the syntax and the predefined filters um, and specifically, they used the filter names that were here. So um, with those, but there's also sorting, right? So I'm not showing that here, but they, uh, I also got an exam question asking me about what you could sort by. Uh, but uh, yeah, you definitely need to know all those three things and we'll take a closer look on maybe a bigger repo so that we can get some practice, okay? <laughs> Hey, it's Andrew Brown, and in this follow along, we're gonna look at how to search and filter issues. So I'm gonna make my way over to Rails because they should have a lot of issues, 409, uh, 455, that's not a small amount. And let's take a look at what we can filter by. So we have open issues and pull requests, so we can do that. We have your issues, so things that you're assigned to. We have your pull requests, which I'm confused why, oh, you know what it is? It's flipping me between the two things. So it's suggesting that these interfaces are the same. I didn't even notice that. Okay. 
So your pull request, notice we change tabs. We can go back to your issues over here. We have everything assigned to you and then everything you're mentioned in. Okay, so assigned, mentioned, the ones you opened and then things that are open for pull requests or issues. It's weird that like they have this one joined, but this one's separate, I have no idea why. Um, another thing that we should make note of is these filters here because they might say, hey, are you able to filter based on project? Hey, are you able to filter based on assignee or sort or filter? So these are basically, um, these are broad filters and then these are um, very specific filters, like very, very specific. And then we have our sort over here where we can sort some stuff. But yeah, you'll need to know this stuff, uh, this and the advanced search syntax. So I, I have some written out here. We can play around with it a bit and see what we can do. So let's see what we can do. We can say is issue and that seems to be a thing. So we'll go ahead and hit enter there. So yes, it's an issue. Um, we could say no assignee. Okay, so nobody's assigned to it. We could put label active support. So we're filtering based on this one here. Let's see if that works. Cool. And I wonder if we could do like some generic text search. Um, so maybe we could just say replace on the end here. And notice that it's picking up, I think that, like let's try caches, caches. Okay, so we're kind of getting that. It might be the contents of it, but it is trying to do search for it. We could also say something like there's zero comments. So let's say comments zero. So those ones have zero comments. And so that gives you an idea of how uh, that works. Um, so, you know, hopefully that is pretty straightforward, but yeah, the filters is the same for pull requests and issues. Um, and, you know, if there's more to it, we could click here and you can read through all the options. Uh, but for the most part, you can pretty much figure it out and guess based on what kind of options you have over here that you could filter by. But we'll see you in the next one, okay? Ciao. So issue templates are markdown templates that are preloaded for new issues. They help ensure users creating issues provide all relevant and expected information. And if the exam, if one of the exam language, there was a exam question that says you can coerce, <laughs> terrible word, but coerce people into writing what you want them to write. So here's an example, it's a markdown template. That's all it's really doing is loading in that markdown template. And the idea is that they, you can have different issue templates. So a new category will appear here of issue and then people open it up from there. Some of these are kind of linked to stuff. So like that report to vulnerability is not necessarily an issue template, um, but bug report and feature requests are, but they're like built-in ones. I should point out that on the exam, they'll probably ask you, what are the three default ones? And these are the three. So you should remember report bug or bug report, feature request and uh, report uh, security vulnerability. Because now that I'm remembering it, they definitely asked me that. Um, you create issue templates here in that folder. So you make a folder called issue underscore templates, all in caps, and you put them in there. Originally you used to just have one called issue template.md. Some older projects still have that, but everything goes in that folder. And we're gonna find out that issue forms also go in there as well, which is the beta replacement for this feature that I never could get working. Um, GitHub has a wizard GUI to easily create issue templates. So you don't really have to write um, uh, markdown there, but uh, it will spit out markdown. But we'll take a look at what that looks like uh, since I haven't used it in a while, but we'll find out here shortly, okay? Let's take a look at issue forms. This is the evolution of issue templates and it uses a YAML formatted file to create issue forms for stricter entry for issue information. As the time of this video, this is a beta feature, so it might go away. What's odd is that they want to include it in the exam, so beta features can appear in uh, GitHub certifications, which I disagree with, but that's what they're doing. And so here's an example of the template. I don't think they'll ask you the format of the template. Um, like GitHub Actions, they'll definitely do, but not for issue forms, because it's so new. And that's kind of a visualization of what that would look like. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown and this follow along, we're gonna take a look at issue templates and we'll try to do issue forms. I never got it working the first time I tried it, but maybe it'll work this time around. Let's go take a, a, a peek and see who would might have some existing uh, issue templates. I know Rails does, but the thing is Rails is such an old 
um, or mature <laughs> product that they've had this template, this issues template file in here forever, and they don't have it in the, uh, the place where you expect it to be. So it would be in the doc GitHub folder, but it's right here. They don't have a, a, um, a folder of them. So this is actually the old way. So they say, you're using an old version of the issue template, use the new way of doing it. So that's not recommended anymore, okay? But um, maybe a better project might be like Forum. Uh, if Forum's still around and kicking. Because I feel like they would utilize this. And if we go over to our issues, let's say we wanted to make a new issue. We have um, this one. This one looks like a template. Okay, so maybe this is a template that they're using and we have that format there. And we might just steal this so we can save some time later on. So I'm gonna leave this tab open. I just don't feel like making a new one. <laughs> and if we go over to their code, let's take a look and see what they have in their GitHub folder. And in here they have issue template, and there it is. They also have a config YAML, so there's a little bit more going on there than, than I thought. Um, is, that, is this the new style? That looks like an issue form. I think that's an issue form. Okay, well maybe we'll grab both of theirs and see if we can get these both to work. But I didn't see that when we opened an issue. Let's go back here and take a look. New issue. Um, I don't see it. So I'm not 100% sure on that. But if it's a YAML file, then that's what it should be. Unless that's something else. And I'm just, maybe it's something else, I don't know. So anyway, let's go ahead and do that for our own repo. So I'm gonna go here into GitHub, GitHub examples. And I'm gonna actually open this up in github.dev. I can do that by hitting the period. By the way, if you hit comma, it doesn't do anything. Um, I'm just gonna try that. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just convinced maybe a comma does something, it doesn't do anything. We'll hit period, and that's gonna open up github.dev. Um, oh, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna do that. Hold on, let's close that out. Maybe comma does do something, I'll have to check that again. So we'll go here, and I want to go onto the left-hand side, and we're gonna make a new folder here. We're gonna call this dot git ignore, or sorry, dot git ignore, dot git hub. <laughs> That's a file. That's not a folder. Let's try that again. We'll say new folder dot github. And then inside of that, we'll make a new folder, call it issue template. Is that what it's supposed to be called? Issue template? Yeah. And then I'll make a new one in here and we'll say, um, I'm trying to think of something, secret. We'll call this secret MD. And I mean, I said I was gonna copy this. I guess we don't really need to, we can just make our own. And I'm just gonna put anything in here. So I'll just say, welcome to the secret uh, submissions. Submit to secrets. Okay, I don't know if that's a thing. I'm just gonna put cool here. I think that should render out because that's uh, that's something there. And I'm gonna go ahead and add this. Commit or add issue template. Go ahead and commit and pull. Good. I wanna go back to this repo. So I'll open another tab here. And if I go and open an issue, do we have it? Mm, it didn't show us uh, options. Must have done something wrong. Let's go back here. Dot GitHub issue template. Dot GitHub issue template. I made an MD file, yeah. I don't understand. It looks right to me. Okay, so we'll go back over here. Maybe we got something wrong, that's okay. And we'll rename this. I mean, I don't think so. Secret.md. What if we um, refresh the page? I'm just gonna do a hard refresh here. I just don't trust it. New issue. We're not seeing issue templates. Okay. Let's go to our settings. Well, hold on, is this repo private or public? Because that could matter. This is a, um, 
Oh, this is a private repo, I think. You cannot change the visibility of this fork. Is this public or private? No, it's it's public. Oh, I'm um I've added this here. This is, this, this is my fork. Yeah, it is here. But it's not showing up here. Maybe it only works if it's on the, the main one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a pull request. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're going to just create a new one and uh, update and just say update here. I'm going to create that one. And maybe that's going to resolve our issue. I don't want to get confused. No, we only have one pull request. And we'll go over to this one. I think it's because it's a fork. And so maybe it only works on the, the top level one. And we'll go ahead and we'll just merge this pull request. And now we'll take a look and see what happens. So we'll go to issues, new new issue. No, it's not showing us anything. It's a public repo. It's in the right folder. What else does it want from me? Let's go here. Um, hmm. Yeah. What could I be doing wrong? That is a good question. Is it because this is not a community project? Okay. Issue templates not working. This is a legacy workflow to create issue templates. We recommend using the upgraded issue template builder. Okay. If you use a legacy workflow to manually do that, well, let's click on that. Create an issue template. You can create an issue template as an issue template subdirectory uh, in any of the supported folders to contain multiple issues. So it could be in multiple folders. Okay. Dot GitHub. I swear I've done this before. To make an issue template uh, visible in the repository, do this. Commit the changes. I'm like going crazy here because I definitely I made it. Um, and use the template query parameter to specify the template that will fill the issue body. Okay. Do we need maybe a, um, a, like maybe we need a YAML file. Let's go back over to form. Mm, I don't think so. Do we need some front matter maybe in the, yeah, that might be something we need in the, in the file here. Yeah, okay, you know what we're missing? We're just missing some front matter. That's what it is. That's what it is. Okay, so I'm gonna go back over to this one, I guess. And what we need is some front matter in here and that's why it's not working. Front matter is um, is this, it can go into YAML files, I think, or maybe not, maybe markdown files. And this is like YAML stuff you put at the top here. So I'll just say secret, secret, uh, secret issue. Submits a secret. Um, and I think the idea here is you can automatically assign labels. So maybe we have like a secret label. We'll have to make a label for that because we don't have one. Uh, I want to go back to, oh, let's use that command. I'm going to do control K. There we go. I love this. And I'm going to type in um, examples. It's just like a fast way to navigate to stuff. I got to remember to do that more. Um, and we want to make a new label over here. I'm gonna call this one secret. I'm on the wrong repo. <laughs> Control K. Uh, I'm gonna try this again. Example. I want mine. Why is it only showing this one? All right, well, I guess that feature is not as great as I thought it was. But we'll go over here. And I'll go to issues and then I'll go to labels and I'll add a new one called secret. And we choose something crazy, maybe that. Okay, so there's our new secret. I don't need any signees, we'll leave that blank. We'll save that. Update issue template. Commit and push. We'll go back over here. And now we go to issues and we say new issue. There we go. 
Now, what's interesting is that we weren't getting those three default ones, which I'm really surprised. If we go to edit templates, okay, they go there, but they usually have like a builder. I remember them having a builder before and I don't know where it is now. So that's really interesting. Hmm. Well, we can go back to the other one. Like this works. I'm sure this works. We fill it in. There it is. But what I'm surprised is we don't have those three default ones there. And I know again on the exam, they showed that. And I could have swore that they would have set you up with that. But maybe if it only happens that this is a community project, which again, I'm not even sure how to uh, set that up. Um, I kind of forget. So a place to set community project, community project. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, insights, community. Oh, here it is. To enable discussions, uh, enable discussions to unlock community insights. Okay, sure, we'll enable that. I don't really wanna enable that right now, but maybe that's what would bring those issues in later. We can go check. I'm just, again, I just wanna see why I can't see those default ones. And we'll go here and we'll go back to this repo. Uh, GitHub, examples, and well, first I just want to open an issue over here. No templates, fine. Let's go over to community again. Issue templates, add, what if we click it here? Okay, so this is where the builder is. It's weird that um, it didn't show another place. Okay, so here's some, a couple of the default ones. So we can go here and do this. And then there's custom template. So maybe these are the three ones because I said the other one was like vulnerability one, but maybe it's these three because it was trying to ask you like, what were the default ones that were there? So I think maybe I was wrong <laughs> in that slide and it's really custom template. We'll go ahead and we'll just propose those changes and say continue. And now if we go over to issues. All right, that looks fine. I wonder how they got the little icon there. Maybe there's some way to do that. Now we can edit the templates over here. Not really though. I thought we could do a little bit more there, but we now have uh, those in here, secrets in here as well. But of course this one doesn't have a front matter and that's why it's not working. We're gonna go back and switch over to our old one here. And um, what I wanna do is I want to try to get that issue form working because I've never gotten one of those working before. So I'm gonna look up issue form and I wanna just give it another go on GitHub here, issue form. I'm just looking for an example one. So here's an example of one. I'm gonna grab this whole one here. I'll copy it. I'm gonna go back over to here and I'm gonna make uh, a new one. We'll just call this one extra MD. It's actually uh, YAML. Okay, we'll paste this in, we'll save it. And we'll just say extra bug report at the top so it can distinguish it from the other one. And We'll go ahead and commit this. Try and add an issue form. Like I like the idea of issue forms, but uh, you know, again, beta feature. So why why is it an exam? Um, and we'll see if we can get this to work. This was committed on this one here, so I'm going to go back over to uh, uh, this one. Come on, <laughs> let me. I have like a, my, my mouse is sticking. That's why I'm getting a double click, eh? And actually I'm in the account that I wanna be. I'm just trying to get to that repo again. So we'll click over here and we'll go back into ours. And now we'll go to issues. And I wanna see if that other one shows up. It does, okay, finally. And now we actually have those fields. So that's pretty nice. Um, before I had like the hardest time getting this to work, but now it's working no problem. So I think that covers it for issue forms and issue templates, and I will see you in the next one. Ciao. So for GitHub issues, you're able to pin them and you can pin up to three. Once you pin them, they show up the top and it makes it really easy uh, to find the most important issues. That's pretty much it, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and we are taking a look at pull requests, often abbreviated as PR, and you'll see that a lot, it's very common, uh, is a formal process to put forth changes that can be manually or automatically reviewed before it's accepted into your 
base branch, your main branch here. So here are pull requests in GitHub. And the benefits of pull requests is collaboration review or collaborative review. So enhances code quality through team discussions and peer feedback. It, it, it tracks changes. It says change tracking, but tracks changes. Provides a record of code changes and related discussions. Automated testing enables integration with tools for automated checks and tests. Controlled integration manages safe and reviewed merging of code changes. Open source friendly simplifies contributions and collaboration in open source projects. I want to point out that pull requests is not a necessarily a Git feature, but a, a workflow. And GitHub has built a bunch of features around pull requests. Pull requests aren't unique to GitHub. Um, it's just part of the workflow and, and whatever they want to build around it, they can build around it. And that has to do with other tools that do this like Jira and Bitbucket or whatever other tools like GitLab and stuff. Okay. So we can create pull requests using the GitHub CLI. Uh, that's one really cool way of doing it. The other way is using uh, the GitHub website. So you go to the pull request tab in your repo, you create a new pull request. And there it is. I'm sure you know by now how to create a pull request because it's almost impossible not to show you that 100 times over before we got to pull requests here, but that's how you create them. One thing I wanna point out is um, uh, that we have to set a base. This is who we're gonna merge into and ahead who uh, the changes that we're gonna pull into. Notice it says compare, and we'll talk about that in the next slide about base and compare, okay? <laughs> So base and compare determines the direction of the merge for a pull request. And the idea is we have the base. So is who you want to merge into. This is usually the main branch or an environment specific branch. It doesn't have to be main, but usually main is base, right? Um, then we have compare. This is what will be merged into base. Uh, compare is choosing the head reference. So notice before I called it head. And if you look very closely, it says choose the head reference. So that's what compare is. This is usually a bug or feature branch. Uh, another thing that I need to point out is that you can compare across forks. Uh, this is useful if you're trying to contribute to an open source project. So you're gonna have the option to choose the base uh, repository um, and the HUD repository to different uh, repos from different owners. So there you go. So a draft pull request on GitHub is a feature that allows you to open a pull request, but mark it as a work in progress. Uh, the use cases for draft pull requests would be indicating work in progress. So communicates the pull request is not ready for review or merging. Preventing premature merging ensures incomplete work is not accidentally merged. Facilitating early feedback and collaboration so people can talk about it. Continuous integration testing. So maybe you want to just run uh, a test code because when you have a pull request, it's automatically going to start doing that. Transitioning to a ready state, so easily switch from a draft to a ready for final review and merging. Organizing work and priorities help in managing and tracking ongoing work in large projects. Um, draft requests, draft pull requests is a feature only for GitHub organization teams. I believe you can use it in the uh, free, uh, uh, free organizations that are public. So we'll take a look and see if that's even possible. Uh, if, if I don't make a video, then you know that it wasn't. Uh, there are two things you need to remember for this. For the exam, dr uh, draft pull requests cannot be merged. Code owners are not automatically requested to review draft pull requests, okay? So remember those two things because they will show up on your exam. Ciao. Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and in this follow along, I wanna take a look and see if we are able to open up a draft pull request in our GitHub organization free account that we created. So what I'm going to do is make a new repo because we're going to need to need we're going to need to have one in our um, our one here. And actually, you know what I'm going to do? No, no, no. I'm just going to. Uh, I don't want to make it too complicated. I'm just going to make a new repo. So just say uh, like fun repo. We'll say fun repo. Okay. And this can be public. We're going to make it public so just in case we need to have that so we can have that functionality because a lot of times public allows us to have um, that paid functionality for free. So what I wanna do is take a look here and create a new pull request and see if we have the option. We don't have any code. So we'll need to create ourselves a new branch. I'm gonna just do that in here in the UI and we'll just say uh, dev and we'll create that branch. And then from here, we'll go over and I want to switch over to dev 
And then I want to edit the README here. And I'm just gonna put in some exclamation marks. We're gonna commit that change, looks good to me. And then we're gonna make our way over to pull requests and we'll make a new pull request. And what I wanna know is if I can make a draft pull request. So we'll say create new pull request and we'll drop this down and there it is. Okay, so that's all it takes to create a draft pull request. If there are code owners assigned, they can't touch it. Notice I cannot merge it. I'm clicking like a maniac. It's not gonna happen. And that is draft pull requests. So there you go. Let's talk about linking activity within a pull request. So you can link issues to a pull request so that the state of the pull request will automatically close the issue. We actually already did this before we looked at issues, during we looked at issues and we're looking at it again. So the idea is that you go up to development on that cog and you choose um, the issue, or sorry, the pull request and then they're linked. Okay, so that will close it. The other way is via those supported keywords. So if you have any of those words you put in the comment of the actual pull request, um, then that will close it. It says the pull request must be on the default branch, okay? The pull, re pull request must be on the default branch for it to work. I don't know if that's true. I mean, it worked for me when we did it, but um, how we did it, I guess it was on the default branch. But um, uh, anyway, that's that. I don't think that there's any point of us showing this again, because we've done it so many times, but hopefully you know that you can do that and the direction to which it happens. You're putting it in the uh, body, the description of the pull request, um, so it links to the issue, okay? Ciao. Let us take a look here at the different statuses a pull request can be. Surprisingly, this isn't an exam question, but it's something you should know, so let's go through them all. The first is open. The default status when a pull request is created, it's open for discussion review. Draft indicates the pull request is a work in progress and not ready for review. Close. The pull request has been closed without being merged. This status is used when the proposed changes are no longer needed or if the branch has been rejected, merged. The pull request changes has been merged into the target branch. The status indicates a successful conclusion of the pull request process. Changes requested. This status is used during the review process when a reviewer requests changes before the pull request can be merged. Review required indicates that the pull request requires a review before it can be merged. This status is common in repos where uh, reviews are mandatory part of the workflow. Approved, the pull request has been reviewed and approved for merging by the required number of, of reviewers. Conflict indicates that there are conflicts between the pull request branch and the target branch that needs to be resol resolved before merging. Ready for review, a pull request initially marked as draft can be changed to this status once it's ready for review. So that gives you an idea of the functionality of it. And you kind of figure this out as you are working with a pull requests, but there you go. So commenting in pull requests, which is basically saying reviewing in pull requests because comments really do link up to reviewing. But the idea is that uh, you can um, make a comment and in particular, you can have it so that it is reviewing changes. So when you are reviewing changes, a review change, a review can be a comment. It can be an approval. It can be a request changes, which has a comment attached to it. So hopefully that is clear um, that when you're doing pull requests, a comment is a review in a sense, okay? It uh, submits general feedback without explicitly approval, okay? Um, another thing I need to note is that you can uh, mark comments on specific lines of code that could require a review to begin. So there could be one where you're just saying something about the code, or you could literally be saying, hey, you have to do something about this before we'll accept it, okay? So the code owners file is a GitHub specific file that defines individuals or teams that are responsible for specific code in a repo. And so the idea is that they have the syntax that's similar to git ignore. And when a pull request is open, that modifies any files matching a pattern in the code owner's file, GitHub automatically uh, requests a review from the specified code owner. The code owner files go in either the root, uh, project root .github folder or docs directory. Um, and so, yeah, I think this is something that is a paid feature. It probably could be in free if we're talking about um, organizations, teams, or sorry, or like free organizations that have to take a look. But yeah, it is a very powerful feature, okay? <laughs>
So when you're merging a pull request, there are a few options. So we have this dropdown where we can either create a merge, this will bring all commits over into the repo. We have squash and merge, which will have one commit to be added. We have rebase and merge, which will be added and then do a rebase. The third one is a more complex one. So if you're not familiar with rebase, you're probably gonna be looking towards squash, which is a good one. Uh, the use case depends on your team's workflow. They may prefer only a single commit uh, uh, added. And so that's why you'd want to have squash or rebase, um, but you do have a lot of options there for how you want to bring code in uh, to your, uh, your, base, um, your base there. Required reviewers is a way for you to explicitly say, hey, these people have to review this code, otherwise it won't be accepted. Um, and so you can assign or uh, allow multiple re uh, re required re uh, reviewers before code uh, gets into a repo. And a lot of times you can say it can't be the same person uh, that submitted the code. And it's not uncommon to have like four or five people that can be required reviewers and two or three have to um, look it over before it gets accepted. So here um, I would be assigning myself and saying, okay, Omen King, this, this user has to um, review the code. And then from there, as that user, I would have to approve the changes. And then from there, it would change it to saying, okay, Omen King or Andrew Brown, approve the changes. And so now you'll be able to press that merge button, okay? So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown. In this video, I want to uh, do a little bit more with pull requests in terms of code reviews and Maybe we could try to get that code owner's file to work or um, you know, just things that we didn't get a chance to really get hands on with as we have made pull requests quite a bit, but not from a uh, reviewing kind of code proper way. So what I wanna do is I wanna make my way over to our, um, uh, our pretend organization and we're gonna go ahead and create ourselves a new repo unless we already have one like the fun repo, does that still exist? It does. So what we'll do is go ahead and use this one. And what I wanna do before we do anything else is I wanna add um, or make sure that the collaborator is added uh, to this repo here. And so I'm gonna go ahead and add Omen King, okay? And there I am. And I'm gonna go ahead and say, this person can maintain this repo. All right, and now they're part of this repo. So they're there. And the reason I was able to add that very quickly was because they were already part of a, of a team. So, or sorry, they were already part of our organization. So I didn't have to send an invite and confirm they're not external from that. So that was very easy. Um, the next thing I wanna do is I wanna go through and uh, create a pull request. It looks like we already have one here. So if we already have one, I'm not gonna make a new one. If you have to, you make a new one. But here it says this pull request, oh, this is that draft one, right? So we can't do anything with this one right now. Uh, so I'm just gonna close that pull request. I'm gonna go over here to pull request. I'm gonna try to make a new pull request because we still might have, yes, we do from earlier. And I'm gonna go ahead and create that pull request, okay? And so we'll create that one. And I wanna say that this has to be reviewed by Omen King. As soon as I do that, notice we cannot proceed forward until that's uh, ready. And there's another thing here that says ready for review. So this pull request is still a work in progress. So it's suggesting that this is a draft. I guess I didn't notice, but um, it probably was still set to draft. And so I'm ready for review, okay? And so now uh, Omen King should know that they need to approve it for this to work, okay? Another thing that we could do is we could add, um, require other things for approval. So we could go ahead and add a rule and rule sets allow us to do that. So there might be some things in here that we could set. Um, require status checks to pass. So that might be something that we might wanna do. And right now we don't actually have any status checks. And so that's the reason why we can't, <laughs> we can't add that there. So if I go back, okay. It would be nice to get some checks in here because that's the real value of pull requests is having some kind of automation thing in here. But I suppose we'd have to have like GitHub Actions or something else. So maybe we'll leave that for when we get to GitHub Actions and integrate it there. And we'll just continue on with the reviewers here. So um, I'm gonna switch to my other account. And I'm in this uh, repo and saying, oh, I need to add a review. So I can go here 
And let's say I don't like this change. I'm gonna go here and say request changes. I don't like it, make it better. And so if I do this, okay, now it's saying in red, hey, you gotta do something. I, it, like it's not allowed to go uh, through. Um, and by the way, it still, it still shows merge pull request. And I really don't want this to show up unless I've accepted it. So maybe there's a setting that we can do in here. I thought it would have been that rule set that we could do, but maybe there's something else that we can do to protect it. Always suggest updating the pull request branch. No. Moderation options. I might not be able to do it because I'm not the admin. So I'm gonna go back and switch over to this. I'll go back to settings. And what I'm looking for is the option to say that it requires uh, reviewers, or otherwise it cannot be merged. Um, and so that's what I'm looking for right now. Maybe it's under uh, rules. Could be branch protection as well. Let's take a look here. Require a pull request before merging. Um, I really thought that there would have been a rule for this. The reason I think that is because I'm used to um, I'm used to uh, using Jira and uh, and Bitbucket, and, and they'll let you do that. So maybe I can't set that. I'm not sure. Restrict creation. Yeah, so I'm really surprised I can't find that. Maybe it's there, but I can't find it, and that's totally fine. But let's go ahead and pretend. Uh, you know, we're going to go fix this issue. So we go here and it says, I don't like it, make it better. So how can we um, submit that fix, right? And the way we're gonna do that is we'll actually have to go to this branch and change something. So we'll go here and make sure we're in the correct branch. And in here, I'm just gonna go ahead and change it again. Okay, commit the change, commit. And so now if we go back to the pull request, we should be able to update this pull request. I'm trying to do that here. Files changed. Normally what happens like, and again, it's because I'm thinking of Jira and Atlassian is that you'd open another pull request and it would be the same one, the same spot. So I'm not sure if we can do that. Uh, if I go dev here, because it's the same branch, right? So if I do this, it says view pull request. How do I do this? Hmm. And again, it's because I'm expecting it to act like uh, another piece of software and it's not doing what I think it's doing. Review changes. I mean, I can review my own, that makes no sense. Review in code space. So I guess the way it's gonna work, I really thought there'd be a back and forth there, but I guess there's not. Is I suppose I would just have to go here and then approve it. Looks great. Okay, so yeah, I guess there's less process there than I thought. And now that I'm happy with it, I can go ahead and merge it. So the next question is, can we make a code owner file and see how that works? Because I think that would be kind of unique to do. <coughs> Sorry. And so I believe that file is called code owners. And uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and create myself a new file here, we'll say new file. I'm gonna say code owners. And I'm just gonna put an asterisk on here and just say Omen King. And so the idea is that anytime anything changes, it should assign it to Omen King. That's what I'm thinking anyway. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and commit these changes. And we'll do this again. Okay. And the idea is that if anything changes from that other person, they, they send a pull request, I'm hoping that it's gonna auto assign. Now this might not work because it might be only a paid feature, I don't know, but we're gonna try anyway. So I'm gonna go in the dev branch. And before I do anything, I'm actually gonna merge it the other way. Um, I'm gonna do that by opening up uh, code spaces on dev, and I'm just gonna merge it back in, into the direction. Cause I'm not gonna make a pull request that goes in the opposite direction. I'm not gonna do that. That doesn't make sense. Pull requests are supposed to go into your main branch, right? So 
So I'm just giving this a moment here. And what I want to do is do git, whoops, git merge main. I'll do git pull. I'll do git checkout main, git pull, just in case. We'll say git checkout main, git merge main, git push. Saying it's all up to date. I'm not sure if I, I'm convinced, so I'm going to double check. Uh, it's not showing our tree here, so let's say git graph. I really wish it would persist changes, but hey, it's code spaces. And I'll go back over to here. Do I have this now? And show it shows that uh, main is ahead of dev, so it's totally lying to me. They're definitely not in sync. I knew this was not the case. Oh, you know what? I merged when I was in main, so that's probably why. Uh, git checkout um, dev, git merge main. It's always great to have this open so we can see. And I'm gonna go sync those changes. Okay, just in case that didn't, I can just git push, just in case. Great, that is in good shape. I wanna stop this environment. Stop, good, we're stopping it. Okay, I'll go ahead and close that tab out. So now I have confidence that this code owners is in both. I, I just had a feeling I need to do that for some reason. I'm gonna go ahead and just change this. And we'll do that. I'm gonna go ahead and create a new pull request. And I wanna see whether it auto assigns. So we go here, dev, create a pull request. And look, it auto assigned it. So it says awaiting request to review from Omen King. Omen King is a code owner. Omen King will be requested when this pull request is created. So that means the code owner file is working. I don't need to create this pull request to know that. And I think that's sufficient. Um, the only last thing I would say is that, you know, people can comment directly on specific lines. Just remember that because they might ask you on the exam. And that's about it. We'll see you in the next one. Okay. Ciao. Hey everyone, this is Andrew Brown and this follow along, I want to show you uh, some of the more advanced options for pull requests. Um, in terms of the merge options and why you'd use one over the other. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into our GitHub examples. And in this case, we do need to open up uh, some kind of editor. Mm, I think we could get away with using uh, github.dev and that's what I'm going to do. So I'm gonna hit period on my keyboard and that's gonna open up the editor. We're still gonna need the repo open. So I'm gonna go here and wait for this to load and go to repo. And so, I'm, I'm gonna to wanna to go over here for a moment. I'm gonna get rid of this um, pull request so we're not getting mixed up. And um, I really wanna be on development. And I actually don't even know if I'm on that. So I'm actually gonna just close this stuff out. I might've mucked this up. And we'll close this out because I need to be on the correct branch for this to work. And I mean, we can do this in GitHub examples. I'm gonna do this in our other repo. Sorry, I'm, I know I'm all over the place. But I want to go back to our home and I want to go to our cool repo. So I'm going to drop down our, whoops, our option here. And I'm not sure why they don't ever show those on the right hand side. They really should. But we'll go here and I'm going to now um, open pull requests in a new tab here. And I'm going to go ahead and hit period. And the reason why, actually, you know what? We can't use uh, GitHub dev. Sorry. We're going to have to open up code spaces because what I need is that visualization tool so we can see what we're doing. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up GitHub code spaces, and we're gonna to have to wait a little while for this to start up, unless it's already running, that'd be really nice. And I'll be back here in just a second when it loads, okay? All right, so now that is ready, um, we want to <laughs> make this a little bit easier to look at. So I'm gonna switch my theme as per usual. We'll go to uh, a darker theme, there we go. And um, the other thing that I want to do here is I wanna switch out to the dev branch. So let's say git checkout dev. Okay, and another thing we're gonna need is a, a tree. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to extensions here. We'll say git graph, because we need to make this really clear what's going on. Uh, so I'm gonna go here and install this. Okay. And hopefully that installs nice and quick. Is it here? Not yet. Come on, git graph, install. You can do git graph. We want you, there we go. We want you here, Git Graph. 
So the idea is that I want to put a bunch of commits here and then we're going to merge them and see what it looks like when we do that. And then we'll try a different merge option and we'll see how much cleaner it is uh, doing that another way. So what I want to do is I want to go ahead and modify this file, save it. I'm going to go git commit hyphen m change one. And we can do ma to grab all of them in one go. And then I want to git push, okay? And then we're going to do this again, save. And I'm going to just do a semicolon so I can just get through this a lot quicker. So we'll do that again. We'll do that again. Okay, you're getting kind of the idea of what's going on here. We're kind of crazy. People are not going to be happy with all of our commits. Okay, great. So now if we go back to our Git graph here, we got a bunch of changes. I guess we should have incremented them. <laughs> it just says one, 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 one. Uh, we can amend those. Like there's a way to rename them. I don't really want to deal with that. But let's just assume we didn't name it all dumb like that. We made one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Or for the next one, we'll, we'll just name it two. So the idea is that what will happen, the question is what will happen when we merge this in? Will we end up with one over here or all of these over here? And that's what we're going to find out. So we'll create a pull request. We'll make a new pull request. We will merge dev to main. We'll create that pull request. I'm going to switch it back to normal. We'll create that pull request. We're going to ignore our reviewers. We're going to just uh, review it ourselves. And notice we're on create and merge commit. So we do this. And what do we get? We go back over to git graph. And I'm going to go git fetch. Because I'll update the graph without pulling anything. And now notice that all of these commits um, is up here now. OK, so that is there. It didn't squash them all into one. We still have all of the history of them, OK? So just to make this clear, I'm going to just go git checkout main, git pull, git checkout dev, git pull, because I want to show you that they're all still there. OK, oh, sorry, git merge main, git pull, and refresh. OK, and I'll just do a git push for our dev, sorry. But what I want to show you is that all of this history is still here. It's not gone, right? It's all still here. So hopefully that is clear. I know it's not the best visual, but I'm hoping that makes sense. What I want to do now is I want to do a, um, I want to do a squash, okay, for the branch. So I'm going to just make a new branch. Git checkout dev2. And actually, I'm going to do git checkout hyphen b dev2. And then we'll do git, um, because we want to push this branch, git push u origin dev2. And so now it's being remotely uh, tracked. And I want to do something really similar to what we were doing before. So I'm going to go here, and for each one, I'm going to remove a line. OK, we'll save it. I'm looking for that one liner. There we go. And this will just be two this time. Two. And we'll go here, save that. And this will be two. And we'll go ahead and save this. And this will be two. And we'll go ahead and save this. And this will be two. And we'll go ahead and save this. And this will be two. All right, let's go back to our Git graph. We have a bunch of this stuff here. Let's go over here and make a new pull request. This time, we're going to dev2. And we're going to create that pull request. And we're going to say create pull request. And this time, we're going to say merge pull request. Squash and merge. Squash and merge. So it's bringing all those commits in. And now if we go back here and we refresh, OK? Um, we're going to refresh here again. Oh, I got to go fetch. Git fetch. That's why we don't see anything here. Git fetch or refresh. And so notice now it doesn't show like a merge line coming into here. What it's done is taken all of this stuff and it's squashed it into a new commit and has it over here. Okay, so it really depends on what you want. Do you want to keep all this history or do you want to kind of have this like over here and this has a completely separated commit here? Um, it's really up to you how you want to do it. I think this looks a lot cleaner. 
Um, but this is totally an option as well. It's really what you want to do. And I will see you uh, in the next one. So before I do that, I'm just going to stop my workspace. All right. And see you later. Ciao. Pull request templates are similar to issue templates. They will populate the pull request text area with the specified markdown template. So there it is. Um, I need to point out that uh, it's in .github forward slash pull underscore request underscore template dot MD. That's what you want to use. Technically, there is a folder called pull request template that you can use, but I found that you really couldn't leverage it because there was no UI to select from it. And the only way that you could do that was via this URL you generated with a query string. So um, I would suggest that you use pull request template MD and not use the folder. Uh, and that's where it kind of feels like it's it's like uh, where we have issue templates where they have that older version of it. Pull requests still feel like that old kind of version, if that makes sense. So there you go. GitHub Discussions is a community communication tool for your public or private GitHub repos. And there's a lot of features it has. It has threaded conversations, categorization, com uh, community interaction, markdown support, pin discussions, conversation polls, discussion voting, converse, uh, conversion to issues, notifications, searchable, uh, searchable and linkable, GitHub integration. And I'm certainly sure there is more. Um, you have to turn this on as a feature in your repo. A discussion tab will appear in your GitHub repo and you'll have some default categories to begin with. So there you go. So when someone creates a discussion in GitHub discussions, they need to choose a category. And there's a bunch that already exists for you by default, um, but you can create your own and it's a powerful feature to have. So the idea is that you have these discussion formats and we have these four. So do we have open discussion? This is just free form conversation. You have Q and A where you're basically upvoting the best answer. Think of Stack Overflow. You have announcements. Uh, only admins can make these posts. Anyone can reply. You have polls so you can uh, poll people to see, you know, things. Uh, categories can be grouped into sections and it's pretty straightforward from there, okay? Specifically for the Q&A discussion format, you can mark an answer that is the recommended answer regardless of the upvotes to help direct which question you think is the most credible. This is very similar to Stack Overflow. So the idea is that as a min or maybe a maintainer, I can mark it as the answer and then it will show up as the answer. The reason I'm calling this out because it could be an exam question. So there you go. We can pin discussions. This is similar to issues. Um, and the idea is uh, you can just pin a discussion. It shows up at the top of the page and it'll be nice and colorful. You can pin for particular categories or for the whole discussions page, but it's very straightforward, okay? For a discussion, you can actually convert it into an issue. I say convert with quotations because really what you're doing is creating a new issue. It's weird they use the language convert in the documentation, but clearly when you're adding it right there, it's telling you it's just creating an issue. It's just gonna pre-populate it with the same content and then it's gonna have a soft link. It's not like pull request to issues where there's any relationship there. It's just a simple link um, and a convenient way to help you make uh, an issue from a discussion, okay? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and in this follow along, I wanna take a look at discussions. So we have our fun repo in our uh, organization account. I'm gonna to go to settings and let's go ahead and enable discussions. So we'll go and do that. I'm gonna go ahead and set it up based on the default and it has a bunch of cool stuff. I'm gonna go ahead and hit start discussion. And so now if we go over to our discussions, we have our first discussion that we've ever posted. We have some default categories. Uh, you can see I can upvote or you know not upvote. And then if I want to provide uh, a marked answer, I can just hit comment here. Um, oh, this one is just upvoting. It not necessarily has Q and A. So let's go ahead and try some of the different discussion formats. So I'll say new discussion and we'll say Q and A. And I'll say, uh, what is the best movie ever? We'll start a discussion. What is it? And from there, I'll just say Roadhouse. 
okay? And so people can uh, uh, mark it up or I can mark it as the uh, correct answer and then it shows up like that. We could turn this into an issue if we wanted to. So I could, well, first I could pin this discussion and put it at the top, so that's another thing. So now it'll be at the top of our page here, okay? But the other thing that we can do is create this into an issue and now it's an issue, there you go. We can go back to our discussions. Um, a few other things that we could do, we could make a poll, so that might be interesting. Choose the best movie. What is the best movie? What is the best movie? We'll say Roadhouse or Roadhouse 2. Roadhouse 2 is not a good movie. <laughs> We'll go ahead and start that discussion. And now we can vote. There we go. Yeah. Um, if you want to see a little bit more with uh, a, like a full discussion, uh, GitHub has their own. It's called Discussion Community. And so you can see it's a lot more active, a lot more fun stuff. You can see that I made a post the other day here um, about certifications and I was trying to provide them feedback they didn't hear me, they ignored me. But this is all about the certification that you are taking right now as I was trying to describe what I thought was lacking and what could be better. Um, and if you're watching this video and you wanna practice using GitHub Discussions, can you do me a favor and can you upvote this? Um, because I feel like GitHub should really listen and it's a great opportunity for you to test the feature and then we can see how many people have been using this here. So you can come over here and leave a comment and give it an upvote. Um, but yeah, that's about it for discussions and I'll see you in the next one. Okay. Ciao. So I just want to quickly point out that you can find your notification options in your profile under notifications and you have some options there about what you are looking at for subscriptions, what you're automatically watching or not watching. Go take a look there. Again, I didn't see the exam asking any of the stuff, but you should really take a look here and see all the options here. And we'll probably do that in one of the, um, uh, the follow alongs here, okay? For notifications, we have some filter options and uh, we actually have a filter syntax. It looks the same as every other filter syntax we've been looking at in GitHub so far. There are some predefined save filters where you can see that they already have filter syntaxes underneath. And if you want, you can, I think you can create your own, yeah, you can create your own new filters. Uh, there is the option to group by repository or date. Again, I don't remember the exam ever asking uh, this, but it's in the exam guide outline. So I just wanted to quickly point this out, okay? So something you can do is you can mention people in, um, in comments. And so what that will do is that will get their attention. Um, and by that, I mean, it'll show up in your inbox. Uh, for the filters, you can go to the mention and quickly find where you have been mentioned. And yeah, that's pretty much it. It's just, you mention people and it gets their attention and it'll show up in your notifications inbox, okay? <laughs> So the notifications inbox provides a chronological list of notification threads. This allows you to keep on top of all subscribe activities with an associated GitHub repo. And that's located at forward slash notifications. Um, and I wanna point out that there is some other notification views. I don't know if these are legacy views or alternate views, but I figured I should cover our bases and look at all of them. Most of the stuff that I think the exam is gonna focus on is probably the inbox, but I never got any questions about notifications whatsoever in my exam attempt. But if you do, um, you know, let's just make sure we cover our bases here, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown. And in this video, I wanna take a look at the notifications inbox, which is in the top right corner. It looks like a little inbox. You can also get there by probably going to notifications somewhere. I thought it would be here on the left-hand side or right-hand side, it isn't. So I guess you really do have to click that inbox to get there. That's gonna be up here at notifications. Um, this is showing stuff that we're participating in. So you'll notice that uh, we have um, what looks to be pull requests. And I guess we can click into there and get to them right away. So you can see that um, you know somebody's talking to me here and so I'm getting those uh, alerts there, and this has to do with all participating stuff. 
So there's not a lot to show here, um, but we can show mentioning because that's something that I think would be interesting to show. So what I'm gonna do is go over to my other account and I'm gonna go into a repo that we're both in. So I'm gonna go to Andrew WC Brown um, and there should be a repo here. No, that's, that's not it. I'm part of some organization called Cloud Journeyers. I already forgot what it's called. So I'll have to get the URL from this one here and we'll switch over to Cloud Journeyers. And I want the fun repo and I'm just gonna grab that link, go back to the other account. And then from here, I'll just go into an issue and I'm just going to say, um, I think, so I'll say Andrew WC Brown, I think that would be Roadhouse. Okay, maybe we can go get an image of Roadhouse for fun. Movie, Roadhouse movie. There we go. Oh yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. So I'm just gonna drag that off screen here and bring that in here. So we've got another reason to use uploads for file images and I'll comment that and there we go. So now what I'm gonna do is go back to that other account and I'm gonna go into my inbox and see if I was mentioned. What the heck? <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay, we just had to be a little bit patient. So there it is. Um, we you know we have some other options over here. We have, what's this? I guess approve, uh, don't get any more alerts for it or save it for later or bookmark it. Um, I guess you should know those options. Again, I didn't see them in the exam. In terms of other stuff, I'm gonna go to my other account to kind of show you a little bit more because it has more information in it. But uh, of course we can filter stuff. So I can say is unread. And then it, we can even click through and do more stuff like repo is exam pro, you know, and then I can click there and it should filter for that. We could group by repository instead, right? So that makes it a little bit more clear. Pretty straightforward, pretty straightforward. Um, and that's about it, okay? Ciao. So, you can watch a repo in order to get notified of activities. Uh, your own repos are, you're gonna be set as watching. And so you can change the level of participation that you want. If it feels like we're repeating this, we did because we covered watching prior when we were talking about repos. But what we didn't cover was the fact that there's this additional watching page where you can find where everything that you're watching, this does not show up on the, the notifications inbox. So th this is a page you're gonna wanna know in order to keep track of stuff that you're watching. So there you go. Let's take a look at notification subscriptions. And this allows you to follow activities for a specific pull request or issue. So if you go into an issue or you go into a pull request, they have that notifications area where you can say, I'm subscribing. And you can see all your subscriptions on your notifications page, but more or less the notification inbox is going to take care of that. Um, but what I want you to remember is that watching is for repos, it's for people, it's for organizations. Notification subscriptions are for very specific pull requests or issues, okay? So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown and this follow along, I wanna take a look at those other screens, the watches and the subscriptions so we can uh, see that alternate view. And the easiest way to get there is to go to the inbox and I can scroll all the way down to the ground and we have the options down below. And so if I click into watch repositories, I can see all the repos I'm watching and I can see all the subscriptions I belong to. And there's not a whole lot to say here. This is kind of like an alternate view of um, notifications inbox. So it's not that super exciting, but it is another simplified view. We can go take a look at our notification settings and we didn't really look at this in the lecture slide. So I should cover it a bit more here and carefully read it. So. We have the default notification email. So if I wanna send that to another email, I can do that. There's custom routing, which allows you to send certain things uh, to certain emails. I've never played around with it before, but it sounds cool. We can aut automatically watch repositories uh, or teams. So I imagine if we join a team, we're, match uh, we're watching it. If we uh, create a repo or own it, we're watching it. We can choose between email and GitHub, okay? Um, notifications for conversations you're participating uh, in. So 
whether we get a mention, if, if we should get alerted. Uh, apparently we can customize our email updates. So basically what we're gonna get in those emails, then we can get a weekly digest or not get any emails whatsoever. You can get notified about Dependabot alerts, um, notified about GitHub actions, and then a deploy key alert. So when you're given ad admin permissions in org, when a new deploy key is added. So there is your settings and that wraps up notifications. So GIST provide a simple way to share code snippets with others and every GIST is a Git repo, which means that it can be forked and cloned. You can get this at gist.github.com. This is a super useful service. I use it all the time. And uh, here's an example of a public GIST. Uh, GIST can be public or secret. Public gist are searchable. Public gist show up in, uh, in discovery or discover, I should say. Secret gist are not searchable and do not show up in discovery. Secret gist are not private. They are secret, but they're not private. You can share URLs with friends and because that URL could be given to somebody else, they could get access to it. Secret gist can be changed to uh, be public. Public gist cannot be changed to be private. You can pin gist to your profile for other others to easily find, just allow other users to comment, just allow you to navigate revisions with ease. You need to remember these factoids because the exams will test you on it. I got just questions. And one was about like, um, about knowing how to fork or clone. Uh, and also for the, uh, the private thing that just secrets are not actually private. To create a just very straightforward. Uh, oh, sorry, I just want to point out that GISTs can be also marked down as well. They don't necessarily have to be code, and that's really nice. But to create a GIST is very straightforward. You name it, you provide the file name so it knows how to do the syntax highlighting, you provide your code, you can uh, attach a few files to it, and create a GIST. I'm going to remind you that, and maybe I didn't write it in there, but GISTs are full repos, okay? So even though they're like single files, they're full Git repos. Uh, and you can clone them and do a lot of fun stuff with them, okay? I was saying that you can fork and clone gists, uh, and the way you would do that is if you drop down the embed, you'll see clone options. I don't know why they kind of hide it on you, but basically you just clone it like a regular repo, um, and for uh, gist repos, other than yours, you can just fork them. So those are two things that you need to know because they'll probably show up in the exam, and I just wanna make sure I really call those out to you here, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and in this follow along, I want to take a look at gists. So gists allow you to create snippets of code that you can share with other folks. So I'm going to go ahead and do gist.github.com, and I'm just going to zoom on out here. And before we create anything, I just want to show you that there is an all gist page, so we can see a bunch of stuff that's already here. And maybe we can go take a test and just clone something at random. So or not clone, but fork. So if we go uh, here, we can just fork this, and now we can make changes uh, to this here. And so I'm going to go ahead hit edit, and I'm going to just make some changes and hit update to this. And what's cool is that you have this revisions tab, and it actually shows you what's been changed over time. So that's something that I really like, is that if you're trying to uh, teach somebody something and you need to show that history over time, just make for great examples. Uh, so I really like that. Again, Embed here, you can go ahead and clone HTTPS or SSH. Let's go over here and make a new gist. I wanna make a private one. So I'm gonna keep it, or sorry, not private, but secret. So I'm gonna go ahead and say secret gist, okay? And we'll try to make this markdown. So I'll just say readme.md. I'll say secret gist. This is secret, okay? And maybe what we'll do is we'll uh, attach our file here. I wonder if we can just drag it in. Yes, we can. And I, mean, I think it added. Okay. Oh, maybe it's it's in there. I'm not 100% I'm not sure. But I dragged it in, and we'll go ahead and create this secret gist. Contents can't be empty. That's totally fine. Um, I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> Okay, so you do that. Um, I thought like you would drag it in. 
Maybe it's very particular in terms of what you can bring in. Again, the exam's not gonna test you on that, but I'm a bit confused why I can't bring that image in. But I'm gonna go ahead and create this gist, and it is secret. If I wanna share this with somebody, um, I would give them the shareable link. So there it is, new tab. There we go, right? Pretty straightforward. Uh, you can pin these to your profiles. I think we did that already. Um, so if I go over to our, and you can star gist as well, right? So if you go here, you can star gist. Then you go your star gists, right? But um, if we go back to github.com, I think we already have one pinned from before. So if we go to our repositories, or sorry, not repositories, our profile, we can see we pinned one earlier. So yeah, there you go. That's just... <laughs>
Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and this fall along, I wanna go ahead and create ourselves a static website. So uh, apparently what we can do is use our username and do github.io, and that should allow us to turn this into a static website. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and initialize a readme, and we'll make this a repo public. And we'll see if it's as simple as they say it is. I'm gonna go ahead and add a new uh, file here. This one is going to be an index.html file. So we'll just go ahead and say index.html. And I need a little bit of code here. So I'm just gonna get a template for an in index.html page. Maybe we can get one from FreeCodeCamp. We're gonna go ahead and grab this one here. I don't need any JavaScript. So I'm just gonna take that out there. We'll give that a preview. Looks fine to me. We'll go ahead and commit those changes, commit those changes. And so the question is, is this a static website? Um, I don't know, let's go ahead and copy this. Maybe we have to turn it on. Nope, but we can go try to figure it out by going over to here. And so I'm carefully looking for that static website hosting. I've done it before, it's just been a while. And yeah, uh, it's pages over here, pages. Ah, here we go. So build and deployment, so deploy from a branch. That's the classic experience. I'm totally fine with that. And I'll choose main. Mm, okay. What happened? It used to just let you do static pages. Let's go take a look here. Uh-huh. Create the .o. That's what I did. I followed the instructions on this page. And if the repository doesn't match the name exactly, it won't, it won't work. Okay. Uh-huh, add an index page, okay, sure, push, and you're done. Well, I did all that. So I'm gonna try this again. Oh, okay, it just needed some time to propagate. But here, it looks like we can do a little bit more. So if we were to integrate um, Jekyll and deploy it and like integrate it, we could deploy that. Jekyll is pretty cool. Um, it's a little bit out of scope for this certification. The other thing that's interesting is you could add a custom domain. GitHub doesn't seem to really care about GitHub pages for the exam. So, um, you know, it's on there, but I, I didn't see any questions. So this is why it's so, so light that we're covering here, but uh, that's it, okay? Well, let's take a look at GitHub Actions, which is a CICD pipeline directly integrated with GitHub repos. And GitHub Actions allows you to automate running test suites, building uh, images, specifically Docker images, compiling static sites, deploying code to servers, and more. And we can access this all through the Actions tab in your GitHub repo. Uh, when you first use GitHub Actions, there are some templates that you can utilize. And all these files are stored in your workflow directory in your .github folder. As you can see, there's this kind of YAML file that we're going to utilize. It's gonna be important that we remember some of the structure. So I remember on the exam, they wanted you to know that there was jobs on and steps. Uh, you can have multiple workflows in a repo triggered by different events. So when you run GitHub Actions, you'll get a history of workflow runs where it will indicate if it was successful or a failure, how long it took to run. So this is um, for something, probably for, um, some, for one of the boot camps that we ran as we used GitHub Actions to build the site. If you want to find the example repos, because there are those little getting started, but it's the same repo here at the starter workflows, and you can get the YAML files and get started really quickly. There are different types of triggers uh, that you can use with GitHub Actions. That's gonna go into that on area. And GitHub, there's about 35 uh, GitHub Actions. I say plus because in case there are more that I'm not aware of, I'm covering my bases there. Examples of common GitHub Actions could be pushes, pull requests, issues, releases, schedule events, and manual triggers. The exam wants you to know that you can trigger based on these things. So make sure you remember this short little list here, okay? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and in this follow along, let's take a look at GitHub Actions. So what I wanna do is go over to our organization. I'm gonna to go to our fun repo, and here we have a tab called Actions where we can set up some GitHub Actions. Now, I don't use GitHub Actions a whole lot. Maybe I will if I go ahead and do that GitHub Actions certi uh, certification course, but uh, we'll just have to kind of work our way through it. It shouldn't be too hard. 
So there's a lot of different things that we can utilize here. I can set up Terraform, which is kind of cool. Uh, we have deployment to AWS, to Azure, to Alibaba Cloud. We have uh, some security things that we can do here. We have continuous integration, automation, a whole host of stuff. And um, you can even do static compilation, which is pretty cool as well. So we're gonna have to make, make a decision uh, in terms of something that we want to use. Um, I don't think it's gonna be deployment because that seems like a lot of work. Um, so I'm trying to make a decision here, what we could utilize, build, lint, and test a Rails application. That seems pretty small or easy for me to do, but maybe we should try to use one of these things down below. Uh, labels, pull requests based on files change. Let's go ahead and see if we can utilize that. So I hit the configure button and it's gonna bring us into this action. And I guess there's the marketplace where we can get uh, more stuff. I didn't even realize there was a marketplace for this. Looks like we got some documentation here. So customizing when workflows run based on trigger. So here it says on push branch. So when we push to specific ones, we can trigger different stuff. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Let's take a look here and see if we can expand this and see what we're looking at. So we have name, labeler, on, pull request target, jobs, and then we have labels. So run as Ubuntu. So it's probably start a container as an Ubuntu with permissions of contents to read and it can write pull requests. And the step that we're gonna have here, it's going to use the actions labeler version four. And with the repo token, it's gonna to bring in that token so it has authorization to do so. And we know about GitHub tokens. Um, and I think, I think we showed this uh, for GitHub actions, but not 100% sure. So, Carefully reading here, the whole point of this is to apply labelers. And the, basically the way it's gonna do that is through these steps. And so I'm assuming that this is kind of like a built-in step. And if we go here and just type it in, maybe we'll go find it. Yeah, and so they're talking about actions here. Hold on here. I guess it's just a repo. So we get documentation. And, oh, okay, it's called actions. All right, and so, this whole repo contains actions. All right, and so it's coming from this one. And so I'm just gonna go into here and take a look at what this looks like. So just zoom out for a second. And it kind of explains maybe how it works. Um, automatically labels new pull requests based on the past of the files being changed on the branch. The ability to apply labels based on names of branches and things like that, the bug related to the issue. So create a .github labeler.yaml file. This will list a, uh, a list of labels and config options to match and apply the label. All right. The match object allows control over the matching options. You can specify the label to be applied based on the files that have been changed and et cetera like that. And sounds a little bit complicated. <laughs> But at least down here, it's like showing us uh, the flow. It's interesting that this one is showing version four when clearly there is a version five. Um, there might've been a warning up here saying that we should use, it doesn't say that we have to use version five or four or we're first to use five. Um, but let's see if we can figure this out. So I'm gonna go ahead and go down below and just look at the workflow a little bit more here, and it looks pretty much the same. The only difference is that this one's using version five, and it's not passing the width for the repo token. So I'm not 100% sure if we actually really need to do that, but I'm gonna go ahead and, and go commit changes, and we'll commit that there. Okay, so now we have that here, and if we go to actions, um, we can see that we have labeler, and it's only gonna run what's gonna trigger it. Let's go take a look here. Um, if we wanna know how it triggers, we should just take a look at the code and, whoops, go back here and take a quick look. So it says pull pull request target. So we pull request target. What does that mean? We'll go search it here. Um, pull request target. So activity types assigned, assigned, labeled runs your workflow when activity on a pull request in the workflows repository occurs. 
when activity on a pull request in the workflow activity occurs. So it's gonna check on based on a lot of stuff. So that's pretty broad, but that seems fine. It looks like we could even narrow it down to very specific types. Okay, so I mean, that's, that's how we could play with triggers. Um, and so basically when that triggers, it's gonna go ahead and then start up Ubuntu for some reason. Uh, maybe that's what it has to use to run this code uh, that we saw from over here. Okay, and this looks like it's JavaScript or something. And then we need that labelers file. So we need to make sense of what this is. So the base match object is defined as this, any glob to any file. Okay, the key, okay, so what does this thing do? <laughs> Automatically label new pull requests based on the path of the files being changed, uh, uh, changed or the branch name. Okay, well, I'd rather just do that on the branch name. So let's see if we can find that. So it says, change files. Give me a moment just to try to make sense of this and then I'll just save you the trouble of me struggling through it, okay? Okay, scrolling on down, we're getting better examples. So this is starting to make more sense. It says, add an any change label to any changes within the entire repository. Okay, add documentation label to any changes within the docs folder. So maybe what we can do is give this one a go. And uh, we need to create a file. What's this file need to be called? Dot GitHub labeler YAML. So we'll go here and I'm gonna add a new file. Okay, um, add a file. This will be labeler.yaml. We'll double check, make sure that is correct. I've been known to make mistakes often. <laughs> And I'm gonna paste that on in here and we're going to commit that change. And so now we have our labeler YAML. I'm gonna go take a look here and see if the action got triggered. It did, um, it failed. I mean, there's nothing for it to check right now. So no event triggers defined is on. So not exactly sure what it's saying there, but that's totally fine for now. And what I need to do is I need to create a pull request. I mean, it shouldn't trigger unless we have a pull request, right? Um, but it did just happen now. So I'm curious what would happen if I went ahead and just uh, made any kind of change. Because it shouldn't really trigger unless it's a pull request. We'll go here and go back to actions. And it ran again. So I'm really confused. Why is this running when it should only happen on a pull request target? Um, we'll open it up again here. So no event trigger defined is on. Okay, maybe there's something wrong with our, our workflow file. Well, let's see what they say. You can trigger all branches just by using remove the hyphen. Your workflow file seems fine. Have you checked all indentation? So, I mean, we didn't make that file, right? It, it was generated for us. But let's go take a look and see what we can do about that. We have label and labeler. Okay, so this was the one that we wrote. I mean, everything looks fine here. I'm gonna open this up in code spaces or not code spaces, we'll open this up in github.dev just to see if we can rule out any kind of formatting issues. YAML files are very sensitive to any kind of indentation or, or things that go wrong. And so I just wanna rule that out. So looking here, this all looks fine. I know that we this is an array, so we could technically bring this down on this line like this and do that. Um, I don't know if we need this. I'm just gonna take that out because the other one didn't have it. Okay, I'm gonna expand this. Yeah, it still has this here. And I'm not sure why this little red line is here. Maybe it's just superficial and it's confused. But this seems fine. I'm gonna go ahead and update this and say update action. The other question is, do I have this in the right folder? Because yeah, it's, it's in actions, but labeler YAML, labeler YAML isn't supposed to be in the actions folder. So I think what's happening here is that it thinks, <laughs> I think I know what happened here. Um, if we go back to our repo, I think it thinks labeler is a, an action. Yeah, so I think it's just we put that in the wrong folder. 
So I'm going to go back and open up github.dev again. And we're just going to move that back into the correct location. Okay, so we're going to expand that. And this labeler is going to go into the GitHub folder. There we go. I'm going to go ahead and add this all and fix. And we will commit and we will let that push. And I'm going to go back over to here. All right. And if we go back over to actions, oh, uh, this is not the repo. <laughs> We'll go back over to our organization into fun repo. It might've triggered one more time, I don't know. It has not, so we are in good shape. Can we del delete this run? Yep, we can. Let's just delete this up to clean up so we can see what we're doing. And uh, what I wanna do is I want to trigger that uh, pull request to get automatically labeled. So we're gonna need a label called documentation for this to work. So we're going to go here to labels and we'll make a new label. There actually already is one called documentation. I don't know if this is case sensitive, so I'm just going to change it to a capital D so it just works for us. And we're going to go over here to code and I need a new branch. So I'm going to go to dev. And in here, I'm going to create myself a, um, a docs directory. So I'm going to make a new folder here. And what I'll do is I'll make a new folder. We'll call this docs and I'll say readme.md. Readme, okay, we'll save that. We'll go ahead and commit this. And we're in a branch, right? Yeah, we're in a branch. So commit for like new docs directory. And I know I spelled that wrong, it's okay. Nobody's watching here today. There's no grading going on. If I ever grade you, I'll poke you for that, but right now it doesn't matter. And I think that we made that in the dev branch. So we'll go over here and I wanna go ahead and create a new pull request. So I wanna make sure that folder is there. Pull requests, new pull request. We'll drop down dev. We'll compare that over, we'll say create pull request. And the idea is that when we create this, it should label it if this worked as expected. Um, and so what I wanna do is go over to actions and see if it triggered and it's running. So it's queued. It's gonna think what to do. It has to spin up compute. So this isn't instantaneous. In progress, good, we're watching it. Label complete, success. We'll go to our pull request. There we go, look at that. Um, and now we have a, a check that passed and we over go to our checks and it shows that it passes. So, you know, before we talked about like branch rules, we could maybe just tell it that it has to pass that before it could proceed. Not a really good example for this, but we could try it. And it's just an opportunity to show off this branch protection rule stuff. So I'm just looking here carefully for where that was. Uh, it was like checks. Okay, and I'm gonna just drop that down. And still doesn't show up here. So maybe that doesn't work as expected, but I was hoping that maybe I could just choose that from there. Um, Cause it's not like an upfront check. It's like something that happens uh, after you do that. But anyway, that's GitHub Actions in a nutshell. Um, it is very important that we understand how those files work. So before I go, I just want to uh, pull up a link because there was something that really explained the structure of these files really well. It was understanding GitHub Actions. Okay, so it says here, learn GitHub Actions, understanding GitHub Actions. I think it was this one. Yeah, and so this one really helps explain this workflow file. So let's go through it really quickly and, and make sure we understand it. So um, first thing is the name. So we're gonna name it, that's optional. We have run name, so the workflow uh, runs the generated from the workflow. I guess it's gonna be like the run name we have on, so specify the trigger of this workflow. So on triggers events, jobs, groups together all the jobs that run. Then we have steps, groups together all the steps that run uh, in the check bats version. Notice we didn't have these before. Runs on, configures the run on the latest version of Ubuntu Linux runner. I imagine you could change this to other things. Uses, the uses keyword specifies the step 
that will run uh, here. And of course we found out those are remote repos. So that makes sense. Um, and that's pretty much it. So, so steps, jobs, on. Remember those three, on, jobs, and steps, okay? And that's pretty much it. So I'll see you in the next one, okay? Ciao. GitHub Copilot is an AI developer tool that can be used with multiple IDEs via an extension. So here is an example of it auto-completing code for a terminal-based uh, blackjack game, which I asked it to do. It can do code completion. You can have uh, chat conversations in your ID or mobile while you're working on code. It is a CLI assistance. It does code referencing, public code filter, and IP indemnity. I don't know what the last one is, but it does it. And you can get a free trial with um, uh, for a one day, 30 day trial. Do you need a credit card? I'm not 100% sure, but we're gonna find out here shortly as we will go and try to set it up. It is free to use for verified students, teachers, and maintainers of popular open source projects. All right, so let's compare the two versions of uh, GitHub Copilot. We have the individuals and the business version of Copilot. And the reason I'm doing this is because I'm pretty sure I got an exam question about a specific comparison, so pay close attention. So for pricing, Copilot for individuals is $10 a month or 100 for the year. For Copilot Business, it's 19 uh, USD dollars per user per month. The types of GitHub accounts would be personal accounts for individuals and then org and enterprise accounts for Copilot Business. For telemetry, you get it for um, individuals, which I believe that was the exam question that I got asked. For business, you do not get it. Um, for block suggestions matching public code, they both get it. Uh, they get both plug uh, plug rights into your editor, so extensions for both IDEs or for both of them. For multi-line function suggestions, they both get them. For organization-wide policy management, Copilot Business gets that. Uh, excluding specific files, Copilot Business gets that. For audit logs, Copilot Business gets that. And then for HTTP proxy support via custom certificates, Copilot Business gets that. So make sure you know which you can get and which one cannot get those feature sets, okay? Let's take a quick look at how we would set up Copilot and some of its functionality. So the first thing we will need to do is install the GitHub Copilot extension in VS Code. There are extensions for other different browsers, but this is the one that we're gonna focus on. Once you install it, you want to trust the workspace and install, um, sign into GitHub, for GitHub Copilot, you're gonna authorize GitHub in order to allow access. And then you'll have this little Copilot icon in the bottom right corner. When you wanna start using it, the first thing I would do is go look at the keyboard shortcuts. They do list keyboard shortcuts on their website, but I found that um, uh, the ones that were set for me were completely different. I have no idea why. So whether you're on a Mac or Windows, make sure that you know what your settings are. At the time I was doing this, I was doing this on my Mac and so it's showing Mac-like key bindings here. Uh, it's, and again, it's just a reminder, best to check the hotkeys because it can be changed to anything and they didn't seem to match for me. Um, once you have Copilot installed, you can also enable Copilot chat feature and this allows you to chat in the left-hand side. I found this to be extremely useful and I would recommend turning it on if you can. But uh, yeah, there you go. <music> So in this fall along, we're gonna take a look at installing or setting up and using um, GitHub Copilot. Um, I have a business version in my uh, primary account and in this one, I'm gonna to try to set up individual. Um, so hopefully that will go smoothly here. Um, so the first thing we wanna do is start using Copilot and maybe a good idea would be to try to use it in um, code spaces because I feel like that's gonna be a lot easier and there'd be direct integration. Before we do that, I just wanna show you something kind of funny about uh, GitHub and their branding. So they have really decided to call themselves an AI powered developer platform, which to me is a little bit silly because their only AI solution is Copilot. Is there any other AI stuff? Not that I'm aware of, um, but it's a really weird rebranding because they are still a Git hosting repository, but hey, they can do what they wanna do, <laughs> but I'm just not gonna buy it. But anyway, let's go ahead and open up code spaces. And we do have some other ones down here below. I'm just gonna delete them and we'll just start from scratch here. Um, just delete and delete. 
So we don't have to worry about these other ones here. And what I'm gonna do is go over to uh, that repo one more time uh, over here. And we'll go ahead and create ourselves a new code space. So we'll just give it a moment to spin up and we'll configure it as per usual. All right, so our environment or our code space is now running. What I'm gonna do is go ahead and change the color theme to dark or something that is easier on my eyes. And what I'm looking for here is Copilot. Now, is it already pre-installed? I have no idea. We'll go ahead and take a look. So we'll type in GitHub Copilot and see if we can find it here. And there it is. So there's a couple things I'm gonna want. I'm going to want GitHub Copilot. And then we have GitHub Copilot chat. It looks like it grabbed both of them when I did that. So I didn't have to do anything extra. Um, so that is gonna go ahead and install there. And then down below, it says extension failed, no access to GitHub Copilot. You're currently logged in as Andrew Brown. That's true. And it says no access, sign up. So let's go sign up for uh, GitHub uh, Copilot. And here we have a few options. We have the monthly $10 plan or the $100 plan. Where's my trial? <laughs> so it says pay for frequency after trial. So you'd have to pay for it. Um, confirm your payment details. And it looks like we'd actually have to fill in payment information. So I'm gonna save you money here today so that you don't have to spend anything. And I'm just gonna show you in my other account what it looks like to use uh, GitHub Copilot so you can pass the exam. Whether you wanna fill this stuff in is up to you. Um, I'm not gonna do that. We, I'm already paying for it, so I'm not gonna pay for it twice. And uh, you know, again, my expectation is you don't, shouldn't have to pay, pay for that either. So what I'm gonna do is go up to my command palette and just go into stop. And I want to stop the current code space. And I mean, we figured that out, that that's where we're gonna hit that boundary. I'm gonna switch over to Omen King. And I'm in the same repo and I think I'm part of this so I can open this up in code spaces. And we'll go ahead and do the same process and I'll be back here in just a moment when this environment is ready to go. All right, so our environment is up and as per usual, let's change our theme to something that is a little bit easier on the eyes. So there we go and we'll proceed and do the same thing as we were doing before. So I'm gonna type in Copilot and that's gonna give us Copilot right here. I want the chat to be installed as well, but it seems like it knows to pick that up. There's also a Copilot, Copilot voice. I've never used it. It looks like it's in preview, so that's kind of interesting, but uh, not something here for today that we'll be playing around with. Um, and I'm waiting for this to finish its install. It should, you know, come up and pop up here. If it doesn't, I can click down here below. And it looks like it's ready to go. So I'm not having to do any additional configurations. Again, this other account already has Copilot activated. But while I'm here, what I wanna do is show you in my settings, the Copilot options. So if I go down here below, you'll notice here that we have um, this feature enabled. So because it is a business organization, I had to go into that one and turn it on. But if it's enabled and I did enable it, then I, I think that's the reason why I picked it up because the first time I did this, it didn't install that chat. And then I had to go into the settings and say turn and enable chat. And then now it seems to automatically install. So um, I think the chat's right over here. So that's really good. And then down below it is, we can click this to bring it open. But let's go take a look at what our keyboard shortcuts are because that's gonna really tell us how to use this. And so we have control forward slash, so accept panel suggestion, alt, uh, square brace, next or previous, open completion panels, control X, suggest terminal commands, uh, inline triggers. So we'll try our best to try to figure this stuff out. There's clearly a lot more stuff going on here, like explain this and other things like that. So, I mean, explain this might be a really useful one to have or generate docs, that seems pretty cool. But what we'll do is go ahead and make ourselves a new file and pretend that we are programmers. I am a programmer, but you know, we're all pretending we're, uh, that's fine. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with that. But let's go ahead and make a game. So I'm gonna go ahead and type in game RB. And here it says, press to ask uh, GitHub Copilot to do something. So let's go ahead and click that and ask it to generate some code. And I'll say, um, create a game loop for a terminal uh, tic-tac-toe game, okay? So I'll hit enter. And there's a lot of different ways you can interact with it. This is like one way you can do it in the chat, copy and paste and do other things, but it's starting to get this stuff set up. 
Uh, and the thing is that this is actually pulling from real repos. So it's not like magic. It's actually going out and leveraging a lot of public repos, which I'm not really happy about, but um, it does get the job done. And so we already have a game generated out here. Does it start the game for us? It looks like it does. And so let's go ahead and see if we can play it. So I'm gonna go ahead and type in Ruby and type in game.rb and hit enter. And boom, we got a game. So enter your move, row and column. So I'm gonna say, it doesn't tell me like, whatever, I'm gonna say one and one. So I guess that's center. And is this the second player now? So zero and zero. And then we have one and, uh, so one and one, what happens there? Invalid move, okay. So zero and one. And then I'm just trying to purposely lose here. So two and two. And then zero and three. Zero and two. So there's a few things about this game that's not really good. It doesn't tell us the grid numbers. It doesn't have an AI to play against, a simple AI. Um, it doesn't tell us uh, a few things there. So maybe we can make some improvements. Uh, we can go to the chat. And, the, and I think the chat is like aware of our code. So it should be able to make some modifications. Uh, but I really like the fact that we had that little box in place. Um, so looking through this, uh, I want to look where the board is being rendered. I know Ruby really well, so this is really easy for me to read. And I'm looking for puts. Where does it render the board? Where are you rendering? Up here, display the board. And so method to display the board game. The board should show the coordinates on the... Uh, 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 of each cell. Sure, why not? And I'm not sure how we would tell it to do that if I select that. Say, modify this code to, code to show the coordinates for each cell. All right, and see what we can do. All right, and so we'll copy this function. We'll paste it on back in here. Say allow, and we'll try this again. We'll see what we get. And it's not exactly what I want. Uh, no, so I'll say no, I want the coordinates on the outside of the board. That's board at border, I'm gonna say board. There we go, that looks like a little bit more of what I want. So we'll go ahead and try that. Okay, we'll stop this. And so now that makes a lot more sense. Okay, so now I can go zero, zero, and I'm, I'm less uh, confused about which one it is. Um, so that's really good. Uh, the next thing is I don't wanna be playing against myself. I wanna have some AI, um, you know, how can I, uh, can you write a simple tick tack toe AI for my game code? And it's going to do that. So it's making a separate function, which actually is a good idea. And so that's actually what I wanted. I wanted an input and an output. This code assumes that you have a game over function. Um, do we have that? Yeah, we do. Let's go ahead and see if that works. But where do we use this function? This, this code assumes that you have a game over method that checks if a player has won the game. The AI move method first checks if the AI can win the next move if it can. It makes the move if it can't, it checks the player if there's no winning. Um, so the question is where you know, where do I call this function in my code? I'm checking to see if it understands the context of it. It's loading in game.rb, so clearly it's using that file to figure it out. So it's saying here, you should call the AI move function in your game loop. Um, so here it's updated our game loop. Mm, the loop starts up, there's a loop here and then this here is our AI move. So this is our main game loop. I'm just gonna bring this on down here so it's less confusing, okay? And 
it looks like it's rewritten it. So we have update board. I don't have display board in here. This code will make the AI play its turn whenever the AI's turn. The AI move function will decide the best move and update the board. Where is the display board in this loop? Is this loop incomplete? Could we also put the loop, yeah, we'll just complete, incomplete. Because it doesn't look complete to me. All right, so now it's actually completed it. It kind of lied, but that's fine. And so we'll go ahead and just copy this. I mean, I knew what to do there, but that's fine. And look, it took out the uh, while loop, so it clearly changed its code. Let's go ahead and see if that works now. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And another thing that I would like to know is could it indicate, can you indicate who's Turn it, well, let's play the game and see what happens first. So I'm gonna say zero, zero. It says wrong number of arguments for game over. Let's go take a look at that. I think it was suggesting that game over might be a little bit different. So it says board and player. And so I'm gonna put player in here for a second. And I don't see player getting called here. Um, what about the new game over function Yeah, so it's gonna to try to update that. You passed player. And there's ways of doing uh, like code completion in line. I just kind of forget, but this is the way I kind of use it. So every AI tool is a little bit different. I'm sure if I did a uh, course on how to use these tools, I'd be a lot more thorough about it, but I think this is sufficient enough. Let's see if it takes that. Okay, and we'll say zero, zero, wrong number of arguments. So you can see like how this can be a little bit finicky to get something working. Um, you really do need to know what you're looking at. It is definitely a, a very powerful tool, um, but as you can see, you gotta keep working through it. Uh, here, maybe we'll just do current player. I think it's because we still have one more check here. Okay, zero, zero, there we go. Now it's moving. Uh, we'll say one, one. Okay, blocked me. Zero, two. There we go. We'll say one, zero. And then one, two. Or two, one, sorry, two, one. And it messes up here at the end. I'm not sure why, but for the most part, it almost worked. This is line 121, so I can go to line 121. And it has an issue updating the board for some reason. So, and it's on 114. So I could jump to line 114 here. And yeah, so maybe it just doesn't really have a way of ending the game gracefully, but hey, it did code it. So that's pretty impressive. We didn't really use those hotkeys, but again, it depends if you're gonna be chat driven or if you're gonna use the console here. We could take a look at some of those hotkeys and just quickly try to use them. Okay, so we'll go back into, oops, into our edit settings. And, whoops. Hotkeys here, there we go. Control forward slash, accept a panel suggestion. Suggest terminal command, trigger inline select suggestion, alt backslash. So we'll do alt backslash and see what it does. Nope. It clearly is trying to do something down below. I think it did something. Yeah, so I think maybe it's like um, code. And see, it is also trying to autocomplete things, but function for scoreboard go here and it's thinking down below. So if it didn't do that, we could have probably hit the hotkey, but it's apparently doing it. I'm gonna hit tab to grab that. So you can see it kind of helps as you're coding, but you learn how to use it as you use it. We're not building something big here. And I think this is sufficient. So we'll call this one done. I'm gonna go ahead and stop this workspace. 
So I'll open up the command palette, stop, and I will see you in the next one, okay? Ciao. Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and we are taking a look at GitHub Codespaces. This is a cloud developer environment, or also known as a CDE, integrated with your GitHub repo. And the idea is that you have this thing called a code space. That's what they call their developer environment. And a code space runs Ubuntu Linux Docker container on a virtual machine hosted and managed by GitHub. So this is kind of a representation of how it works. Um, I don't write it here, but the idea is that when you launch up GitHub code spaces, it's actually cloning your GitHub um, repository so you can start working with it right away. Uh, and most cloud developer environments do that. So that's a pretty common pattern. And it's gonna clone that repo into a workspaces folder. So you can interact with code spaces via a multiple ways. We have the SSH, uh, via SSH, via the GitHub CLI. You have code editors such as VS Code Browser, the desktop, JetBrains IDE. Um, for the desktop, you can just open that up in the browser mode by going to open a VS Code desktop. And it does give you a bit more flexibility than the browser because there could be extensions that only work uh, locally. And, you know, it's just, you get a better experience there, but I usually use everything in the browser because I don't like to do local development anymore. I'm totally moved over to the cloud, but uh, for the GitHub CLI commands, we do have a lot there. And so that's a great way to programmatically work with your GitHub code spaces. Uh, when you create a new code space, you'll have to choose the repo, the branch, the region, the machine type, and that shows that all there. That gives you a good idea of how you can configure uh, your code space. Uh, the regions you can choose from is US East, US West, Europe West, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, and the Australias. And you know what, I think when I first launched, I don't know if it always shows me this options, but if you need to choose these options, you can make sure you get that stuff. Uh, there is a capacity of your environment based on the virtual machine type. So the more, uh, the larger it is, the more expensive it is, and they, they go based on cores. So you can see the larger the cores, the more RAM, and the more storage you're gonna get, that second value being the storage. You can see all your code spaces across all your repos at github.com forward slash code spaces. And uh, the way you're gonna start a code space is if you drop down that code under the code spaces tab, you can go ahead and create it on a particular branch. That's usually what you wanna do is say, I wanna launch this on main branch or a dev branch. You can obviously use the GitHub CLI to open up code spaces. There is a limit of concurrent code spaces allowed to run. If you hit that limit, you may need to stop other code spaces first. I don't know if this is the case, but there might also be a hotkey within GitHub uh, repo, but well, if I'll have to go double check that uh, before we talk about it, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and this follow along, I wanna take a look at some of the configuration options when we launch up our code spaces. So I'm gonna switch back to my um, other account here, and we'll go into the fun repo. And what I wanna do is open up this code tab, and normally what we would do is we'd launch a code space here, but I really wanna choose the options that I use to configure it with. And so you can see we have some other things here. We'll go config with options, and this is where we're gonna get the choice of choosing our branch choosing our region, choosing our machine type. And so that is the way that we can do it. Notice that we're limited to two and four cores. This is probably because we don't have a credit card attached. And so it is very limited. I'm curious to see what it is in my other account, which could have mm, some paid capabilities. So I'm just gonna quickly switch over to that and take a look there. So let's say we went into the exam pro repo because definitely we're paying on exam pro for sure. And let's just say I'm doing Terraform beginner. I'm gonna go here and go to code spaces and say with options and see if we get more options. And yeah, look, we do get more options. So that definitely is a factor for the things that you're going to be able to see. So that is pretty clear. Let's go back over uh, to here. And I want to, again, go back to this repo. And I mean, we definitely do wanna open one for code spaces, but I'm gonna go ahead and delete this one. I really just wanna to get to the repo itself. And let's go take a look, uh, yeah, here again. And I mean, I never looked at this before, so I'm really curious uh, what's under here for configure dev container. Oh, it just opens it up in JSON. So nothing super interesting, but it's nice to see they have some documentation here as you're working on that file to help you configure it. I could have probably used that later on. So um, I guess we'll take a look at that, but really it's simple. We'll just go ahead and say with options, and we'll be very explicit about how we launch it, main, 
Yeah, pretty straightforward. We'll go ahead and launch a code space. And so all I really wanna do is just show you the command palette in here for code spaces, as we've already used code spaces a lot in this course. But um, you know, just go here and show you some of the command palette options. So if we go to the command palette, which was down below here, we type in code spaces. This is where we're gonna get a lot of the actions. Actually, I'm surprised I didn't make a slide on this, but um, you can see that we have a few different things. So uh, we can change our mach machine type here. We can manage our secrets from here. We can rebuild our container. If we change our dev container file, um, you know, we can stop our workspace. So a lot of stuff here, but I'm gonna go ahead and stop our current workspace. Okay, because that's good enough for me for now. And we'll go back over to GitHub. Let's take a look at what we have in our settings. We go here and we go down to code spaces. And so we can have our secrets here. We can have settings things, which is turned on and doesn't seem to ever work. And we have some additional options. So we have access and security. This might be, oh, I guess it's no longer here. We can choose the default editor to launch in, uh, the idle time, the host image, whether we wanna use beta or stable or manually set our region, but it seems like it auto detects. But yeah, it's pretty straightforward, but we'll look at these features as we uh, go through this code spaces section. So there you go. Let's take a look at the GitHub code spaces life cycle. There was no diagram, so I'm the first one to make one, uh, if that's even that exciting. But usually the first thing that's gonna happen is you wanna create your code space. And technically reopening is kind of similar. So we could say create or reopen. And from there, we wanna get our code space running. Once our code space is running, uh, we can stop it. And of course, stopping it freezes the state of your workspace so you can use it again later. And the idea is that if we want to reuse it, we just reopen it and it'll run again. If let's say our um, code, our, our environment timed out for any reason, maybe we walked away from our computer, maybe we just forgot that we forgot to turn it off, maybe we had some kind of interruption, uh, Code Spaces is gonna turn off by default after 30 minutes of activity. Um, it's basically the same thing as doing a, a stop and it's the equivalent, um, yeah, it's the equivalent of doing a stop there. So this is just to keep costs low for you. Um, you know, if you want to make changes to your dev container file, which is gonna say what your base image is and stuff that's installed, you have to do a rebuild in the current environment. That's the only way it's going to do that. If you're launching up a code space for the first time, it's gonna build it from that uh, dev container, but sometimes you have to do rebuilds. Uh, the environment gets saved periodically. So generally you're not losing data. So when you abruptly close and then it stops, it's persisting data to the virtual machine as long as it's not deleted, but still assume that that environment is uh, possible to be lost. I think after a certain amount of time, it will actually delete um, a repo after a certain amount of days. So just understand that, you know, if it's something really important, make sure to commit it and put it in a temporary branch or working branch. Um, it does auto saving. So with the VS Code browser, it will auto save on by default. For VS Code desktop, auto save needs to be turned on apparently. But when I was using it, I never ran into any issues. It just seemed to work. Uh, when you're deleting, when you're done with your, uh, your environment, you can delete it. Uh, you don't have to delete it if you think you're gonna start it up again because you're not uh, having any spend while it's deleted, but there could be some limits in terms of how many workspaces you have or code spaces, so you might need to delete some, but there you go. So when you create a code space, it's gonna be assigned an auto-generated display name. And so in this case, it made shiny space chainsaw. And sometimes when you have a lot of um, code spaces, it gets confusing what is the contents of those code spaces. So it's totally possible for you to rename uh, your code space. And that's just gonna make things a lot easier. You can see all of those code spaces at forward slash code spaces, and it'll just make it a lot clearer, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and this fall along, we're gonna take a look at how to rename a GitHub code space. So let's hope that we already have one here so that we can rename it. If you don't, you'll have to make a new one. This one's called Shiny Cod. Not a great name, <laughs> not a great, na a great name, whatsoever, but let's go ahead and rename it. And I'm gonna call this one uh, just dev, okay? And we'll keep it right nice and simple here. And so now it's been renamed dev. And so let's go take a look at our code spaces so we can see the renaming of that. So it's not here, I gotta go back a little bit. And so now we can see all of our code spaces and there it is. So we have our, um, our repo here and it's called dev and that is a lot better 
than before. So that's all I wanted to show you. Let's take a look at some VS Code um, configurations in the context of GitHub Code Spaces. So the idea is that GitHub Code Spaces should persist your VS Code settings so you get a similar environment across Code Spaces. So far, I haven't had that experience. I have no way of figuring out how to configure that, but it seems like it's supposed to, to work. So if you figure it out, please tell me, but uh, I'll just pretend that it does work somehow. Um, if you've never used VS Code before, there's this thing called settings, and it's a little bit more complicated than that because all this stuff that you're editing in the UI is actually updating a settings.json file. Uh, it gets synced and backed up, I'm assuming on uh, GitHub, maybe it goes somewhere else, but you can see there's a backup and sync settings. You can override settings JSON options in your dev container JSON Dot file. Let's take a look at uh, VS Code extensions. So GitHub Code Spaces should persist. I use the word should because again, I'm not getting it to work for me. But the idea is that you can install your extensions. Um, most VS Code Marketplace extensions are available to install in the VS Code browser for GitHub Code Spaces. You can ensure your extensions reliably load every time by setting them in the dev container.json. We have VS Code theme. This allows you to change the look of your VS Code. Um, and you know, this is a personal choice of what you want to choose, but those kind of choices you're not supposed to put in your dev container.json file for some reason. Um, but yeah, there you go. There are two options or configuration options you should know for GitHub code spaces, and that's timeout and retention period. Um, so timeout is how long code spaces should wait to stop a code space when there has been no activity. You can set this to be as low as five minutes uh, up to a maximum of four hours and the default is 30 minutes. For default retention, this is saying, when should we start deleting your code spaces if they are inactive? You could set it to a minimum of zero days uh, to a maximum of 30 days and the default is 30. So play around with these values and figure out what works best for you. <laughs> So there is an option called sync settings for code spaces, which will pull your sync settings. And the idea is it's supposed to uh, continually reset it. So VS Code sync settings lets you share your Visual Studio Code configurations such as settings, key, uh, key bindings, and install extensions across your machines. So you're always working with your favorite setup. This has not worked so far for me. I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but um, you know, it is an option, I have it turned on in my account, but uh, supposedly this is an offering uh, that is available for code spaces. You can configure GitHub code spaces to use dot files from a specific repo that will be used for all future code spaces that you start. So the idea is you checkbox this on, you specify the repo, it's gonna pull the dot files from this repo into all future code spaces that you start up. Um, GitHub clones your selected dot file repos to the code space environment, looks for one of the following files to set up in your environment. So we have install, sh, bootstrap, setup, sh, and a bunch of others. Um, so you can see that you could probably offset some of the configuration that would be in dev container into this um, as uh, post boot scripts. Um, but yeah, there you go. <laughs> Codespaces Deep Link is just a way for you to generate out a URL that will launch a codespace for a specific repo. So here is a look at the actual URL. It says codespaces.new forward slash and then the repo name. But you can get this Deep Link through dropping down the code tab and then you can get either the URL or HTML or markup to make it really easy to launch it. And when you do launch it, it's gonna bring you to the create a new codespace uh, workspace, you can checkbox the quick start if you wanna skip that, but that's all it really is. It's just a shareable link. So when you're using code spaces, you might have uh, environment variables or uh, passwords or secrets or access tokens that you don't want to hard code into your code because that's just a bad habit. Uh, it's just gonna lead into uh, serious issues. So you need to inject them some way in the environment when they launch up from a secure location. That is what Code Spaces Secrets does. So you can see in this example, we have AWS credentials, and the idea it will get, get, is that it will get loaded in the environment. So we'll go take a look at that, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown. In this video, I wanna take a look at how to set 
secrets for code spaces. So we'll go to the repo. There might be a few different ways that we can set it. But what I wanna do is go first check if we can do it this way. No, but uh, we can go over to our settings and we'll check out code spaces here on the left hand side. And from here, if we scroll, well, it's actually right up here, we can create a new secret. And so let's just pretend that we have a super secret. We'll just make up something here and we'll just say roadhouse, uh, a bunch of numbers, and then a dollar sign and that sign, okay? And we can even say what repo it's for. So if it's for the fun repo, and we're gonna go ahead and add that secret. Now let's go launch up uh, a code spaces and see if it's available. So I'm gonna go back to that repo and yeah, we'll go back over here. We might already have one from before. I'm gonna go ahead and delete that. And I'm just gonna launch a new one so that we are squeaky clean. And I'm not sure why it's giving me all these options. I just wanna launch one. We'll go back over here. We'll try this again. We'll say create one on main and we'll hope that that gets loaded in. So I'll be back here when this is fully loaded, okay? All right, so now that our environment's up, I'm gonna assume that those secrets were loaded via the environment variables. So I'm just gonna bump up the font here for a moment. We're not gonna spend too much time in here. And I'm gonna type in ENV and actually we'll just hit enter and see what we get. So we have a bunch of environment variables that doesn't help so much. So I'm gonna go back and type in grep and we'll type in super and there it is. So we can now access that as an environment variable. I could echo it out if I want, super secret. And there we go. So that's all I really wanted to show you. Uh, and I'll see you in the next one, okay? So before I do that, I'll just stop this environment. <laughs> and yeah, we'll see you now. Ciao. So Visual Studio Code Dev Containers allows you to configure your Docker containers via JSON file. So you can use this in code spaces, you can use this with VS Code in general. Um, so the dev container JSON file is expected in the root of your project. And there's an example of a very simple one. Let's go look at some common configurations so you can quickly understand how this file works. Um, usually you want to provide a remote image. So this is the one um, that is, I think being used for a base image for Microsoft and a lot of the um, features that you can add to it. Uh, you can build your own images by supplying the Docker file in your project and su uh, supply it some arguments. Uh, there are features that allow you to quickly install certain programs. We did this earlier, um, I think in our uh, quick and dirty um, Git crash course. But the idea is that we can install these features so we can get quickly moving. Uh, and this is specifically for the common base image. If you want to create your own features, you totally could, but it has to be for your uh, image. You can also uh, configure custom programs. You'd usually put that in your Docker file. Um, you could also use the post create command to run a um, shell script. So there's a lot of ways to um, do post configuration or try to do something very similar. And as I said, you can create your own features to quickly install on top of your own base images. It is a lot of work to make features though. Um, setting, uh, settings allow you to configure the settings of VS Code. So that is a block that you can put in there. And you can see we also have one for extensions, so it knows what to install next time. We can tell what ports to always forward, which is really useful if you're running web servers. We have command flags, uh, at, at, or we can pass command flags to run, uh, Docker run with the run args. So that's something that might be useful for you. If you need to pass environment variables, you set that in the container env. Uh, you can mount uh, a bunch of locations and then map the, the files and folders. So we'll take a quick look here at some of the options. So we bind, mount a local directory, mount a Docker volume for persistent storage, mount the Docker socket, mount a specific file, mount a host directory as a read only, okay? Um, the command that runs after creation is the post create command. You can set the default username that a VS Code should use when connecting to the container. You can, uh, you could use the post create command to install a bunch of programs on top of your base uh, container. And that's pretty much it. So there is obviously a lot that goes in with these dev containers. I find them really hard to configure. I don't wanna to spend too much time doing them. Uh, and the exam's not gonna ask you about um, uh, this stuff, but for practic practicality, we should know it because if we're working with code spaces or VS Code, it's definitely something you're gonna come across, but there you go. 
let's take a look at how you would change the shell for um, GitHub Code Spaces. So the idea is that uh, VS, the VS Code browser comes with bash, fish, zsh. So you do have a few options um, in order to change your shells. I usually just use bash, but um, you know maybe you like something else. Is there some way to get PowerShell on there? Probably, but I didn't look into it. And the way you would configure that is in your dev container. So the idea is that uh, let's say you wanted to bring in one called uh, CSSH. And so you would specify the path of where it is. So this is CSH, CSH but you, know, you might have to be very specific where it is. And then that way you can uh, uh, have it in your profiles as a dropdown. Um, notice that if you are using um, uh, VS Code for very specific OS distributions, then you can set the default uh, there. Um, but yeah, that's about it. The github.dev editor is a VS Code browser that instantly loads and has no attached compute. So it looks like VS Code. Um, there are two ways you can open up your GitHub repo in github.dev. The easiest way is pressing period when you're on the GitHub repo page. The other way is by assembling the URL. So you have github.dev and then you have your repo followed by it. GitHub.dev is intended for quickly changing files and committing code in an IDE experience. Um, it has no attached compute, so it's very limited in what it can do. So there's two things that look like editors in GitHub, and it's important that we distinguish between the two because on the exam, we'll definitely ask you the differences between them. So for GitHub.dev, it is totally free for code spaces. You have a free monthly quota but uh, it can charge based on storage or core hours per month. And this is usually based on that machine type. It'll increase the cost. For availability, they're available to both on github.com. Uh, for startup, it instantly launches. There's no dev container JSON configuration. For code spaces, it takes a few minutes and it does load a dev container JSON. For compute, there is no attached compute. You can't run code or apps. For code spaces, you have a dedicated attached VM. You run and debug your code and your apps. Uh, there's no terminal access for github.dev. For code spaces, there is. Uh, for github.dev, we have a limited subset of extensions. For code spaces, most extensions for them is from the VS Code Marketplace. So there you go. Open source is source code made freely available for possible modification and redistribution. And you might have heard of some of these open source projects like Linux or Git or Docker or Spark. Um, a lot of times these companies are really well utilized by a very specific company that will have a paid solution. And it really does help keep um, the project going or help with its mass adoption. In the case of Git, uh, Git is actually um, managed by the Linux Foundation. So it's not necessarily a project that GitHub manages, but GitHub uh, clearly makes a large, um, makes good use of uh, Git. So open source uh, benefits include things as encouraging global collaboration, speeds up innovation, offers adaptability and customization, reduces software costs, enhances learning for developers, typically high quality and uh, things that are typically high quality and reliable, provides transparency for trust and security. And open source software has often have free community versions, which make it easy for personal developers or small organizations to quickly adopt technology. Uh, if you're looking at that logo, that's from the OSI or the Open Source Initiative, which is a nonprofit organization. They are the steward of the open source definition. This is the set of rules that help define open source software. And uh, one cool project that they have is they maintain a list of open source licensing documents. And that way you're able to take these documents and quickly apply them to your projects. The top five most uh, popular open source licenses are MIT, uh, the new public public or the the new general public license so GPL Apache 2.0 uh, lesser general public license so LGPL and the BSD license depending on the license it determines whether someone can re redistribute your code uh, as a commercial product or do they have to alert you of how they're using utilizing the product or reference you there's all different kinds of licenses and you can pick one which works for your code base if you choose to make it open source.
GitHub Sponsors allows GitHub users to collect donations from their GitHub hosted open source projects. So here you can see someone can sponsor the Octocat. So I say projects, but of course you can directly do user accounts if it's through Patreon. Um, sponsorship payments um, are facilitated two ways, payments through GitHub on github.com, payments through Patreon on github.com. And so you can set it up for a specific repo to get your sponsor button. Um, you can connect your Patreon via your account settings, I think to get that global one there. Uh, to receive sponsorship through GitHub on github.com, you need to be accepted into the GitHub Sponsors Program. I think this is specifically for if you want GitHub to collect the money on your behalf. Um, you have to apply for it and go onto a waiting list. You can do it for personal accounts and organizations, and you might have to provide, uh, well, you will have to provide uh, banking information in order to get paid. GitHub makes it easy to locate people who maintain your dependencies so you can support open source contributions. You can go to uh, forward slash sponsors, forward slash explore, and they'll tell you about uh, the, like the repos, that, or sorry, the dependencies that you're using in your project to suggest um, who you could sponsor uh, that are helping you out uh, in that sense. But there you go. Let's talk about GitHub and open source projects. Um, there is some kind of statement that GitHub makes about open source, but I really couldn't figure out what it is that they wanted me to put in this course. Uh, when I took the exam, they definitely had some kind of um, uh, PR kind of language and saying, oh, what do you think that uh, uh, is GitHub's relationship with open source? So just do your best to guess that. I really couldn't assemble it here. So it's hidden in some kind of PR content. But let's talk about the practicalities of how GitHub works with open source. Uh, one thing is that when you create a repo, you can choose a license for easily. I imagine that it's from that OSI approved list. And then when you go to repo, you can see the license clearly displayed. Um, and that will be stored in that license.md. That could be license.md, license, or license.md with all caps. They'll all work. If you're looking to find open source projects, you can use the search to search based on license. Um, yeah, there are many open source GitHub repos that are hosted on GitHub um, because GitHub offers a lot of stuff for free to uh, good open source projects. Some people will mirror their projects, so maybe they don't host it primarily on GitHub, but they'll make a copy and they'll sync it so that it has redundancy of where it could be. You can use, um, uh, you can explore under to uh, GitHub topics and GitHub trending in the community pages uh, to try to find open source uh, projects based on whether they're popular or for specific categories. You can follow organizations and um, you can sponsor organizations. And so that might be one way of doing that. If you're utilizing the GitHub Marketplace, they have a bunch of apps in here. And a lot of these are open source projects and they'll have, uh, you'll be able to install them for free. So that is uh, something else that is really interesting. Um, but yeah, there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown. Let's go take a look and figure out what kind of open source stuff we can find out on github.com. And one thing I think that would be really important to check out is the community page. Um, so I think it's just here on the Explorer. So on the left-hand side, we'll go to Explorer. We might as well open up the Marketplace as well. I mean, the Marketplace is good also for apps, um, not just for open source, but there definitely is open store uh, stuff here. So like if I go into here, I'm not sure if they have an open source license, but sometimes you go to plans. And they might tell you, so this one says free, not necessarily open source, but there are ones that are open source that we can uh, find, but you do have to do a bit of digging to find them, I suppose. Anyway, um, if we go to explore, this is where we get a kind of a community of information. Uh, you can see what's trending in terms of repos and developers. Uh, we have topics over here where you can drill down into specific things. So if you like AWS, you can see all of uh, these repos here. Okay, so that makes it pretty clear in terms of discoverability. For trending, we could look for trending stuff as well over here. All right, but you know, primarily if you're gonna find open source stuff, I guess you'd have to search for it and look based on the license. So we can go here and try to expand our search, but maybe we say license. License, I have a hard time spelling that. And so we can just choose one here, say MIT, and just hit enter and it'll show us everything that is uh, under MIT license. So that could be one way that you could explore and try to find things. Um, but yeah, hopefully that gives you kind of an idea uh, of 
you know, open source. Maybe we should take a look and see what GitHub thinks they, they, they want to say about open source. GitHub, open source. They probably have some kind of statement where open source community lives. A PR person definitely wrote this. Um, open source software is free for you to use and explore. All right. Read our open source guides. And yeah, maybe there's something in here that they would want us to know in the course, but it's just a lot of stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's nobody wants to read through all this, but um, yeah, I mean, there's stuff in here, so that's cool, I guess. But yeah, that's open source and GitHub, okay? Inner source is organization and development best practices for non-open source or proprietary software. The term was coined by Tim O'Reilly back in 2000. An inner source is not a strict guideline, but a loose strategy to establish an open source like culture within organizations. It was really, really hard, <laughs> really hard to figure out what this was because they, they, when they say loose, they mean it's really loose. Um, but uh, what I found to help make more sense was to look at the free structured resources provided by the innersourcecommons.org, where they have a bunch of patterns that you can use um, to apply to your organization to start to apply inner source. Um, and yeah, it's just to make sure you adopt open source in a way that is great for the community and your company. All right, let's make sure we understand the difference between inner source versus open source. So the scope is a bit different. Inner source is within an organization. Remember that word inner. So if it's pointing inwards, we're talking about the org. If it's open source, this is public and a global community. Um, in terms of accessibility, inner source is limited to company employees where open source is open to everybody. For um, purpose, inner source improves collaboration efficiency internally whereas open source shares and collaborates on projects globally. For contributions, employees of the organization is for inner source, and for open source, it's about anybody, such as developers or users. For visibility, inner source is code and discussions often private to the organization, and open source is publicly available and visible. For governance, inner source is based on the internal policies and culture of the organization, and for open source, it's usually governed by open source licenses and community rules. So there you go. So forking a repo allows you to create a copy of a repo and uh, forking allows you to take an open source or source available repo and go your own way. Quickly apply bugs and patch fixes, a separate repo to work on uh, for community contributions. You can also uh, create cross pull, uh, repo, repo pull requests to get accepted into the original repo. When you fork a repo, you'll be able to tell because it will say forked from the location underneath. If you need to explore other forked repos, you can use the network graph to find uh, specific commits to see what the difference between your repo and another one is at a glance. You may prefer using a forked repo over the original. You may find uh, the original project abandoned and a fork becoming the go-to repo for a project. Forks help keep public projects alive, uh, on the edge, and collaborative. So there you go. GitHub repos can be set as public, making repos easily searchable on GitHub via search engines. Public repos serve a community purpose for knowledge sharing, educational resources, and open source projects. Besides just search, GitHub curates content via community pages, such as the Explore page and the Trending page. Um, GitHub provides a robust search that, not, uh, that lets us not only search the repo's name, but the contents of the repo. As you can see in the advanced search, we have a lot of options for search. Uh, there is a search syntax where we can utilize a lot of different um, of these little filters to find things very quickly. The search syntax also supports regular expressions, wildcards, not, or, and multiple terms and more. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown and this follow along, I wanna take a look at repository search as it probably will appear on your exam to know how to utilize this. So what we'll do is just type in rails and um, I'm looking for all results. I'm gonna click the one up here because I wanna to get to this more advanced search where we have a bunch of options. And where the exam might ask is understanding how to compose a query. So you can see we have a lot of options uh, here and notice as soon as I click, it starts filling them in. So um, 
If we just go here for a moment, we could just take out rails completely and we could try to do something. So we have public, oh, sorry. We'll go down here and try it down here. So we say public. So is public is something that we could do. Um, we could also specify based on topic. Mm, I'm not sure what we would put in for topic. Let's go take a look and, and see what is there. So I'm not really seeing anything for topic, but what we could do, we're not exactly sure on all these parameters. If we go to advanced search down below, this kind of basically gives us the same stuff. So if I was to search topic here, and I'm really surprised I can't find what topic is, but let's go take a look and see if that actually is something, because I'm really curious. GitHub repo topic. Um, with topics, you can explore repos. Okay, so it looks like we can actually categorize them in certain ways. I didn't even know that. Let's go over here. Ah, oh, yes, topics here. Okay, so I guess the idea is that we can classify our project based on a topic, and so maybe one could be Azure. So we could go back over to our search. I was kind of curious about that. And we could say something like topic, colon, and then Azure, and then hit enter. And so this could narrow it down to Azure projects. Maybe we could take out the Rails term in the front so we can kind of narrow down exactly what it is we're looking for. And so now we're getting kind of Azure projects. We can put like loose search on the end here. So let's say we wanted to use Bicep, which is something that Azure has. We could search it that way. I'm kind of curious about this topic option because I didn't realize we could set topics. So let's go over to our repo and see if we can set that. So I'm gonna go into our fun repo. We'll go into settings and I'm looking for topics. So let's find that. And the reason I'm interested is because on my exam, actually topics came up and I wasn't really aware of being able to set them. So yeah, let's go see if there's some way we can do that. Um, searching topics on the about page. It seems like we can set that. So I'm going to go back to my repo here and we'll go here. Oh, we have topics. So I could say fun, <laughs> which is not a real topic, but we could do that. We could say uh, beginner. And so that's going to provide uh, topics that are uh, really well known and allow people to search for that. So I think that's pretty useful. So, you know, get some experience with the discoverable uh, or the, the search functionality and add some topics. And I think that'll be good enough. Okay. <music> GitHub labels are used to categorize issues, pull requests and discussions. And the way it works is you can just apply multiple labels to your targeted item, and then it should show up uh, beside the item somewhere. Uh, you can manage your labels or create new labels on the labels page for your repo. And creating a label is pretty simple. It just needs a name, a description, and a color. The GitHub CLI provides commands for labels. So it is very easy to create labels. Milestones allow you to group multiple issues into an end goal, which shows completion towards that goal for each closed issue. So the idea is you can make a new milestone and you can assign milestones to it. I'm just getting my pen tool out here so you can see, but the idea is that as we uh, close, we get to a completion. So if we have one open, one close, we're at 50%. And when we're done, it's at 100%. You can set a date um, and there you go. Hey, it's Angie Brown and this fall along, we want to create some custom labels. It's pretty straightforward, but uh, I figured we should take a look at a more popular repo and see what kind of labels they're using, if they've even modified them at all. So we're over here on the Ruby on Rails um, uh, site, and we can see we have lots of labels, and they're breaking it down based on uh, sub packages and things like that. And I'm not sure what this is. It looks like maybe open issues. So you can go here and filter out to that. Um, there's a lot of automation that you can apply with labels. Um, so when you create issues, you can have labels being pre-assigned. You could have... Uh, pull requests, act a certain way based on the labels it has. So there's a lot you can do with labels. We're not going to show you all those automation features, but we will show you how to create your own labels, which is pretty straightforward. So we'll go into our fun repo and we'll go over to issues and we will create some labels. We'll make a new one here called um, secret. If we haven't already made one before, and I'll go ahead and just choose a random color and boom, we have our secret label. If we go over to our issues, we can then go ahead and assign all sorts of labels, super easy. So yeah, there you go. That's all you need to know. Ciao. 
Hey everyone, it's Andrew Brown, and this fall along, we're gonna take a look at milestones. So what we'll do is go to our fun repo, and we'll have to create a couple of issues. I have one here called, what is the best movie ever? But then we can say, what is the best food ever? As our other ticket, and then we can figure out what that is later on. But the idea is that we want to put this into a new milestone. So what we'll do is go back to issues, and we'll create ourselves a new milestone, and we'll call this, um, live in life. I don't, I don't know what to call this, but we're going to go ahead and call that. Um, oh, that was another issue. That wasn't a milestone, <laughs> but that's fine. We could always use more milestones here and we'll create a new milestone. We'll say true living. Okay. And we could set a date in the future, any date that we want to complete this. And I'm going to go back over to my issues and I'm going to check box. Well, first I'll go into one. And we can assign the milestone this way. We can also mass assign probably this way as well. If we go here, by the way, there's mass assignment for all these things for issues. Probably good to know that. And now if we go over to our milestone, we have a percentage of how complete it is. So if we go back over here, we can close a couple of these. Okay. And if we go back over to our milestone, we can see that we've made some progress. It's 66% complete. I wanna show you maybe Rails because I have a feeling that they probably have milestones. A lot of open source projects will have milestones to help you know when the next version's coming out. So if we go over to issues here and go to milestones, you can get an idea like when the next version is. And uh, that's a really great use case for milestones. So we can go in here and see that they only have one more ticket to get version 7.13 out. Um, then we have 8.00 and they have a bunch of other stuff. So it is quite interesting how milestones can be organized, but usually this is the use case uh, that I see. But anyway, we'll see you in the next one, okay? Ciao. GitHub Projects is a planning and tracking tool when working on GitHub repos and a project has an adaptable view that can be changed at any time between a spreadsheet, a task board, and a roadmap. Um, so that's kind of the screen where you choose what kind of view you want. Projects directly integrate with issues and pull requests. Projects have built-in workflows to automate common actions. So uh, the idea is that a GitHub project is composed of multiple views, and you can add more views to your project. Each view's layout can be changed at any time to accommodate the project use case. So if you set up a view, you can change it whenever you want. Uh, so let's take a look at what the table looks like. So this is a great uh, layout if you want a traditional uh, ticket tracking system or you have a large amount of tasks. Then we have the board. This is a great layout for agile task. And if you need to understand clearly the state of your issues, it's your basic Kanban board. And then we have a roadmap. This is great if you're trying to plan for uh, uh, tasks based on a timeline. We call these normally... Um, Gantt charts. So that's kind of what that is there. For your layout, you can configure your data based on multiple options. So we got fields, columns, group by, sort by, field sum, slice by, zoom level, and dates. I'm not reading through all this because I didn't see it on the exam. So, uh, you know, these are pretty straightforward and you can read these if you want, but um, yeah. So your GitHub project items have custom fields. You can create new fields and add uh, and provide options to easily fill in those fields. And I mean, that's pretty much the start of it, but there we go. Let's talk about GitHub projects versus GitHub project classic as this might end up as an exam question and to avoid any confusion if you somehow end up creating a classic project. So GitHub projects are new, more dynamic interfaces with tables, board, and views. Uh, classic just has a, a Kanban board style thing like Trello. Um, GitHub projects are highly customizable with different views and fields. The classic is limited customization options. Uh, there is apparently more automation support in the new projects, whereas the old one was simpler. The new projects has enhanced reporting features and insights, whereas classic has basic reporting and tracking. Uh, GitHub projects has deeper integration with GitHub issues and pull requests, whereas classics has basic integration with GitHub repos. GitHub projects offers more advanced and flexible project management tools compared to GitHub classic projects which is simpler and more straightforward. There's no reason to ever use classic unless it's for legacy reason, but yeah, there you go.
GitHub has built-in project workflows that allows you to automate what happens based on specific events in your projects. So you have this workflows um, uh, area, like I think you do the ellipses and you get to workflows. And from there you can uh, basically change some behavior. So when here it says when a pull request is merged, you could say set the value or the status as being done for this particular field. There are the following built-in workflows, item added to project, item reopened, item closed, code changes requested, code review approved, pull request merged, auto archived items, auto add to project. And for the exam, they will definitely, definitely ask you which are some built-in workflows. I do not like that question, but it's in the exam. So make sure you remember these so that you can get an extra point on your exam. Uh, for more advanced automation of GitHub projects, you can use GitHub Actions, and there you go. Project Insights lets you create charts about your GitHub projects, and there are two charts that they want you to know. The first is current charts, and the second one is historical charts. So current charts is basically you take a value and you can plot it as a chart. The historical charts is you take values and you plot them over time. The exam will definitely ask you about what are the two types of um, charts. So make sure you remember that it's current charts and historical charts. There you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown. And in this follow along, I wanna take a look at uh, GitHub projects. And by the way, I'm not sure if it's picking up, but I'm in my snowsuit because it's so darn cold in my office because it's winter and my furnace isn't working. So if you hear like, scratchy sounds, it's because I'm wearing a full blown uh, heavy duty snowsuit, okay? <laughs> and you might hear them in other videos, but I just wanted to point that out if that, you know, if you're wondering what that sound is. But anyway, let's go take a look at our fun repo. And from here, I wanna make our way over to projects and we'll create ourselves a new project. I would like this to get out of the way and um, I'm gonna go ahead and create a new project. I should note that um, a project can um, contain uh, uh, tasks and issues from other projects. But for the most part, I'd, I'd, I'd rather make a new one here. And so it just keeps giving me this darn pop, get out of the way. <laughs> and so we can choose from a bunch of different templates. Um, I'm gonna choose team planning, cause that sounds really good. And right away, we're gonna get a bunch of views across the top. So we've got our backlog. We can go ahead and add an item. I'll just say, uh, watch Roadhouse and write a review, okay? And so we'll go ahead and do that. And this is a draft, so it's not really an issue yet. It's kind of like in limbo, but you can convert this to an issue and put it in the repo. And now I can drag it around and move into other states, which is really nice. We can go up here to backlog. If you don't like the board, we can change it to a table. This allows us to drop things down in a very nice and easy way. It gives us some uh, default parameters that came with this project. We can go to roadmap if we want to, and we could say we need to do it between this time and that time for the scope of our project. Not super complicated. I don't know how this stuff works. I fiddled with it. It wasn't doing what I thought it was gonna do, but I'll change this back to a board. Um, we could go and generate out a chart, which is gonna be in Project Insights. Understand there's two types of charts, current charts and historical charts. And this one looks like it's a current one, so it's not over time and how you would have it in time. I have no idea. Um, oh, up here. So I guess these are the types of layouts we can have. So that's pretty cool. Um, so we change that to line or bar or stacked bar. Uh, we can go ahead and hit new chart. And I'm trying to figure out how do we get historical charts? Because I thought it'd be like you choose one or the other, but it doesn't seem like it's that way. It seems like you probably have to group it by something or you'd have to have it based on the timeline, like iteration or something. So yeah, I'm not exactly sure how you create the historical chart. I don't think it really matters. Um, again, this is GitHub Foundations. We just need to get some familiarity with projects. If we go up here in the top right corner, um, we can get this drop down to get over to our workflows. And again, I'm gonna go through these with you. So we have item added to project. Item reopened, item closed. You can see there's a couple already set. So when we have an item closed, it's gonna set the value as done. Okay, so if I go back over to this issue, okay, and we close it, it should get moved to done. 
There we go. So see how that automatically moved to done? And that's because of that workflow here. And so we have some other ones that we could set up if we want, we could edit them. But these are very, very simple. As you can see, they're very straightforward. Uh, we can go to settings and in settings, you can see we have our custom fields. You can add them, change the field type to a very specific kind. So if you wanna say, I wanna collect the date, you could have that there. And if we call this roadhouse date, which makes no sense, but we can do that. And we go back to our settings. We can go to our ticket, okay? And click it. And we can now set our roadhouse date. So yeah, hopefully that makes sense, but it's pretty darn straightforward. And that is GitHub projects. <laughs>
close pull <laughs> requests in the repo, enable, disable auto merge for a pull request, apply suggested changes to pull requests in the repo, create a pull request from a fork of the repo, submit a review of a pull request that affects the mergeability of the pull request, create and edit a wiki for the repo, create and edit releases for the repo, acts as a code owner for the repo, publish, view, or installs packages, removes themselves as collaborators on the repo. Okay, so that's a lot to remember. So just remember this. Repo owners have full control of the repo. Collaborators can pull, such as read the contents of the repo and push, write changes to the repo. There you go. Ciao. Enterprise managed users, also known as EMUs, allow you to manage the lifecycle and authentication of users on github.com from an external identity management system or IDP. GitHub partners with some developers of identity management systems to provide a paid path integration with EMUs. Um, the IDPs, yeah, IDPs mostly provide authentication using SAML. They can use Microsoft Entre ID, previously known as Azure AD, and also offers OIDC for authentication. The IDP applications provisions users with systems for cross-domain identity management, SCIM, and I'm going to just tell you, on my exam, I got so many darn questions about this, and I have no idea why. But anyway, for partner IDPs, you can use Microsoft Entre ID, formerly known as Azure AD, Okta, and Pig Federate. They all support SAML. Uh, only OCID is supported by Microsoft Entre ID. And then you have SCIM. Now, when I say I got questions on the exam, it wasn't specifically which partner provided what IDP, but it was more just understanding that enterprises have uh, this functionality of having SCIM and OIDC, and was it between enterprise uh, server and enterprise cloud? Okay, um, but there we go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and this fall along, I want to focus a little bit on security as I feel that uh, the security section here is a little bit light. And maybe by looking at some of the security stuff, it might help us on the exam because they do ask things about like these scanning things. And so I'm hoping that if we look at them, you'll remember them. So we have Dependabot, Code Scanning, and Secret Scanning. This is a public repo. So we have these options here. And uh, we have Private Vulnerability Reporting. Let's see if we can turn that on. What happens? It's a beta feature. Let's turn it on. Can we turn it on? It's on. There we go. Can we turn on Dependabot alerts? Let's do it. It is on. And then we have code scanning. So code scanning is a little bit more work. It has code uh, QL anal analysis. Is it easy to set up? Let's do the defaults. And it says we're using Ruby and we'll enable code QL. So all those scans are now set up. It was as simple as that. I don't think it's gonna cost me anything additional because it's a public repo. Okay, and so now those are enabled. I thought this one was enabled because we turned it on, but maybe not. Secret scanning would be something that would be really good. So let's go ahead and try that out. Secret scanning, let's enable that as well. And boom, there you go. You got all that stuff in place. It's no more complicated than that. We do also see secrets and uh, variables here. So it looks like it kind of uh, bring, brings them all into one place. So we saw it for code spaces, but I guess GitHub Actions can have secrets as well. Dependabot can have secrets as well. Looks like the same kind of functionality across the board for all of these. Uh, we were basically just looking at code security analysis. So, you know, that's that. We can go over to our settings over here. Maybe they have a security tab over here. Um, yeah, they got this. It looks like the same thing, more or less. Maybe from a global perspective. It says push protection for yourself. Block commits that contains uh, supported secrets across all repos. That sounds really good. I'm going to turn that on. But uh, yeah, just remember those three things. The secret scanning. Uh, was, did I say three things? Let's go back and make sure it's just those three, whatever they were. We'll go back here. Depend about code scanning and secret scanning. Remember those three scanners, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown and this follow along, I wanna take a look at what kind of permissions we have for organizational accounts. I was trying to make a slide on this, but I was getting um, mis mixed match information, maybe because there used to be an old way of doing it, now there's a new way. 
And so it was really confusing. So this doesn't really work, but I figured what we could do is just look at the organization and see what we have for options. It didn't mess me up on the exam, but I still think that we should take a look and see how um, those kind of permissions work uh, for uh, organizations. So here I'm in an organization, we have collaborators and teams and notice that we can set different roles so we have admin, maintain, write, triage, and read. And if we want to have custom roles, we would have to have GitHub Enterprise. That's the only way that we're going to get it. So hopefully that is pretty darn clear. I don't know what else to say about it. It's pretty darn straightforward, um, but uh, there could be a bit more, but I don't know. So I just wanted to show you that very quickly, okay? <laughs> So within a GitHub repo, we can manage multiple features by enabling or disabling them, such as wikis, issues, sponsorships, preserve uh, the repo, which goes into the GitHub Arctic Code Vault, discussions, projects, and possibly more. I just got to point this out because it's in uh, the section for GitHub Administrator and so uh, for the GitHub Foundations course. And so I had to explicitly call out these particular features. And there we go. <laughs> Let's take a look at repo uh, permission levels. And so when you're a collaborator and they accept an invite, you can choose from predefined roles with different levels of access. The first is read, which allows you to view and clone the repo, open and comment on issues and pull requests and download releases. We have triage, which manages issues, pull requests without right access, label and assign issues and pull requests, close and reopen issues and pull requests. We have maintain, this allows you to push the repo manage issues, pull requests, labels, and project boards, create and publish re releases, configure repo settings for non-sensitive fields. We have admins, which basically have full control and enterprises allow for custom rules, okay? <music> branch protection rules are used to enforce certain workflows or requirements before changes can be merged into a branch. You could find that under the uh, branch tab in your GitHub repo. And so here we could apply a branch, uh, uh, branch protection rules. There's a lot of stuff that we can do here. We can require a pull request before merging, require status checks to pass before merging, require conversation uh, resolution before merging, require signed commits, require linear history, require deployment to succeed before merging, lock branch, do not allow bypassing the above settings. And for admins, we can allow force push, allow deletions, on the exam, they might ask you what kind of uh, branch protection rule you can do. I don't think it's a very fair question because I could never remember all of these, but unfortunately uh, uh, it, they, it might show up in your exam. And if you don't want to lose a point, uh, make sure you remember generally what things you can do with branch protection rules, okay? So there is a security tab and this is for your repo and it basically acts as a security checklist. If you are, um, not the, the owner, you're gonna see something else like the actual security policy and some information about vulnerabilities in the repo. But security policy is one thing that it will suggest uh, for you to create, which is a markdown file on how security vulnerabilities should be reported. We have security advisories, which privately discusses, fix and publishes information. I think they're uh, deprecating this feature, um, except for open source public repo. So it might not be something that uh, is used uh, much in the future. Uh, we have private vulnerability reporting, allow your community to privately report uh, potential security vulnerabilities to maintainers and re repos, basically a form to tell you about vulnerabilities. I think this is in beta right now. Uh, we have Dependabot alerts, so a bot that alerts you of vulnerabilities due to out of date dependencies. Dependabot can automatically create PRs to update dependencies for you to approve. We have code scanning alerts, automatically detect common vulnerabilities and coding errors via code QL and third party tools. And then we have secret scanning alerts, get notified when a secret is pushed to a repo. Collaborators allow uh, you to let other GitHub users have access to your repo based on the permission levels you provide. So you can search based on username across everybody. It'll tell you whether they, I actually I don't know if it'll tell you if they're external, but the point is you can search for them and then you can add them. The idea is that you'll get an invitation. You have to accept the invitation um, at the invitation's address. I strongly recommend that you tell people um, to go accept it because it's not the best at alerting uh, other people. And then sometimes it just times out or expires. So that's kind of a pain. So just make sure you keep on top of your invitations, okay? <laughs> 
an organization can group uh, organization members into teams. And so that's an example of having a core team. Um, you can set the vis visibility between uh, secret and visible. That will definitely be an exam question that I got. So make sure you remember that. Uh, teams can be assigned to projects and issues. Uh, re uh, request reviews from teams or request reviews from teams. Yep. Teams can be mentioned in discussions, issues, and pull requests. Control team access to repos. And new members can be added to teams, instantly giving them access to all relevant repos and discussions. So the idea is that if you add people to a team, you have uh, ways of delegating out a bunch of um, responsibilities and uh, things like that. So there you go. GitHub Connect enhances GitHub Enterprise servers by allowing your GHES instance to access some of the GitHub.com cloud-only offerings. So the idea is that because you are self-hosting, there's just functionality that lives in the cloud. And so this is their way of bringing some of it to you. What kind of functionality are we talking about? Well, that is the automatic user license sync, Dependabot, GitHub.com Actions, which I'm not sure what that means, but oh, probably GitHub Actions. It's because the .com's in there, it's confusing. Server Statistics, Unified Search, and Unified Contribution. So the key thing I want you to remember is that GitHub Connect is specifically for the Enterprise Server Edition, and it's to uh, bring certain features uh, to your self-hosted version from the cloud, okay? So GitHub Enterprise Cloud Accounts have a third special GitHub repo, which is called internal. And so what this internal uh, GitHub repo does, it allows all enterprise members to have read permissions in the internal repo. Internal repositories are not visible to people outside of the enterprise, including outside collaborators on organization repos, unless uh, your enterprise uses EMUs, members of the enterprise can fork any internal repos owned by an organization in the enterprise. And internal repos are the default setting for all new repositories created in an organi organization owned by an enterprise account. So all I want you to know is that there is these things called internal repos. They're only for enterprise cloud. Uh, are they on the server one? I don't think so, but in the docs, they said it was for cloud. And then when I looked up a different feature, in enterprise, it said it was only for cloud, but it was for both. So um, yeah, I would just say, remember that there's just third option for enterprise or enterprise cloud, and you'll be in good shape and get another point on your exam, okay? So GitHub makes extra security features available to customers under a GitHub advanced security license. And these GitHub Advanced Security is available for enterprise accounts on GitHub Enterprise Cloud, GitHub Enterprise Servers, and some of the features uh, are available for public repositories on GitHub. I'm not sure I have of four in there. I guess it's just a, a little muck up there. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I can barely get to my pen tool. Um, but anyway, uh, the features that they're talking about is code scanning, secret scanning, dependency review. And so based on uh, whether you're a public repo or you're a private repo without advanced security, you're going to have different access. So for public repos, you get full access. For private repos without the advanced security license, you get nothing. And if you have the advanced security, you get them all. What's confusing about uh, this one in particular is um, it says some of the features for public repos. So it makes me think there's more than three features. I could not find more other than the three listed. Uh, maybe if I made an enterprise account and contacted support that I could figure that out. But um, that is a lot of work, especially for a foundations course. So just know that there is a GitHub, a GitHub advanced security license. I remember those three components. And those are the same things that we basically kind of saw in the, um, in the, uh, uh, the security tab, right, with all the scans. And dependency review, I'm going to assume is a dependabot, okay? Uh, but there you go. Let's quickly talk about SAML and SCIM. These are both available for GitHub Enterprise Cloud and GitHub Enterprise Server. Um, just remember that these are features specifically to enterprise and just have a general understanding the difference between the two. So SAML stands for Security Assertion Markup Language. It is an open standard for exchanging authentication authorization between an identity provider and a service provider. It's an important use case for SAML is single sign-on via the browser. If you don't know what single sign-on is, it's where you use one account to log in and then you're logged in everywhere else. 
And so if you want to have single sign-on, the mechanism they're using here is SAML. Then you have SCIM. So this is stands for System of Cross-Domain Identity Management. It's an open standard for automating the exchange of user identity information across different identity management systems. A key use for SCIM is to enable scalable and automated user provisioning and deprovisioning, often integrated with enterprise identity services. I know that's a mouthful, but I got a simpler summary for you here. SAML is about securely transmitting user authentication and authorization data for single sign-on purposes. And SCIM is about managing user identities across different systems to simplify account maintenance provisioning. So if you remember those two at the bottom, you'll note they are. Um, they didn't really ask, at least I didn't get any questions that had to distinguish between the two. It was more so, you know, where are these features available? And it was for both the enterprise cloud and enterprise server. Um, and one other thing I want to just note is that these two, uh, these two things can complement each other in the same ecosystem because they're doing two different things, um, uh, serving two different purposes. So just understand that they co commingle, um, and that this is for enterprises. Okay. Hey, this is Andrew Brown. And in this fall along, I want to show you how to register um, or book your uh, GitHub certification exam. So what you're going to want to do is go to the GitHub certifications page, and you can do that by typing in gh.io forward slash certifications, and it should bring you uh, generally here. I've never done this booking before, so we're going to learn together, but it shouldn't be too hard. And the first thing we'll want to do is register. I want to point out that if we go down below, we can see our certifications to get additional information, but I'm going to go ahead and register here. And I actually already have registered and the process is connecting your GitHub account um, uh, to here. So my steps might be slightly different, but more or less is the same. So you might have a, a page where it's gonna pop up. It's gonna show you that you have to confirm um, a connection and go ahead and do that. And you should end up in here. And so in here is where we're going to see um, uh, our exams. And so we have GitHub Actions, GitHub Administrator, Advanced Security and Foundations. I'm interested in the foundations one, so I'm gonna go ahead and click into that. And just understand that this price may change based on, um, you know, based on uh, if they change the price down the road, but right now it's price is 99 USD because uh, this exam is so new at the time I'm shooting this video, it actually has a discount of $49. So you might not get that. Um, it might just be 99 USD dollars, which is still very affordable, but just understand that, uh, you know, different times means different results. Let's go ahead and schedule this exam. It's through PSI. So if you've ever done a PSI exam, that'll be pretty straightforward. So we'll go ahead and schedule and take our exam. And we have information to fill out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through all of this and fill out my information and click this button, and then I'll show you the next step. So I just don't want to expose other information. So I'll see you back here in just a moment, okay? All right, so I click through there, and now it's gonna want me to um, accept the uh, PSI test taker site to my GitHub account. I'm gonna go ahead and authorize this. I'm just gonna stop and start again, just because I'm not sure if it's gonna show personal information. I don't really feel like uh, um, emitting it, so I'm just trying to do that. So I'll be back here in just a moment. I'm gonna head, go ahead and click that green button. There we go, and it's brought us over to the PSI online store. So this is a familiar experience, at least for me. Let's go take a look at and see the uh, available tests. Um, you know, sometimes there are tests that are online or are on site. These days, everything is both. Uh, right, right now, I cannot take these ones. I'm not exactly sure as to why, as I'm pretty sure the other ones did not have prerequisites, but maybe GitHub changed it and you need to have the foundations before you take these ones. That's totally fine. I'm just clicking to this and see why that is. The test requires authorization from the test sponsor. So maybe since it's so new at this time, it's not going to allow me to do this, or it could be that it is a prerequisite there, but what we'll do is go back here and click on the foundations and notice that we have 99 USD. I'm gonna go ahead and continue booking. Actually, I'm gonna click back there because I think there was a, a deal. You're pre-approved, uh, you're eligible for this exam until 3, 12, 24. Not exactly sure why I chose that message, that's totally fine. So we have online proctored and on site. I'm gonna go ahead and go to continue booking. Um, we have some information here. Uh, please don't call me, it doesn't go to me. Uh, it's just annoying, okay? so. Do not call my phone number. We'll go ahead and hit continue. I might even go wipe that out so it's less of an issue for me. I'm gonna go ahead and type in Canada. I am in Toronto time. So I'm gonna go ahead and type in Toronto. That's uh, US East uh, standard. Um, and we'll go ahead and hit find. And so now I'm looking for an available time that I wish to book. 
Um, so, I mean, I could book it today. That seems a bit crazy. Um, do I want to do that? Am I crazy enough to do that today? Um, maybe. Yeah, you know what? I think I'm going to do it. I'm going to book my um, uh, mine tonight for 9 p.m. I know that sounds really crazy, but I'm going to do it. We'll go ahead and choose 9 p.m. Make sure your time is correct. You're going to have an issue there. I'm going to book this time slot. And now I need to fill in my additional information. I just happen to have uh, a voucher code here. Um, just understand that you know you may or may not have it, but I just happen to have it because I'm lucky. But we're going to go ahead and fill in the rest of the information, continue on. If the review information has personal information, I might not show it, um, but uh, we're almost there. So I'll be back in just a moment. I just want to quickly show that you have two options, credit card and PayPal. So I'm going to go ahead and enter my credit card in. I'm just going to go ahead and do that. I'll see you back in a moment. All right. So yeah, here is my confirmation. I'm going to go ahead and purchase this. So it looks to be good. Make sure you confirm the time and uh, make note of the time that you have to complete it, as that is very important. Um, again, today is February 1st where I am, so that is the correct date. I'm going to go ahead and click Purchase. And now my uh, booking is confirmed. It's probably a great idea to print your confirmation. A lot of times you have to prep your environment, so make sure you uh, set up your remote online proctored uh, system and do your checks uh, prior to this. So if you click that, it should install an app on your computer. Um, really make sure you do that ahead of time. With these exams, you should always have two pieces of government IDs. So think passport and driver's license. The reason I just tell you to have both of them is in case one is giving you a problem. Um, so just make sure you have both on hand. You really only need one, but if you go to an in-person uh, place, they might want to have two pieces of government ID. Maybe one that, uh, you know, sometimes it could be a health card, but mostly it's driver's license, passport. Um, it's gonna vary per country. But uh, yeah, uh, give me good luck on my exam and I'll talk to you soon. Ciao.